Damon and Veronica had just met Avery at the Berlin airport. The three of them were planning to travel Europe together. Avery couldn't believe that Damon was in Berlin and she wondered why he was here. He grinned at her but didn't say anything. Avery, let's go to the hotel to rest first, Veronica suggested. Then we can get together and start planning our trip. Avery was tired from the flight, so she nodded her head. Damon took her luggage for her and the three of them went to check into a hotel together. Later that morning, they met up in the hotel's restaurant to start planning their trip. Avery wanted to go sightseeing in Venice. After all, it was known as the capital of romance. She also wanted to go to a Scandinavian country like Norway to experience the culture. The three of them already had a rough idea about where they wanted to go. They just had to finalize the details. Avery and Veronica had wanted to travel Europe together for a long time now, but they were a little worried about doing it alone. Two girls by themselves could run into problems. Now that Damon was with them, their worries disappeared. That day, Veronica gave Avery a tour of Berlin. In the evening, they met up with Damon for dinner. Damon's fears about being the third wheel seemed founded. Whenever they were all together, Avery and Veronica spent the time chatting privately about girl stuff and did not pay much attention to him. When they went shopping, they made him carry their purchases. He felt like he was just free labor. The girls made all the travel plans, and then he bought the tickets and booked the hotels. He felt like a tour guide. On their last day in Berlin, the three of them went to bed early. The next morning, they set off for their first stop, Venice. They went to Italy by train. It was already night when they arrived in Venice. It was too late to go sightseeing, so they ate dinner and talked about what they would do together the next day. When they woke up the next morning, the two girls already knew what they wanted to do first. They dragged Damon along and rented a boat. They spent the whole day cruising the canals in the beautiful city. The waterways were full of boats. Tourists from all over the world wanted to experience the famous canals of Venice. It was said that since the sea level was rising, it was only a matter of time before the city disappeared into the sea forever. Therefore, many people wanted to come to see it while they still had the chance. However, Damon suspected that this was just a gimmick to draw more tourists. After staying in Venice for two days, the three of them flew north to Sweden. They stayed there for two days before heading on to Norway. After spending a few days in the Norwegian capital, they chose to spend a night in a small town near the sea before ending their trip. On the way to their last destination, Damon thought about the trip. Veronica was usually quiet and aloof, but when she traveled, she was very open and cheerful. Traveling in Europe had opened Damon's eyes to the world. He had seen many wonderful places. After he returned home, he planned to work on an update for Old Century so that he could integrate some of the wonderful things he had seen into his game. The good times never lasted. After a week of traveling, it was finally their last day together. Overall, Veronica and Avery were satisfied with their European vacation. After all, Damon had done most of the hard work for them. The two girls had a very good time. However, Damon felt like a third wheel. They treated him like free labor, not a friend or equal. After spending a week together traveling, he didn't feel any closer to either of them. Ronnie, how about we rent a boat and go for a row? Avery suggested. After all, we have to go home tomorrow. Let's take advantage of our last day and do something fun. The three of them were eating in an open-air restaurant by the sea. They could see some boats moored nearby. The restaurant where they were eating was next to a pier. The sea was calm and blue and many boats bobbed about on the surface. The locals were out fishing for crabs. It was not the girls' first time in Europe, but they had never been out crab fishing before. They wanted to try. When Veronica agreed, Avery immediately cheered. She grabbed Veronica's hand and ran off towards the marina. Damon heard her calling from afar. Come on, hurry up! He smiled helplessly, paid the bill, and followed the girls. At the pier, they met a man who rented boats. He was very warm to the three of them. He was obviously used to dealing with tourists. Veronica rented a boat and they agreed to bring it back before six o'clock in the evening. It was a motorboat. The man gave them life jackets and showed them how to drive it. Damon took the helm and the two girls sat at the bow to enjoy the scenery. It was already three o'clock in the afternoon and the tide was going out. The weather was pleasant and the wind blew gently, tousling the girls' beautiful long hair. It was pleasing to watch. The three of them enjoyed the warm afternoon. After a while, Avery suddenly turned and asked, Damon, do you like it here? He hadn't expected Avery to ask him this, but he nodded. I like it a lot. She smiled at him. Then if we get the chance, let's do this more often. If Ronnie and I have plans to travel again, can I invite you along? At first, Damon was moved by her invitation. But soon he realized she was probably just using him again. He smiled bitterly. You guys have been so focused on chatting with each other the whole time. I've been bored to death. <laughs> Avery giggled. She smiled sweetly and continued, What's wrong? Do you feel like we are ignoring you? 
then how can we make it up to you? Damon saw her charming expression and his mind ran wild. He could think of a few ways they could make it up to him. Of course, this was just a fantasy. Then he cast his gaze out over the blue ocean. The water was beautiful and clear. In the shallows, you could even see seaweed growing in the sand ten yards below the surface. Schools of tiny fish darted about under the boat. The girls relaxed in the bow, enjoying the sea breeze. When Damon closed his eyes, he could smell their sweet perfume. It was very enjoyable. It would be better if the girls were into him, though. As this thought floated through his mind, he tried to push it away. He was being shameless. His mind drifted to the night he spent with Miss Branto back in Berlin. The memory of this was still vivid in his mind. He did not really like her, and the memory of what he had done still made him feel guilty. He couldn't stop thinking about it. It was ruining his mood. At this moment, another boat appeared not far away. As they got closer to it, they could see that two tourists were on the boat. They were both men, and when they saw Avery and Veronica, their eyes immediately lit up. The women attracted attention wherever they went. The other boat came up beside them. Hey, ladies, where are you from? One of the men leaned across and grabbed the side of their boat so they wouldn't drift away. He was nearly drooling. The other man chuckled. His eyes were practically popping out of his head. Avery and Veronica frowned. After all, they were in a foreign country, so they were a little nervous. Avery turned and whispered, Damon, let's go. These guys are bothering us. Compared to the girls, Damon appeared very calm. However, he still did as she asked and put the boat in reverse. The man in the other boat had no choice but to let go of the side of their boat. Hey, ladies, don't leave. This must be your first time here, right? Do you want us to show you around the good crabbing spots? The two men were not going to let them get away so easily. Damon put the boat in drive and accelerated away, but the other men hurriedly gave chase. Furthermore, their boat was faster than Damon's. The distance between the two boats shrank. One of the men shouted angrily, Hey, why are you running away? We were just being friendly. Hurry up and stop your boat or we'll crash into you. When the two women heard this, their pretty faces turned pale. They looked helplessly at Damon and hoped that he would know what to do. He smiled and stopped the boat. He then calmly watched the two men in the other boat to see what they would do next. That's right, sweethearts. Don't be afraid. We just want to get to know you. The two men saw the other boat had stopped and they were overjoyed. They pulled up next to them before Damon could change his mind. Then, one of the men jumped aboard and tied his boat to theirs. Hey, you, he said to Damon. Get on our boat and give us some space. We want to get to know your friends. He did not want Damon to ruin his fun. The other man jumped onto their boat too. He flexed his muscles and glared. Damon sat at the console. He wasn't going anywhere. He leisurely lit a cigarette. What if I don't? Damn it, you have a death wish, one of the men threatened while moving closer to him. The other man said angrily, If you continue to talk nonsense, we will feed you to the fish. Avery and Veronica were becoming more and more nervous, but they knew Damon was quite good at fighting. As they thought of this, they relaxed a little. Damon put out his cigarette. He had a cold expression on his eyes as he spat. Losers. What did you just say? When the men heard him daring to talk back to them, they were furious. One of them jumped towards him, but Damon wasn't afraid. As the man approached him, he suddenly grabbed the guy's neck and punched him hard in the nose. The man screamed and his nose began to bleed. I'm going to kill you! He roared with rage, but before he could finish his words, Damon kicked him in the face. The man's face was a bloody mess now. Damon pushed him and he fell backwards into the sea with a plop. At first, the second man had been eager to teach Damon a lesson. However, after seeing his companion get tossed into the sea, he was dumbfounded. He hadn't expected this guy to be so skilled at fighting. When Damon approached him step by step, the man hurriedly shrugged his shoulders and tried to act cool. Hey, bro, we were just joking with you. Don't get angry. Hey, look at me. I'm a friendly guy. Have you ever seen such a friendly person? Ah! Before he could finish his words, Damon punched him in the face too. The man was stunned. Then Damon punched him again. The force of the blow was incredibly strong and the pain was blinding. His head was buzzing as if it were going to explode. Please don't hit me again. I beg you. I won't mess with you anymore. The man cried. He knelt on the floor of the boat and begged for mercy. But Damon wasn't going to let him go so easily. The man had been arrogant moments before. Now he was making a show of begging for mercy. Well, it was too late. Damon hit him with another round of punches and kicks. He beat the man until he cried for his mother. Please, I'll never do it again. Please let me go. Damon kicked the poor man into the sea as well, but he was still not satisfied. He got onto the hooligan's boat and tore the engine off. Then he punched a hole in the bottom and smashed their oars. These guys could swim back to shore. 
When the two women saw this, they could not help but smile. However, as they thought about the ugly expression on the two men's faces, they felt very relieved to have Damon with them. Clearly, the men had bad intentions. If Damon hadn't beaten them up, who knew what might have happened? The men might have actually fed him to the fish. As for the two girls, it was obvious that they couldn't defend themselves against those villains. The men would have had their way with them. Fortunately, the crisis was finally resolved. But now, they realized that they didn't know where they were. While trying to escape the two men, they had sped out to sea. The tide was also moving fast, and it carried them further and further from shore. Now there was no land in sight. Damon, Veronica, and Avery had rented a boat and gone for a cruise. Two sleazy men had harassed them, but Damon saved the day. Unfortunately, they were now far out at sea and they couldn't see land anymore. How will we get back? Avery asked. She felt a little frightened. Damon looked up at the sky. He wanted to use the sun to tell the direction, but the weather had changed and the sky was cloudy now. On top of that, the wind had picked up. It felt like a big storm was coming. The situation did not look good. He quickly took out his phone and tried to make a call. Only then did he realize he had no signal. He asked the women to check their phones too, but the answer was the same. What should we do? Avery asked nervously. Her expression was somewhat fearful. Veronica, however, was acting cool, but Damon could see the anxiety in her eyes. After all, the sea was a boundless place, and they were unable to tell which direction to go. In addition, dark clouds were rolling in from the horizon. A storm was on the way. The whole sky was getting darker and darker. If they did not get back to land soon, who knew what might happen? But they didn't know which direction to go, so how would they get there? If they went the wrong way, they would head further out to sea. It was a dangerous situation. The wind is getting stronger, Avery exclaimed. A gust of strong wind suddenly blasted their faces. The small boat seemed exceptionally fragile in the storm. Damon's expression was serious now. Quickly put on the life jackets and hide back here in the cabin with me. What if the waves got bigger and capsized the boat? He didn't want to think about it. Then, a big wave broke over the bow and Avery and Veronica were instantly drenched. Although it was summer, the wind was cold. The two girls were wearing thin clothes and they shivered. It would get colder at night, too. Avery looked helplessly at Damon and asked, What do we do now? At this moment, he was their only hope. They were relying on him to save them. He frowned. We don't have a lot of options. The only thing we can do is wait for this storm to pass. Hopefully it ends soon and we can make our way back to land. He paused and gazed out toward the horizon. If it doesn't, we might have to spend the night on the boat. When the sun comes out tomorrow, we can use it to find the right direction. In the worst case scenario, they would have to spend the night on the sea. Avery and Veronica were a little afraid. However, they had seen Damon save them from the two sleazy guys, so they had faith in him now. He searched the boat for warm clothes, but after searching for a long time, he found nothing. He came back disappointed and said, I'm going to turn the engine off. I want to conserve fuel so we can return to shore when we know which direction to go. The two women nodded. He looked at them and said gently, Don't be afraid. It's just one night. We won't drift far. In any other circumstances, this would be quite romantic. He saw the nervous expressions on their faces and tried to lighten the mood. How about I tell you a few jokes? The two women nodded, but they were not really paying attention. He tried to make them laugh, and they calmed down a little. Meanwhile, the wind was blowing harder and harder, and Veronica and Avery were shivering. I happen to be wearing two layers, Damon said. Here, I will give them both to you. Veronica shook her head. No, you should keep them on. He did not listen, though. He took off his shirt and jacket and passed them to the women. You should change into these dry clothes, he said softly. If you keep those wet clothes on, you will catch a cold. After he finished speaking, he turned around to give them privacy to change. Seeing Damon act like this reminded Veronica of something that had happened back in high school. They were at the graduation party together, and she had slipped and accidentally fallen into the river. Damon had jumped in to save her without a thought for his own safety. It had happened at night, and he had given her his dry clothes that time too. Back then, he had turned around to give her privacy to change, just like he was doing now. As she thought of this, she felt warm. She knew that she could trust him. However, she was worried that if she wore Damon's clothes, he would be cold. In the end, she didn't say anything out loud. She had known him for a long time, so she knew his personality well. If she didn't wear his shirt, he would be unhappy, so she quietly changed. Avery saw her doing this and followed suit. After changing, Veronica softly said, You must be cold, right? He looked into her eyes and laughed off her concern. <laughs> Look at my muscles. How could I be cold? The two women subtly glanced at his bare chest. 
In fact, they hadn't seen him with his shirt off at such a close distance. His body was chiseled. When they saw this, they blushed and shyly lowered their heads, but they continued to picture his muscled torso in their minds. They knew that he was good at playing basketball, so it wasn't surprising that he had a fit body. They hadn't expected him to be this ripped, though. The sky was getting darker and darker, but they could still see clearly his perfect muscles. He had an incredibly sexy body. It was simply jaw-dropping. The women's hearts beat wildly when they saw it. Avery even imagined what it would be like to reach out and touch his muscles. The gunshot wound on his shoulder had faded, leaving only a faint mark. His ability to heal quickly was amazing. This wind is getting stronger. You two should come inside the cabin, he said after a while, huddled together for warmth. The sky gradually darkened and the wind picked up. Damon saw the frightened expressions on the women's faces and tried to comfort them. It's okay, you get some sleep, I'll keep watch. The wind was blowing like crazy now and someone had to stay at the helm to steady the boat. If a wave hit them from the wrong direction, the boat would capsize and they would be finished. Obviously, Damon was the only one among them up to this task. The two women could not withstand the cold and what they were wearing. They weren't strong enough to steer the boat in the storm either. If anything went wrong... It was up to Damon to save them. He had supernatural powers, so the cold did not affect him as much. His body was also extremely strong. When the women heard his soothing words, they felt an inexplicable sense of peace. He was the kind of man who made women feel safe. Since they knew that they had to wait until morning before they could do anything, Avery and Veronica went into the cabin to stay warm. They huddled closely together. Avery could not see her friend's expression at the moment. She heard the sound of the waves crashing against the boat, but she trusted that Damon would protect them. This thought soothed her. She did not feel afraid anymore. She tossed and turned, but she could not fall asleep. Since she couldn't sleep, she secretly watched Damon at the helm. It was dark, but the lights from the console illuminated his face clearly. He looked serious and focused. The boat seemed tiny in the storm, and he struggled to keep it facing into the wind. He was worried that Avery and Veronica wouldn't be able to sleep during the storm. After all, the sea was very rough. However, he was able to maintain control of the boat. Considering the situation, he was actually handling it quite well. Although the waves were strong, he was no ordinary person. Avery watched him with amusement. Was there anything that Damon couldn't do? He was a man of many talents. She wondered if he was cold. He must be, right? After all, he was shirtless in the cold wind. Despite this, his posture was straight and he did not seem to be shivering. Surprisingly, he seemed to be in high spirits. Then, Avery began to wonder if he was lonely. He was alone at the helm, surrounded by a vast sea. The water seemed endless. No one was chatting with him to take his mind off things. How could he not be lonely? Avery thought of the time when they had sat together by the lake at Myerson University. Back then, she had tried to muster up the courage to tell him how she really felt. However, in the end, she didn't have the guts to say it out loud. It seemed so long ago now. Suddenly, a huge wave washed over the side of the boat, nearly tipping them over. Damon immediately stood up and did his best to stabilize the craft. After the danger had passed, he finally sat down. He glanced over at the two girls who were lying next to each other inside the cabin. When they saw that they were safe, he relaxed a little. A few minutes later, he heard movement inside the cabin. Shall I keep you company? A soft voice suddenly asked. He looked over and saw Avery standing up in the darkness. Damon, Avery, and Veronica were lost at sea in a storm. Night had fallen, but Damon stayed awake at the helm to steady the small boat against the crashing waves. The women huddled inside the cabin for warmth, but Avery couldn't sleep. She got up and went to keep Damon company. The smell of her sweet perfume drifted into his nose. In the blink of an eye, she was sitting beside him. Avery did not know if Veronica had fallen asleep or not. In any case, she was wide awake. Even though she had huddled against Veronica for warmth while wearing Damon's dry clothes, she still felt too cold to sleep. She might as well keep him company. He must be lonely at the helm, right? He was surprised to see her. You're not sleepy? She shyly replied, No, I can't sleep. Then she looked at him and asked, are you cold? He could see her eyes gleaming in the darkness and his heart beat faster. He shook his head. No, not really. He wasn't surprised to hear that she couldn't sleep. It was indeed very cold tonight. Are you afraid? He asked. She shook her head and her eyes sparkled. I'm not afraid. This surprised him too. Then you are quite adventurous. In fact, she was not a very courageous person, but she felt safe with Damon. 
As long as he was around, she would feel at ease no matter what happened. However, she did not have the nerve to say these words aloud. Instead, she changed the subject. How are you doing in school lately? How are things going with your girlfriend? When Avery mentioned Fiona, a tender look appeared in Damon's eyes and he smiled. She and I are pretty good. Avery saw the expression on his face and felt a little bitter inside. She knew she was jealous, but she did her best to hide it. Instead, she joked, Since your relationship is so good, why aren't you living together? Fiona already suggested it, he replied with embarrassment. So, we probably will soon. He couldn't believe he was having this conversation with Avery. She smiled sweetly at him. Wow, sounds like you two are getting pretty serious. As she said this, she continued smiling sweetly, but she felt even more bitter. Besides hiding her feelings, what else could she do? She couldn't do anything. Furthermore, she was an actor now. Since joining the entertainment industry, she had learned how to hide her true feelings. She had to deal with a lot of rude people at work. To be successful, she had to mingle in the right circles. It was here that she had learned to laugh things off in order to protect herself. While the two of them were chatting, Veronica woke up. Actually, she had not fallen asleep either. After all, it was very cold. She had been quietly watching Damon and Avery chat. They looked so happy together and she felt left out. She looked at the watch on her wrist and pursed her lips, as if she was thinking hard about something. Then she got up and walked out of the cabin. What are you guys talking about? Avery saw her and she gently asked. You can't sleep either, huh? Veronica nodded her head and looked at Damon for a moment before turning her gaze away. At this moment, he looked up and noticed something. Hey, look at the sky. The two women quickly looked up and saw that the dark clouds were passing. They could see the clear sky above. It was late at night and there was no light pollution. The three friends saw bright stars twinkling above them. It was a wonderful sight. As the dark clouds disappeared, more and more stars appeared. They could see the vast expanse of the Milky Way. They lived in the city, so they had never seen the stars shining so brightly before. Avery's mouth was wide open and she exclaimed, Wow, that's really beautiful. This was also Veronica's first time seeing the night sky so clearly. It was so majestic. She could not help but cover her mouth with her hand. Her heart was pounding in her chest. Although it was cold and the surrounding ocean was pitch black, seeing such a beautiful scene made it all worth it. Quick, take out your phone and take a picture, Damon suggested with a smile. We might not see this ever again. The women quickly took out their phones. Unfortunately, their phones had been soaked by the wave and they wouldn't turn on. Here, use mine. Damon handed Avery his phone and she quickly snapped some photos. Suddenly, a strong wind began blowing again and the waves began to get bigger. You two, hold on to something. Don't fall overboard, he warned. The boat shook violently and Avery and Veronica quickly grabbed on for support. Veronica was still feeling all right about the situation. After she had fallen into the water at the graduation party back in high school, she signed up for swimming lessons. She never wanted to be in the same situation again. She was confident around water now, so she was able to maintain calm. Avery, however, was pale. She did not know how to swim. The waves were very big now, and she was afraid that she might accidentally fall overboard. If she did, they might never recover her body. <gasps> they all cried in surprise. A huge wave washed over the boat, drenching them all from head to toe. Are you all right? Damon asked. The two women nodded their heads, but it was dark and they couldn't see anything. We're fine. We're fine. Avery sputtered. Then, before she could finish speaking, the small boat suddenly bucked again. Another huge wave hit them and the force of it sent them flying. The two women landed in the water. The sky was dark again and the sea was dark too. The wind howled and the waves were enormous. The boat seemed on the verge of capsizing. Hey, where are you? Damon called. He broke out in a cold sweat when he realized that he was alone on the boat. He scanned the darkness and saw that both his friends had fallen into the water. This was a huge shock. The two women were bobbing on the surface. He could just make out their shapes in the darkness. They were tiny specks in the vast ocean. Although Damon had superhuman powers, he still felt extremely anxious at this moment. The two women were about to be swallowed by the sea and he was helpless. He didn't know who he should try to save first. If he were to save Avery first, Veronica would certainly be washed away. If he were to save Veronica, it would be impossible then to find Avery. Additionally, Avery was afraid of the water. She couldn't swim. She was totally helpless out there. Damon didn't know how to choose. He loved them both. If he let either of them die, he would never get over it. Even worse was the fact that they were quickly drifting away from each other. He stood at the bow of the boat and watched for a long time, not daring to make a move. 
Damon, quickly save Avery, Veronica called faintly from afar. I know how to swim. I'll be okay. She could see him hesitating in the bow of the boat, and she knew what he was thinking. She wanted to help him make a choice. As for Avery, she was too afraid to speak. Although she was wearing a life jacket, she was scared to death. Ronnie, be careful, Damon shouted, but he couldn't wait any longer. Avery was drifting further and further away from him. He could see her struggling. She obviously did not know how to swim. If he hesitated any longer, his friend would forever disappear into the vast sea. He picked up the boat's life ring and threw it at Veronica. Then he tried to start the boat, but the engine wouldn't turn over. Left with no other choice, he jumped into the sea and swam in Avery's direction with all his strength. Avery was dizzy, and she did not know where she was. Although she had grown up by the water, she couldn't swim. She was struggling with all her might, but her body felt heavy. She was wearing a life jacket, but she couldn't swim against the current. The waves were still massive, and she kept swallowing mouthfuls of water. Despite this, her mind became unusually clear. She wondered if this was what happened before a person died. The first thing she thought of was Damon. Would he come and save her? He had saved Veronica from drowning before, which meant that he was a good swimmer. However, she and Veronica had both fallen into the sea at the same time. How would he choose who to save? Would he help her or Veronica? She did not know. Furthermore, the ocean was massive and the current was fast. He might not be able to save both of them. Damon had once confessed his love for Avery in front of everyone, but she had rejected him. She wished she could turn back time. If she could, she would have acted differently. She would have agreed to be his girlfriend and they would have fallen in love and gotten married. They would have spent their lives together. But none of this had happened. Everything was over now. Damon, farewell. No matter where you go in life, I hope you don't forget me. Knowing this, I can rest in peace. While she was wallowing in despair, she suddenly felt something around her waist. Someone was pulling her back toward the boat. Then, she saw a dark figure hugging her tightly from behind. He swam with powerful strokes while holding her head well above the water. Avery took a deep breath. At this moment, she could see the line between life and death. There was hope. Grab my body, not my arms. I need to swim. His words echoed in her ears. The sea was boundless and neither of them knew what would happen next. Damon knew he had to preserve his strength and stop from drifting further from the boat. Avery nodded. At this moment, he was all she could think of. She hung on to his every word and put her arms around his waist so he could swim steadily. He was stable in the water and it made her feel safe. Finally, they saw the boat not far away. A figure was standing in the bow. It must be Veronica. The waves rocked the hull, but she was holding on to the railing. With the help of the life ring, she had made it back to the boat and pulled herself on board. Seeing Veronica, Damon heaved a sigh of relief. He swam quickly towards her and she cried out to them. When he reached the side, he grabbed on and boosted Avery aboard first. Then he climbed aboard himself and asked, Ronnie, are you all right? She nodded and smiled sweetly. I'm fine. He could finally relax a little. He turned to see how Avery was doing. She was pale and shivering. I, I swallowed a lot of water, she stammered. She felt like she had drunk the whole ocean. Therefore, Damon did not take any chances. He made her lean over the side and vomit up all the salt water. After emptying her stomach, she seemed very weak. She fell softly into his arms and quietly rested her head on his chest. He felt a little awkward, but then he heard her soft voice. I, I'm a little cold. Can you hug me? In any other situation, Damon would be overjoyed to hear this request. After all, he had dreamed about hugging her for a very long time now. But at this moment, he felt only concern. After all, she had been in the ocean for too long. If they didn't warm her up, she could die. The storm raged and the waves tossed the boat around like it was a toy. A particularly large wave had struck the boat and the two women were thrown into the sea. Luckily, Damon rescued Avery and Veronica was able to swim back on her own. Now they were huddling together, trying to stay warm. Damon hugged Avery tightly and eventually she stopped shivering. He looked down at her and saw a smile on her face. The storm outside was dying down. Avery listened to Damon's heartbeat. At this moment, everything in the world felt right. But soon the smile faded from her face and her mood darkened again. She remembered that the moment wouldn't last. In reality, Damon was not hers to hold. Veronica had told her all about Damon and Fiona's relationship. She had hoped that it wouldn't last. 
but he had just told her that things were going well. He and Fiona were even thinking about moving in together. As Avery thought of this, she hugged him tighter. She had to take advantage of this moment because she knew it wouldn't last. She no longer felt afraid. She wasn't bothered by the darkness. She was completely focused on hugging Damon, and she didn't want this moment to end. Finally, the sky cleared and the storm passed. The sea became calm again. Soon after, the beautiful and profound view of the night sky appeared above them once again. The stars were so bright, they seemed within reach. It's so beautiful, Avery murmured. At this moment, she felt incredibly moved. The person who she loved most in the world was hugging her. He had saved her from certain death. No one spoke, and they all admired the beauty of the universe. They were alone at sea. The real world felt far away. Was there anything more romantic than this? Avery stole a glance at Damon. He was also looking up with fascination at the beautiful sky. Did he feel the same as her? At this moment, she suddenly had an urge to say what she couldn't say before by the lake. She wanted Veronica to be her witness as she told him about all her regrets. She wanted to confess that she was in love with him. If he was willing, she would marry him. But in the end, she did not say these things out loud. After all, he had a girlfriend, and he was in love with her. Avery was so close to him, but in reality, she was still so far away. Damon, have you forgotten the time? Veronica suddenly asked. He was so surprised to hear this that he quickly let go of Avery. He was a little embarrassed because he had been so caught up in the hug that he forgot Veronica was still beside him. This wasn't good. Would Veronica think that he was a pervert? Avery took the opportunity to pull herself away from his embrace. As she did, her heart filled with regret. Even so, she kept a neutral expression on her face. She acted like everything was normal. Thank you, Damon. I was a little cold before, but I'm much better now. You saved me and I'm very grateful. I must stink though, huh? I haven't showered since last night. She was deliberately trying to lighten the mood. She felt guilty about letting herself get swept away by emotions while lying in his arms, and she didn't want them to know how much she had enjoyed it. Damon felt a little embarrassed when he heard this. Avery turned to Veronica and joked, Hey, are you jealous about him hugging me? You can have a turn now if you want. <laughs> I bet Damon would be willing. No, Veronica shook her head. I'll pass, thanks. Damon was feeling awkward, so he changed the subject. You two should get some sleep. Otherwise, you'll be dead tired tomorrow. The women nodded. Suddenly, the boat started to shake. Then they heard splashing sounds all around. Fish were jumping everywhere. There were too many to count, but there must have been thousands of them. They were floating in a massive school of fish. The water was teeming with them. It was a magical sight. None of them had ever seen anything like it before, and they were too shocked to speak. Some of the fish jumped into the boat and flopped about on the floor. Fish often come to the surface to feed after a storm. Damon explained. Seeing them means that the storm has passed. Don't worry, they won't hurt us. He picked the fish that had jumped into the boat and threw them into the sea. The two women sat down to quietly admire this wondrous scene. It was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. After a while, the sea finally became calm again. The two women were having trouble staying awake, so they went to rest in the cabin. About half an hour passed, and Damon was starting to feel bored. Then, Avery anxiously came out of the cabin. She had a panicked look on her face. Come quick, Ronnie is not well. She seems to have a fever. He quickly stood up and went to the cabin. He touched Veronica's forehead and found that her body was really hot. She was also babbling nonsense. Cold, I'm so cold. After falling into the sea, Veronica was just as cold as Avery. However, she hadn't made a big deal about it. She was too embarrassed to ask Damon to warm her up, so she gritted her teeth and suffered silently. She had been fine until she lay down to rest, but now she was weak. Her body couldn't take it anymore, and she developed a fever. What should we do? What should we do? Avery asked frantically. Her mind was in chaos. She didn't know how long it was until morning. Veronica was soaked in sweat. She would definitely freeze to death unless they did something. Damon sighed. Don't worry, I will warm her up. He felt rather embarrassed. He didn't want to take advantage of her, but hugging her was the only way to warm her at the moment. Despite the cold, he had a lot of body heat. Avery nodded. Quickly, hug her! He held Veronica in his arms. His heart was calm, and he kept a clear head. He did not have any bad intentions. He hoped that she would recover quickly and that everything would be okay. Eventually, Veronica's fever broke, and she weakly opened her eyes. When Damon saw that she was awake, he gently explained, You had a fever, so I hugged you to keep you warm. He was worried that she would be angry at him. After all, Damon already had a girlfriend. On top of this, he had been hugging Avery, 
and now he was hugging Veronica. It wouldn't be surprising for her to question his motives. However, she nodded. Thank you for saving me. Veronica was not stupid. She knew that he was trying to help her, so she didn't doubt him. He generated a lot of body heat, so he was able to warm her up. After being hugged by him for a while, Veronica felt somewhat recovered, but she did not try to pull away. Instead, she snuggled closer and snuck glances at him while he wasn't paying attention. As he held her, he felt calm inside. He just wanted her to get better quickly. Suddenly, they heard a splash, and a pod of whales breached happily nearby. They could hear the sound of the whales singing to each other. They couldn't believe their eyes. Veronica smiled when she saw them. Look, whales. Avery saw them too. She sat down by her friends so they could enjoy the beautiful scene together. Quickly, look in the water. Damon had noticed something moving beneath them. Veronica struggled to get up, but her body was weak, so he supported her as she looked over the side of the boat. Avery came over to look too. They saw something glowing far down in the depths. Slowly it became brighter and brighter. Little by little, it was rising to the surface. It looked like floating lanterns. Finally, the glowing lights were just below the surface. Damon finally realized that it was a giant school of glowing jellyfish. It was a miraculous sight. There were too many jellyfish to count, but they lit up the entire sea around the boat. At this moment, stars sparkled above them and jellyfish glowed below them. The world was lit up with these strange but beautiful lights. The three friends wondered if they were dreaming. Most people would never lay eyes on such a wonderful scene in their whole lives. It was magical. Avery sighed with admiration. Such beauty was endlessly fascinating. They had just survived a disaster, and now they were experiencing the wonder of Mother Nature. As if this wasn't enough, something bright streaked across the sky at this moment too. Look, a meteor! Avery exclaimed, pointing to the sky. The others looked and saw a bright trail of light. Ronnie, quick, make a wish. It would be a waste not to. Veronica followed her suggestion and closed her eyes. Then she muttered something to herself, but she didn't tell them what she had wished for. Avery, however, did not make a wish. She just watched the beautiful scene in a daze. No one knew what she was thinking about. Naturally, Damon did not believe in wishing on shooting stars. He simply sat and enjoyed the moment. Everything seemed perfect right now. Finally, Veronica opened her eyes. Ronnie, what did you wish for? Avery asked with a smile. Did you wish to find the man of your dreams as soon as possible? Veronica did not reply, but her face turned red. Her heart beat faster and she hoped that the others couldn't hear it. Avery realized that her friend didn't want to talk about it, so naturally she didn't press the matter. When she next spoke, her tone was neutral. It's so beautiful. This would be the perfect place for my true love to confess his feelings to me. As she spoke, she looked at the sky, her expression filled with longing. Damon's heart skipped a beat. However, when he heard Avery say, my true love, he knew that she wasn't referring to him. Perhaps she was just moved by the beauty. After all, it was a very romantic scene. As he thought about this, he could not help but feel bitter. He remembered how in the past he had confessed his feelings to her, but she had heartlessly rejected him. He wondered who the true love she was referring to was. But he kept his thoughts to himself, and he even teased, are you talking about that Spanish exchange student? Liam told me that that guy already confessed his feelings for you. Did you agree to date him? Avery looked at him and smiled sweetly. Why, do you think I should? Her words were a little ambiguous, so he just smiled awkwardly. After that, she dropped the subject, but a trace of disappointment appeared on her face. The three of them sat quietly together at the bow of the boat. They looked at the stars in the sky above and at the jellyfish in the sea below. It was a truly magical moment. Unknowingly, Veronica fell asleep in Damon's arms. She still had a faint smile on her face. After a while, Avery fell asleep too. Her head gently rested on his shoulder and she was smiling with satisfaction. He liked these women a lot and he had longed for a moment like this with them. He hadn't expected that it would happen under such circumstances though. Lying next to them was warm and comfortable and he wished that he could pause time and linger in this moment. He did not want morning to come. Being here with the two of them made him incredibly happy. Then... He thought of Fiona and felt guilty. Was he betraying her again? Damon, Avery, and Veronica were lying together in the cabin of the boat. Damon put his arm over the two women to keep them warm, but his mind was on Fiona. As he thought of her, he felt somewhat regretful. Good times never lasted, though, and he had to enjoy this moment while he could. 
The waves had died down, so he did not need to keep watch at the helm anymore. Unknowingly, Damon also fell asleep. When he woke up, he saw that the sun was already high in the sky. The day was very bright. He tried to get up, but something was weighing him down. Then he realized that the two women were still lying on his arm. Avery was closest to him, her beautiful legs were resting on top of his. They were both wearing dresses, so he could see the pale skin of their thighs. It was incredibly tempting. Seeing this made his heart pound. Being alone with these two beauties was something he had always dreamed of. At first, he did not want to move and disturb the women's sleep. He wanted to lie here with them for a while longer. They were sleeping very peacefully, and they both had sweet smiles on their faces. It looked like they were having good dreams. Damon put his hand to their foreheads to check their temperatures and found they both seemed normal. Veronica's fever had subsided during the night. Knowing this, he was able to relax. He took advantage of the bright sunlight streaming into the cabin to boldly check out the women beside him. They were natural-born beauties. It was hard to look away. Their skin was fair and their lips were red. Their long eyelashes trembled as they dreamed. He suddenly had the urge to kiss them. As he lay there next to them, his heart began to race. He couldn't get the thought of kissing them out of his mind. He knew it wasn't right, but an evil voice in his head kept saying, What's the harm? It's just a kiss. Besides, they're asleep. They probably won't even notice. Haven't you always wondered what it would be like? Then another voice in his head countered, You can't. Don't violate their trust. It's not right. Don't take advantage of them. It's fine, the other voice argued back. One little kiss won't hurt anyone. The two voices went back and forth like this in his head. He looked at the beautiful women beside him and became more and more tempted. In the end, the good voice won. He decided against kissing them. He hadn't wanted to violate them. He wouldn't touch them. But there was no harm in looking, right? Avery was closer to him, so he tilted his head a little to get a better view of her. She was sound asleep, so he didn't think that she would wake up. Her eyelashes trembled and she had a faint smile on her face. Her beautiful and sparkling red lips were moist and tempting. He watched her chest rise and fall with her breathing. It was wonderful to watch, but he still felt a bit guilty. Firstly, he was watching Avery without her knowing. Secondly, he had a girlfriend back in Meyerson. Fiona was an outstanding girl, and he felt bad about betraying her. But this was probably a once-in-a-lifetime chance, and he was just looking. After this, he would stop thinking about other women. He would have eyes only for Fiona. After coming to this decision, Damon's gaze drifted over to Veronica. That's when he suddenly realized that Veronica was already awake. Her eyes were open and she was staring at him in surprise. Obviously, she had seen him checking out Avery. Knowing that she knew his secret made Damon feel very awkward. Damn it, she had caught him in the act. What should he do now? Even though he was a smart guy, his mind was a mess right now. He wanted to explain himself, but what was there to explain? How could he tell her that he was only looking? That didn't make it right. Forget it. It would be even worse to make excuses. Veronica wouldn't believe him anyway. She had probably already decided that he was a pervert. After all, he had a girlfriend. He was being unfaithful. The only thing he could do now was to play it cool and just pretend that it never happened. Perhaps Veronica didn't actually see anything. At this moment, Avery woke up too. She had a big smile on her face as she stretched and rubbed the sleep from her eyes. Wow, the sun is so beautiful. We are still alive. What a great morning. She seemed totally unaware that Damon had been watching her moments before. Veronica looked at him with a strange expression. She looked embarrassed and seemed like she wanted to ask something. But since Avery was awake now, she didn't. Damon was about to ask her how she felt. But when she saw the look on her face, he decided against it. Avery, however, was totally oblivious. Where are we now, guys? She asked. Where are we going? Damon quickly stood up, went outside, and looked up in the sky. My best guess is that we drifted around 10 miles last night. Fortunately, we did not run aground. We still have lots of fuel. It should be enough to get us back. Oh, that's good, Avery exclaimed. We are counting on you to get us back safely. She gazed at him with her big, beautiful eyes. She had full confidence in him. What happened last night was proof that he was a trustworthy person. After all, he saved their lives. Avery would believe whatever he said. Obviously, he did not want to let the two women down now. They fired up the boat's engine without any difficulty and drove for more than half an hour. Gradually, the horizon came into sight in the distance. 
Then, they saw a lighthouse and some tidy rows of Norwegian buildings. Avery shouted excitedly when she saw these buildings. She knew that they would soon get back to shore. They had survived the storm, and she was happy to be alive. When they finally got back to the pier, the two women cried happy tears. A lot had happened since yesterday, and they would remember it for the rest of their lives. At this moment, they felt incredibly grateful. They had just had a near-death experience. The three friends had also seen many strange and wondrous sights. They had relied on each other to survive. In the future, during quiet moments by themselves, they would remember this unforgettable journey. Damon, can you help me up? Avery asked after the boat was tied up safely at the pier. The dock was a bit higher than the side of the boat, and she needed a hand. He nodded, but he still felt strange about what he had done. Avery could tell that something was not right, but she didn't know what. Damon was not going to say anything, though. However, he could feel her eyes on him. After helping Avery onto the pier, he gave Veronica a hand as well. The owner of the boat was waiting for them. He was frightened when they hadn't come back last night. Now, he was incredibly relieved that the three of them had returned safely. The two women told him about everything that had happened to them. The man was angry when he heard how the thugs had hassled them. At the same time, he also thanked the heavens for their safe return. When he heard about all the wonders they had seen after the storm, he smiled. In Norway, we have a legend about that. When a man and a woman see a school of jellyfish swimming under a starry sky, it means that their destinies are intertwined. The three of you have a special connection now. The legends never lie. When the three friends heard his words, they felt quite awkward. The legend made sense for a couple, but what did it mean for three people? What was the universe trying to tell them? However, it was just a story, though it probably wasn't true. Now that they were back on dry land, they could continue the trip as planned and head back to Berlin. It was already after six o'clock in the evening when they arrived in Berlin, and they could see the lights of the city skyline. It was an extremely moving sight. Avery bid farewell to Damon and Veronica. She had to go and meet up with her film crew. After that, Damon accompanied Veronica back to campus. On their way back to the campus, he thought about what had happened that morning on the boat. He wanted to explain himself, but he wasn't sure where to start. Then, out of the blue, Veronica turned to him and asked, You still like Avery, right? The three friends had just finished traveling around Europe. They flew back to Berlin. Avery said goodbye to the other two at the airport, and Damon accompanied Veronica back to her campus. On the way, Veronica asked him an unexpected question. You still like Avery, right? The whole way back, he had been agonizing over how best to explain his behavior on the boat that morning. He looked at her with embarrassment. Veronica was smiling mysteriously at him. You saw me watching her, right? She nodded and asked, What about Fiona? Do you actually like her? Yes, he answered with certainty. I just... I just... He tried to think of a good excuse, but there wasn't one. He thought about telling her that it was the last time he'd look at another woman that way, but that sounded too shameless to say out loud. He was too embarrassed to say anything. When Veronica saw that he was speechless, she continued to hassle him. Then what do you plan to do? Who do you choose, Fiona or Avery? He sighed. She was asking difficult questions, and he didn't know how to answer them. He smiled bitterly at her. There's no choice, really. Avery's heart probably belongs to someone else. Veronica frowned. What if Avery loved you? In that case, how would you choose? She doesn't love me. It's not possible. Veronica must be joking. In all his wildest fantasies, he had never considered this possibility. After all, she had rejected him before. It was hard to imagine that Avery would turn around and like him after that. Veronica still had an all-knowing expression on her face. Damon was silent. Abandoning Fiona seemed impossible. He loved her, but what about Avery? She was, after all, the first person who he had ever had a crush on. In a certain sense, he considered her his first love. And what about Veronica? In fact, even he had to admit that she occupied a very special place in his heart. If he had to choose between these three women, it would undoubtedly be the biggest decision of his life. He wasn't sure he would find an answer to this question. For the first time ever, Veronica rolled her eyes at him and scoffed. Pervert! After saying this, she turned her head away and ignored him. Damon assumed that Veronica probably wouldn't want to be his friend anymore, but he was wrong. When their cab arrived at the University of Berlin, she turned to him before leaving. What time is your flight tomorrow? Avery and I want to see you off together. He raised his eyebrows in surprise. Really? After hearing this, his mood immediately improved. He was overjoyed that she still considered him a friend. 
Next day, when they came to the airport, Damon hugged them goodbye. My plane leaves soon, so I'll have to go. I'll be waiting for you and Meyerson. Avery nodded and said with a smile, I will be going back soon too. We will see each other around campus. Veronica smiled sweetly. Yes, same. My exchange is about to end, so I'll be back soon too. When Damon heard her words, he was sure that she wasn't mad at him. If she was, why would she act so friendly? As he thought of this, he finally relaxed. Meanwhile, back in Meyerson, Nancy Brokerton was anxiously pacing the floor of her apartment. She was waiting for the results from the blood tests. It had been three days since the university conducted physicals on the students from New York City. Blood samples had been sent to the lab for analysis. During these three days, Nancy couldn't relax. She barely slept or ate. Without a doubt, waiting for the test results was one of the most difficult things she had ever done. It was almost as difficult as losing her son. She had insomnia and had to rely on sleeping pills. She was starting to look a little haggard, which made her husband's heart ache when he saw her. To ensure that no mistakes were made during the testing process, the samples were sent to the best lab in the country to be analyzed. Even so, it would still take several days to get the results back. Nancy and Robert had paid the lab staff to work overtime so they could get an answer as soon as possible. After all, there were over a hundred samples to analyze. It was a rather large project. While they waited, Robert secretly deposited $1,000 into the bank account of each student who had blood taken. Although the students were in the dark about Brokerton's plan, Robert still wanted to compensate them. When the students saw the money mysteriously appear in their bank accounts, they were overjoyed. They wondered why they had received this surprising windfall. The day before the test results were ready, Nancy and Robert returned to California from Meyerson. It was a Sunday, so they went to church. They prayed that they would find their long-lost son. They also prayed for all the other patients who had lost children. After so many years, mother and child might finally be reunited. It was a joyous thought. After church, the Brokertons went back to spend the night at their mansion in Malibu. Nancy wanted to prepare their house for their son's arrival. Then, early the next morning, they took their private jet back to Meyerson. It was after lunch by the time they got off the plane. The results were ready, so the two of them took a limo to the lab. Although Nancy was trying her best to remain calm, Robert could tell she was restless. At this moment, his usually calm and collected wife was trembling all over. He was also nervous, but he lightly patted her back down to calm her down. He was always more patient than her. He was usually able to calm her in difficult situations, but today, nothing he did helped. Nancy gazed at the traffic outside the window and asked with a trembling voice, Robert, so many years have passed. Do you think we can still find our son? He wanted to say yes, but he hesitated. He knew that right now his wife needed encouragement, but he could not bear to say the word. When he didn't respond, the hopeful look on Nancy's face faded. She sighed softly. Actually, I know what you want to say. The chance of finding him is slim. Although she had found her son's key again, it was like Robert had said. The key didn't prove anything. Anyone could have picked it up. Furthermore, they had been searching for him for years. How could they have overlooked a clue? Robert's expression was unusually firm. Don't worry, dear. Perhaps the heavens will take pity on us. Perhaps things will be different this time. She nodded, but she looked even more nervous. After all, she had been waiting for this day for many years. When the motorcade arrived at the lab, Nancy and Robert went to find the manager, Mrs. White. When they got to her office, she was about to make a call. Robert knocked on the door. Mrs. White, we're here. The woman saw them and quickly put down the phone. Mr. and Mrs. Brokerton, you're here. I was just about to call you. As you requested, the lab has been working overtime for the past few days. We had to bring in extra equipment from their locations so we could expedite your tests. We just finished analyzing the DNA. Nancy became extremely nervous when she heard that the results were ready. She clenched her fists and tried her best to remain calm. What did you find? Her voice trembled as she spoke. Was there a match? At this moment, Robert started getting nervous too. He took his wife's hand and they gazed expectantly at Mrs. White, their eyes filled with eager expressions. They were hoping for a miracle. We compared all the samples you sent with your DNA. We even tested them all twice to make sure there were no mistakes. As Mrs. White spoke, she adjusted her glasses on her nose. She paused for a moment, then continued. Unfortunately, among the hundred plus samples, we didn't find a match. I'm sorry. The lab manager had a regretful expression on her face. Although she didn't know who exactly the Brokertons were, she could tell from their motorcade that they were important people. 
Mrs. White had never received such a demand at her lab before. Her staff had worked day and night to deliver the results as quickly as possible. Some important members of government had even personally called to ask Mrs. White to expedite the testing process. They wanted to make the Brokertons happy. And if Mrs. White could deliver positive results, her future would be secure. When she heard this, she was also overjoyed. She knew she had to treat these clients with the utmost care. So she was extremely attentive with their tests. That is why the results were ready so quickly. However, the outcome was regrettable. And Mrs. White couldn't do anything about it. When the Brokertons heard the news, the eager expression on Nancy's face faded. She felt her vision go, and she fainted. She had waited for many days to hear the results, yet there was no match. How could she accept this? No, it was too much to bear. Robert was also extremely disappointed. However, when he saw his wife fall to the ground beside him, he put aside his despair and rushed to help her. He called for help, and Regan, who had been waiting outside, ran in with several bodyguards. When they saw Nancy unconscious on the ground, they were shocked. They rushed her to the nearest hospital. If anything happened to her, no one could bear it. While Nancy was unconscious, her mind was full of nightmares. She dreamt of her young son. His face was bloody and he was crying for her with all his might. After an unknown amount of time, she finally regained consciousness. When she woke up, the first thing she remembered was Mrs. White's words. They had tested samples from all the male students from New York, but none of them matched. This meant that their last clue was a dead end. She had hoped that the key would lead her to her son, but now it seemed unlikely. At this moment, she lost all hope. Her dream of finding her son this time had been in vain. It was too good to be true after all. The dream had shattered, and she was awake. Only endless torment awaited her now. Dear, how are you feeling? Robert asked. He looked anxiously at his wife's haggard expression, and his heart bled for her. No one else could understand the bitterness they felt at this moment. The harsh reality of the situation had shattered their hopes. Now, his wife was sick with grief again, and he didn't know what to do. He helped her sit up in the hospital bed and asked if she needed anything. Nancy shook her head and pulled him closer. She whispered to him, Tell me, do you think our son is dead? Robert was silent. The truth was right in front of them. What else could he say? Tears quietly rolled down his wife's cheeks. Robert, do you think God is playing with us? Why would God give us hope and then heartlessly tear it away? He was speechless. He did not know the answer either. Reality was too cruel. Although they were rich and powerful, they couldn't change their fate. In the end, they couldn't find what they had lost. I dream of him every day, Nancy choked through tears. I dream that we will be together again one day. I dream about cooking him his favorite foods. I hope that one day he will return to our side again and he will see that I haven't forgotten him. Tears streamed from her eyes. She was hysterical. He will see that this home is the same as it was when he left and that his room remained unchanged. It doesn't matter how long I have to wait, 10 years, 20 years, even 50 years or 100 years, he will know that his mother never forgot him. He will know how much I missed him. But now, this dream was completely shattered. As she thought of this, her heart felt like it was being cut out by a knife and she almost fainted again. Nancy, you need to calm yourself. We should have given up our search more than 10 years ago. We know where our son is. We need to pray for him every day and take comfort in the fact that his soul is in heaven. No, Nancy suddenly exclaimed. She shook her head and when she next spoke, her tone was firm. Our son is not dead. I can feel him. He is nearby. Are you sure that Mr. Upperton got blood samples from all the students from New York City? Nancy and Robert had just heard the results from the DNA tests. None of the samples matched. It was a crushing blow, but Nancy still seemed certain that their son was alive. She could feel him nearby. She wanted to know if Mr. Upperton had tested every single male student from New York City. Robert couldn't answer his wife's question. He was sure that Mr. Upperton had done his best to collect the blood samples, but he didn't know if all the students had been tested. Furthermore, the physical examination was not mandatory. They had been secretive about the reason for the exam, so perhaps the students had not all wanted to participate. It was even possible that some of the students were away on the day the exams were conducted. In light of this, he supposed that Nancy might be right. Seeing Robert's hesitation, Nancy grabbed his hand and begged, Please, can you ask Mr. Upperton? Ask him if he missed anyone. If he did, can he get a blood sample now? 
just in case? If he can't, maybe he could just tell us who the person is. I have to be sure. She would not give up until all hope was lost. Robert could not stand to hear his wife begging so pitifully. Even though he knew that it was useless, he still nodded his head vigorously. After all, they had already come so far. It made sense to be certain that they hadn't overlooked anyone. Therefore, in front of his wife, he took out his phone and called Mr. Upperton again. First, he told him about the test results. Then, he implored his old friend to tell him if any students from New York had missed being tested. After all, Nancy and Robert had counted a total of 96 students from New York City, but in the end, there were only 85 blood samples. This meant that 11 people had not been tested. Mr. Upperton was straightforward with them. It was true that 11 students had not given samples. The physicals were not mandatory, and due to various reasons, these 11 students weren't present on that day. After hearing this, Robert requested, Old friend, please do me one last favor. Give me these 11 students' information, and then help me get blood samples from them. That afternoon, Mr. Upperton sent the remaining 11 students' information to the Brockerton building. Then, he urged these students to go to the campus clinic for physical examinations that afternoon. After this was complete, he called the Brokertons to update them. I was able to collect blood samples from 10 of the 11 students in question. The 11 student recently took a leave of absence from the school, so I was unable to get a sample from him. I have sent you the other 10 students' information. I sincerely hope that you find what you were looking for. After receiving Mr. Upperton's blessing, Nancy and Robert once again waited for the results. It was agonizing, but this was their last hope. After all their pain and suffering, the answer was still the same as before. No match. Mrs. White had carefully analyzed the samples of the remaining 10 students, but none of them had Robert and Nancy's DNA. When the Brokertons heard this news, words couldn't express the disappointment in their hearts. They returned to California that day, and Nancy locked herself in the nursery. She told her husband that she needed time alone. Robert was concerned, so he cautiously knocked on the door and entered. He saw her sitting on the bed, holding a framed photo. It was the last picture they had taken together before their son disappeared. She was caressing it over and over again. The picture was wet from her tears. Dear, won't you eat something? You need to take care of yourself despite what happened. Robert's forehead was creased with worry. When they lost their son, Robert wished for death. He was a strong person, but if anything were to happen to Nancy now, he would be completely defeated. She heard his voice and looked up at him. She knew that he was hurting too. Robert, thank you, but I am not hungry. Actually, she was starving, but compared to her mental anguish, physical pain was nothing. Robert saw that she was inconsolable, so he said, There's not much hope, but we still have one last student to test. Why don't I call James and ask him to send us that student's information? Nancy's delicate body trembled, and she finally put down the photo that she was holding. She gazed into the distance. No, Robert, what's the point? I think you and I both know in our hearts that we won't find our son now. We tested more than a hundred samples, but we never found a match. Do you really believe that this last person could be him? He was silent. She was right. Nancy was thinking rationally. Her words also indicated that she had completely given up hope. He knew he should feel relieved, but he couldn't stand to see her like this. In an attempt to rekindle her hope, he suggested... Why don't I call James later and ask him to send us the information anyways? You are probably right, and it's probably pointless, but what's the harm in being sure? There's no need. Don't bother him anymore, she replied softly. By now, she had completely given up hope. She did not want to go through the pain of disappointment yet again. It was better to know when to call it quits, right? Now she needed to mourn her loss. Robert nodded quietly when he heard this. He decided not to call Mr. Upperton, and he didn't expect that his old friend would call him instead. He and James had known each other for years, so even though their search was unsuccessful, James still wanted to check in. He was concerned about Robert and Nancy. His call warmed the Brokerton's hearts. Robertson first thanked him for his concern and then told him that there was still no match. Mr. Upperton was silent when he heard this. In fact, he had been expecting an outcome. If they hadn't found a match among a hundred people, what were the odds of finding one among these ten? However, he still comforted his friend. Robert, that's life. You need to accept the reality of the situation. Although Mr. Upperton didn't explicitly say it, Robert already knew what he was referring to. Therefore, he murmured in agreement. The president hesitated for a moment and then went on. 
there is still one more student from New York whose blood has yet to be tested. Do you want me to look into it? Robert sighed. Thank you for your kindness, but I don't think it's necessary. Since his wife had already said there was no need, he didn't see a point in pursuing the matter. It was unnecessary. Everyone already knew the answer. Finding a match now was impossible. The Brokertons had already accepted the fact that their son was gone for good. They had accepted this ten years ago, but then Nancy found the key. They had abandoned their reason and hoped against hope that he was still out there somewhere. Nancy's nephew, Silas, hurriedly arranged for the kitchen staff to make a healthy meal for his aunt. Sidney, Silas's fiance, personally helped prepare it. During dinner, Silas was quite concerned about his aunt's condition. Nancy's face was still stained with tears. Silas also heard that she had fainted recently. However, Robert explained that she had just caught a cold and was fine. He did not mention anything about the search for their son. Robert and Nancy treated Silas as their own child, but after being together for many years, they also knew his personality well. Among the family, he was perhaps the only one who would not want their son to return. After all, if they found their son, Silas would no longer be the heir to their fortune. Although their search had been fruitless, if their nephew knew that they had done this behind his back, who knew what he might do? Although he might not come out and say anything, it was possible that he would quietly turn on them. After dinner, Silas went back to his work. Robert, on the other hand, tried to cheer himself up. The mayor of Myerson had invited him to a party tonight. Before he left, he asked Sidney to stay with his wife. But when Sidney came to find her, Nancy told her that she wanted to be alone. After dinner, Nancy went to the park next to the Brokerton building. She wanted to walk by herself. Her mind was filled with thoughts, and she had a worried expression on her face. When she returned home, it was already after 8 o'clock in the evening. She walked in the door. She saw Sidney waiting for her in the living room. Her future niece-in-law quickly stood up and greeted her. Auntie, I'm glad you're back. Just now, a staff member from Myerson University dropped off some information. He said that Mr. Upperton sent it. Sydney handed her an envelope. Nancy looked at the envelope and then put it down on the table, unopened. She knew, just from looking at it, that this was the information about the last remaining student from New York. It was in the same kind of envelope as the other files that she had received. Even though her husband had turned down Mr. Upperton's offer, the man still had followed through and sent the information. He was a good person to the end. However, Nancy was not interested in seeing the contents of the envelope. She remembered how she was disappointed last time, and she didn't think she could go through it again. She couldn't bring herself to look. No, she needed to move on. She could not let herself fall apart again. Sydney watched as Nancy put the unopened envelope inside a drawer. She was a little surprised, but she didn't ask any questions. After a week, Nancy was finally starting to feel better. She began to attend events with her husband again. Robert even took her to a nearby tourist spot so they could spend some time together. He wanted her to relax. During this time, he also took her to some auctions and charity dinners. He was trying to take her mind off their son. On top of this, he encouraged her to spend more time with friends. In the past, she had often spent time with the wives of many important people in the city government. Apart from cultivating useful connections, spending more time with these women might cheer her up. Therefore, during her free time on Saturday afternoon, Nancy invited friends over for a gathering. Many of them were high-ranking dignitaries in the local government. They drank afternoon tea together in the gardens downstairs. The afternoon activity quickly ended, and Nancy's mood was much better after. She even felt like personally cooking dinner for Robert and Silas. After she finished cooking, she put the dinner in the oven to keep warm and waited for the most important me in her life to come home. Being alone in the living room was somewhat boring, so she called Sydney and asked if she had time to chat. However, Sydney was out with a friend. Nancy didn't force the issue. She told her future niece-in-law to have fun and not worry. Then, she hung up the phone. After that, she turned on the TV and watched some interesting programs to pass the time. But she still felt bored. At this moment, she suddenly remembered the envelope that Mr. Epperton had sent. It had arrived more than a week ago now, but it was lying in the drawer forgotten until now. She was bored, so why not just open it and see who the last student was? What was the harm in that? She knew that it couldn't be her son. That was impossible. But she was still curious. It was the last remaining student. Perhaps opening the envelope was a part of the mourning process. But after thinking about it for a moment, another voice spoke inside her head. Don't open it, it warned. If she opened it, she would see that it was not her son, and her last remaining hope would be destroyed. Grief might overcome her once again. Again, 
Nancy was waiting for Robert and Silas to come home for dinner. She felt bored, so she toyed with the idea of opening the envelope that Mr. Upperton had sent. Inside was the information about the only student from New York who hadn't given a blood sample. She thought about it, but she felt torn. She didn't know whether to open it or not. She went back and forth about what to do. Finally, she got up off the couch. Her curiosity won out, so she went to the drawer to look for the information. Unfortunately, when she opened the drawer, the envelope was nowhere to be found. She searched and searched, but came up empty-handed. Only then did she remember that Sydney had watched her put it in the drawer. So she picked up the phone and called her nephew's fiancé again to ask if she had seen it. Sydney had assumed that Nancy would eventually want to open the envelope, so she moved it to a shelf in the living room next to the sofa. She told Nancy to check and see if it was there. Hence, Nancy looked on the shelf and found the envelope unopened. She held it and looked it over for a moment. Then, she slowly tore it open and pulled out the documents from inside. Although it was only a photocopy of the original file, it was still quite clear. It even included a color photo of the student in question. However, she accidentally dropped the page with the photo. She was not in a hurry to look at his picture, so she left it on the floor for the moment. She carefully read over the student's information. This student came from a rather poor neighborhood in New York City. Nancy remembered going here once before during the search for her son. It was in a bad part of town, so she hadn't stayed long, and she had not investigated the area in full. However, it was not far from the location where she and her son had been separated. According to the information, this student was now 21 years old, and he was a sophomore in Meyerson University. His name was Damon Walker. That was interesting. She fell deep into thought after reading his name. There was a year's difference in age between this young man and her son, so it was unlikely that they were the same person. With this thought, her last bit of hope finally shattered. An indescribable sorrow surged inside her and her mood darkened. She put down the documents and went to the balcony. Looking at the lights of the city made her feel a little better. Then, she sat back down on the sofa and picked up the documents again. Although this young man was not the right age to be her son, she still wanted to keep his information. She intended to get in touch with him anyways and offer to pay his tuition. Although she couldn't help her son, she could help him. As she thought of this, she remembered the photo that had fallen on the floor and went to pick it up. She looked at it and saw a familiar face staring back at her. She was stunned. Was this the same young man who had beaten up Silas? It was the same person who she kept running into all over the city. Until now, she hadn't known his name or where he was from. She hadn't expected the file in the last envelope to belong to him. Anger coursed through her. So this defiant young man was actually a poor kid from a bad part of New York City, huh? Well, she wasn't going to sponsor this troublemaker. She wouldn't spend a penny on a guy like him. She went to put Damon's photo back in the envelope, but suddenly, something came over her. Out of nowhere, she got a feeling that his appearance seemed somewhat familiar. In fact, she had had the same feeling when she saw him at the golf course. At that time, she had wanted to put him in his place, but the same inexplicable feeling stopped her. Her heart had softened and she let him go. As she looked at the photo now, she had the same feeling. She had to admit that there was something familiar about him. As for what, she couldn't quite put her finger on it. There was something about him though, and the more she looked, the stronger the feeling became. It was as if she had seen him somewhere before. Finally, she figured it out. She knew why he looked so familiar. The young man in the picture looked like Robert when he was young. When this thought flashed in her mind, she felt as if she had been struck by lightning. She held the photo in a daze. Then, she recalled her husband's appearance when they first met. It had been a long time and the memory wasn't clear. However, she still remembered his youthful appearance. It was precisely what had first attracted her to him. She had fallen in love with his boyish good looks, and they had gone through many trials and tribulations together before finally getting married. Damon looked so similar to Robert at that age. If there was any difference, it might be that Damon lacked the arrogance that her husband had had when he was young. This might be due to Damon's upbringing. However, in many ways, he was even more attractive than Robert had been. His eyes were especially dreamy. Even though it was only a picture, they still seemed alive and full of vigor. As she thought about this, tears silently flowed from her eyes once again. She suddenly felt that this young man who had repeatedly opposed her was actually her long-lost son. Was it possible? However, at the same time, she worried that fate was playing another trick on her. Perhaps she was just mad with grief. 
Perhaps she was seeing connections that weren't really there because she missed her son too much. Was she just imagining the similarities? Besides, this young man was one year younger than her son. It didn't make sense. Nancy reread Damon's file. She read about his parents and discovered that they were both unemployed. Then she realized something. Her son hadn't any ID on him when he went missing. Whoever found him would have no way to know how old he actually was. It was entirely possible that they had given him a new age to go with his new identity. As she thought of this, she nervously looked at the photo again. All her hopes were now pinned on this young man. After all these years, she might finally find her baby. But what if she didn't? Could she handle the disappointment if things didn't work out again? At nine o'clock in the evening, Robert came home. His keen eyes noticed that his wife had been crying again, and he could not help being concerned. Dear, what's wrong? She shook her head. Don't worry, I'm fine. I was just thinking about our son, so I felt a little sad. It's okay, though. I feel better now. That's good. He held his wife in his arms to comfort her. Nancy thought quietly for a while. Then she turned and looked at him straight in the eye. Robert, honey, do you know any private investigators? Off the top of my head, I don't, he replied. But if you need to hire one, it shouldn't be difficult. The Brokertons could easily afford to hire a team of the best private investigators in the country. They had done this in the past to help look for their son, but it was a long time ago now, and they hadn't kept in contact. I want you to hire someone to help me investigate some people, she explained. I need to dig up information on their backgrounds. It should be pretty straightforward. I'm not looking for anything out of the ordinary, just the basic things. The sooner she could find an answer about Damon, the better. Her husband laughed. <laughs> what are you up to now, dear? Anyways, if you just want to look up some simple information, we don't need to hire a private investigator. Why don't you look online? He paused to stroke her hair. If you don't find what you need, I'll make some phone calls tomorrow, okay? Can we please meet with an investigator tomorrow? She begged. Even though she might be able to find the information on her own, she preferred to deal with a professional. Besides, it might take some time for whoever they hired to find all the answers she needed. Robert saw she was anxious and could not help asking, What's going on? What are you worried about? She hadn't told him about her new discovery yet, and she intended to keep it a secret for the time being. I want to investigate first. If my suspicions are confirmed, I will tell you everything. She did not tell him about the photo because she didn't want him to be disappointed again if it turned out to be another dead end. She knew that the probability of this lead panning out wasn't high. She had seen how much pain he had suffered after their last failure, and she wanted to spare him. She would rather bear the pain for both of them. Since Nancy did not want to tell him yet, Robert didn't force the matter. He believed in his wife, and he trusted her. He knew that she would tell him when she was ready, so he just nodded. Then... The two of them went to bed. Nancy finally opened the envelope from Mr. Epperton, and what she found inside shocked her. She recognized Damon from the picture on his file. The more she looked at his face, the more similarities she saw between him and her husband at that age. Could he possibly be her long-lost son? She decided to keep her suspicions to herself until she could be sure. That night, she slept quite soundly. She hadn't let herself get carried away this time. She knew that the probability of her hunch being correct was not high. Although Damon looked very similar to a younger version of Robert, perhaps it was just her subconscious playing tricks on her. The next day, she woke up early. It was 8.30 in the morning when she finished her breakfast. Then, she called for her driver and her motorcade headed straight to the office of a private investigation firm. Her husband had contacted the firm first thing that morning, so they were expecting her. The private investigator who would be handling her case was named Wayne Sparks. When his boss told him that Nancy Brokerton was on the way, he rushed into the office to meet her. Nancy told Detective Sparks what she knew about Damon. She hoped that the detective could find some basic background information about him. The detective had access to all sorts of information databases, so it didn't take him long to find what she wanted. In less than an hour, he was able to tell her the basics about Damon. She already knew a lot of the information from reading his student file, but Detective Sparks was able to tell her about his family background as well. This was what she was really after. The detective told her that Damon was adopted. She couldn't believe it. He was adopted. This young man called Damon, who looked like a younger version of Robert, was adopted. At this moment, Nancy's chest felt tight. It was hard to breathe. Until this moment, she had been sure that her mind was playing tricks on her. She looked at the detective in disbelief. 
she could not help but ask him to repeat himself. Detective Sparks, did you just say that this student was adopted? Did I hear you right? The detective nodded. That's what it says here, so it must be right. When she heard this, she began to cry. She did not know how many tears she had shed lately, but at this moment, it all seemed worth it. A faint voice inside her head was telling her that this time, it was probably true. As the saying went, when God closed a door, he opened a window. The heavens must have heard her prayers after all these years. Right when she had given up all hope and was at the brink of despair, something had finally happened. She couldn't explain it. Nancy knew that she still had to be cautious, but her mind was running wild. Damon was around at the same age that her son would be, and he looked like Robert when he was young. Also, he was adopted. Even if these facts were not solid proof that Damon was her long-lost son, it was worth following up on. When Nancy returned home, she told Robert her thoughts. His chest tightened as he listened. He went into his study and found a picture of himself when he was young. Then, he and his wife compared it with the photo of Damon from the student file. The more they looked, the more similarities they noticed. They also looked for traces of Nancy's features in Damon, but they couldn't find any. As she gazed at the two photos, tears quietly rolled down her cheeks. Robert gently patted his wife's shoulder. Don't cry. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. There are other clues, aren't there? Oh, yes, she nodded. There was indeed another clue. This clue was more substantial. The thought of it excited her. However, she was afraid of being disappointed again. She had been disappointed too many times already. She gently raised her head and spoke through tears. Have you forgotten? I had a conflict with him before. Naturally, her husband had recognized him. He knew that Damon was once Will's partner at KC Games. Nancy disliked him because of what had happened with Silas. She could see the irony of the situation. It seemed too bizarre to be real. She never imagined that a young man who she hated so much might actually turn out to be her son. Could it be true? It was also difficult for Robert to come to terms with the situation. He felt uncomfortable. Robert, tell me, if he really is our son, what will we do? Will we still make things difficult for him? Nancy was starting to worry. She knew that Silas had a vendetta against KC Games. He had basically crushed the company. After that, KC Games had to partner with Silly Goose to stay afloat. She had even heard that later on, Damon was forcibly bought out of his company by the higher-ups. This was all the Brokerton Group's fault. Robert was speechless. He also felt a little conflicted. But then again, they knew that they were overthinking things. Even though new evidence had come to light, they still couldn't be sure that he was really their son. After all, what were the odds? It was a terrifying thought. I remember now, Nancy suddenly exclaimed. Her eyes lit up and she continued, I remember, I really remember. It could really be him, our long lost baby. It's true, I really think it's him. That's right, it must be. She became so excited that she was incoherent. Robert was moved to hear his wife speak so confidently. How can you be so sure? She nodded with excitement. She felt like she had died and gone to heaven. She slowly explained, I remember something now. He was here in the building and he got into a fight with Silas. After that, I said a few words to him. When he looked at me, I saw the hatred in his eyes. He called me a vicious woman. She grabbed Robert's arm tightly. He knew what I did. How else could he have known? At the time, Damon's word hit a soft spot in her. When she heard them, she was dumbstruck, but she could not refute. In the end, she waved him away and he left. However, at that time, she couldn't figure out what he had meant. She racked her brain and still came up with nothing. What had Damon meant by that? But now that she thought about it again, it seemed obvious. He must remember everything. That must be why he was so resentful towards her. It made sense. Otherwise, why would he hate her so much? It was a pity that he hadn't told her before. Now that she thought about it, though, if she had said something before, she probably wouldn't have believed him. Fate had brought the two of them together, but she had needed time to understand the facts. Because of this, the likelihood of a successful reunion had greatly improved. Robert's heart began to pound when he heard his wife's words. Since Damon was adopted, he might really be their son. The evidence was piling up now, and what Damon had said to Nancy during the meeting with KC Games seemed to corroborate it. It proved that he remembered everything. It was just that he hated them to the bone, so he hadn't told them what he knew. If he didn't know their secret, why would he say such a thing? How would he know those things about Nancy? When the nightmarish earthquake happened in New York City, Robert had grabbed his wife and escaped at the last moment. 
they had done a shameless thing. They abandoned their son. Of course, the most important piece of evidence was the key that Regan had picked up. The bodyguard had found it on the ground after the fight with Damon. Now that he thought about it, it was very likely that Damon had accidentally lost the key during the fight, right? Yes, that must be it. That's right, Robert excitedly asked. Dear, can you remember exactly what he said to you? Think back to what happened. What did he say? Fortunately, Nancy's memory was very good, and she remembered exactly what Damon had said to her that day. He asked me what sort of a person abandons her son. He asked what sort of a person doesn't care about her own flesh and blood. Really? Yes, I'm sure that's what he said. She held her husband's hand tightly. Robert had never felt so happy before. Tears of joy streamed down his face. He hugged his wife and cried. When Nancy could finally speak again, she exclaimed, I really can't wait. I have never been so excited before. How about it, dear? We don't need to wait for the results of the blood test. Tomorrow, we will go to Meyerson University together, all right? She paused to wipe her tears. We will find him, and I will ask him face to face. I will ask him how long he has known that I'm his mother. I want to tell him how much I've missed him, how much I've suffered, how many tears I've shed. However, as these words came out of her mouth, Robert shook his head. No, they couldn't act rashly. First of all, despite the evidence, they were still just guessing. They didn't know for sure whether or not Damon was really their child. They couldn't jump to conclusions. And if this young man knew that he was their son, why hadn't he said anything about it? They didn't want to spook him now. What if he disappeared or refused to recognize them as his biological parents? Moreover, they had a serious conflict with him in the past. Approaching him in such a manner now would not be right. All in all, Robert felt that it was a bad idea to confront Damon in person right now. However, the husband and wife quickly came up with a plan. The first thing to do was to get a blood sample and do a DNA test. This was the easiest way to make certain. After they did the DNA test, it would be clear at a glance whether their suspicions were founded. After that, they had to send people to New York City to investigate. It would be best to get in touch with his adoptive parents. Yes, this was the best way to proceed. The thing that they had long hoped for was finally within their grasp. This was a gift from the heavens. After many years, God had answered their prayer. As Nancy thought about this, she hugged Robert and cried tears of joy. They did not sleep well that night. They were so close now. Their son was waiting for them. The next morning, Robert called Mr. Upperton again and told him about their discovery. They needed his help getting a blood sample from Damon. The president gladly agreed to do it. After that, Nancy sent the private investigator to New York City to investigate Damon's family. She wanted him to talk to the Walker family's neighbors and see what information turned up. After doing this, the couple should have sat quietly at home to wait for news, but Nancy couldn't sit still. This time, the evidence was solid. She didn't want to wait any longer, so she suggested, Robert, can you come with me to Meyerson University? I want to see him, even if it's just from afar. I can't handle not seeing him. I can't calm down. She was a mother who had finally found her long-lost son. After more than 10 years, she had suddenly discovered that her child was alive and well. No mother would be able to relax under such circumstances. She couldn't get him off her mind. Robert understood, but he still had concerns. Aren't you afraid that he will see us spying on him? Yes, I'm afraid, she nodded. Her expression was anxious. But I really want to see him. I, I won't disturb him. I'll just, just watch from afar, all right? He won't know I'm there. Nancy and Robert were certain that Damon was their long-lost son. Nancy wanted to rush to Meyerson University and talk to him face to face, but Robert advised caution. They needed to proceed with care. Despite this, his wife couldn't restrain herself. She had to see her son, even if only from afar. Robert couldn't stand to fear his wife pleading with him. Furthermore, he was also quite eager to sneak a peek at this young man. The evidence proved that Damon was most likely their long-lost son. Losing him was the greatest sorrow of their lives. No matter how successful the Brokertons were, they couldn't forget the loss of their only child. But now they had found him. He had been safe and sound all these long years. Robert sighed helplessly and agreed to his wife's request. Okay, fine. However, we might have to keep our distance. We can't let him see us. Otherwise, we run the risk of losing him again. However, being able to only watch him from afar sounded like torture. It was truly too terrible. Despite this, Nancy hurriedly nodded her head. Okay, I promise. 
He won't know I'm there. After that, the two of them called for a car and went to the university as fast as they could. This time, they didn't take the whole motorcade along. They went in one car with one bodyguard. They didn't want to cause a scene. Along the way, Nancy gazed out the window. The drive was short, only half an hour long, but to her it seemed to take a century. When the car finally drove onto campus, her heart began pounding from excitement. She knew that she would see her son soon, and she felt incredibly impatient. She already knew where his dorm was. She had read this information in his student file. She also knew his class schedule. He lived in room 502 of building 12. Robert told the bodyguard not to follow them. His presence would only draw attention. Then he and his wife walked past Damon's dorm building. It just so happened that there was a grove of trees across the street, so they decided to hide there and watch for him. They anxiously waited for him to appear. This kind of waiting was torture. The minutes seemed to crawl by. Nancy craned her neck to try to catch a glimpse of him. Every time that anyone appeared, she stared at them, afraid that she would miss something. More than half an hour passed, but Damon still didn't show his face. Nancy could not keep her cool. Dear, why hasn't our son come out yet? Maybe he went out the back door? Why don't we go up to his dorm and take a look? Robert knew his wife had already made her mind up about Damon. She was convinced he was her son. He patted her shoulder. Don't worry, let's not rush things. He has class soon, so I'm sure he will come out any minute now. Nancy nodded and tried to be patient. Damon was already in class, though. Actually, he didn't have a morning class today, but Fiona did, so he went with her to keep her company. He was feeling a little bored and had nothing better to do. Since coming back from Europe, he felt a lot more relaxed. He didn't have to worry about the financing for Everbright anymore. He missed his girlfriend, so he took a book and went to class with her that morning. After it was over, the two of them went to the cafeteria to eat together. She ordered a single bowl of soup for them to share. Damon was about to order another, but she stopped him. She looked at him and rolled her eyes. Then she said somewhat angrily, I want us to share. <laughs> Why do you want your own? As she finished speaking, she realized that she was being demanding. She saw the stunned gazes of the surrounding students and she hurriedly lowered her head in embarrassment. Even though she was being unreasonable, she secretly blamed Damon for making her look bad. After eating, they held hands and went back to the dorms together. On the way, she asked, Cupcake, have you resigned from the radio station yet? He had promised her that he would resign this semester, but he still hadn't done it. He explained with some difficulty. Beefy, I promised Veronica that I would stay on for a while. But before he could finish speaking, Fiona suddenly became angry. No, you need to resign right now. I'm begging you, okay? I don't want you and Veronica spending time together. She sounded like she was about to cry. Fiona had always been a confident person, but when it came to Veronica, she could not remain calm. She knew that she was beautiful, but Veronica was a knockout. Most women felt intimidated by Veronica's looks, regardless of how attractive they were themselves. Furthermore, she knew that Damon had a special place in his heart for his co-host, which made Fiona even more nervous. Okay, 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 I will. Seeing that his girlfriend had such strong feelings about the situation made him feel somewhat guilty. He wondered if he had been thoughtless. After all, her worry was not unreasonable. He did have fantasies about Veronica. When Fiona heard him agree to her request, she finally stopped crying and smiled. She hugged him and murmured, Cupcake, don't blame me for being overbearing. I'm just afraid of losing you. He couldn't help but stroke her soft hair. He loved seeing her tender side. They arrived in front of his dorm. Nancy, who was hiding in the woods, spotted them right away. She couldn't take her eyes off Damon. He was her baby, her long-lost baby. Her baby had finally appeared. Tears formed at the corners of her eyes. She tried to hold herself together. This was her first time seeing him since discovering his true identity. How could she not be excited? He was so near. However, from where she was standing, she could only see the side of his face. She pulled on her husband's sleeve. Robert, look, he's here. As she looked at Damon's profile, she felt that he looked even more like Robert. Robert nodded and watched in a daze. Nancy gazed at her son for a long time. Then she looked at the woman who was with him. She saw Fiona's young and beautiful face and exclaimed softly, She must be my son's girlfriend, right? Oh, she is really beautiful. Oh, they make such a great couple. She watched Fiona and Damon kiss. It was very sweet. When children grew up, they needed to find partners. As long as they were happy together, Nancy did not object. She knew she had to win this woman over as well. She wanted to get to know her son's girlfriend. Robert nodded. He was thinking about how much his son had changed. He still thought of him as a baby, but now this fellow actually had a girlfriend. I want to take a closer look, Nancy suddenly begged. He frowned. He was worried that if Damon saw them, he would dislike them even more. 
After all, in his mind, they were still enemies. I just want a glance, she pleaded. The look of grief in her eyes was intensifying. Robert smiled bitterly to himself. He should have known that she wouldn't be able to restrain herself. Watching from afar was easier said than done. However, before he could say anything, his wife had already started walking toward Damon. It was too late for him to stop her, even if he wanted to. Excuse me, is your name Damon? Just as Damon and Fiona were about to say goodbye to each other, Nancy interrupted them. She was afraid that he would get angry, so she was a little nervous. Her demeanor was completely different from the last time they met. Then, she had been strong, calm, and proud. It's you, what do you want? When Damon saw her suddenly appear, his expression instantly became ugly. Naturally, he did not know what she was thinking. He assumed that she was here to cause trouble for him. However, seeing the nervous expression on her face at this moment confused him. Fiona sensed that something in her boyfriend's tone was not right, so she hugged him tightly and glared at Nancy. An enemy of Damon's was an enemy of hers as well. I, 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 Nancy stammered. She was a little embarrassed. She wanted to ask him if he was her son, but in the end, she couldn't bring herself to do it. Therefore, she didn't know what to say. She could only look at him helplessly. Her expression was serious and intense. It was as if she was taking a mental picture of him. Fiona could not stand to see another woman looking at her boyfriend like this. This was the same way that she herself often looked at him. Who was this woman? Why was she looking at Damon like that? Fiona was confused and upset. Why are you looking at my cupcake like that? Is there something wrong with you? She snapped. As she spoke, she wrapped her arms around Damon's neck as if to declare that he belonged to her. She glared at Nancy. It was like she thought that this woman would snatch him away. Nancy guessed what was on Fiona's mind. She could hear the jealousy in her voice, so she quickly smiled and asked, You're Damon's girlfriend, right? You are really beautiful. Clearly, she was trying to flatter her. Nancy was not stupid. She knew that if she wanted to gain her son's favor, she had to win over his girlfriend, too. Fiona kept her guard up. What exactly do you want? She felt that something about the situation was not right. However, this woman was much older than Damon. Plus, she seemed to be acting friendly. What exactly did this woman want from them? Damon looked coldly at Nancy, too. She was acting very different from before. Yes, what is it? Are you here to cause trouble again? He asked suspiciously. If you are scheming against me, just come out and say it. Don't beat around the bush. Nancy saw that her son was on edge and she felt as if a knife was piercing her heart. She wished she could tell him everything right now. She wanted so much to hold her son in her arms and tell him that she was his biological mother. She had searched for him for so many years. It was maddening. But in the end, she just shook her head. She knew that she had to wait. Everything was still hypothetical. She stammered. No, no, it's nothing. I just, just... Just what? She just wanted to see him, that was all. However, she couldn't say this aloud. If she did, he would probably think she was plotting something. He might even think that she was a lunatic. You have some nerve, he spat. Leave me alone. Indeed, he had a bad impression of her. Fiona did not like Nancy, so she tugged her boyfriend's arm and led him away. Nancy wanted to follow him and say a few more words, but she was afraid that this would make him dislike her even more. She stood there in a daze and watched them leave. Tears were streaming down her face. Robert, who had been watching from afar, saw his wife returning with tears in her eyes. He sighed to himself. After Nancy was beside him again, he could not help but comfort her. Dear, don't be sad. If he is really our son, he will know we came with good intentions. He looks just like you. The similarities are uncanny, Nancy muttered to herself. She had made careful note of Damon's profile. He looked not only like her husband, but also like her. She had seen it for herself. When she approached him, she felt something. Was it the feeling of the bond between mother and son? She wasn't sure, but there had been some sort of connection. Robert tried to calm her down. Regardless, we should wait for the results of the DNA test. It's the only way to be 100% certain. She nodded and finally relaxed a little. Then, they left Meyerson University. As Nancy sat in the car on the drive home, she began crying again. Robert, do you think he has a hard life? His adoptive parents are unemployed. After we were separated, he must have gone through countless hardships. She was used to living a high-end lifestyle, and she couldn't imagine what life was like for ordinary people. She knew people like that didn't have the same resources available to them. How difficult would it be for a poor child to get into Meyerson University? Although in theory, everyone in America was equal. In reality, it was hard to rise above one's social class. 
It was difficult for poor people to become successful. No matter how smart a person was, one still needed connections and resources. Nancy could not imagine how much effort it must have taken a person like Damon to get into Meyerson. Yes, I think it must have been hard for him, Robert replied. Nancy thought about how she would make it up to her son after they were reunited. Meanwhile, Damon and Fiona were still hiding around a corner of the building. Fiona looked at her boyfriend seriously and asked, Cupcake, who was that woman just now? How do you know her? Her and I had a confrontation before. As for who she is, I don't know. Then he went on to explain what had happened after Jillian was hit by the car. However, he was careful to avoid using Jillian's name. He didn't want Fiona to get jealous for no reason. But his girlfriend was smart. She didn't believe him. Really? She questioned. You aren't lying to me? After seeing him nod seriously, she finally accepted his story. Okay, fine. I believe you. But Cupcake, I don't like you talking to women like that. Despite Nancy's age, and despite the fact that she had been so friendly, the situation made Fiona uneasy. She didn't like the way that woman had looked at her boyfriend. Fiona cared a lot about Damon, so she wanted to nip any potential threats in the bud. Naturally, he agreed unconditionally. Hearing this, she smiled with satisfaction. Cupcake, I hope you don't mind me being like this. I just, I really care about you. Damon could not help but caress her beautiful face. He knew that she deeply cared for him. He looked at her perfect red lips, and then he leaned in and kissed her. Afterwards, they said goodbye and went their separate ways. Damon and Fiona had just had a strange encounter with Nancy. Fiona didn't know who the woman was, but she didn't like how she looked at her boyfriend. Damon hadn't been happy to see Nancy either. What did she want? After parting ways with his girlfriend, he returned to his dorm and saw that Quinn was working hard at his computer. He was learning programming for his new job at Everbright. Seeing that Damon had returned, Quinn quickly put down his mouse. Hey, you're back. Theo just gave me a message for you. He said that you're supposed to go to the clinic for a checkup when you have time. Don't forget. Why do I need a checkup? Damon asked. During the past two days, he had noticed people talking about this in the student group chat. For some reason, only the students from New York City were being asked to take physicals. After the checkups, $1,000 mysteriously showed up in the bank accounts of these students. Everyone who hadn't been asked to undergo a physical was extremely envious. $1,000 was a lot of money for many people. However, Damon could smell something fishy about the whole situation. Although he couldn't explain why, he had a feeling that something weird was going on. Then, he suddenly remembered how Nancy had come to find him earlier. He thought about the strange look she had in her eyes, and it made him feel uneasy. So, he rolled his eyes and turned back to his friend. Quinn, I want to ask you something. Nancy was overjoyed when she heard the news that Damon's blood sample was on the way to the lab. No matter how she looked at it, she was sure that this time she would get the answer she wanted. Her only son, whom she had missed day and night for more than ten years, might finally be coming home. He had already grown up, but she didn't care. They could still make up for all the lost time. She was incredibly excited by the possibility. To ensure the accuracy of the DNA test this time, Nancy and Robert went to the clinic to have a new blood sample drawn. They sent these fresh samples to the lab so they could be sure that there was no contamination. Then, they had to wait for the results to come back. During this time, Nancy busied herself again. She stopped participating in her charity events and spent all her time in the kitchen. She was trying out new recipes. She even hired a chef to give her some private lessons. She tried to recall what her son's favorite foods had been when he was young. She remembered that he had been fond of her homemade chicken soup. However, because her husband did not really like it, she hadn't made it in a long time. She had forgotten how to make it. But that didn't matter. She still had time to relearn the recipe. She even changed her hairstyle back to how she used to wear it when her son was young. She didn't want him to find her unfamiliar. This way, he would have an easier time accepting her. In her free time, she researched top universities all over the world. Her son had lived among ordinary people for so long. She wanted to make up for lost time at any cost. After he finished his undergrad at Meyerson, she could send him to do his master's abroad. Would it be better to send him to Oxford or to Cambridge? Ah... <sighs> In the end, she would let him decide. She was not worried about his grades at all. Any student who could get into Meyerson University must be smart and capable. He shouldn't have any problem being accepted at a school like Oxford. Money was not an issue. She wanted what was best for him at any cost. Without a doubt, the Brokertons could help Damon rise to his full potential. 
Furthermore, they knew countless alumni from all the top universities. Getting accepted would not be a problem for their son. Nancy wanted to make her son proud to have a parent like her. She had to help him become the best he could be. Only then would she feel at ease. She had to prove herself worthy of him. Robert saw his wife keeping busy, and he noticed that her face had a healthy glow again. Seeing this made him happy. However, he was a little worried that Nancy would forget about him once she was a mother again. He was also worried about what would happen if the test results didn't match, so he reminded her not to jump to conclusions. Dear, although I understand why you are doing all of this, you need to be realistic. I know you are already convinced that this student is our long-lost son, but we still haven't received the test results back. Please remember that this is not a sure thing. You have to be mentally prepared for any outcome. He didn't want her to get too carried away before they knew for certain. He repeated this warning many times. He was worried that the more she got her hopes up, the greater her disappointment would be if the DNA didn't match. He wasn't sure that she could withstand such a huge blow. No matter what, he didn't want to see her let down again. This time, when Robert reminded her, Nancy was looking up a new recipe. She wanted to get good at making a few more dishes, no matter how many chefs worked for them, she knew that a mother's cooking was always the most delicious. Her body stiffened when she heard his words. Then she sighed and put down the recipe she was holding. Robert, I know, but I just want to do what a mother should do. I have to be prepared. What if he really is our son? That's right. She had to be prepared. She wanted her child to know how much she had missed him. She wanted him to feel his mother's love. Robert nodded. When he spoke, his tone was gentle. All right. Well... In any case, the results will be ready tomorrow afternoon. We will know the answer then. His wife nodded. That night, the couple lay in bed. They both tossed and turned, but they were unable to fall asleep. After all, they had been painstakingly searching for their son for many years. Now they finally had news about him, and the situation seemed hopeful this time. Even someone as rational as Robert could see that. He was filled with anticipation. After midnight, the two of them finally fell asleep. By the time they woke up, it was already late in the morning. They didn't eat until lunchtime. An entrepreneur wanted to meet with Robert that morning, but Robert turned him down. He wanted to go with his wife to hear the results of the DNA test. He was anxious to know if the sample was a match. When they arrived at the lab, they saw many people in the waiting room. It was busy there this morning. Nancy started feeling nervous as soon as she stepped through the door. After all, she had been disappointed many times before, and she was afraid that it would happen again this time. She could not help but tug the corner of her husband's sleeve and ask, Honey, do you think that we will get a match today? Yes, I'm sure we will. He was trying to comfort both himself and his wife at the same time. She nodded, and a charming smile appeared on her face. The two of them went to the manager's office to ask if the results were ready. However, when they got there, an assistant told them that the manager, Mrs. White, wasn't there at the moment. Nancy explained why they were here. Then, she asked if the assistant could call Mrs. White and ask when she would be back. The man nodded and took out his phone. Soon, he got in touch with his manager. She would be back in half an hour. The Brokerton's chests felt tight when they heard this. In half an hour, they would know the result and the truth would be revealed. They were both filled with anticipation and fear. They both hoped that the time would pass quickly and the test results would be a match. After all these years, had they finally found their beloved son? The situation was undoubtedly tense. At the same time, they dreaded hearing the test result, and they wished that time would slow down. What if the result wasn't what they hoped for, and they were thrown into a pit of despair yet again? If there was no match this time, their last bit of hope would disappear. Half an hour passed. During this time, Nancy looked out the window every time she heard the sound of a car pulling up, each time she was disappointed. Finally, she saw a Volkswagen park outside. Immediately after, Mrs. White got out with a stack of documents. Her expression was calm, and no one could tell what she was thinking. The Brokertons stood up to greet her when she entered. Nancy spoke first. Mrs. White, is the test finished? Do you have the results? It's finished, but I haven't had the time to take a look yet. Let me grab a drink, and then I'll get it for you. As she spoke, the lab manager walked across the office, picked up her water bottle, and drank a few mouthfuls. She had guessed that the Brokertons would be waiting for her to return, so she hurried back. After drinking some water, she asked Nancy and Robert to sit down. Then, she took out the information and started to read. As the couple watched Mrs. White flip through the pages, their chests felt tight. 
They stared at the manager's face, trying to determine what she was thinking at the moment. Mrs. White frowned, and Nancy's heart sank. An ominous feeling grew inside her. <sighs> the manager looked at Brockertons with fear. The results show that the sample is not a match. There is no blood relation. I'm so sorry. How is that possible? Robert exclaimed, jumping out of his seat. He couldn't hide his disappointment. His sudden outburst shocked Mrs. White. After realizing that he was acting crazy, he calmed himself down a little. His tone was quieter when he next spoke. Could there be a mistake? There are lots of similarities between us and the person in question. How is this possible? Tears streamed down Nancy's face. She kept nodding and begging. That's right. Please help us redo the tests. There must be a mistake somewhere. It's not possible. How could this be? Yes, there must be a mistake, right? Mrs. White couldn't bear seeing the two of them so disappointed. However, there was nothing she could do. She shook her head. The results are accurate. I know how important this is to you, so I handled the whole process personally. Unless you brought us the wrong blood sample, the person in question isn't related to you. Her tone was confident. Mrs. White's words were like a death sentence for the Brokerton's dreams. Nancy was dumbstruck. She just kept repeating, How can this be? How can this be? Robert looked at his wife's sad expression, and he felt as if his heart had been cut by a knife. In fact, he was also extremely disappointed but he knew he had to hold himself together for her sake. Dear, let's go. Nancy walked out of the lab in a daze. She didn't even remember the drive back home. The moment that she heard the final result, her soul shattered into a million pieces. She felt the kind of despair that made people want to die. All her hope was gone. After all, this was the biggest disappointment yet. Robert's footsteps were heavy. He felt as if he had suddenly aged 10 years. His wife sobbed silently the entire drive back. He felt extremely distracted, and he even forgot to comfort her. When they finally returned home, they were relieved to discover that Silas was not around. Robert tried to pull himself together. He hugged his wife and comforted her. Dear, everything is settled now. Don't be sad anymore. She shook her head. No, but why did it turn out like this? Do you know how high my hopes were this time? I was so sure that we found him. But why? Why did it have to end like this? Robert didn't have an answer. He didn't know. He wished that he did. He was an all-powerful business tycoon who never had a problem that he couldn't solve. However, he was powerless when it came to this matter. No! Nancy cried with grief. I felt a connection with him. I know that he's my baby. I know that our destinies are intertwined. Why didn't the DNA test prove it? Something must have gone wrong. She shook her head. She still felt a spark of hope inside. This time, she trusted her intuition and believed in the bond between mother and son. She looked at Robert with hopeful eyes and asked with a trembling voice, Do you think something happened that caused our test to fail? He frowned. Are you suggesting that the young man did something to mess up the results? Nancy bit her lip. Although I have no evidence, I have a feeling he did. She knew that Damon was suspicious of her. On top of that, he was highly intelligent. If her hunch was correct, it could explain why the test results weren't a match. Damon knew that she was his mother, but he was angry with her for abandoning him. He hated her, so it wouldn't be surprising if he wanted to hide from her. Perhaps he guessed that something strange was going on when he heard that the school wanted blood samples from the students from New York. Perhaps he had even heard that these students all received a mysterious payout as well. People generally didn't give out large sums of money for no reason. The situation was quite unusual. And then, there was Nancy's sudden visit to consider as well. If Damon was paying attention, the answer would be obvious. Furthermore, Nancy knew that he did not want anything to do with her. He probably suspected that she was playing a trick on him. In light of all this, it was likely that the blood sample in question wasn't Damon's at all. Now that she thought about it, this seemed completely possible. The Brokertons received the results from the final DNA test. Damon's sample didn't match. At first, Nancy was overcome with grief. She was convinced that it was a mistake, and the more she thought about this, the more sense it made. Perhaps Damon had sent someone else to the physical in his stead. If he had done this, it would further prove that he was their son. In this case, 
He must know that they were looking for him. Robert sighed. He had to admit that his wife had a point. All right, in that case, I'll ask someone to look into it, okay? By now, he felt that there was not much hope. Prolonging the inevitable was like torture, but he also trusted his wife. She had worked so hard to get to this point. They couldn't give up until all their leads were completely exhausted. Nancy looked at him and nodded silently. The next morning, Robert called Mr. Upperton, the president of Meyerson University. He was hoping to get the surveillance footage of the street outside the clinic from the day in question. Naturally, the president had no objections. Robert had originally planned to spend the day with his wife, but she declined his offer. In addition, he had some pressing matters to attend to in the capital, so he decided to let her do as she pleased. After he left for the airport, Nancy drove to the university. She had to find an answer to this last question, no matter what. When she arrived on campus, she went to find Mr. Upperton. He warmly welcomed her and asked if she wanted him to accompany her to the security office. The security office was where all the campus's surveillance footage was stored. She thanked him, but declined his offer. She wanted to go alone. Mr. Upperton then called and told campus security to expect her. Then, Nancy went on her way. Her bodyguard, Regan, accompanied her. When they arrived at the security office, they found it to be quite busy. At this moment, many students were waiting to pay parking tickets or check the lost and found. Nancy went straight to the counter and asked to talk to the person in charge. The head of security was waiting for her, and he brought her back to the back room to view the surveillance footage. Although there was no footage of the clinic's entrance, there was one camera with a good view of the street out front. The head of security started playing the footage, but the resolution wasn't very clear. Then, he fast-forwarded to around the correct time. Nancy watched intently, and before long, she saw a guy dressed in black walking toward the clinic. After a while, he left the same way he had come. They watched for a while longer but no other students came to the clinic. Nancy asked the man to rewind the footage and pause so she could see the student's face. Then, she stared at the screen, trying to determine if the grainy person in the image was actually Damon. He looked a bit similar. She turned to the guard and asked, If you had to guess, how tall would you say this student is? The security guard was used to making such estimates based on surveillance footage, so he answered with confidence, I'd say about 5'2", or 5'3". He's definitely under 5'5". Five five. Nancy stared at him and asked, Are you sure? She was an intimidating lady, and the guard felt a little nervous when she looked at him like that. But he still nodded. He was certain. Yes, ma'am, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. She began to cry. However, this time she wasn't crying tears of sadness. No, she was crying tears of joy. She couldn't remain calm. At this moment, everything was falling into place, and she knew the truth. Even if it hadn't yet been confirmed, she was already certain. Damon, the guy who had hated her so much, the guy who gritted his teeth when he saw her, the guy who she herself also despised, was her son. Otherwise, why would he have had the key? Why would he have said that she abandoned her own flesh and blood? Why would he hate her so much? And why would he send someone else to the physical in his place? Damon was almost six feet tall, and he had good posture. The person in the surveillance footage was under 5'5". The only explanation was that he had figured out what was going on and sent someone else in his place. <sighs> she had put so much effort into all of this, she wouldn't give up now. After all, she was a person with perseverance and determination, and she knew that she would be rewarded for it. She remembered how she had taken Silas's side against Damon. She had even allowed her nephew to use the Brokerton Group to attack KC Games. She had stood by while Silas drove him out of his own company. How sad and desperate he must have felt after that. No wonder he hated them. He had grown up in such a poor family, and through his own efforts, he managed to get into Meyerson University and start a business. However, because of them, he ended up with nothing. She had hurt him again and again. How could she forgive herself? Baby, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. She was torn. On one hand, she felt awful for what she'd done to him. On the other hand, she felt overjoyed that she'd finally found him. After years of darkness, she was finally seeing the light of day. The only thing left to do was to bring him back to her side. At this moment, Regan's phone rang. He answered it and then handed it to Nancy. She put the phone to her ear and heard a man's voice on the other line. It was Detective Sparks, the private investigator who she had sent to New York City. She had hired him to investigate the Walker family. She wanted more information about Damon's adoption. 
She had also given him the key that Regan had found, and she wanted the detective to ask Damon's parents about it. After all, Damon had lived with them for most of his life. They would know if the key belonged to him. Detective Sparks had the answers to her questions. They know the key, he said. They said that Damon's had it since he was young. Nancy was so excited that she could barely speak. Did they ask how you got it? Did they ask anything else? She urged. No, I was afraid they would be suspicious, so I returned the key to them and left. All right, thank you. Keep digging, she instructed and hung up the phone. Now she knows the truth. It was as if a huge weight had been lifted from her. She was wild with joy. She also felt relieved. She didn't want to cry in front of strangers, but she couldn't help it. The head of security watched her with concern. He did not understand why this elegant woman had suddenly started to cry. Naturally, he did not know what she was going through at this moment. He couldn't understand the feelings of a mother who had just found her long-lost child. Regan saw that his boss was losing her composure, so he quickly took out a tissue and gave it to her. Nancy took the tissue and wiped her tears. Then, she immediately called Robert, who was working in the Capitol. Honey, what are you doing? I have to tell you something. I am in a meeting right now. What is it? He could tell that something had happened. She took a deep breath to calm herself. Robert, are you ready to hear what I discovered? Let me tell you. Tell me what? His chest felt tight. He knew that she was about to tell him something big. I am completely sure that we found our son. He's not dead. He's just been hiding from us all this time. Damon is our son. Robert's hand trembled when he heard this. The other people in the meeting saw, and one of them asked with concern, Mr. Brokerton, what is it? Sorry, he whispered to them. It's my wife. This is important. He smiled at his associates and tried his best to calm himself. He turned his attention back to Nancy, and she continued, I saw the surveillance footage from outside the clinic. He never went to the exam, and he sent someone else in his place. He knows what we're up to, and he's been hiding from us all this time. Furthermore, his adoptive parents confirmed that the key belongs to him. He's had it ever since he was young. Everything confirmed her suspicions. Did she need anything else? No, the truth was clear. Damon was the one who they had searched for for more than a decade. He was the child who they had longed for in their dreams. Now they needed to think about how to explain things to him face to face. How would they overcome the resentment that he harbored toward them for so many years? He had accused them of not caring about him. He was convinced of their poor character and didn't consider them worthy of being parents. Nancy and Robert blamed themselves for leaving their son behind that day. Now they finally had to face the problem head on. Robert silently hung up the phone. At this moment, his mind was in turmoil and his eyes were slightly moist. He turned to his associates. Sorry, I have an urgent matter to attend to today. The news was too shocking. He felt emotional and his voice trembled when he spoke. The other people in the meeting wondered what kind of matter could shake Mr. Brockerton like this. The man closest to him stood up and said, if you have something you need to do, then go ahead and do it. We can reschedule. Although he didn't know what exactly was going on, he knew it must be important. He had never seen Robert shaken like this before. Nancy was still in the security office. She put away her phone and looked out the window. At this moment, she felt the sun was especially bright. She had so much to look forward to now. Her heart pounded. She wondered if she should go to Damon's dorm to find him. Even if she just watched him from afar, she would be satisfied. She wouldn't stay long. Just long enough to catch one glimpse. But in the end, she did not need to go looking for him, because he showed up at the security office. Today, Quinn had lost his wallet, so he came to ask campus security if anyone found it. He was worried, so Damon came along with him for moral support. Nancy had just walked out of the back room into the lobby of the building. Her eyes were red from crying, and she was lost in thought. She and Damon saw each other at the same time. When she saw him, her body trembled and tears flowed slowly down her cheeks. Damon frowned. He wondered why he kept running into this woman all over the place lately. What did it mean? Before either of them could speak, the head of security came out of the back room too and saw Quint. He pointed at him and exclaimed, Ma'am, that's the guy from the video. He's the one we saw going to the clinic, I'm certain. The man was used to identifying people from grainy surveillance footage, so there was no reason not to believe him. When Nancy heard this, she cried even harder. She looked at Damon like a mother looking at her child, which made him feel very awkward. Even though Damon looked calm, he still felt a little scared. He turned and quickly went with Quinn to check the lost and found. He didn't expect Nancy to follow him, but she did. She even stood right in front of him and carefully examined his face. She knew that she was being rude, but she didn't care. This was her son, and she was worried about him. She hadn't had a chance to get a good look at him yet. 
After so many years, how had he changed? Was he still as naughty as before? Did he still like to play with toys? Oh, he was already an adult, so of course he didn't. He had grown into a handsome young man. He was about six feet tall, and he had a girlfriend who loved him. He was neither fat nor thin, and his body was muscular. Clearly, he had the self-discipline to work out. Yes, he must be very disciplined. Otherwise, how could he have gotten into Meyerson University? Subconsciously, she felt a wave of pride. Her son was so outstanding. Why are you staring at me? Is there a problem? Damon finally asked. He didn't know what she would do if he continued to ignore her. Only then did Nancy react. She realized that she was being too forward, so she quickly looked away and gently asked, Are... are you alright? Do you need money? You can tell me. I can help you. He was confused. Are you on drugs? The two of them were enemies. Why was she being so nice? Has she gone crazy? Nancy's jaw clenched when she heard this. She felt like her heart was being cut out by a knife. How she wished she could tell him that she knew he was her son. Oh, she knew he was just pretending not to recognize her. She wanted to hug him and ask him if he had everything he needed. Was he eating enough? Was he happy? She would do whatever she could to help him. She wanted to tell him that he didn't have to hide from her anymore and that she already knew everything. No matter where he hid, she would find him. These thoughts raced through her mind, but in the end, she did not say them out loud. Reason overcame emotion. Due to the tense relationship between them, she worried that if she acted rashly, he would reject her. She couldn't stand to be mocked or ridiculed by him. She was even more worried that if she angered him, he would hide and never let her see him again. What should she do? By chance, Nancy ran into Damon in the lobby of the campus security office. She now knew for certain that he was her son. She wanted to tell him, but she was afraid that he would reject her. Big news like this had to be delivered the right way, so she forced herself to remain silent. She had to smooth over this awkward situation and then go back and have a long discussion with Robert. They needed to wait for the right moment to have this conversation with their son. Although it was difficult to endure, she knew that she had to wait. As she thought of this, the hopeful look in her eyes dimmed. She looked at Damon and gently said, Then, take care of yourself. Mom, I, I mean, I will leave first. She had almost spilled the beans. She already considered herself to be his mom. Then, she forced herself to walk away. As she left, she kept turning her head to look back. She was reluctant to leave him. After leaving the building, she looked back at him through the window for a moment. Then, she finally left. Late that evening... Robert returned home. He canceled the rest of his meetings in the capital and flew home as soon as he heard his wife's news. Nothing was more important than finding his son. He felt incredibly anxious. When Nancy saw him walk through the door, she ran over and hugged him tightly. Tears appeared in the corners of his eyes, however, he was more reserved than his wife when it came to expressing emotion. After many years of painstaking searches, it had finally happened. They found their son. Nancy couldn't contain herself. She was overcome with emotion and she cried until she had no tears left. They had waited for this day for countless years and finally it had arrived. They still didn't have a DNA match to confirm their suspicions, but this was no longer important. The existing evidence combined with Damon's actions proved it. Furthermore, they were certain that under the circumstances he wouldn't agree to give a blood sample. The fact that he had sent someone else to give a sample in his stead indicated that he guessed their motive. He was hiding from them on purpose. No, getting his DNA was no longer important. The important thing was that they had found him. Now that they were certain, nothing else mattered. They were so excited that they had cried happy tears. It was a long time before they calmed back down and began thinking clearly. What they needed to plan next was how to break the news to Damon. How would they help him come to terms with all of this? The two of them hugged each other tightly for a while. Eventually, Robert patted his wife's shoulder and said, All right, don't cry. Today is a joyous occasion, isn't it? Why are you still crying? Nancy felt her husband's comforting touch and was finally able to calm herself a little. They sat down together and then Robert asked, Tell me, how did you find out that that brat of ours sent someone else to give the blood sample? Although it was obvious what had happened, he was curious to know how his wife had found proof. After all, their son had hidden from them for more than ten years now. How had she won this battle of wits and courage? Damon had probably thought that if the blood sample didn't match Brokerton's DNA, Nancy would definitely give up on the idea. But he had underestimated his mother's love for him. He had underestimated her determination to find her long-lost son. 
To find him, she had suffered countless hardships and shed countless tears. She wouldn't give up just because of one little trick. A mother's love for her child was boundless, and Nancy was a persistent person. Once she made up her mind about something, nothing could stop her. Robert, tell me, how will we break this news to him? She had already confronted him earlier that day, but it hadn't gone well. She wanted her son to come home as soon as possible. For this to happen, they had to talk to him face to face and ask why he had hidden from them all these years. Didn't he know that they'd been searching for him? Nancy wanted to ask how he'd been all these years. Was he happy? Had his parents kept him warm and well-fed? Oh, he must have suffered endless hardships living with that poor family. When he came back to his true home, Nancy had to make it up to him. Then he would know that his real parents had never stopped loving him. But how could they ever make up for the trauma they had caused him to suffer? How could they make up for all the years they had lost? Robert didn't know how to answer his wife's question. He thought for a while before replying, Let's not jump to conclusions. First, we'll investigate whether his adoptive parents were good to him. His adoptive parents are very good to him, Nancy replied. They treat him as their own son. She had heard back from Detective Sparks again that afternoon. He had questioned the Walker's neighbors. They had been model parents. Before losing their jobs, they had worked hard every day. The Walkers loved both of their children and raised them right. Otherwise, Damon wouldn't be the good student that he was today. He had even gotten into Meyerson University. His adoptive parents were very supportive. In light of this, it was no wonder that Damon had never thought of looking for his biological parents. His last memory of Robert and Nancy was of them abandoning him to save themselves. After that, he received all the parental love that he needed from the Walkers. However, there was something that the Walkers could not give him. Money. Damon didn't seem to care much about money, though. When Robert heard this, he felt at ease. Then we should really be thanking them. We should thank them for all their efforts over the years. Words were not enough to express their gratitude. He wanted to give them money as well. But how much? Was one million enough or ten million? No, they deserved at least one hundred million. In reality, no amount of money could express how grateful the Brokertons were to Damon's adoptive parents. They had brought him up right. The walkers had stopped him from ending up on the streets. Nancy nodded. As for how much to give the walkers, she didn't care. Even if they wanted a mountain of gold and silver, she would happily give it to them. Nothing was more important than finding their son. She was more concerned about the matter at hand. How are we going to tell our son, though? She couldn't wait any longer. She wanted to go back to Myerson University right now and tell him everything. I'll go look for him tomorrow, Robert replied. But I will choose my words carefully. I don't want to make him dislike me. He couldn't wait any longer either. His wife nodded. She was willing to do anything to get their son to come home. The next morning, she dressed up. She wanted to look her best when she met her son again. She also carefully combed her husband's hair for him. This way, their son would see how much his real parents cared about what he thought of them. When Robert saw his wife being so serious, he joked that she hadn't even been this excited on their wedding day. Then, the two of them drove to campus. This time, to show Damon how important he was, Nancy even organized a motorcade of a dozen luxury cars to accompany them. Those cars were all filled with tough-looking bodyguards. Although the Brokertons were not fearful people, the world had taught them to play it safe. Also, Nancy wanted their son to see that they had a lot to offer. Her heart yearned for him to come back to them. They had been waiting for him for so long. As long as he agreed, they were willing to do anything. He could say anything to them and they wouldn't hold it against him. The motorcade arrived at Myerson University in a grandiose manner. The students who saw these cars stared in awe. The cars were all Mercedes Benzes. Additionally, many of the onlookers realized that these models were all customized. You couldn't buy them at the dealership. Whoever owned them must be outrageously wealthy. Ordinary people couldn't even imagine how much these cars must have cost. Even more shocking was the fact that the windows of these luxury cars were all made of bulletproof glass. When the more knowledgeable onlookers realized this, they couldn't help but suck in breaths of cold air. They wondered who was in these cars. Even the president of the university didn't arrive on campus in such an imposing manner. The motorcade drove to the dorms, but after circling the parking lot a few times, the drivers realized that there were not enough parking spaces to accommodate so many cars. Helpless, they had no choice but to park a little further away. The Brokertons would have to walk back to Damon's dorm. However, Nancy was worried that if they brought all their bodyguards, they would scare the students. So she told their guards to wait nearby and not to get too close to the dorms. 
When the Brokertons arrived outside the Wright building, they came across a group of students smoking. These young people were leaning against luxury cars parked by the curb. More people stood nearby, as if they were waiting for something. Drew, Veronica's ex, was among the group. Amber, the president of the Association of Young Entrepreneurs, was there too. Chris stood nearby, as well as an assortment of random people who led different clubs and associations on campus. In short, they were all Damon's enemies. These were some of the people who Damon fought against during the big campus brawl. The crowd was getting bigger and bigger. Apparently, there were even some police on the way. They were all here to make trouble for Damon. Hans, the guy who Damon humiliated in Berlin, had a lot of friends at Meyerson University. News of what had happened back in Germany finally reached this friend circle, and now they were out for blood. Coincidentally, Drew and Hans were quite close, so when Drew heard about what had happened, he offered to help. He had wanted to teach Damon a lesson for a long time. Hans didn't tell him about Damon's true identity as the founder of Everbright. After all, he didn't want them to be scared of the guy. In short, he would do whatever it took to get revenge for being humiliated, even if that meant lying to his friend. The memory of Damon chasing and beating him was still fresh in Drew's mind. Since the fight, life had been difficult for him. He was afraid that Damon would come for revenge, so he stayed in hiding. Every time he left his apartment, he was paranoid that someone would see him and rat him out. He was eager to return to his old life, so when he heard from Hans, he offered to help right away. Now he had a new excuse to rally people against Damon. Hans had also dug up some dirt on their enemy, and he used it to get the police on his side. This was why the officers were on their way to campus now. It was certain to be a great show. Actually, Drew already knew about Damon's history with the law, so he didn't need Hans to tell him about it. Back in first year, Damon had collaborated with another student and started an illegal software development workshop. The other student had been expelled from university over it. The case was closed, and Damon wasn't charged. However, now Hans had found some people who were willing to testify about Damon's involvement. They had proof that he was likely the mastermind behind the whole business. With Hans's urging, Drew was easily convinced. He was happy for a chance to finally get revenge. Regardless of whether Damon had really been involved in illegal activities or not, they could get him arrested and thrown in jail. As long as there was enough evidence, Damon would be powerless to help himself, even if he was innocent. Not so clever now, are you? Drew murmured under his breath. Well, see if you can still beat me up after you go to jail. You will have to plead guilty, and then you'll be expelled from school and imprisoned. Nancy and Robert were arriving at the dorm just as this was all taking place. From afar, they saw Damon walking out the door. At the same time, a police car pulled up out front and two policemen got out. One of them was Officer Chandler, the policeman who had given Damon so much trouble in the past. He had tried to trick Damon before, but an older officer intervened and stopped him. Another time, after the big brawl on campus, Officer Chandler had quarreled with Damon and his friends. He hated this kid to the core. As such, the officer was excited that new evidence had come to light against this student. He walked over to Damon and announced that he was going to arrest him. Then he read him his rights. Drew and the others were all smirking. They wanted to see their enemy humiliated in front of everyone. He wouldn't dare to raise his head again after this. Damon did not fight the officer. After all, the police were the law and resisting was pointless. He was confused, and he didn't know why the police wanted to take him away. He could see Drew and the others leaning against their cars watching. A few pretty girls snickered at him. They all wanted him to look bad. Those who Damon had hurt in the past watched the scene with playful expressions. They remembered how he had chased them off campus before. Now, they were finally getting revenge. He wouldn't get away this time. Officer, may I ask why you were arresting me? Damon asked in a polite tone. However, when he saw Drew and his group of friends, he knew that they were up to something. Officer Chandler looked him over from head to toe. Someone is pressing charges against you for assault. Also, we have new evidence against you for your past crimes. You need to come with us. Now Damon understood. Hans was trying to get revenge. Luckily, he knew his rights. Please show me the evidence. If there is no evidence, you can't arrest me. The Brokertons arrived on campus looking for Damon. They got to his dorm building just in time to see the police confronting him. A large group of people were standing around watching. Damon wasn't going willingly, and he demanded to know what evidence the police had against him. Officer Chandler's expression instantly became ugly. He knew that the assault had happened in Berlin. It was out of his jurisdiction, so he couldn't really arrest Damon for it. 
It had just been a pretext to get this kid down to the station. He hadn't expected him to resist and call him out like this. The officer flew into a rage. The evidence is at the station. You will see it when we get there. As for the matter concerning your past crimes, you must come to the station for questioning. He had no more patience for Damon, and he reached out to grab him. Damon dodged. Officer, I will cooperate with the investigation, but you have no grounds to arrest me. You don't even have a warrant. If you do, then please show me, and I will come with you willingly. Officer Chandler was furious. It was true that he didn't have a warrant. He hadn't expected this kid to be so defiant. He stomped his foot, and the veins in his temple pulsed with anger. Do I need a warrant to take you in? Are you coming or not? If you don't come willingly, I'll handcuff you right now. However, Damon did not budge, even after hearing this. Instead, he dropped down into a defensive stance. Without an arrest warrant, you can't touch me. The policeman laughed loudly. Oh, you think you're pretty awesome, don't you? What, do you dare to touch me? Try attacking the police, see what happens then. At this moment, Drew waved his hand, and the group of people around him stepped forward and gradually surrounded Damon. They all remembered how Damon and his friends had beaten them up last time. That time, they had been punished for starting the fight. But this time, the police were on their side. Who would dare to touch them now? Damon saw Drew and his friends surrounding him, and he prepared to fight. Ziggy, the gangster, was there to watch the show as well, and he crossed his arms over his chest. He wanted to see if Damon really dared to fight when the police were involved. Did this pesky student have the guts to attack Officer Chandler? If he started anything, Drew's friends would step in and beat him up. If this happened, it would be Damon's fault for starting it. Would he be so bold as to attack the police? Perhaps the police would even drag him down to the station and beat him again afterwards. With Drew backing him up, Officer Chandler regained his courage. He roared, Are you coming or not? He took out his handcuffs and stepped toward his quarry. Damon's eyes flashed with a cold light. Then, he suddenly reached out, grabbed the officer's arm, and pulled hard. The policeman fell forward. It happened so fast that Officer Chandler didn't have time to react. He face-planted on the ground. His teeth felt like they had been knocked out, and he cried tears of pain. Drew saw Damon boldly attacking the police officer, and he immediately roared in excitement. That's it! This guy attacked the police! Everyone beat him! Finally, they had a good excuse to teach this kid a lesson. When Drew's friends heard this roar, they all attacked. The students who Damon had beaten before were especially excited. They finally had an opportunity to take revenge. They weren't afraid because they knew that Damon's true vendetta was against Drew. Moreover, they felt self-righteous. The way they saw it, they were just helping the police. Although they knew that Drew was using official means to take revenge on Damon for a personal reason, they didn't care. As Drew spoke, he waved his hand and urged his friends to charge. He wasn't stupid. The memory of Damon's awesome fighting skills was still fresh in his memory. He knew if he rushed forward first, he would definitely get hurt. He might as well wait for his opponent to tire himself out a bit first. Then, he could swoop in and finish him off. When the time came, he would settle the score. Indeed, Damon's iron fists were not to be trifled with. He sent the two students who were leading the charge flying. Officer Chandler saw this, and his expression distorted in anger. This kid had assaulted a police officer, and now he had beaten up two more people. The situation was out of control, and he needed to call for backup. Originally, Officer Chandler had planned to bring in Damon peacefully, but he didn't have the arrest warrant to fall back on. Now the student had attacked him. He didn't need an arrest warrant anymore. He could do whatever it took to subdue the suspect. Naturally, Damon was not going to wait around to be killed. Seeing that the officer was about to attack, he prepared to defend himself. The policeman did not dare to move. Drew's gang also hesitated. After all, everyone knew that Damon was a ruthless fighter. They hadn't expected him to fight back. Just as Drew was thinking about his next move, Nancy rushed forward. Her expression was icy. What are you doing? What's going on here? Why are all you students fighting instead of studying? At this moment, her expression was very fierce. It seemed very out of character, but she wouldn't just stand by and watch people attack her son. Although she was a noble, well-educated woman, first and foremost, she was a mother. It was natural for her to want to protect her child. Even animals risked their lives to save their children. What's more, Damon was her only son. She would tear apart anyone who dared to touch a hair on his head. Fortunately, no one had hurt him. Otherwise, she would have had to teach them a lesson. Her behavior even surprised Robert. He stood and watched her with a dumbfounded expression on his face. He could understand, though. Damon was Nancy's child. He knew that his wife loved her child more than she loved him. Sometimes this made him feel jealous, but at the same time, he understood. 
Their son had disappeared more than 10 years ago. They had basically accepted that he was dead, but then suddenly, he had reappeared alive and well. In light of this, it was natural for Nancy to be so protective of him. Nancy aside, even Robert wouldn't stand by and watch his son being bullied. Seeing such a thing infuriated him. If anything happened to Damon, he would make these people wish that they were dead. Drew, Officer Chandler, and the others were about to attack Damon when suddenly they saw Nancy step in. Seeing this made them furrow their brows in confusion. Who was this woman and why was she here? Was she trying to get herself killed? She should mind her own business. However, they noticed her elegant and confident demeanor. They also saw Robert standing imposingly behind her and they did not dare to be impudent. A silence fell over the crowd. However, Drew was also a person from a prominent family. In addition, Officer Chandler felt that he was in the right. This student had attacked him and he wasn't going to let this student's parents or teachers intimidate him. Because of this, he did not have much respect for Nancy. Who are you? Drew asked. Why are you interfering in our business? Officer Chandler touched his bruised face and said coldly, The police are handling this. If there's nothing else, then get lost. Otherwise, I'll arrest you as well. This student had attacked an officer of the law, and the bystanders were just trying to help. Why was this woman standing up for a criminal? Officer Chandler was extremely angry. Although it wasn't a serious situation, seeing an officer being assaulted was still scary to the police. He had to regain control of the situation. Therefore, his tone was not polite at all. Nancy was already furious. She hadn't expected to find someone treating her son like this. Speaking of which, it was her job to protect him. What had he done without her? Although he had adoptive parents, would they feel the same natural urge to protect him? It must have been difficult to grow up in poverty. How could he hold his head up high under such circumstances? Being poor made life more difficult. It made one a target for bullying, and it was inevitable for some people to roll their eyes at such people. As Nancy thought about the injustice, she felt like her heart was being cut out by a knife. She couldn't stand the thought of her son suffering. Seeing Officer Chandler's arrogance made her so angry that all she could do was laugh but her eyes remained cold. You are out of line, officer. You don't have an arrest warrant, and you were being a bully. You would have arrested this student either way. Can you blame him for attacking you? You are disrespectful, and you got what you deserved. Officer Chandler retorted angrily, The police don't need to explain themselves to you, ma'am. Move along. Of course they do. The people have the right to know, Nancy insisted. She wasn't afraid of him. If you can't produce an arrest warrant, then you don't have the right to hassle this student. Nancy was standing up for Damon. If she could not protect her son, how could she call herself a parent? Oh, oh, you are something else, lady, the officer exclaimed. Who do you think you are? How dare you speak to me like that? Move along or I'll arrest you too. The police were trying to arrest Damon, but he wasn't cooperating. They didn't have any grounds to bring him in. On top of this, Drew and his gang were involved and they wanted to beat Damon up and get revenge. Luckily, the Brokertons arrived in the nick of time. Nancy stepped in front of Officer Chandler to protect her son. The officer was so angry that he felt like he was going to explode. He had just been assaulted by Damon, and now this woman was provoking him. He wasn't messing around anymore. Nancy threatened, If you try anything, I'll make you regret it. Officer Chandler was about to lose it. He wanted to put both her and Damon in handcuffs. Who was she, and why did she think she could talk to him like this? The Brokertons' bodyguards were still far behind. After all, the couple had started running when they saw that their son was in danger. Now, only Robert could protect his wife. He saw Officer Chandler threatening her, and he didn't know what to do. He knew he had to act fast, so he suddenly rushed forward and pushed the officer away from her. The push was too strong, though, and it knocked the policeman to the ground. He fell on his face again, and it began to swell. He looked as miserable as could be. The Brokertons' sudden arrival surprised Damon. He recognized Nancy and Robert, but although Nancy was helping him, he still didn't trust her. He took a few steps back and watched her arguing with the officer. However, he hadn't expected Robert's attack. Damon had originally thought that he was the kind of man who didn't get his hands dirty. He didn't think the man could fight, so he was stunned to see him push Officer Chandler to the ground. Not only was this officer's face now swollen, but he was also bleeding. The policeman had never felt so insulted before. He jumped to his feet in anger and shouted, Criminals! You are criminals! How dare you assault a police officer! I need backup! These people are attacking an officer! Help! Drew was also unhappy with Nancy and Robert. Although the couple looked wealthy, he was not afraid of them. He was from a prominent family, and he knew they would protect him. He knew all kinds of big shots. How dare these people get involved? 
No matter who they were, he could deal with that later. Perhaps Drew felt a little timid when facing Damon. After all, he knew the guy could fight. He wasn't afraid of an old guy like Robert, though. It would be easy to teach this geezer a lesson. Drew's gang rushed toward Robert like a tidal wave. For a moment, it looked like he was screwed, but suddenly, someone shouted from behind, Hey, what are you doing? It was the Brokerton's team of bodyguards. Nancy's assistant had seen that something was happening, so she quickly called the bodyguards over. The bodyguards were all skilled fighters. Among them was the giant, the massive guard who Silas had sicked on Damon in the past. When the guards heard their bosses were in danger, they were so scared that they broke out in cold sweat. If anything happened to the Brokertons, none of them could bear it. Therefore, they rushed over and saw Drew and his group planning to surround and attack Robert. An extremely strong man who looked like a ferocious beast led the team of bodyguards. He charged towards Drew and swung at him with his huge fists. Drew went flying and landed in a nearby trash can. When he crawled out, he was covered in garbage. He smelled awful and no longer looked like a handsome young rich kid. Because of the chaos, the rest of Drew's gang didn't even notice. They kept rushing towards Robert without any care for their lives. However, the Brokerton's dozen or so bodyguards were not to be trifled with. They were like wolves on a flock of sheep. They swung their fists and defended their bosses. Even the students who were competent fighters didn't stand a chance. They were no match for the bodyguards. It was truly a massacre. In less than a minute, Drew's friends were all crying and begging for mercy. Then, the bodyguards turned on the onlookers who were leaning against luxury cars watching the fight. Each and every one of them had their teeth knocked out and their noses broken. They looked as miserable as could be. At this point, Robert called off the guards. If it was up to Nancy, she would have let the bodyguards continue their work. She had no mercy for anyone who attacked her son. In her eyes, such a thing was unforgivable. The ones who got the worst were Officer Chandler and Drew. They were the main culprits, so naturally the bodyguards made them pay. The policeman's hand was broken. He was trembling as he called for backup. Drew was also calling for more friends. Robert told his assistant to send for more bodyguards. Although he was not afraid, he wanted to end this as soon as possible. After all, they had come here today to meet their son, not to get involved in a fight. Nancy saw that her husband's assistant was calling for more security, so she quickly turned her eyes to Damon and asked nervously, Baby, are you alright? Are you hurt? If you are injured, you can tell your mother. Mom will bring you to the hospital. I won't let anything happen to you. The moment she saw him, a feeling of maternal love welled up inside her. She knew that he was fine, but she kept asking anyway. She was nervous and scared, and she didn't want to lose him again. If anything happened to him now, she would never forgive herself. Damon felt slightly moved to hear this, but he didn't let on. He looked at her coldly. What's wrong with you? Are you on drugs? Why are you talking nonsense? She choked when she heard his words. Only then did she remember that the relationship between them was strained. Strictly speaking, this was the first time they were meeting with full knowledge of each other's identity. However, Damon did not know what Nancy knew, so it was confusing to hear her call herself mother all of a sudden. All this time, she also realized how strange her words must sound. Originally, she had wanted to explain things clearly. She was afraid that he would not accept it if she was too direct. But now, she'd gone and put her foot in her mouth. Hence, she said awkwardly, I, I, I care about you. Damon did not reply. He looked at her coldly, waiting to see what she would do. At this moment, they heard sirens in the distance. Officer Chandler's reinforcements were finally arriving. Furthermore, the policeman was smart. He knew that his small police station didn't have enough resources to take on the Brokerton's entire security team, so he lied to dispatch. He told the operators that a violent incident was taking place on campus, and they sent a SWAT team. When the local police station heard that a violent incident was taking place and their fellow police officers were in danger, they called in the best forces in the city to help. The SWAT team arrived, and without an explanation, they surrounded the Brokertons and their bodyguards. The leader of the team was Officer Chandler's father, Captain Roy Chandler. He would do anything to protect his son. After the team was in position, he quickly ran over to Officer Chandler and asked, Sam, Sam, my son, are you all right? If anything happened to you, your mother would kill me. Officer Sam Chandler was the captain's only child, and he was his pride and joy. Because of this, the captain often bent the rules in his favor. While Officer Chandler was studying at the police academy, he got a woman pregnant. Afterwards, the woman wouldn't leave him alone. The situation became so messy that his father paid money to settle it. Then, the captain had his son reassigned to a different jurisdiction to cover up the scandal. At that time, 
it had been easy for the captain to pull strings and clean up his son's mess. He couldn't bear to see his precious child suffer. Today, when he heard that his son had been attacked, he rushed to the scene. After he arrived and saw that Officer Chandler's hand was broken, he totally lost it. Who, who did this? His gaze fiercely scanned the crowd. Drew covered his face with one hand and pointed at the Brokertons with the other. Sir, they started this. Their bodyguards attacked him. They would have killed him if you hadn't arrived. How arrogant, how arrogant, arrest them all. The captain was furious. Had these people actually dared to touch his son, he would never let them get away with it. No way. Freeze, don't move. When the Brockerton's bodyguards saw the SWAT team coming for Nancy and Robert, they couldn't bear it. Was this really happening? They felt that their boss's lives were on the line, so they took out their guns and aimed them at the SWAT team. Everyone was stunned to see this. None of them had expected the bodyguards to be armed. Who were these people? Drew realized that he might have bitten off more than he could chew. Captain Chandler was completely overwhelmed by anger. He saw the bodyguards pull out their guns and he flew into a rage. How dare these people defy the law? This was unforgivable. He was so angry that he lost all reason. He shouted, Do you all want to die? The leader of the bodyguards said coolly, We are trained to protect our employees with our lives. If anything happens to the Brokertons today, none of you will leave here alive. As he said this, he signaled for his subordinates to move into position and shield Robert and Nancy. The Brokertons were their only priority now. If the SWAT team really opened fire, they would use their bodies as human shields. Captain Chandler was so angry that he jumped up and down. Don't move! Whoever dares to move will be killed! Suddenly, the captain's phone rang. He quickly took it out and looked at it. It was the local congressperson, Mrs. Joyce. Although the captain didn't necessarily have to answer to Congress, he still had to maintain a good relationship with the local congressperson. His demeanor immediately changed. Helpless, he answered the call. Mrs. Joyce, I'm a bit busy at the moment. When are you free? We should have lunch together soon. No one else could hear what was happening on the other line, but the captain listened silently for a while. As he did, his expression became very ugly. Then he exclaimed, But Mrs. Joyce, they attacked a police officer. My son was in danger. I don't care who these people are. Justice must be served. After listening to Mrs. Joyce for a few moments, he hung up the phone. Then he turned to face Nancy and Robert. The two of them were calm and composed, and the captain began to feel uncertain. He had finally realized who they were. He wasn't sure how Mrs. Joyce had known to call, but she had warned him not to do anything rash. How had she known about this situation? As he thought about this, he broke out in a cold sweat. Then, he remembered how his son had been attacked. He could not let them get away with this. Unexpectedly, his phone rang again. This time, it was Mayor Francis calling. Roy, old friend, I heard that you were heading a SWAT team at Meyerson University. Be careful. Don't escalate the situation. If anything goes wrong, don't say I didn't warn you. He had just hung up when his phone rang again. This time, it was the police commissioner. Who told you to bring the SWAT team? Who gave you the go-ahead? Did you clear it with the higher-ups? Come back immediately. You don't have the authority. Captain Chandler felt like everything was going wrong for him today. The president of Meyerson University, Mr. Upperton, was holding an important meeting today. He heard that there was a problem on campus and that the Brokertons were involved. When he heard this, he was so concerned that he called off the meeting. He apologized to the other attendees and told them that something more important had come up. Then he called campus security to send people over and get control of the situation. The people attending the meeting were all important figures in the local government. Some of them even personally knew Robert and Nancy. When they heard that the Brokertons were in trouble, they were shocked. How could that be? Who would be responsible if anything happened to them? They hurriedly followed Mr. Upperton to see what was happening. The rest of the school leaders also came along. Before long, the scene was bustling with people. Mayor Francis had been attending to business nearby, so when he heard the news, he rushed over too. The street in front of the dorms was jam-packed with vehicles. Campus security finally arrived, and they went to see if Robert and Nancy were all right. Mayor Francis and Mr. Upperton pushed through the crowd. They heaved sighs of relief when they saw the Brokertons were fine. Only then did they start to ask questions, and quickly, the whole story came out. Seeing all these important people arrive scared Captain Chandler, his son, Drew, and the others. Officer Chandler's hand was broken, but he stopped screaming in pain when he saw Mayor Francis. He didn't understand why everyone was making such a fuss over one meaningless student. As for the identity of the other party, he guessed that they must be very important people. In any case, he could tell that he'd caused a lot of trouble here today. Drew's eyes also widened in surprise. His family had money. 
but they weren't so rich as to be untouchable. Because his family was well off, he was quite knowledgeable about the inner workings of the elite circle. Occasionally, he would also attend events hosted by people of Meyerson's upper-class society. Therefore, he personally knew some of these people. People like Mr. Upperton and Mayor Francis were all highly respected. Everyone wanted to curry favor with them. Officer Chandler had come to campus to arrest Damon, but everything went wrong. When the SWAT team got into a confrontation with the Brokerton's bodyguards, all sorts of important people started getting involved. Now, even Mayor Francis and Mr. Upperton were at the scene. When Drew saw the mayor, he started feeling nervous. He knew his parents desperately wanted to stay on the mayor's good side. They were acquainted with each other, and his parents considered this a great honor. Drew could tell that the mayor was concerned about the Brokerton's well-being. Who were these people who had so much influence over all of Meyerson's elites? They must be important figures. As Drew thought of this, he could not help but shiver. However, he still did not know about the relationship between Nancy and Damon. If he did, he would be even more afraid. Officer Chandler was also dumbfounded at this moment. He did not know what was happening either. Why were there so many people? Even the president of the university and the mayor of Meyerson were here? These people were more powerful than his father. What was going on? Why was the mayor here? He felt afraid. He looked at his father's pale face and he could tell that the situation wasn't good. He even forgot the pain in his hand. He knew that what he had done was actually illegal because he didn't have an arrest warrant for Damon. This had all been for personal revenge and now his plan had gone wrong. Even his father was involved now. Officer Chandler was finished. He looked at his father, trying to figure out what the captain would do. No matter what, his father had to save him. But at this moment, Captain Chandler was in trouble. He wished he could ask someone for help, but everyone had turned on him. Naturally, he was older and wiser than his son. He could see that Mayor Francis was close with the Brokertons. Mr. Upperton was also looking at them with concern. Obviously, the couple was extremely well connected. Even though his team had responded to a legitimate call, something didn't seem right. He suspected that his son had overreacted and called the SWAT team unnecessarily. Furthermore, the captain knew he himself had acted maliciously towards this couple just now. He had been out of line. A policeman was not supposed to act that way, regardless of who was involved. He knew his son's personality. Officer Chandler had likely done something against procedure. His son's behavior often made him feel ill at ease. If this couple pushed for an investigation into Officer Chandler's actions, even the captain wouldn't be able to cover his ass. All his son's past troubles might also come to light. As the captain thought of this, he quickly wiped the sweat from his forehead. Then, he went over to greet Mayor Francis. He was trying to find a way to apologize to Nancy and Robert. He would do anything to avoid being blamed for this situation. However, when Mayor Francis saw him, he just nodded and turned back to Mr. Upperton. After all, this was Meyerson University, and the school's president was in charge here, right? In fact, the police were outside of their jurisdiction. This was campus security's turf. By coming here, the police had crossed a line. Captain Chandler saw that Mayor Francis didn't have any intention of responding to him. His expression was as miserable as could be. Mr. Upperton talked with the Brokertons for a while. Then, the bystanders heard Nancy loudly declare, Mr. Upperton, Mayor Francis, these people have gone too far. They are arrogant and they think they are above the law. They even beat people up. No matter what, we must see justice. It was rare for Nancy to get so angry in public. How dare they attack her son? In her eyes, their actions were unforgivable. She wasn't willing to negotiate. Mr. Upperton nodded. Officer Chandler saw this and felt frightened. He knew that a catastrophe was about to befall him. Drew and the others were also scared and they wanted to run away. Many of Drew's friends had already sensed the danger and slipped away earlier. Now, the rest of them shrank back and ran away with their tails between their legs. They knew this was no joke. Even Mr. Upperton was there. If the university were to investigate this matter, they would all be finished. They might even be expelled. The few who hadn't left hung their heads and tried to disappear among the crowd. The arrogant expressions they had worn earlier were gone. They trembled with fear and worried that they'd be thrown in jail. Their faces turned pale. Everyone could see that things had gotten out of hand. They had just wanted to teach this annoying student a lesson and they hadn't expected the situation to turn on them like this. Mr. Upperton nodded and pointed at Drew and the others. He addressed campus security. Take these troublemakers away and question them. If they are behind this, we must find out the truth. The person in charge nodded. 
Drew and the others had sullen looks on their faces as campus security led them away. Mayor Francis turned to look at Captain Chandler. Although he was not the police captain's boss, he still <sighs> sighed and issued an order. Take this officer back to the station and tell the higher-ups what happened here today. Don't try to hide anything. I will be having a conversation with them myself as well. Poor Officer Chandler looked helplessly at his father. But how could the captain say no to the mayor? The captain nodded. Then he took his son's gun and badge and put him in handcuffs and helped him into the back of a police car. After the matter was finally settled, Mayor Francis, Mr. Upperton, and the Brokertons chatted for a while longer. The president asked them all to lunch, but Robert and Nancy still had business to attend to. After that, they all said their goodbyes. At this time, Damon was about to leave as well, but Nancy quickly stopped him. Baby, I mean, Damon, wait. He looked at her. What is it? His gaze was cold, and Nancy felt somewhat flustered. In a flattering tone, she asked, Can, can you come with me for a quick chat? We can go wherever you want. Mom, I mean, I have something I want to say to you. I'm busy. He couldn't be bothered to hear what she had to say. He turned around and was about to walk back into his dorm when two bodyguards blocked his path. He turned around and spat. What, are you going to use force? She shook her head and tears welled up in her eyes. She began to plead, looking as pitiful as could be. Taman, I just want to say a few words to you. I have no other intentions. I helped you today, so will you listen? Is that all right? Please, I'm begging you, okay? At this moment, Nancy would do whatever it took to make him hear her out. She would even kneel down and beg for him to listen. As long as he would let her talk to him, she was willing to do anything. Actually, he already knew what she wanted. He knew that this day would come sooner or later, but he hadn't expected it to come so quickly. He thought for a while and nodded. Okay, I'll give you a chance. Tears fell from her eyes and she kept nodding her head. Now that he had agreed to talk to her, the rest would be easy. Robert, who was standing behind her, felt his chest tighten. He took his wife's hand. Excitement coursed through his body. They went to a coffee shop on campus and found a quiet corner where they could talk. The three of them sat down at a table, and for a moment, the atmosphere was somewhat awkward. No one spoke. Then, Damon broke the silence. So, what is it? Tell me what you want from me. The Brokertons looked at each other. Robert did his best to calm himself, and he tried to make his tone as gentle as possible. You are Damon, right? Well, your name used to be Barrett Brokerton. Actually, I think you already know who we are and your relationship to us. Damon's expression remained blank. What did you say? I don't understand what you mean. What's the relationship between us? Then, with a look of sudden realization, he went on. Oh, I remember now. What's the matter? You suddenly got a conscience? Are you finally willing to admit all the evil things that your nephew did? And you are here to apologize to me, the victim? If the Brokertons hadn't done their homework on Damon, they would have been stunned. However, Nancy and Robert had known what to expect. Besides, they had been in the business world for many years and had encountered all kinds of smart people. Damon was a good actor. Unfortunately for him, the couple did not fall for his trick. Nancy stared at him. Her eyes were filled with endless tenderness. Honey, there is no need to avoid it anymore. You are my son, Barrett. I just want to talk to you. Why didn't you come looking for us when you realized we were your parents? Do you really hate your father and mother so much? Damon still pretended to be confused. What are you talking about? I don't understand. Nancy began to cry. Baby, no. <laughs> don't be like this, okay? It makes your mother sad when you are like this. However, Damon was indifferent. He seemed to think this was all a joke. He seemed to think she was just pretending. Robert did not speak. He was observing his son's expression. Even he had to admire Damon's acting skills. He wasn't bad at all. Finally, Robert pounded his fist on the table. He wasn't messing around anymore. You are Damon, right? Who gave you this name? He was trying to pressure their son into admitting the truth. Unfortunately, Damon didn't fall for this trick. He looked out the window and said slowly, You'd better stop being so arrogant. I won't fall for your tricks. And I don't have time to talk nonsense with you. I'm not your son, so stop bothering me. You're both being ridiculous, and I won't play along. Damon agreed to hear what the Brokertons had to say, so the three of them went to a coffee shop to chat. Nancy and Robert told him what they knew, but Damon refused to open up to them. He just kept pretending that he had no idea what they were talking about, 
He was about to leave, but Nancy quickly stood up to stop him. Tears continued to roll down her cheeks. Baby, listen to your mother. Listen to me. Can you sit down? Sit down for another minute. He saw that Nancy wasn't going to give up, so he sat back down to see what they had to say. Robert continued. We did a DNA test. I think you already know that, right? Damon suddenly understood. I was wondering why the school suddenly wanted a blood sample. What, so you guys were behind it? Robert nodded. He explained calmly. According to the test, your DNA is a match with ours. It proves that you are our son, Barrett. Damon and Nancy were both stunned. They looked at him with strange expressions. In fact, all three of them knew the true result of the DNA test, but at this moment, Robert was lying through his teeth. He was actually claiming that the sample was a match. Mother and son saw through his story. Even though Damon was surprised to hear this, he couldn't refute it. If he came out and said that it was impossible, he would be admitting to sending someone else in his stead. In fact, he knew better than anyone else whether or not he was related to the Brokertons. Robert had backed him into a corner. If his son claimed not to believe him, he could ask him to do another DNA test to settle the matter for good. If Damon didn't agree, it proved that he was hiding something. If, on the other hand, he did agree and took another test, they would have conclusive evidence that he was related to them. Therefore, no matter what Damon did, the Brokertons would get an answer. After a few moments, Damon quickly came back to his senses. When he spoke, his voice was low. Firstly, I don't believe you. Secondly, I am not your son. Furthermore, I already have parents, so it's impossible for me to be related to you. Please, don't waste my time anymore. Then why did you send someone else to give a blood sample? Why didn't you go yourself? Robert stared at his son and spoke decisively. Damon's expression became extremely ugly. Are you investigating me? What? Can't I? I saw the surveillance footage of the street outside the clinic that day. You never went. Instead, you sent your classmate, Quinn. You also gave him the thousand dollar payment as well, didn't you? Robert didn't deny his son's accusations. This was his long lost child and he desperately wanted to find him. It would have been strange for him not to investigate. Shameless, despicable, Damon spat. Robert smiled like an old fox. And I investigated your parents too. I know they adopted you. Your adopted mother even told us about the gold key that she found with you. They adopted you. We are your real parents. Nancy nodded as her husband spoke. Then she quickly took out the gold key from her bag. Damon's expression froze when he saw the key. No wonder he hadn't been able to find it lately. Had this woman actually picked it up? He remembered the fight he had gotten into with her bodyguard, Regan. He remembered Regan bending down to pick something up off the ground after the fight. It must have been the key. He must have dropped it accidentally. He hadn't expected Nancy to have it. In light of this, it was no wonder that she had collected blood samples from all those students. His own negligence had caused this entire situation. Fate had intervened and brought them together. At this moment, Damon thought of something else. You didn't do anything to them, did you? The key wasn't important now. He was more concerned about his parents and his sister. Had the Brokertons threatened them? With their power, they could make the walkers disappear by waving their hands. Robert responded in a low voice. Do you think I'm the kind of person who does not distinguish right from wrong? Do you think I'm heartless? The walkers raised you. Nothing I can do would ever be enough to thank them. How could I cause them harm? Damon heaved a oh. sigh of relief. I'm warning you now. The walkers are my family. I am not your son. If anything happens to them, it doesn't matter how powerful you are. I will make you pay. You'd better remember this. After issuing this threat, he quickly stood up and left. Nancy got up to follow him. If her son left, she might never see him again. She was not willing to give up so easily. However, Robert stopped her. Dear, forget it. Let him go. When she heard this, she froze, but her gaze was locked on the door that Damon had just exited. She felt a mixture of nostalgia and disappointment. Her husband stood up and sighed. He soothed. Give him some time. We don't want to put too much pressure on him. He will come around. Now that they were sure he was their son, everything would be fine. Robert did not take his son's words to heart. After all, they had been separated for more than 10 years and they were strangers to each other. Nancy knew her husband's words made sense, so she nodded quietly. However, the tears didn't stop rolling down her cheeks. 
After more than 10 years, she was finally reunited with her son, but she could hardly even recognize him. Was there anything more depressing? However, what made her even more uncomfortable was how Damon felt about his adoptive parents. Compared to her and Robert, his relationship with them was much closer. Although she understood, she couldn't help feeling jealous. She would give 10 years off her life to have Damon be protective of her and Robert like that. However, she knew she had gained something today. After all, this was the first time in more than a decade that she had talked to her son as a parent. On top of that, his reaction confirmed the relationship between them. Now, they needed to figure out how to fix their relationship with him. They would show him how much they loved him, and everything would be fine. Eventually, they would change his mind. Naturally, Damon did not know what the Brockertons had been up to. He hadn't expected them to find him so quickly. After parting ways with them, he went to the mountain behind campus to take a stroll and think. When he got back to his dorm later, he found the atmosphere to be quite lively. Theo, Xander, and Hector were all chatting together, and some of the women from room 201 were also there. Riley, Willow, and Jillian had stopped by to talk about plans for the summer vacation. It turned out that Theo and Xander had both joined the school basketball team, and the team had recently been invited to compete in the inter-school league. They had even been offered sports scholarships. Furthermore, the team would be traveling all over the country to compete. The girls were planning to come and see some of the games in different cities this summer. At this moment, they were discussing where they wanted to go. Quinn, on the other hand, did not join in the conversation. Everyone else was chatting happily, but he was still at his desk studying programming. Ever since Damon told him that he could have a good job with Everbright, he had worked very hard. Damon would test him whenever he was ready, and if he was good enough, he could start working for the company. Seeing that Damon had returned, Theo and Xander hurriedly called him over and told him their plans. They wanted him to come traveling with them this summer. Riley, Willow, and Jillian all waited with anticipation to see what he would say, but Damon shook his head. I have a lot of things to do here. Next time, okay? Everbright had just secured financing, and furthermore, Old Century and the online Astromar community were still growing in popularity. He had too many things to deal with, so he couldn't take another vacation right now. When Damon's friends heard that he couldn't come, they all looked disappointed. Riley, Willow, and Jillian looked at the guys in confusion. The women had keen senses. They could tell that Damon was the unspoken leader of the friend group. They knew that he played basketball and had coached Xander and Theo before. Because of this, they were surprised that he didn't want to come and see any games. What was keeping him so busy? Riley and Willow did not know about Damon's secret talents. Only Jillian did. Such things would seem unbelievable to most ordinary students. Riley had long considered Damon a joke. She didn't think him capable of such achievements. However, Jillian now knew better. She was still kicking herself for being so short-sighted and breaking up with him. By chance, she had discovered how truly wonderful he was, but it was too late. By the time she realized this, his feelings for her were history. No matter how much she regretted her choice, there was nothing she could do. It was dinner time, and Theo, Xander, and the others were tired of discussing summer plans. They prepared to go eat together and asked Damon if he wanted to join them. Damon was having some technical problems with the Astromar community forum, so he did not want to go. He watched them all leave the dorm together. He worked on the computer for a while, and then his phone rang. It was Fiona calling. She asked if he had eaten yet. When he said he hadn't, she told him she'd get takeout and come meet him. He agreed and hung up. Then he got back to work while he waited for her. Five minutes later, he heard a knock on the door. Wow, that didn't take long, he thought to himself as he went to let Fiona in. The door swung open and he saw a woman standing outside. It was not Fiona. It was Jillian. She was the last person who he wanted to see. He was stunned for a moment, but then he regained his composure and smiled. Did you finish eating already? Jillian shook her head and glanced at him. She explained softly, I just came to take my coat. I forgot it here. He looked around the room and saw that her coat was indeed hanging behind Quinn's chair. He invited her in, and as she walked past, he could smell her sweet perfume. She walked across the dorm and took her coat. But after, she did not leave. Instead, she turned around and looked at him with her charming eyes. Her tender gaze softened his heart. Damon, will you come traveling with us to see Xander and Theo play? She asked. Her tone was soft and she sounded like she was pleading. No, I have some things to do here. I can't make it, he replied. Seeing that he wasn't going to change his mind, Jillian felt slightly hurt. Then she continued. Do you know what? Jonathan and I broke up. He frowned and wanted to ask what this had to do with him. However, when he saw the look in her eyes, he stopped himself. He could see the emotion welling up in them and he didn't want to hurt her. Therefore, 
He simply kept silent and pretended he hadn't heard her. She walked over to him and softly asked, Don't you want to know why I broke up with him? He still didn't say anything. She went on, I don't like his personality and we have different values, so I ended it. When Damon heard this, he could not help but sneer. Is that so? I thought you and Riley were both desperate to join his group of elite friends. When she heard this, her eyes filled with a look of despair. Do you really think I'm that kind of a person? He didn't reply. She felt as if he had torn her heart out. She asked nervously, Damon, won't you give me another chance? Jillian and Damon were alone together in his dorm room. She had just told him that she'd broken up with Jonathan. Then she asked him if he'd give her another chance. He hadn't expected her to spring this question on him all of a sudden, and he looked embarrassed. Jillian, I'm flattered, but I already have a girlfriend. Let's just pretend that this conversation never happened. Don't bring it up again in the future, okay? He didn't want to hurt her feelings, but he had no interest in her. He just wanted her to leave. Damon, like most men, liked beautiful women. He liked Fiona, and he liked Veronica. He'd even hooked up with Miss Branto. Although Jillian was attractive, he didn't have any interest in her now. They had been together before, but she ended it. Now she has come crawling back. He couldn't stand people like her, and he wasn't going to fall for her tricks. But... I really like you, she insisted. Her eyes were full of desire, but he had already turned around. She begged. Then, can you hug me just one last time? It's all I want. Hug me and I'll never pester you again. He didn't want to do it. What did she think this was? Damn it, they had broken up a long time ago, yet she still had the nerve to ask for a hug. Furthermore, Fiona was on her way here. He didn't want to imagine what would happen if she were to encounter such a scene. Unfortunately, before he could protest, Jillian took the initiative and wrapped her arms around him. She then leaned her head on his shoulder. He could feel her soft breasts pressing tightly against his body. The feeling was enough to make any man fall in love. He froze and awkwardly said, Jillian, respect my wishes. We don't have a future. No, she continued to beg. Damon, I like you. I love you. Can you give me another chance? Really, just one chance? No, a female voice exclaimed. It was Fiona. She had just walked in and happened upon the scene. Lucky for Damon, his girlfriend had guessed what was going on. She was an intelligent woman, so when she saw Jillian hugging him and pleading, she put the pieces together. She rushed over and pulled the other woman off him. Then, she quickly wrapped her own arms around him to further prove her point. It's... it's you, Jillian stammered, her pretty face turned pale. She knew that she no longer stood a chance of convincing him, and her heart felt like it was breaking. Fiona, on the other hand, was pleased with herself. What's wrong? <laughs> Who do you think you are? Why don't you go and look in the mirror? You are shameless. From now on, I don't want you anywhere near my cupcake. Next time, I won't mess around. Damon was her beloved, and she would not allow anyone else to touch him. Jillian was intimidated, and she did not dare to speak. Fiona quickly pulled Damon out the door with her, leaving the other woman behind. They went downstairs, and Jillian didn't follow. Once they were alone, Fiona pouted her lips at her boyfriend. She looked unhappy. Damon was afraid that she had misunderstood the situation, and he quickly explained himself. Don't worry, nothing happened between us. Furthermore, I wouldn't have done anything with her anyways. When Fiona heard his explanation, her face broke into a smile. She had just been messing with him. She leaned in and kissed him while he wasn't expecting it. I know, she soothed, but I still don't want you talking to her anymore. She is a problematic person. Although Fiona did not say it aloud, she worried that Damon would not be able to resist the temptation. What if another woman threw herself on him? What would he do? She didn't feel comfortable talking about this anymore. She wasn't usually a jealous person, but she loved Damon so much that she couldn't control her feelings. He saw how worried she was and could not help but hug her tightly. He felt incredibly guilty about what had happened while he was in Europe. He knew that Fiona cared for him wholeheartedly, and he had betrayed her. He was a repugnant beast. The two of them went to the cafeteria for dinner. After dinner, they went for a walk by the lake. They sat down on a bench, and Fiona gently rested her head on his shoulder. Cupcake, when do you think you will be ready for us to move in together? She couldn't wait to take their relationship to the next level. Damon had given her suggestion a lot of thought. He knew that he wanted to wake up next to her every day. Living together would be steamy. They could just stay in all day long and spend time together. They would never be bored with each other's company. That kind of life would be simply too wonderful. After thinking about this, he suggested... How about getting a place together for third year? He nodded. He saw his mischievous smile and guessed what he was thinking. Her pretty face turned red and she said, 
You pervert. <laughs> Look at you. You must be thinking something naughty. No, he denied, but she didn't believe him. Are you thinking about what it would be like to live together? She asked. How about what we would do together every day? No, I'm really not, he replied. If he admitted it, maybe she would change her mind about wanting to move in with him, and he would lose everything. He saw her watching him carefully with her big, beautiful eyes. It was as if she could tell that he was lying. However, he was a cunning fox. He kept a straight face, and she blushed. Then she leaned over and gave him a sweet kiss with her beautiful red lips. You smart ass, she teased. I know what living together entails. I can't wait to be alone with you every day. When Damon heard this, his heart soared. He imagined what he would do to her delicate body once they were alone together. His mind ran wild. Originally, he planned to walk Fiona back to her dorm, but along the way, they ran into someone he knew. It was the CEO of Silly Goose's operations department, Miss Branto. He didn't know how she knew where to find him, but it was obvious that she had been waiting for him for a while. She was sitting in a pink BMW convertible that was parked at the curb. She wore sunglasses, and she had an arrogant expression on her face. Her hair was newly styled, and her beautiful face was immaculately made up. She was wearing a dress that fit her body like a glove. Any man would consider her a goddess. However, the cold and arrogant look on her face would scare most men away. When Miss Branto saw Damon and Fiona walking together, a cold light flashed in her eyes. She got out of the car and stopped them. Damon, I have to talk to you about something. He was quite surprised that she had found him. Since they parted in Berlin, he hadn't heard from her again. He had assumed that she felt humiliated and wouldn't show her face. He hadn't expected her to suddenly show up at his dorm. But now that he thought about it, he realized that seeing her again was inevitable. After all, she had sunk a ton of money into New Century. If she gave up just like that, her efforts would be in vain. A woman like her would do anything to achieve her goals. After confronting him, Miss Branto did not immediately explain what she wanted. Instead, she took off her sunglasses and narrowed her eyes at Fiona. She looked her up and down and asked coolly, Is this your girlfriend? The woman's arrogant tone provoked Fiona. She could tell that this woman didn't have good intentions. Before Fiona could reply, Damon put his arm around her and declared, Yes, this is my girlfriend. Why, is something the matter? Oh, Miss Branto exclaimed as she sized her up even more carefully. Even she had to admit that Fiona was outrageously beautiful. She was secretly impressed. Although she herself was stunning, she gave credit where credit was due. Fiona was extremely sexy. No wonder Damon liked her. Hmm... Miss Branto silently compared her own body to Fiona's. Their breasts seemed to be about the same size. No, her own were a little bigger. <sighs> what was she thinking? She had to get it together. Fiona was uncomfortable being stared at by Miss Branto, so she asked rudely, Cupcake, who is this? This is a woman who I've had business dealings with in the past, he exclaimed. He did not even bother to introduce her. He didn't want to extend Miss Branto the courtesy. Fiona relaxed a little when she heard this. She said sweetly, Oh, then you stay and talk. I'm going back to my dorm. Remember, we are having dinner together tonight. She kissed him just to show off a little and then walked off with a bounce in her step. It seems that you have a good relationship with your girlfriend. Cupcake, huh? Aren't you afraid that she'll get upset when she finds out what happened between us? Miss Branto asked in a somewhat strange tone as she watched Fiona leave. In short, no matter how she looked at it, she had the upper hand now. Damon took out a cigarette and lit it. He smiled and said, the relationship between me and my girlfriend has nothing to do with you. If you have something to say, say it. Miss Branto's expression changed when she heard this. She glared fiercely at him. In reality, she felt a bit hurt, but she tried to hide it by ridiculing him. Is that so, you sucker? What do you think will happen if your girlfriend finds out that you betrayed her? Damon's expression changed. Are you threatening me? I think I have the right to, she snorted coldly. Do you dare to admit what you did? Are you going to man up? At this point, she could no longer conceal her anger. After all, she hated him for tricking her. She knew that her career depended on him agreeing to sell her the rights for New Century. His attitude infuriated her. How could he still be so arrogant, especially in front of his girlfriend? He should be begging her to keep his secret. He was simply a bastard. After what had happened between them, he hadn't even called her. He was simply shameless. Damon actually felt quite embarrassed by Miss Branto's outburst. In fact, after that night in Berlin, he also felt quite regretful. He felt that he had taken advantage of her desperation, and he felt guilty about cheating on Fiona. But they had both been drunk at the time, and things had gotten out of hand. 
he made a huge mistake. Hence, he gave her a solemn look and apologized. I'm sorry, actually, I didn't intend to sleep with you that night. Unexpectedly, she became even more worked up. So that's it, huh? You think you can fix it just by saying sorry? Well, I'm not the one who you should be apologizing to. It seemed like she was intent on ruining his relationship. He could not help but say, Hey, you came on to me. It's just as much your fault as mine. That's nonsense, she roared furiously. Don't blame me for your bad decisions. You made your bed, and now you have to lie in it. She stomped her feet, and her pretty face became redder and redder. However, she wasn't happy about what had happened that night either. She knew that what he had said was true. Despite this, she was willing to use it to her advantage. She had no problem with blackmailing him. Damon knew that she could cause him a lot of trouble, so he did not say anything and waited for her to vent her anger. After stomping her feet and yelling for a while, Miss Branto saw that people were staring, so she glared at him fiercely and demanded, Get in the car. We will discuss this later. He got in, and she drove him to a rather high-end hotel near campus. She had booked a meeting room there. After entering the meeting room, the two sat opposite each other. Miss Branto did not want to waste any more time, so she got to the point. I want to settle the lawsuit over New Century. How much do you want for the rights? Is that why I'm here? He asked, feigning surprise. She retorted angrily. You cheated on your girlfriend, right? I'm assuming you don't want her to know. How dare you? He spat back. You! She was usually cool and aloof, but today she was furious. She had never felt so agitated before. Her face flushed red as she threatened. What? You don't remember? Well, I remember everything, and I have no qualms about giving your girlfriend a call. She wasn't going to let him trick her again. No, she was finally back in control. Miss Branto had come to find Damon. She confronted him in front of Fiona. She wanted to settle the matter concerning New Century once and for all, and she wasn't afraid to blackmail him to make it happen. She had insisted that he come with her to discuss the issue, and then she brought him to a meeting room in a high-end hotel. Now, they were arguing. I was drunk that night, Damon spat. Besides, I never agreed to sell you the rights to New Century. What happened between us was just a meaningless fling. His shameless words infuriated Miss Branto. What do you mean? It meant nothing. Her expression became colder and colder. Do you mean to say that after what happened, you won't give me the rights to the game? He saw that she was about to get even angrier, so he didn't beat around the bush anymore. He said lightly, If you want the rights to my game, I'm willing to do that, but it will cost you. Don't expect me to fork them over for free just because we slept together. You weren't that good. Miss Branto was a business person too, so she couldn't blame him for bargaining. They had slept together, but that was personal. Although she could understand it, it still pissed her off. She hadn't expected this turn of events, so her expression became even uglier. He smiled coldly. What's wrong? Are you unhappy? Don't you remember chasing me out of KC games? This is just tit for tat. Don't blame me for getting even. Her face turned pale as she thought about how she had treated him back then. She realized that she had been a hundred times worse to him. She had brought this upon herself. However, she still felt a little uncomfortable. She had never met such a cruel man before. However, she hid her feelings. Instead, she asked, All right, what do you want? He stroked his chin as if deep in thought. Then he replied, I don't want anything up front. What I mean is, Silly Goose and Casey Games should release New Century together. However, I will take 35% of the profit. I designed it, so I deserve this much. In addition, I don't want to see Will involved in anything to do with the game. If I find out that he is, I will take back my rights. Miss Branto looked livid. You want 35% of the profits? You are being too ruthless. Even more ruthless than you? He replied, completely ignoring her anger. I am the creator, so I should take the biggest share. Also, I think my offer is quite generous. If you don't want to take it, I don't care. I'm not desperate to settle right now. Everbright was earning a ton of money with Old Century. Additionally, his website for the Astromar community was also flourishing. Although New Century would indeed be very profitable, Damon was fine either way. However, Casey Games' survival depended on it. Miss Branto's career at Silly Goose relied on it as well. All in all, Damon had her in a corner. She couldn't jeopardize her chance of settling with him. It didn't matter how angry she was at this moment. She felt helpless. He had her in the palm of his hand. She wished that she could wipe the smug look off his face. However, she still had one thing to hold over him. She knew that he wanted to keep their fling a secret from Fiona. Miss Branto thought for a while and finally agreed. 
Okay, you can have 35% of the profit. Also, I will guarantee that Will will not touch the game. In any case, Silly Goose already had absolute control of KC Games. If Will wasn't willing, she could just fire him. When she first partnered with him, he led her to believe that he designed New Century himself. Now she knew this wasn't true. He had lied to her. Damon nodded and suddenly stated, It seems that you don't have a problem using people and throwing them away. He then looked at her strangely. Was he mocking her? She felt a little uncomfortable being looked at like that, and she felt a sudden impulse to explain herself. What is it? Do you think I'm selfish and merciless? Do you think I'm the kind of person who will do whatever it takes to achieve my goals? I didn't say that, he replied coolly. It's none of my business anyway. He truly had no interest in knowing. She looked at him and blushed. She couldn't help defending herself. I'm not that kind of person. Don't get the wrong idea. He couldn't be bothered with her. Was she trying to relate to him? She was a smart woman, so she guessed what he was thinking. She bit her lip and wanted to explain further, but she could tell that it wouldn't matter. He already made his mind up about her, so she changed the subject and asked, So how is your relationship with your girlfriend? He glared at her coldly. You want to blackmail me, huh? Let me tell you something. You were drunk, and you came on to me. Besides, we've already agreed on a deal. Don't even think about it. She played it cool. Whoa, paranoid much? I was just asking casually. Do you really think I'm that despicable? If you know what is best for you, you'll keep quiet, he threatened. Otherwise, you will pay the price. She felt that he was hard to deal with. Usually when men talked to her, they were on their best behavior. This bastard, on the other hand, simply disdained her. To stop him from getting the wrong idea, she changed the subject again. Damon, let me ask you one more thing. Can you answer honestly? That depends on the question, he replied. She took a deep breath and asked, When we were on the flight to Berlin together, there was a violent attack. What were you doing at the time? His eyes narrowed and his voice got quiet. Why are you asking? I saw the gunshot wound on your shoulder, she replied, and the bloody gauze on the floor in the corner of your bathroom. Damon wasn't surprised that she was asking about this. After their one night stand, he noticed that the pile of dirty clothes in his hotel bathroom had been moved. However, at the time, he hadn't given it much thought. He hadn't expected Miss Branto to put the pieces together, but he didn't hide it. Instead, he openly admitted, Yes, it was me, but I hope you can keep this between us. Miss Branto wanted to thank him, but after seeing his attitude toward the whole incident, she no longer thought it necessary. She couldn't help but say sarcastically, You are really noble, huh? What a good guy. Damon couldn't be bothered responding. He didn't need her approval, so he just ignored her sarcasm. At this moment, his phone rang. He took it out and saw that Wilder was calling. It turned out that Ziggy, the gangster who they had beaten up, was causing trouble again. Ever since Wilder had beaten up Ziggy at the gym, he had become famous in his part of town. But Ziggy had suffered a big loss, and he wasn't going to sit back and take it. He had been preparing to deal with Wilder ever since that day at Sharky's. Wilder had also heard that Drew was out for revenge as well. Lately, Drew had been hanging around with a group of his cronies, looking for Wilder and his gang. Although Wilder could handle these thugs on his own, he was worried about Damon. He didn't want him to get in trouble. Furthermore, Ziggy had a lot of people in his gang, so it would be better to stay out of his way for the time being. However, Ziggy wasn't willing to give up so easily. He had gone to Wilder's house and smashed up all the cars in the driveway. He left a message telling Wilder and Damon to stop hiding. He wanted them to meet him at the old junkyard on the outskirts of town next week. Then, they could settle this matter once and for all. At that time, they could each bring as many people as they wanted to fight. If Ziggy's side won, Wilder and Damon would have to kneel and beg for mercy. If Ziggy's side lost, he would be forced to withdraw from the area, and it would become Damon and Wilder's territory. When people heard this announcement, Meyerson's entire underworld was shaken. After receiving the news, Wilder didn't dare ignore it. He hurriedly called Damon to discuss countermeasures. After Damon heard the news, he said that he'd be in touch. Then, he hung up and turned back to Miss Branto. Well, if there's nothing else, I have to get going. Since they had finished discussing business, he didn't have any more time to stand around and yak. When Miss Branto saw that he was about to leave, she quickly stood up. You are going already? Why did she seem reluctant to see him go? He asked curiously. Is there anything else? She quickly put aside her feelings and said, All right then, I will deal with Will and Casey Games, but don't forget your promise. She could easily deal with Will. He had to do what she ordered if he wanted to continue working with Silly Goose. She could deal with him and furthermore, she would not feel any guilt about it. 
She still remembered how Will had lied to her and betrayed Damon. He had brought this on himself and she wouldn't show him any mercy. The only thing she was worried about was Damon going back on his word. After all, she knew he distrusted her. However, when she thought about how he had risked his life to save everyone on the plane, she relaxed a little. Obviously, he was a good person inside. He sued them over New Century only because she and Will had betrayed him first. As she thought about this, she calmed down. Damon nodded to her and left. After saying goodbye to Miss Branto, Damon went to Wilder's house. He saw that the cars in the driveway were all smashed up. It would cost a fortune to fix. Wilder and his friends weren't happy. They knew they had to do something about Ziggy before he struck again. When they saw Damon come in, they quickly stood up. Then Wilder stepped forward and told him what had happened. Damon nodded to show that he understood. This was Drew and Andy's fault. They were the ones who brought Ziggy into this mess. Now that Ziggy was looking for trouble again, Damon was afraid that Drew must also be involved. The guy was probably upset that Nancy had interfered with the plan to get Damon arrested again. Fuel had been added to the fire. When would it end? After filling Damon in on the details, Wilder asked, What do you think we should do now? His friend Bruno was next to him and added, As long as you want us to attack, we won't back down. Although they knew that they'd be at a disadvantage fighting Ziggy's gang, they also knew it was better to face the issue head on. Their opponents wouldn't give up until the matter was settled. Damon smoked and thought for a while. Then he asked, How many people can Ziggy recruit to fight for him? Wilder lowered his head and thought for a moment. I can't be sure. After all, we haven't had many dealings with him in the past few years. Although we beat him up recently, he has been in charge of this territory for a long time. He is a famous gangster. All the gangsters in Myasin will support him. Compared to Ziggy, Wilder was small potatoes. It would be better to just apologize and beg for mercy. It was crazy to think they could fight him. Damon continued, Then how many people will fight for us? He was only a student, so he knew he couldn't recruit many people. But Wilder was a gangster. He should be able to call on a lot of people to help. Wilder replied, All in, I should be able to gather over a hundred people. However, less than half of them have real fighting experience. A lot of them are just friends who work construction or old friends from high school. He paused to light a cigarette before continuing. They often help me with the smaller tasks, but I'm afraid they won't stand a chance in a tough battle like this. I guess I could ask my friends who work construction to bring uh, excavators and bulldozers, but I'm afraid they won't have the courage to fight. Damon nodded and looked around at the rest of the guys in the room. Are you afraid? They all had arrogant expressions. Who among them hadn't seen blood before? What was there to be afraid of? If they got beaten up, they might end up in the hospital, but that wasn't so bad. If, on the other hand, they were labeled cowards, they'd never be able to show their faces in Myerson ever again. When Damon saw the expressions on their faces, he knew what they were thinking. He put out his cigarette and declared, Okay, how about this? Wilder, you go and call all the people you can think of. Try to get as many as possible. We need to create some hype. Tell people that if anyone gets hurt, I'll cover their medical bills. On top of that, I'll pay people $100 each just to show up. Anyone who dares to fight will get $500. We'll teach Ziggy who's the boss around here. Go big or go home, right? Otherwise, they will walk all over us in the future. Damon announced this in a grand manner. Now that he had secured financing for Everbright, he had a lot of money. What's more, New Century was about to start earning for him too. He had two cash cows. If they didn't have enough manpower to fight Ziggy, he would hire more. People would do anything for money. They would teach these bastards a lesson. Not only would they fight, they would also win. No one would mess with them ever again. Wilder felt relieved. He wanted to teach Ziggy a lesson, but he had been afraid that Damon would have concerns. Now that they had a plan, he clapped his hands and cheered. Everyone seemed convinced. Damon was meeting with Wilder and his gang. Ziggy wanted to fight them, and they were making plans for how best to deal with him. Damon had just offered to pay people to fight on their side. It was a good plan, so Wilder nodded. All right, then I will take care of everyone I know. We will take over the territory. I'll see you at the old junkyard in a week's time. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, Damon cautioned. First, I want you to come with me to the old junkyard and we'll take a look at the terrain. I want to see if there's anything we can use to our advantage. We need to be prepared. Then... He addressed the rest of Wilder's gang. Everyone call all your friends and tell them to call their friends too. Also, you should all find suitable weapons. Wilder, Bruno, and the others were just a bunch of toughs. They didn't understand why Damon wanted to look at the terrain beforehand. However, they trusted him, so they went along with his plan unquestioningly. 
Immediately, Wilder arranged for people to start recruiting mercenaries. After that, he, Bruno, and a few others went with Damon to the old junkyard to take a look. When they arrived there, they saw that the area was extremely spacious. The junkyard was next to a river and there was nowhere to hide. It was also a great place to dispose of bodies. Ziggy had indeed chosen the location well. Damon also felt satisfied with the location. He said to Bruno, Listen up and do as I say. I don't want any students participating in the fight. It's too dangerous. As for the workers at the construction site, recruit as many as you can. Also, I want to rent some excavators and bulldozers. Let's go big. It seemed like Damon already had a plan in mind, and Bruno and Wilder were eager to go along with it. Wilder then ordered his men to spread the news that they were taking over Ziggy's territory. On the day of the fight, they would call everyone they knew to come help settle the score. This area of Meyerson was usually peaceful. It had been years since anything like this had happened around here. Was a rival gang actually going to confront Ziggy and try to take over this territory? Ziggy was a famous boss. As for Wilder, most people hadn't heard of him before. His name was known only in the area around the university. Would he really dare to face off against a big shot like Ziggy? The people who knew Wilder also knew that he had found Ziggy before and ended up in jail. Now that he was out, he was coming for revenge. The upcoming fight was attracting attention from countless people. Some people even called the nearby police station to report it. However, the police weren't keen to get involved. They would rather let the gangsters fight it out amongst themselves and then swoop in to clean up afterwards. In any case, these people were all hooligans. The police were hoping that they'd kill each other off. In fact, even if these officers wanted to do something, they knew it would be difficult. The station was underfunded and it didn't have the resources to intervene. No, they would just let the gangsters fight it out. Since the old junkyard was on the outskirts of town, the brawl wouldn't bother anyone else. Ziggy was surprised that Wilder dared to openly oppose him. Did this guy have a death wish? Although he admired him, his ego was still bruised by what had happened last time. No matter what, he had to win this fight. His honor was at stake. He would beat Wilder's gang until they knelt down and begged for mercy. Then he would break a few bones, just for good measure. They wouldn't dare to be arrogant after that. At this moment, Ziggy was at a spa in a high-class hotel. An extremely beautiful woman was massaging his back. Ever since the attack at Sharky's, he had learned his lesson. Now he uses only high-end spas. Not only was the service at these places good, but security was also tight. This way, he no longer had to worry about hot-headed people showing up to harass him. A lackey named Bugsy was getting a massage beside him, and they were chatting together. From time to time, Ziggy's phone rang. Hello, Ziggy. I'm from the south end of town. I heard that you're going to fight some trash next week. If you need a hand, just say so. I guarantee that I can bring more than ten men to fight on your side. Hey, Ziggy, it's me, Meatball. I heard that someone has given you trouble. Will you just wait? I will ask my men to deal with them for you. Hey, boss, it's Jimbo from the Gold District. Do you have enough people? If not, I'll bring a few carloads. You have my support. Hey, Zig, Razor here. I'm in charge of the territory of the university. With so many people calling, Ziggy didn't even want to answer. These guys were just taking advantage of the situation. They wanted him to owe them a favor. If they helped him, naturally he would have to pay them back somehow. After all, everyone already knew who would win this battle. Ziggy had been famous in these parts for a long time, and his opponent, Wilder, was just a young punk fresh out of prison. There was no comparison. It was going to be a massacre. Everyone else wanted to take advantage of the opportunity. They knew Ziggy would reward anyone who fought on his behalf. They'd be stupid not to seize the chance. Although Ziggy didn't need their help, he couldn't openly refuse. After all, this was a fight. The more people on his side, the better, even if it was overkill. He wanted to totally crush Wilder and his gang. Moreover, if he rejected their offers to help, they might get upset. He didn't want to piss them off and have them switch sides on him. In any case, he could afford to owe a few more favors. Ziggy sat up and tipped the beautiful masseuse. Then he asked the man beside him, Bugsy, have you been keeping count? How many people are coming to support us next week? Bugsy calculated silently for a moment. Ever since Wilder accepted the challenge, Ziggy had received hundreds of phone calls from people pledging their support. In total, there were a few hundred people. So the man replied, Boss, there should be at least 300. Ziggy scratched his head and said helplessly, It's going to be so boring. With so many people, what's the point? I still have to compensate everyone who shows up. Wilder would be lucky if he could recruit a few dozen people. No matter how many people he brought, he didn't stand a chance. What was the point? The fight would be one-sided. Where was the suspense in that? Now Ziggy began to feel resentful about all the money he would have to fork out. He had no choice, though. Besides, at least he could show off his strength. 
To be able to gather hundreds of people to his cause was quite impressive. He could be proud of himself. In short, this battle was big news. It was the only thing the people in the underworld were talking about. Everyone wanted to see it. They all wanted to see Ziggy destroy this bunch of punks who didn't know their place. It had been a long time since things were this lively around here. Once everything was ready, all the two sides had to do was wait. The night before the battle, Damon asked Wilder to call everyone he could. There were over a hundred of them in total. He rented a banquet hall and told Wilder to invite them all for dinner. He wanted them to be in good spirits for the fight the next day. At dinner, there was no lack of alcohol. The men ate and drank their fill. Afterwards, they sat back and patted their stomachs. They promised that they would not let their leaders down. Damon raised his glass and said, Friends, winning tomorrow depends on you. As long as we can defeat Ziggy, his territory will become ours. You will be able to do whatever you want. Are you with us? Everyone was drunk, and they shouted excitedly as if the battle was already won. Seeing all these faces comforted Damon. He was confident that they would win. The next day, just after dawn, Damon told Wilder and his gang to meet him at the old junkyard to prepare. However, Ziggy had smashed all their cars, so they had to get there by other means. They drove vans, motorcycles, bicycles, and even construction equipment. It was already 10 o'clock in the morning by the time they arrived at their destination. Ziggy's men were starting to arrive too. To look intimidating, many of them drove luxury cars like BMWs, Bentleys, and even Ferraris. They were all well-known gangsters from Meyerson, and they were decked out in gold jewelry. They were heavily tattooed, and they all smoked expensive cigars. Ziggy's men looked at Damon and his gang as if they were mud. These kids couldn't even grow facial hair yet. Most of these punks were so skinny they looked malnourished. And had they ridden bicycles here? This was a joke. On the other hand, Ziggy's men were all big and muscular. It was obvious that they worked out. They not only had tattoos on their necks, but they also had them on their faces. They easily outnumbered the other side. Damon's side had just over a hundred people, while Ziggy's had over three hundred and counting. Another two hundred were still on their way here. The fight hadn't even started yet, but Damon's guys were getting cold feet. On top of that, many of them were hung over from drinking too much last night. Some had been puking all morning. The more cowardly ones even turned tail and ran. The battle had not yet begun, and both sides were still just posturing. Although Damon and Wilder were there, Ziggy had yet to arrive. At this moment, Ziggy was in his Land Rover on his way to the junkyard. Last night, he stayed up late and had fun in his hotel room with some women. He hadn't got up until 10 o'clock that morning, and he had almost forgotten about the fight. After all, in his opinion, victory was inevitable. Bugsy was driving the Land Rover, and Ziggy yawned and asked how many people had shown up. His lackey estimated that about five to 600 people were already there. After hearing that so many had come to help him, Ziggy felt somewhat proud. With so many on his side today, he would easily punish his opponents. Finally, he arrived at the scene. He saw that the large open space in the middle of the junkyard was jam-packed with luxury cars. His supporters were in high spirits, and they were all waiting for him. When they saw him arrive, they all clustered around to greet him. While greeting his brothers, he also glanced over at Damon's side. He saw a few sorry-looking punks who looked like they were still teenagers. These kids didn't stand a chance. Ziggy was a bit worried that his men were going to slaughter them. What if they all got killed? On the other hand, Damon was full of confidence. When Wilder, Bruno, and the others saw that Ziggy had arrived, they threw their cigarette butts away and walked towards him. Although they were outnumbered, they still felt confident. Seeing this amused Ziggy, and he scoffed. I didn't expect you to have the guts to come. You guys are all going to die. Damon smiled. How dare you smash my friend's car? You are asking for it. Why wouldn't I come? Ziggy nodded and said fiercely, Now I will give you a way out. Do you see all my men? We have you outnumbered. It's not a fair fight. As long as you and your friends kneel down and beg for mercy, I'll just break a few of your legs and let you go. Damon smirked coldly. Do you think we will give up so easily? I'm not here to negotiate, the gangster warned. Damon shook his head and retorted, Negotiate? You must be joking. I came here because I have no intention of submitting to you. Today, you will be the one begging for mercy. After saying this, he waved his hand and roared furiously. Get them! At these words, Damon's men all turned and retreated. The people on Ziggy's side broke out into laughter. They all mocked the other side for being cowards. These kids were all running away. Was there anything more ridiculous? Unfortunately, they weren't laughing for long. 
He watched helplessly as the other side suddenly began pushing iron frames of welded steel out from between the stacks of wrecked cars. These contraptions were catapults, and they were loaded with huge stones. Damon's side let loose the artillery, and the projectiles began raining down on Ziggy's men. The gangsters were caught off guard, and many were smashed by huge falling stones. Their heads were bleeding, and they cried out loudly in pain. They had underestimated this reckless group of kids. Blood splattered everywhere, and Damon's side cheered with excitement. They reloaded the catapults and fired again. The surrounding area was wide open, and there was nowhere for the gangsters to hide. The battle at the old junkyard had just begun. At first, Ziggy's men were cocky. To them, victory seemed certain, but they didn't know that Damon had a plan. When the fighting started, Damon's friends ran to get their secret weapons. Catapults. Damon shouted, Charge! The first wave of projectiles smashed into the opposing side, causing them to cry out in pain. Damon's side then took advantage of the distraction and charged forward with him in the lead. He had an iron rod in his hand. Wilder, Bruno, and the others were also prepared. They took out metal baseball bats and charged towards their opponents like wolves on sheep. Ziggy's men were dumbfounded. The falling rocks had caught them off guard and now the other side was charging at them with metal bats. Their enemy's momentum was unstoppable. Ziggy's men couldn't react in time and they scattered. They cried for help as they ran away. To be honest, most of the people who had shown up today were just here to cheer Ziggy on. They weren't here to actually fight. After all, Ziggy was a famous gangster. They hadn't expected the other side to stand a chance. Therefore, all these gangsters had shown up to watch the show, but they weren't prepared to get their hands dirty. The few who were here to fight saw how ruthless Damon and Wilder were, and they ran like cowards. Those who got caught were beaten miserably. They were left bleeding on the ground. The fallen men were then trampled by the hundreds fleeting behind them. In the end, they were so injured that they couldn't even scream. Anyone who mustered up the courage to resist was beaten black and blue. The gangsters scattered like scared beasts. Dust rose in all directions. It was a particular sight. It was a spectacular sight. It was like a stampede of panicked cattle. Ziggy had never seen anything like it before, and he was angry. The fight wasn't supposed to go like this. Morale was very important in such a situation. After Damon's side fired their first round of projectiles, morale on Ziggy's side weakened significantly. Now that the other side was attacking on foot, none of Ziggy's men dared to resist. After all, this wasn't how such fights were usually conducted. Ziggy knew that if people continued to run like this, he would be finished and he would lose his territory. As he thought of this, he made up his mind and shouted, Brothers, don't run! Think of what's at stake! All of you hold your ground! Hold your ground! They have fewer people, so we outnumber them. Everyone, attack together, and we will definitely win. But could he turn the tide with words alone? He knew that he had to do more, so he shouted, All right, who's with me? I will give everyone who fights $1,000 each as a reward. Everyone had a price especially those who worked in the underworld. So this move was indeed effective. The men who had previously been running away stopped and realized that they outnumbered their opponents. Now, Ziggy had also offered a reward for their help. In addition, they realized how embarrassing it would be if they lost to this group of punk kids. They wouldn't be able to show their faces in Meyerson again. Therefore, some of them turned to face their enemies. However, Damon was prepared for this move. When he saw that Ziggy's men had stopped running and were begging to hold their positions, he took out a megaphone and shouted, Friends, get ready! Bring out the big guns! When Damon's men heard this, they retreated like a tide. The opposing side thought that they were running in fear. They were about to give chase when they heard a rumbling sound. Then, a line of bulldozers and excavators came driving towards them. It was the construction equipment that Damon had rented. Many of the men on his side were construction workers, and in terms of fighting, they weren't very skilled. They were, however, great at driving bulldozers. These machines were stronger than any man. To the construction workers, these machines were extensions of their hands and feet. They knew all sorts of tricks and could use the machinery as weapons. In the huge metal beasts, they were unstoppable. Seeing this dumbfounded Ziggy and his gang, what sort of fight was this? Not only had their opponents used catapults, but now they were even using excavators. What was going on? Who had the courage to continue fighting in such a situation? This was like an all-out war against heavily armored tanks. Foot soldiers didn't stand a chance against tanks. They would certainly die. Moreover, 
Damon had pledged to take responsibility for anything that happened. If any of his men got hurt, he would reward them handsomely. The excavators and bulldozers rushed forward with a rumbling sound. When Ziggy saw this, he cried for his mother and ran for his life. The gangsters all cried out with despair. It was a wonderful sight to behold. The heavy machinery reached the open space in the middle of the junkyard. Many luxury cars were parked there and the gangsters hid behind them. These cars all belonged to Ziggy's men. There were BMWs, Mercedes Benzes, and Ferraris. Ziggy's Land Rover was parked in the very front. The gangsters had all laughed at Damon's friends for riding bicycles and driving minivans, but they weren't laughing now. Now, the bulldozers were bearing down on these expensive vehicles. Damon shouted to the construction workers, Show them what you can do! The excavator that was in the lead lowered its bucket and turned Ziggy's Land Rover into a pile of scrap metal. Seeing this made Ziggy's heart ache. The excavator swung its bucket and totally demolished two brand new Audis. It swung again and bent a Mercedes Benz in half. When the gangsters saw how fierce the excavator was, they were so scared that they wet their pants. At this moment, someone shouted in the distance. It turned out that a boat had just pulled up on the shore of the river. When it landed, armored men carrying various weapons jumped ashore and rushed to join the battle. Ziggy's men saw this and shouted in confusion, It's an ambush! Run! This was the final straw. The gangsters ran as fast as they could. Their only thought was to save themselves. Continuing to fight was the last thing on their minds. Many of them were already injured and couldn't escape in time. They lay on the ground as miserable as could be. The entire place was a mess. The cars were smashed to pieces and the ground was covered with injured men. Ziggy tried to run, but Damon rushed over and grabbed him by the collar. You aren't going anywhere. Then he punched him in the face and broke a few of his teeth. His nose was so crooked that even his mother wouldn't recognize him. When the other gangsters saw their boss had been captured, they knelt down and begged for mercy. No more, please, no more. We are good men. In the future, we'll do whatever you say. Please don't kill us. Everyone on Damon's side burst into laughter and held their heads high. They were outnumbered six to one, but they had still defeated their opponents. These nobodies had beaten many famous gangsters from Meyerson. If people found out, it would be incredibly embarrassing for Ziggy and his men. Damon and his friends could brag about this for the rest of their lives. Damon grabbed Ziggy's hair. Do you give up? The man begged. Yes, yes, I give up. From now on, you are the boss. Ziggy knew the situation better than the rest of his men. He knew he couldn't defeat Damon's fierce attack. If he didn't admit defeat, he would definitely end up injured. He knew that he didn't have a choice. After this, his reputation would be tarnished, but if he wanted to stay in town, he'd have to submit to Damon. Damon was a little surprised. He hadn't expected his opponent to give up so easily. Moreover, he hadn't expected Ziggy's men to go down so quickly either. Damon knew to quit while he was ahead, so he nodded and gave Wilder a look. Wilder understood his meaning and called off his gang. They didn't want their enemies to hold a grudge against them. Damon shouted for all to hear. In the future, remember who was in charge around here, okay? All the gangsters hurriedly nodded. He continued, From now on, my friend Wilder is in charge. All of Ziggy's territory belongs to him now. Then he turned back to Ziggy and said, What about the damage you caused to my friend's property, the cars you smashed, and so on? The gangster nodded vigorously. I'll give you the money. How much do you want? If I don't have enough, I'll give you all these cars as collateral. Damon and Wilder nodded. Seeing all these big shot gangsters kneeling on the ground was very funny. Wilder, Bruno, and the rest of their gang admired Damon even more than ever. If not for his careful planning, it would have been impossible for them to defeat Ziggy's 600 men. They had pulled it off. After that morning of bloody fighting, Damon's name became famous throughout the territory. News of the amazing win spread all across the city. Everyone on the streets was talking about this grand battle where the few defeated the many. It was really satisfying. That afternoon, all the emergency rooms and clinics in the area were full of injured men. The brawny gangsters were wrapped in bandages and medicated for pain. They looked like they had been beaten with baseball bats. However, when the doctors and nurses asked them what had happened, the gangsters knew better than to say. They all made excuses and said that they had accidentally injured themselves. As for those whose luxury cars were destroyed, they didn't dare to report it. If they ratted on Damon and Wilder, they'd never be able to show their faces in these parts again. When the police found out about this matter, they were relieved to hear that no one had died. Since no one had come forward to press charges, why investigate? The situation's resources were limited to begin with, and on top of that, 
they had many other cases waiting to be dealt with. They didn't have time to worry about gangsters fighting gangsters. Wilder's fame spread across the city. Everyone heard about how he had defeated Ziggy with ease. In light of this, the other bosses of the area were convinced and agreed to follow him. Damon, on the other hand, was back in the classroom studying peacefully. No one knew that this big event in the Meyerson underworld had anything to do with him. Finally, the summer was here. Another school year was over, and Damon packed his bags and left for summer vacation. His sophomore year was over. He didn't know how things were going between Casey Games and Silly Goose. He hadn't seen Miss Branto since the day that she had come looking for him on campus. However, he guessed that she must have a plan to deal with Will. Miss Branto was arrogant and ruthless, and she wouldn't hesitate to fire Will if she needed to. Furthermore, she had Silly Goose backing her, so it would be easy for her to deal with Damon's former business partner. Will would definitely find himself in a miserable state. If Damon's hunch was correct, Miss Branto would probably just fire Will. A big company like Silly Goose didn't need him to run things. If he was fired, it would be practically impossible for him to get rehired elsewhere. Despite this, Damon didn't have any pity for the guy. He remembered how Will had betrayed him. No matter the consequences, Will had brought this upon himself. Fiona didn't intend to travel this summer. As her third year approached, her course load was getting heavier. She was going to the capital to attend a special summer program for music. Nancy, on the other hand, visited Damon from time to time during this period. She wanted to talk more with him, but he always avoided her. He really didn't want to see her again. Quinn signed up for summer courses to study programming. He had the perseverance and the smarts to succeed in the field. He had even started helping Damon with some problems on the Astromar community website. The other boys in the dorm agreed to go on a trip with some of the girls from room 201. They were going hiking in Colorado. Meeting Nancy and Robert made Damon's relationship with his adoptive parents even stronger. In addition, his sister Selena was about to start 12th grade, so she needed someone to tutor her. Damon had aced his SATs, so he planned to personally tutor his sister. He wanted her to get into a good university. Liam also went home to New York that summer. Emmett, as well as many more of Damon's old classmates, were back in New York for the holidays too. Janice was organizing a reunion so everyone could meet up and hang out. When the holidays started, Frank gave Damon a call. His father had to move to New York for work, so he planned to spend some time there during the summer vacation. He looked forward to hanging out with Damon over the holidays. Frank had long admired him, and he was proud to call him a friend. Naturally, Damon was excited to see him this summer as well. He wondered if Emily would also be coming. The university semester had ended, but high school students were still in class. They would write their final exams at the end of the month, so Damon helped his sister prepare. Although she was finishing only 11th grade, her marks would still go on her transcript, so it was important she did well. Emmett had returned home earlier than Damon and the others. When the old friends finally met up, they found Emmett much changed. He seemed to have his life together. For the past two years, he had been studying pre-med, and he had a rather famous teacher. His studies were fulfilling and even had a girlfriend. She studied nursing, and she was a beautiful and lively soul. However, the most outstanding person among Damon's high school classmates was definitely Avery. It was summer vacation and Damon was at home in New York City. Many of his old high school classmates were back in town for the holidays too. He was hoping to run into Avery while he was here. Avery was now famous for her role in the television drama. Millions of viewers watched the show. It was incredibly popular and all the actors who played main characters had become famous. Although they weren't A-list celebrities, they were still well-known nationwide. They were worshipped by many adoring fans and targeted by the paparazzi. Although Avery had only the second biggest female role, she was even more popular than the leading female actor. Her name appeared in the entertainment headlines time and time again. In the media, she was called Meyerson's biggest talent and the campus belle. Everything she did became news. Damon's mother liked Avery's TV series a lot. She couldn't believe that one of the main actors in it had been her old neighbor. This was undoubtedly a huge shock to everyone from the neighborhood. Although Avery's parents had moved to a big mansion, her grandparents still lived in this poor part of town. Avery used to ride her bicycle down these alleyways, but now she rode around in a black Mercedes Benz. She had come a long way. Many neighbors had long known that she was destined for great things. This showed that they had good foresight. They just hadn't expected it to happen so quickly. Avery had always been the girl next door, who the neighbors admired. Other parents secretly wished their children could be more like her. When they heard that she had been accepted at the Meyerson College of Music, they were all happy. She was a living proof that people could work hard and rise above their circumstances. However, at this moment, 
Most other people her age were trying to find summer jobs or internships. Avery, on the other hand, was already a big star. When the other women her age thought about this, they felt inadequate. Even if they worked hard their whole lives, they still might never reach the same heights. Of course, none of this had anything to do with Damon. To everyone else, he was still the same as ever. He was just an ordinary student. It had been two years since he aced his SATs, and most people had forgotten. Occasionally, he would meet an old family friend around the neighborhood, and they would tease him in a friendly tone. The genius has returned! During the vacation, he, Emmett, and Liam would ride bicycles along the familiar paths beside the riverside. They hung out on Liam's balcony, and they played computer games when they were in the mood. One afternoon, Damon had just finished his lunch and was about to watch some news. Then, Liam called and told him to come over later. His parents were out so they could have a party. By the time Damon arrived, Emmett and Liam had already prepared the food and drinks. They were waiting for him to join them. The three of them drank and chatted happily. Liam told them about the high school reunion that was planned for next weekend. The three of them were planning to go together. After that, they started talking about Avery. They were all a little shocked by how famous she had become. Liam ate a handful of chips and said, Wow, I'm the loser of our friend group? You guys have all achieved a lot. And Avery is a big celebrity. I'm going nowhere. And you guys are all leaving me in the dust. Emmett said, What are you talking about? You guys all go to school in Meyerson. Liam, your life is way more interesting than mine. Liam smiled and turned to Damon. Hey, it's too bad that Avery turned you back down in high school, huh? Otherwise, you'd have dated a famous actor. He chuckled, then continued. But I heard that your current girlfriend isn't so bad. Veronica mentioned something about her before. She goes to the College of Music as well, right? His tone was uncertain, so Damon nodded. When the other guys saw this, they turned green with envy. Liam went on. You lucky bastard. You've got to help us single guys out. Why haven't you introduced me to any of your girlfriend's friends? I'm relying on you. The next day, Damon and Liam went to check out the venue for the upcoming high school reunion. Janice, their old class president, was organizing it. Summer was a busy time for events, so she had to book the venue well in advance. Otherwise, everywhere would already be taken. She had booked the banquet hall at a rather famous hotel called The Dynasty. Another classmate's parents were managers there, so they had given Janice a discount on the fee. Damon and Liam wanted to go and see if there was anything they could do to help prepare for the event. The Dynasty was a five-star hotel, and it was beautifully built. When the two guys arrived, they ran into Brandon Meeks, the classmate whose parents worked at the hotel. After chatting casually for a while, Brandon broke the news that there was a problem with the booking for the reunion. Business was booming, and the hotel had accidentally double-booked the banquet hall for that day. On top of that, it was booked solid for the next two months. As they spoke, they heard a commotion coming from one of the rooms off the lobby. People were shouting, and then a beautiful server ran out in tears. Brandon's mother came over to see what was wrong. Mrs. Meeks, the server exclaimed. These customers are being so difficult. Mrs. Meeks frowned and then sighed. I know they are bad customers, but we can't afford to offend them. Brandon asked, Mom, who are they? They're a bunch of gangsters, but they are regular customers, and they spend a lot of money here. We just have to put up with them. Mrs. Meeks sighed. She knew that these people were rude and unreasonable, but there wasn't much she could do. They were all famous gangsters, and they were very well connected. She would rather not cause any trouble. As they were talking in the lobby, a man suddenly threw open the door to the room in question. He wasn't wearing a shirt, and his body was covered in serious-looking injuries. He roared angrily. Where's our server? We are paying a fortune to be here. If you don't serve me, I'll never come back. When he saw the server chatting with Mrs. Meeks, his face turned red, and he cursed. Damn it, why are you out here? Hurry up and bring me my drink. He glared at the woman, and the server was so frightened that she nearly screamed. Mrs. Meeks said, Excuse me, this is uncalled for. Please calm down, sir. She wanted to stand up for her employee. However, the man angrily shouted, Get lost! Then he raised his hand as if he were about to hit the woman. Damon saw this and acted fast. He reached out and grabbed the man while demanding, What makes you think you can attack the staff here? The man was shocked. He was a strong guy, but he couldn't escape Damon's grip. Normally, it took more than three grown men to hold him back. He had never met anyone stronger than himself before. But today, this young man was restraining him with just one hand. On top of that, this kid's grip was so strong that the man felt like his bones were breaking. He forgot all about the server and roared, Let me go! You don't have the guts to fight me! Damon released him. At this moment, a thin man walked out of the room to see what was going on. He asked, Joey, what are you doing? Come and drink! The shirtless man was overjoyed that his backup had arrived. He pointed at Damon and said, 
Bruno, this guy's looking for trouble. Who dares to mess with us? The thin man exclaimed. He didn't look very strong, but he radiated an intimidating energy. He looked at Damon and was about to tear a piece of him off when suddenly he realized who he was looking at. He was stunned. Huh? Mr. Walker? Bruno? Damon was shocked as well. It turned out that this skinny man was Wilder's friend Bruno. He hadn't expected to meet him here. Joey was also stunned. Bruno, you know him? Damn it, this is the guy who helped defeat Ziggy at the old junkyard. Bruno's expression was serious. Mr. Walker, why are you here? Come and drink with us. Let me toast you. As he spoke, he rubbed his head sheepishly. Everyone could see how much he respected Damon. Joey finally understood what was going on. He had heard all about what happened to the famous gangster Ziggy. News about it had spread like wildfire and even people in New York City knew. After all, hundreds of people had been at the battle. The victory was legendary. 100 people had defeated 600. When Bruno returned to New York, all the gangsters here wanted to befriend him. After all, his gang had successfully taken over Ziggy's territory. It was an impressive feat. Anyone who was friends with Bruno was safe. On top of that, they would also have the green light to do business in Meyerson. It was no wonder that they all wanted to get on his good side. Everyone had heard about Damon too. They knew he was extremely powerful, but they hadn't expected him to be so young. When Joey realized who Damon was, he became excited. He looked at him with admiration. Damon had just subdued Joey with one hand, so the man knew that he was something special. No matter how stupid the gangster was, he knew that Damon was a force to be reckoned with. He didn't dare to doubt Bruno's claim. Bruno himself was revered in the underworld. He had gone to Meyerson to escape arrest after committing a crime. That year, he had caused a lot of trouble in New York. He was wild and unruly. If this kid named Damon had Bruno's respect, he must be no ordinary person. They sure came young these days. Joey quickly rubbed his bare chest and tried to laugh things off. Mr. Walker, I'm really sorry. I didn't recognize you. I hope I didn't offend you just now. How about this? Let me buy you a drink. Let me make it up to you. Damon shook his head. Thanks, but I can't. I have something I need to do. You guys go ahead. But... Bruno protested. He wanted to hang out with him for a while longer, but he saw that Damon was busy, so he didn't force him. So after chatting for a few more minutes, the two gangsters returned to the room. Liam and Brandon looked at Damon in a daze. Liam stammered. Mr. Walker? Damon, when did you become a gangster? Damon shook his head. I'm not. I just happened to help them out before. It's not as mysterious as you think. His friend was shocked, but all he said was, Oh. He guessed that he shouldn't be surprised. Although he had known Damon since childhood, his friend was constantly surprising him. The guy had aced his SATs out of nowhere, and now he was finding out that the guy was respected among people of the underworld. He had many questions that he wanted to ask, but he remained silent. After chatting with Mrs. Meigs for a while longer, they were able to come up with a solution for the double booking. After that, the three of them bid farewell to Brandon and his mother and prepared to leave. As they were walking away, a young man suddenly ran over in a panic and said, Mrs. Meigs, it's bad. Someone is causing trouble. The manager's expression became serious. Why were so many things going wrong today? What's happening? She asked. I don't know, ma'am. You better come and take a look. While the young man was talking, a woman walked in and started making a big fuss. She waved her hand and shouted, I want to speak to your manager. You are incompetent. If you can't accommodate my brother's wedding, I'll have your hotel shut down. The woman's tone was so arrogant that Mrs. Meeks couldn't hold her tongue. Excuse me, ma'am. If you have something to say, please be polite. Don't threaten my staff. If you have a reservation at our hotel, we will do our best to make your brother's wedding perfect. However, if you don't have a reservation, I can't help you. We are already fully booked. When the woman heard Mrs. Meigs talking to her like this, she was furious. Why are you all standing around? You'd better believe that I'll have your hotel shut down for good. The woman walked over and stood right in front of the manager. She waved her finger in Mrs. Meigs' face and said, Do you know who I am? My uncle is the mayor, and he can shut you down. If you don't believe me, just wait and see. Miss Meigs didn't believe her. Lady, we are operating a legal business here. Besides, we are fully booked. The manager said this tactfully. She was trying to defuse the situation, but it didn't work. The woman suddenly roared angrily. Ma'am, I will say this one more time. If you don't find space for my event, your hotel will be finished. As she said this, they heard the sound of many footsteps rushing down the corridor. A group of young men dressed in black leather pants barged in. The young man in the front had a vicious expression. When Damon saw him, his entire body trembled and he stared fixedly at the man. The guy was an old acquaintance, and Damon hoped he wouldn't recognize him. 
Damon was about to leave the Dynasty Hotel when a woman arrived and got in a confrontation with the manager. She was being incredibly unreasonable, and she wanted Mrs. Meigs to find space for her brother's wedding, which was happening only three days from now. Then, a bunch of tough-looking guys arrived to back her up. Damon recognized the leader of the gang. It was Noah Miller, the guy who had stolen his high school girlfriend, Lily. Damon would never forget what happened that fateful day in front of the school. It was the turning point of his life. Everything that he had now was all thanks to Noah. He had heard that Noah was the son of a powerful dignitary. Who would have thought that they'd run into each other here? Noah, on the other hand, didn't notice him. He, followed by his group of hooligans, walked up to the front desk and slammed his fist down on it. He roared, Now do as I say. I'll give you one chance. Can I hold my wedding here three days from now? As soon as he finished speaking, the group of hoodlums behind him took jackknives from their pockets and fingered them menacingly. If the manager didn't agree, they weren't afraid to use them. Obviously, when Mrs. Meeks saw the knives, she was scared to death. She recognized Noah. He was a famous gangster in New York City. More importantly, she knew he had connections with the local government. His cruelty was well known, and no one wanted to offend him. The owner of the dynasty had specifically told Mrs. Meeks that if Noah Miller ever showed up here, he should be given whatever he wanted. Otherwise, there would be big trouble. Therefore, when Mrs. Meeks realized who this man was, her demeanor immediately changed. She just nodded and said, Yes, sir. Aha, uh-huh, Damon thought to himself. So it was Noah who was getting married. The manager continued, Mr. Miller, I guarantee that we'll find somewhere to hold your wedding. We will arrange one of our best venues for you. Miss Meeks had no choice but to accommodate him. She would have to cancel another event to make space. That's more like it, Noah declared with satisfaction. He gave the manager a fierce glare. Suddenly, he caught sight of Damon, who was standing to one side. Huh? What are you doing here? Damon smiled and looked at him. So, we meet again. He sighed to himself. His old enemy was getting married. He was marrying Lily. If so, how could she stand to live with this beast? Although he didn't have feelings for her anymore, he still found the thought of her marrying this guy humiliating. How could he ignore this? Noah looked at him in bewilderment. The gangster remembered sicking his group of thugs on Damon. Why was this piece of trash looking at him like it had never happened? Didn't this kid remember the pain and the embarrassment? Noah smiled coldly and muttered, I thought I taught you a lesson last time. How dare you stand there and look at me like that? I'm not in a good mood today, so I'll take it out on you. As he spoke, he cracked his knuckles and began walking towards Damon. What are you doing? Someone suddenly shouted angrily. Bruno was walking across the lobby. He had been on his way to the bathroom when he encountered this scene. He ran over to intervene. When Noah saw him, he was stunned for a moment. He could tell that Bruno was a gangster too, so he declared, I'll give you 10 seconds to get out of here. It's not too late to save yourself. If you don't leave, I'll break your legs. Bruno looked at him with disdain. I'd like to see you try, if you have the guts. The other men who were drinking in the room off the lobby heard the commotion and stuck their heads out the door. Joey came out, followed by the rest of his friends. He shouted, What's wrong? What's going on here? An instant later, a dozen more men rushed out of the room and into the lobby. Noah's side had only five people and they were at a disadvantage. The gangster had sharp eyes and he realized this right away. He said to Damon, Oh, no wonder you're so arrogant. You have backup. Joey crossed his arms in front of his chest and stated, What, you want to fight? Noah glared at them all and sneered, Good, you have guts. Then he waved his hand at his gang of men. Let's go. He knew better than to fight when the odds were against him. He thought to himself, Just you wait. We'll see who has the last laugh. He motioned to his sister, and they all left. Bruno gave Damon a business card and said, If you need anything while you were in New York, just call me. After saying goodbye to everyone, Damon left with Liam and Emmett. The two guys also knew who Noah was. They knew all about how the gangster had stolen their friend's girlfriend, but he didn't know that he had Damon beaten up. Liam looked at Damon worriedly. However, Damon just shrugged and said nothing. He just wanted to avoid running into Noah again in the future. But some things were unavoidable. The high school reunion was in three days, the same day as Noah's wedding. Damon knew that his next run-in with the gangster would not be as simple. After parting ways with Liam and Emmett, he began to think up a plan. If he wanted to gain the upper hand, he had to strike first. He wanted to crush Noah so that he'd never have to deal with the guy ever again. It didn't take long for him to think of an idea. He took out his phone and called Bruno. Hey, are you free three days from now? Get some guys together. No problem, Bruno replied. He would handle everything. He wasn't in his own territory, but he still knew a lot of people. 
Damon asked for his address. He wanted to come over so that they could go over the plan in person. After hanging up the phone, Damon smiled to himself. Noah's wedding would be unforgettable. When he went home that afternoon, his parents told him that there was a special parent-teacher conference tomorrow for people whose children were going into 12th grade. Selena was going into her senior year of high school, and the school was holding an info session for parents. 12th grade was an important year for high school students. Unfortunately, Mr. and Mrs. Walker both had to work tomorrow. They had just started new jobs, so they weren't able to get time off. This meant that neither of them could attend. Mr. Walker turned his gaze to his son and asked if he'd go in their stead. Now that Damon was in university, he was considered an adult. It was acceptable for him to attend the info session on their behalf. He nodded. All right, I will go for you, but you shouldn't overwork yourselves. Those new jobs of yours don't pay very well. You may as well just stay home and rest. I can give you some money to start a business of your own. Damon had told his parents that he earned good money programming. He claimed that it was just enough to cover his sister's expenses. Of course, he didn't dare to tell his parents how much money he actually had. His parents had worked all their lives and they were still poor. Damon was afraid that if they knew how much was in his bank account, they wouldn't be able to bear it. His parents were both very happy that their son was so generous, but they refused to take his money. His mother shook her head and said, "'Silly child, save your money. You will need it in the future after you graduate. Your father and I are still young, so we can earn our own money. We want to be self-sufficient.'" Later that night, Mrs. Walker commented to her husband, "'Our son has finally grown up. Oh, some of the neighbors think that Avery is the brightest young person from our street, but in my eyes, Damon is just as talented. Mrs. Walker sighed again. Avery was now a superstar. She had earned both fame and fortune. To most ordinary people, wealth and fame was more important than being smart. Avery and Damon would make a great couple, her husband replied. Mrs. Walker rolled her eyes and chided, Don't even think about that. Who knows if Avery will ever show her face around here again? I heard that her grandpa and grandma aren't doing well. They are thinking about selling their house and moving to the mansion. Mr. Walker didn't say anything else. After dinner, Damon was about to tutor Selena when someone knocked on the door and called, Hello, is anyone home? Mrs. Walker heard the enthusiastic voice outside the door. She knew at once that it was Avery. She opened the door and exclaimed, Wow, the big star is back. You must be here for Damon, right? Thank you, but just call me Avery. Yes, I'm here to see Damon. I have some questions I want to ask him. Mrs. Walker escorted the guest into the kitchen. Damon, you have a visitor. Come and say hello. Selena and Damon were sitting at the kitchen table studying. Selena saw Avery and rolled her eyes. Then she smiled and said, Hey, bro, looks like you're too busy to help me tonight. It's okay, though. Go and hang out with your friend. Damon's sister more or less understood what her brother was thinking. She also quite liked Avery, especially now that Avery's TV show had become so popular. Selena admired her and she hoped that Avery and her brother would hook up. Damon nodded to his sister and led Avery out to the yard. She had a guitar with her. Once they were alone together, she blinked at him innocently with her big, beautiful eyes and asked, Could you give me some pointers on guitar? I'm having trouble with some new songs. Can you help me? He nodded. All right. She hesitated for a moment, then said, I don't want to disturb your sister's studies. Why don't we go and sit by the river? Sure, let's go. Damon stuck his head back into the house and told his mother that he was going out. Have fun, she replied. On their way out of the yard, Avery saw Mr. Walker's bicycle leaning on the fence and smiled. It's quite a way to the river and it's already getting late. Do you want a bike there? I can ride on the handlebars. It was six o'clock at night, but because it was summer, the sun still hadn't set. If they stayed out late though, they'd have to walk back in the dark. Mr. Walker's bicycle was a bit old, but it was strong and it had wide handlebars. Damon nodded and got on the bike. Avery looked joyful as she hopped on the front. She balanced her guitar case across her knees and Damon drove them along the small path towards the riverbank. The journey was a little bumpy, so Avery leaned back on him for support. Even though this was only for practical reasons, their minds started racing and their hearts beat a little faster. They could feel the subtle intimacy of the moment. A cool breeze blew over them, fanning away the heat of the summer evening. It was an indescribably comfortable feeling. They passed some familiar faces along the way and these people greeted them warmly. These old neighbors teased them, calling Avery, Big Star, and Damon, Mr. Smarty Pants. Avery was famous now, and everyone knew her. Although she never mentioned it herself, she was now known from coast to coast. As long as she could land one or two more big roles, she would eventually become famous all over the world. As for Damon, although he had aced his SATs, he hadn't seemed to have done much since. However, all the neighbors remembered his achievement, and he was a legend in these parts. When people saw him and Avery heading to the river together, they nodded in approval. 
these two were indeed a good match. Over the years, Damon and Avery had even joked about being childhood sweethearts. After all, they had grown up together. Now Avery was slim and graceful and her long hair reached her waist. Damon, on the other hand, was tall, handsome, and muscular. He had gotten into a top university and she had gone off to become famous. Their futures were bright. If the two of them got together, it would be the perfect love story. When they arrived at the riverside, the sun was already low. The sunset was like fire illuminating the sky. It was truly beautiful. Damon leaned the bicycle on a rock, and the two of them sat by the river and watched the glow of the setting sun. The water gently lapped the shore. Avery had a longing look in her eyes as she softly exclaimed, Wow, it's so beautiful. Damon was also quite enjoying the peace of this moment, especially since Avery was sitting beside him. He said, Tell me what you need help with and I'll teach you what I know. Thank you. She nodded and took the guitar out of its case. It turned out that she wanted help with a song that she had written herself. She wasn't satisfied with some parts, so she wanted his advice. Although Damon's musical career was over, he still couldn't hide his talent. Avery liked his songs, Time Flies and Dawn, a lot. She used to listen to them every night before she fell asleep. Moreover, Levi, who was a famous musician now, had achieved glory thanks to Damon. So Avery was confident that he could help her with her music. He asked her to play the song for him so he could listen carefully for anything that sounded wrong. Although Avery had been busy with her acting career recently, this hadn't hindered her progress with music. She started by playing an old folk song that they often listened to back in high school. It brought back old memories. She missed her hometown a lot. Damon wasn't as nostalgic, but there was still a hint of sadness in his voice when he talked about high school. His past was indeed far from perfect, but he still liked talking about it with Avery. After talking for a while, she played her new songs for him. He was surprised to hear how sad some of her lyrics were. Damon and Avery were sitting together by the river. She had asked him to help her out with her new songs. She played them for him and he listened. He hadn't expected her lyrics to be so sorrowful. After listening to her play, he gave her some suggestions. With his advice, she felt much more confident. How about I spend some more time working on your songs for you, he offered. They are very good. He spoke from the bottom of his heart. When she heard this, her eyes lit up and she smiled sweetly. That'd be great, thank you. He nodded and couldn't help but ask, Why did you suddenly start writing such sad songs? It seems out of character for you. Did someone break your heart recently? Avery turned her head in surprise. She hadn't expected him to get it. He really understood her. She didn't know how to respond, so she stared at him blankly for a moment. It was as though she was taking a mental photograph of him. After a few seconds, she said, I might be leaving this place soon, and I miss it already. Leaving? What do you mean? He asked. His heart skipped a beat, and he suddenly felt very uncomfortable. He didn't want to lose her. She gazed out over the river. The sun had already set, and the stars were beginning to twinkle in the sky. She explained, My grandparents haven't been in good health lately. My parents want them to sell their house and move into the mansion with them. After that happens, I probably won't get many chances to come back to this neighborhood. Damon remembered hearing his mother speculate about this before. Was she right? Avery's parents had moved away from the neighborhood a long time ago. The only reason why Avery still spent time here was because of her grandparents. Her grandfather and grandmother still lived here. However, if they moved, she would have no reason to come back anymore, aside from visiting her old friends. However, such occasions would likely be rare. They all had grown up now and all had busy lives. Eventually, they would graduate from university and walk separate paths. Avery was rich and famous now. Her journey would take her to many new and exciting places. She had to move on. It was only a matter of time. No wonder she had written this song. When are your grandparents leaving? We will start moving their things this week. Hearing this news, Damon couldn't help but feel gloomy. He hadn't expected them to be going so soon. Although they both studied at the same university and they ran into each other from time to time, they were not as close as they'd once been. Damon had felt her drifting away from him over the years. It would be a lie to say that this didn't make him sad. He had many memories with her. She was his first crush, and he still had feelings for her. She had been his childhood friend for many years. He remembered the night that he had confessed his love to her as if it were yesterday. This news was so sudden that he found it hard to accept. Avery saw the look of regret on his face. <sighs> the atmosphere was a little dull for a moment. Then she stood up and said, We will still see each other in Meyerson, right? Let's bike around a bit and remember the old times. I'm going to miss this place. 
After all, she had grown up here. All right, he agreed. He climbed back on the handlebars and they rode around the neighborhood. Perhaps it was just to keep her balance, but she leaned back against him as they rode. The wind blew her hair and it tickled his face. After riding in silence for a while, she asked, How is your relationship going with Fiona? Are you guys good? Yes, we are. Why? Can't I ask? I care about you. She and I are doing great. When Damon spoke about Fiona, he got a dreamy look on his face. Avery saw this and knew he was in love. A sad look flashed in her eyes, but she quickly forced a smile and said, I think I'm falling in love too. Damon kept paddling the bike, but his body trembled. I didn't know you had a boyfriend. Why didn't you tell me before? She rolled her eyes at him. Do I have to inform the whole world about my private life? He thought about this and realized that she was right. His words had been too rash. She looked at him and forced another smile. So, do you want me to tell you about my relationship? He shook his head. He knew that it was only a matter of time before Avery fell in love with someone. He thought about how she had rejected him in the past, and he wondered what kind of guy she had fallen for. Whoever it was, he must be exceptionally outstanding, right? As he pondered this, he couldn't help but ask, Who is it? He's around six feet tall, and he's very handsome, she replied breezily. And his eyes are especially charming. He quite likes to play basketball, and he always stands up for what is right. He's very brave. On top of that, he's incredibly smart. Although he's from an ordinary family, I believe that he's destined for great things. Damon smiled. Sounds like you finally found your Prince Charming. He didn't make the connection. He knew that he had to get over his feelings for her. He felt a twinge of regret, but he still wanted her to find a husband, get married, and have children one day. It was all part of life, and he didn't want to stand in the way of her happiness. However, Avery didn't look like a woman who was in love. On the contrary, she seemed to be hiding something. Damon could sense sadness in her, but what exactly was she sad about? He didn't know, nor would he ask, and Avery wasn't going to tell him. Sometimes I wish I could turn back time. If I could, I wouldn't make the same mistake again, she suddenly murmured. Her voice was filled with sadness. Damon didn't know why she had said such a thing, so he didn't reply. They rode down the familiar streets together. It was already late at night. Then, Damon asked, Hey, do you want to go hang out with Liam? We could play games. After all, she was leaving soon. She would want to say goodbye to their other friends as well. It seemed to him that Liam and Avery had a close relationship. There was no reason for her not to want to bid farewell to Liam, right? Unexpectedly, she shook her head and said, It's late. Why don't you just drop me off at the next street? He nodded and slowed the bike. Avery didn't say anything else. When they reached the street corner, she hopped off. Damon asked, Are you going to the high school reunion? She nodded. What about you? Yes, I'll see you there. After hearing that Avery was also going, he suddenly felt warm inside. He watched her turn and walk off down the empty street. She gradually disappeared into the darkness. Then she suddenly turned around and called from afar. Damon, if I really leave, will you still remember me? He thought this was a strange thing for her to ask, but he nodded and replied, I'll remember you. He could never forget her. After all, she was very special to him. Thank you, she called back before finally turning the corner at the end of the street. Damon rode the bike home. Along the way, he thought about her parting words. Why had she asked that question? After they parted ways, Damon kept thinking about what she had said. Something about the way she had described her boyfriend stuck in his mind. Now that he thought about it, the qualities that she had described all seemed very familiar. They sounded a lot like him. But he knew he was just imagining things. Avery was on a whole different level than he was. Plus, she had rejected him before. There was no way she was describing him, right? He was happy for her, though. He was glad that she had fallen for someone from a humble background. He hoped that their relationship would work out, and they could build a beautiful future together. He sincerely wished her the best. It was already 10 o'clock in the evening when he returned home. His mother was sitting at the kitchen table with Selena. Selena was still studying, but when she saw Damon return, she put down her pen and looked at him with a smile. Why were you out so late? What did you and Avery do? We were just talking, he replied. His sister's face was full of disbelief. Then she asked mysteriously, Are you dating Avery? You have to tell me. That's nonsense. How could I possibly date a big star like Avery? <laughs> I think it's possible, Selena retorted. After all, you aced your SATs and got into Meyerson University. That's pretty impressive. She blinked at him innocently and continued, I saw the way that Avery was looking at you earlier. Don't tell me that she doesn't have feelings for you. 
He could see that arguing with her was pointless, so he helplessly patted his sister's head and went to take a shower before going to bed. After lunch the next day, Damon rode his father's bike to the high school, and Selena rode on the handlebars. When they arrived, Damon looked at the entrance to the school with a smile. He remembered being a student here not long ago. He had been expelled during 12th grade, but in the end, he finished high school with flying colors. He was all grown up now, so it was interesting to think back on those days. They walked past the parking lot and saw all kinds of fancy cars parked here. It was even more luxurious than the car exhibition last year. The standard of living in this part of town had clearly risen over the past several years. Selena was one of the few students whose family didn't own a car. Damon was wheeling his bicycle into the parking lot when a security guard ran over waving his arms. You can't park your bike here. Go somewhere else. Damon frowned. But this is the parking lot. Why can't I park my bike here? The guard didn't say anything for a moment. Then he replied, Your bike will get in the way. Go and park it on the street somewhere. Of course, Damon was very unhappy to hear this. At this moment, a white BMW suddenly drove over and pulled into the spot where he was about to park his bike. Then, two girls who were in the back seat of the car pointed at Selena and snickered. Her parents are poor. They can't even afford a car. It's so embarrassing. Selena heard them and immediately turned her face away. She couldn't be bothered with these people. Damon guessed that the girls were probably his sister's classmates. Why did they look down on her so much? The girls' parents also looked at Damon and Selena with disdain. Their sense of superiority was unbearable. People could be such snobs. Why don't we park the bike further away? Selena suggested shyly. Getting to the parent-teacher conference was more important than arguing with these people. Her brother shook his head. Not yet. Let me make a call. After saying this, he took out his phone. Hello? Is this the police? I'd like to report an incident of harassment. Please come quickly. Selena was staring at him with her mouth open. Then she laughed. <laughs> Damon, you are such a troublemaker. However, she felt very relieved. She didn't like the way that these people were treating them either. Her classmates were jealous of her beauty and smarts, so they often mocked her for being from a poor family. Although she never fought back, she still remembered everything they said. She was amused to see her brother teach them a lesson. Not long after, the police arrived and took Damon's statement. Although there wasn't much that the police could do, they still gave a warning to the people involved. They felt embarrassed to be called out on their bad behavior. After the police left, Damon parked his bike right in front of the security guard and walked into the school with Selena. The guard glared at them as they left. After walking into the school, Damon suddenly saw a familiar face. It was Mr. Ezra, and he was sweeping the floor in the hallway. Hadn't he been a teacher before? Why was he cleaning the school now? Seeing her brother's confused expression, Selena smiled sweetly and explained, After you got expelled, something crazy happened. The principal heard that you aced your SATs, and he was so furious with Mr. Ezra that he fired him. However, since he worked here for many years, they let him stay on as a janitor. As she spoke, Selena looked at Mr. Ezra with disgust. She was kind by nature, but she knew how to hold a grudge. Back then, this guy had gotten her brother expelled. Damon had almost missed out on writing his SATs because of it. Mr. Ezra had gotten what he deserved. As for Damon, the man had caused him a lot of trouble, so he didn't feel sorry for him either. In his opinion, Mr. Ezra wasn't qualified to be a teacher anyways. They still had half an hour before the parent-teacher conferences, so Damon decided to walk around the school for a bit with his sister. After all, he used to study here, so he wanted to look around. When they arrived at the gymnasium, they saw some boys playing basketball. The gym had been renovated since Damon went to school here. In the past, the basketball court had been full of bumps and divots. He hadn't expected to find it completely resurfaced less than two years later. Hey, you still play basketball, right? Selena asked. We have time to kill. Why don't you go play? Selena had been in middle school when Damon played high school basketball, but she often came to watch his games. She wanted to see if he had improved. Damon was at his old high school to attend his sister's parent-teacher info session. They still had half an hour until the meeting, so they went to check out the new gym. Selena suggested that her brother shoot some hoops while they waited. Damon smiled at his sister and went to get a ball. Then he dribbled around the court to warm up. Back when he went to school here, this was his favorite place to hang out. Yo, is that you, Selena? Someone called from the other side of the gym. Who are you here with? Is that your uncle? The person laughed rudely. A group of cool-looking teens were sitting on the bleachers, and they eyed Selena with malicious looks. Damon's eyes were sharp, and he recognized the two girls from the parking lot among them. The comments had come from the mouth of a red-haired girl. A blonde-haired young man with them piped up. 
Tinsley, what are you talking about? That doesn't look like her uncle. It's clearly her father. The laughter became even more unrestrained. A kid with green hair and an earring opened his mouth next. Selena, don't look at me like that. Tinsley says that your family doesn't even have a car. Is that true? Why don't you just date Hugo? He scoffed, motioning to the blonde-haired guy next to him. He's rich and his father is powerful. I bet that one night with him pays more than your parents make in a month. Hearing their insults angered Selena. She was so angry that her body trembled. This is my brother, you losers. Sure he is. I believe you. Damon's eyes glinted with a cold light as he shot back. Who asked your opinion? All of you, stand up. Hugo stood up and glared at Damon arrogantly. Selena, what did your brother just say to me? If he has something to say, then tell him to say it to my face. Otherwise, just piss off. Damon smiled coldly. Apologize to my sister, or else. The arrogant young man laughed strangely. Who do you think you are? How dare you talk to me like that? You were asking for it. It seemed like Hugo thought he was the boss of this school. What kind of person dared to talk back to him? Selena's brother obviously didn't know who his father was. If he did, he wouldn't dare to talk back to him. The green-haired kid stepped onto the court. Don't offend Hugo. You'll regret it. Apologize to him or else I'll make you. The other students on the bleachers all got up and surrounded Damon. They wanted to teach him a lesson that he'd never forget. Selena was scared to death. She knew that these students were bad kids. They often got in fights and they had beaten up numerous classmates before. However, they were from prominent families and they never seemed to face consequences. Now that Damon was standing up to them, they definitely wouldn't let it go. Selena didn't want anything to happen to her brother. She pulled at his sleeve and tried to get him to leave. However, he didn't move. He stood his ground and stared down the group of rich kids. This was the calm before the storm. Sure enough, before Hugo could say another word, Damon swung at his head and shouted, Learn some respect! Hugo was caught off guard, and Damon hit him right in the face. His eyes were so swollen that he could barely open them. The green-haired kid was furious when he saw Hugo get hit. How dare you hit him? He shouted. Get him, gang! The girls who were with them screamed in excitement. Their group liked to beat people up together, and they did it often. On the contrary, Selena screamed in fear. She thought her brother was going to die, but she could see that he still looked calm and composed. He pushed her away from the crowd so that she wouldn't get hurt. Then, he rushed towards the group of punks like a predator on prey. His fists were not to be trifled with. The green-haired kid was the next to rush forward. Damon knocked his teeth out. Then, he kicked both opponents and sent them flying across the floor. Two more guys came at Damon from both sides, but they didn't phase him. He moved extremely fast and punched them both, one after the next. They fell to the ground crying for their parents. In less than ten seconds, Damon had finished off all of his attackers. Selena's eyes were wide. She hadn't realized that her brother was so powerful. As for the other girls, they stared at Damon in awe and fear. Now that they were seeing him up close, they realized how tall and handsome he was. As they gazed at him, their hearts beat faster. He walked over and stood in front of Hugo. What's wrong? Are you still going to teach me a lesson? Hugo stared at him fiercely. What's your name? Tell me if you dare. I'll make you pay for this. Wow, you're pretty tough, huh? Damon scoffed. Then he rained more blows down on his opponent. Hugo was just a schoolyard bully. He wasn't really all that tough. But usually, people didn't dare to oppose him. His father was a powerful person. After another round of punches and kicks, finally Hugo couldn't take it anymore. Snot ran from his nose and tears flowed down his cheeks. He cried, Okay, stop hitting me. I beg you. I'll do whatever you say. I won't mess with you or your sister anymore. Selena pulled on Damon's arm. Bro, let him go. If he continued to fight, there would be real consequences. Damon nodded and left the gym with his sister. As they walked away, they could still hear Hugo and the others crying. After leaving the gym, Selena looked at her brother with admiration. Wow, when did you get so strong? Hugo is a tyrant in our school. His father is an important dignitary, and his brother is an infamous gangster. I didn't expect you to do that to him. Damon felt happy to hear his sister praise him. I'm good at fighting. If anyone bullies you in the future, tell me and I'll deal with them for you. Selena cheered. It was almost time for the parent-teacher conference. Damon and Selena went to the classroom where it was being held. From down the hall, they saw an old man wearing glasses chatting with some parents. His expression was extremely serious. He looked like he was rebuking them. The parents looked embarrassed. They lowered their heads and didn't make a sound. After finishing with the parents, the old man turned around and saw Selena. When he saw her, he smiled brightly. Miss Walker. Then he looked at Damon. 
Although this was a parent-teacher meeting, he felt that Damon was too young to be a parent. He wondered if this young man might be her boyfriend, but Damon looked too old to be dating a high school student. Therefore, his expression was a little serious. Selena quickly introduced them. Hello, Mr. Stoddard. This is my brother, Damon. The teacher looked relieved. Oh, I see. You're Selena's brother. I've heard of you before. Our school changed many rules because of you. You're a legend around here. Obviously, Mr. Stoddard knew about what happened. Moreover, the expulsion of a genius like Damon had caused quite a stir. Everyone in the school district knew about it. At the time, it destroyed the school's reputation. Not only had Mr. Ezra been fired over it, but the principal had also gotten in trouble. Afterwards, he was transferred. Now that Mr. Stoddard knew Damon was Selena's older brother, he made a note to pay extra attention to her. Damon shook the teacher's hand and said respectfully, Hello, Mr. Stoddard. Thank you for teaching my sister. His words were sincere. He had a lot of respect for Mr. Stoddard. Many teachers at the school didn't care about the students. Some of them were even corrupt, and they accepted bribes in return for giving good grades. Some parents would do anything to ensure that their children got into good universities. Damon's family, however, couldn't afford to do this. Money didn't matter to Mr. Stoddard, though. He taught because he loved teaching. Selena was a bright student, so he always did his best to encourage and help her. He wanted to see her succeed. He was one of the few teachers at the school who had a passion for the job. Mr. Stoddard always turned down gifts from parents because he was a moral person. This kind of teacher was worthy of respect. After all the parents and students arrived, the meeting began. Generally speaking, a student's performance depended on parent involvement. After all, education had to continue outside of the classroom. Parents had to ensure that students did their homework and came to class. On top of this, they had to encourage their children to take their studies seriously. Students needed to do well in high school to succeed after graduation. This was something that all parents wanted for their kids. Mr. Stoddard also wanted to discuss the curriculum. Students had to choose which classes they wanted to take. The school had students of all different abilities. Not all of them would go on to university, so the teacher also wanted to discuss other career paths. After this, Mr. Stoddard began discussing the penalties for disruptive behavior. He had a few troublemakers in his class who were extremely difficult to deal with. Disobedience might be tolerated in lower grades, but the students were in 12th grade now. If these troublemakers didn't shape up, they would be expelled. When the parents heard this, some of them began to complain. The parents of kids who were good students didn't say anything, though. Although they felt the school shouldn't give up on students, they understood why the policy existed. No matter how much the parents protested, these were the rules. The parents of the troublemakers wondered how they would get their children to behave. Mr. Stoddard continued to emphasize the importance of being disciplined with one's studies. He criticized the students who didn't take their schooling seriously. Then, he emphasized to the parents that they had to get involved. During the meeting, the teacher praised Selena for being a model student. She was the top of her class. When Mr. Stoddard spoke about her, his expression filled with pride. She had A's in every class. When the other parents heard about what a good student Selena was, they were secretly shocked. They looked at her and Damon with envy. At this moment, Mr. Stoddard paused and looked at Selena dotingly. Miss Walker, would you like to come up and say a few words? You can share your experience of learning at this school. The whole room gave a warm round of applause. Selena went to the front to address the parents and students. Most of the time, she was very disciplined and organized. She set goals for herself and strived to achieve them. But there was something else that motivated her as well. She explained, The reason I work so hard is because of my brother. He inspires me to be my best. I know I'll never be as smart as him, but I still try hard. All the parents cheered. They wondered how high Selena's brother's grades were. She herself was already a top student, yet she said she wasn't as smart as him. Her brother must really be a genius. Mr. Stoddart said with a smile, You might not know, but Miss Walker's brother aced his SATs. The parents applauded again. What kind of family did these children come from? Both brother and sister were top students. Selena stood before the envious gazes of the parents and she looked at her brother with admiration. She was very proud of him. The parent-teacher meeting was gradually coming to an end. At this time, the teacher asked if anyone had questions. Then, the parents had a chance to chat with the teacher and with other parents as well. Mr. Wilson, your daughter is also in this class? What a coincidence. Let's grab dinner together later. Mrs. Price, I heard that you're being promoted again. Congratulations. Mr. Von Shackle, I heard that your company has just financed a new report. Do you have time to talk about it? Most of the students who attended this high school came from prominent families. Although school was important, these students were already guaranteed promising futures. After all, everyone went to university nowadays. Generally speaking, money and connections got a person further than good grades alone. 
Selena, you're not that amazing, one girl whispered. Your parents are poor. I bet they didn't even finish high school. Obviously, this girl was jealous and couldn't help but mock her classmate. She had poor grades, and she couldn't stand Selena. She thought her classmate was a pretentious know-it-all. Selena's pretty face turned pale when she heard this, and she almost cried. Although she had been bullied before, she couldn't stand it when people insulted her parents. She loved them, and she was proud of them, regardless of how much money they made. Damon frowned and said coldly, You think you are something special, huh, young lady? The rude girl didn't know what to do. She didn't recognize the sarcasm in his words, so she straightened her back and said proudly, Yes, I am something special. My father is an important person, and he makes a lot of money. He could ruin your parents' lives if I asked him to. The parent-teacher meeting at Selena's school was wrapping up. A student had just made a snide remark, and Selena looked like she was about to cry. Damon, who had overheard the comment, glared at the other girl. Then, a man with a beer belly came over and said, "'Honey, why are you talking to these people?' He put his arm around the girl, who was clearly his daughter, and looked at Selena and Damon with disgust. The man named Mr. Wilson smiled and said, "'Your daughter is right. Having good grades isn't everything. You need more than that to succeed in this world.' The parents, whose children had poor grades, took offense to Selena. They were embarrassed that this girl from a poor family was making their own children look bad. At this time, the meeting ended, and the Walker siblings were about to leave. Suddenly, one of Selena's friends rushed in and said frantically, I have bad news. Hugo and his gang are in the parking lot, and they're waiting for you guys to come out. Selena's face turned pale. She looked at Damon and asked, What should we do? Hugo was a bully, and he wasn't used to being defied. He was even willing to cause a scene in front of all the parents and teachers. Damon was quite surprised to hear this. He hadn't expected Hugo to come for revenge so soon. Furthermore, he knew his sister was afraid of the guy. And after thinking for a while, Damon took his phone and dialed Bruno's number. At this moment, Bruno was hanging out with some toughs, bragging about how he had defeated 600 men at the big brawl in Meyerson. Although New York City was far from Meyerson, news of the huge fight had already spread throughout the underworld. Gangsters far and wide admired the small group of thugs who had taken down Ziggy's gang in a six-on-one battle. Bruno saw that it was Damon calling, and he answered immediately. Hey, if you need my help, just ask. Where are you? Damon inquired. I'm hanging out in a hotel downtown. What do you need? The high school wasn't far from downtown, so Damon said, I need some backup. I'm at a parent-teacher meeting for my sister, and some kids are causing problems. Can you come to back me up? Bring your toughest-looking men. I want to make an impression. Damon wanted to scare Hugo so that he'd never mess with his sister again. He didn't want her to be afraid at school. This good-for-nothing punk needed to be taught a lesson. That way, he wouldn't harass Selena anymore. When Hugo saw Bruno and his gang, he'd wet his pants. Bruno was happy to lend a hand. He admired Damon a lot, and he wanted to suck up to him. When he heard the request, he replied, That's easy, I know a lot of people in New York. I'll call some friends and come to meet you. I'll be there as soon as I can. Bruno told his friends about what was happening, and they were all keen to come along. They had heard stories about this guy named Damon, and they wanted to see him in person. Instantly, the entire New York underworld was thrown into chaos. All the gangsters dropped what they were doing and drove over to the high school. After hanging up the phone, Damon let his sister out of the school. They walked toward the school gate and saw a group of students hassling the security guard there. The people in the crowd were cursing loudly. Most of these punks couldn't really be considered students. Many of them were dropouts. Others had been expelled from school. They wanted to come onto the school grounds, but security wouldn't let them pass, so they were arguing with him. Damon's sharp eyes noticed Hugo leading the group. His face was swollen and bruised, but he still had an arrogant demeanor. He was watching the gate for any sign of his quarry. While he did this, he also laughed and chatted with his lackeys. Suddenly, one of the thugs stumbled backwards. He had been arguing with the security guard, and the guard got fed up and pushed him. After regaining his balance, the young man pointed at the guard and cursed. Damn it, get out of our way. If you don't move, I'll make you. It was unclear whether the security guard felt threatened or not, but in any case, he stepped aside. He was only one person, and he didn't get paid enough to warrant risking his life. These punk kids were getting out of control. Selena saw the guard step aside, and she grabbed onto her brother's arm. Damon, I'm scared. Let's get out of here, okay? She wanted to avoid conflict, but her brother shook his head. Don't be silly. It's fine. Just follow me. Damon looked around. Where was Bruno? Why hadn't anyone shown up yet? He took out his phone to call Bruno again. Bruno picked up right away and said, Don't worry, I'm on my way, and I'm bringing a lot of people with me. We'll be there soon. He hung up the phone. Moments later, he heard the rumble of many cars driving toward the school. The cars turned the corner and came into view. 
Needless to say, they were all expensive luxury cars worth a fortune. There were seven or eight of them in a row. Damon saw Mercedes-Benzes, BMWs, and Ferraris. They were all pounding music from impressive sound systems. It was an intimidating scene to behold, and these were only the first cars to arrive. More were on the way. These gangsters had been hanging out nearby, so when Bruno called, they hopped in their cars and drove over to help. The line of cars pulled up in front of the school. Their motors were deafening, and they immediately got the attention of Hugo and his friends. They all looked at each other and worried what was going on. At first, they thought these new arrivals were on their side. Hugo had a confused look on his face. He had called a lot of people to come and help him deal with Damon, but most of them were already here. Furthermore, his friends were mostly all teenagers, whereas the men in the cars were all adults. However, he guessed that some gangsters might have come to help as a way to curry favor with his father. If that were the case, he would certainly welcome them. It was pretty impressive that so many people had come to his aid. Hugo leaned against the school gate and tried to look as cool as possible. The green-haired guy who Damon had beaten up earlier went over to one of the Ferraris. The driver got out of the car and sized him up. The man was muscular, and it looked like he had just come from the gym. He was wearing workout clothes, and his body was covered in sweat. He glared and asked, What do you want? The green-haired kid pursed his lips and said, What's your name? Are you here to help Hugo? Get your friends over here. The man spat and replied, Who the heck is Hugo? I'm here to help Damon. If you don't piss off, I'll hit you. The kid's expression changed when he heard this and he shouted, Do you have a death wish? Wow, you've got balls, the man exclaimed as he punched the green-haired kid in the face. The teen was about to hit him back, but then he saw the man's powerful-looking muscles, and he thought better of it. Instead, he turned and ran over to Hugo with his tail between his legs. When Hugo realized what was happening, his face went pale. He hadn't expected anyone to oppose him. In spite of this, he knew he had to deal with Damon first. He would not be able to gain the upper hand until Damon submitted to him and told these men to stand down. He had no idea that more gangsters were on the way. Moments later, he heard the sound of more cars in the distance. Then, a second group of people arrived. They looked even more formidable than the first. They all drove luxury cars as well. It was a spectacular sight. Following that, several more groups of people arrived in a similar manner. The cars that they had drove were even more incredible than the others. Among the many vehicles was a Hummer. The owner of the Hummer was said to have a notorious reputation in the city. When the gangsters arrived, they parked their cars and got out to greet each other. They milled about in front of the school as if they were waiting for someone. Cars kept rolling up, and soon, the parking lot was jam-packed with expensive luxury vehicles. It looked like a car exhibition. The security guard had sharp eyes. He could tell that all these men were gangsters. Many of them were famous in New York City, and the guard knew who they were. He recognized them because of the vehicles that they drove. He knew better than to mess with them. He didn't want to die. Even Hugo, who came from a wealthy family, was dumbfounded to see so many luxury cars. He wondered who had called them here. Whoever it was was clearly very powerful. No one was paying attention to Hugo and his friends anymore. Compared to these gangsters, the teens were small potatoes. By now, all the parents and students had come out of the school and they were standing around beside the parking lot waiting to leave. Mr. Wilson, as well as all other parents, surveyed the scene with shock. Although Mr. Wilson was wealthy, he didn't have any real power. He owned a chain of restaurants, so he thought he was hot stuff. But he'd never seen such a display of power and luxury before. Whoever had summoned these people here must really be something special. No one knew that Damon had called these people here to help him. Damon hadn't expected so many people to show up. Bruno had organized everything, and he didn't spend a lot of time in New York City. As such... Damon was surprised that he had rallied so many people to the cause. Damon didn't know that he himself had a reputation as the most powerful gangster either in Meyerson. Although Meyerson was far from New York, news of his deeds had reached people on the streets here. When they heard he needed help, they didn't hesitate to rush over. They all wanted to get on his good side. In the future, they might need a favor from him. Damon was still waiting for Bruno when his phone rang and he heard the man's voice on the other line. Hey, where are you? We're all waiting for you in the parking lot. Do you want us to roll out a red carpet or something? He joked. I can't see you, Damon replied. Where are you? I'm here outside the gate. There are a lot of us. I called everyone here to help. He told me to bring as many people as I could. Is this enough? Damon smiled to himself. Yeah, you did great. I'll be right there. After saying this, he hung up. He gazed at all the luxury cars outside the gate with satisfaction. Let's go, he said to Selena. Then he led her out to the parking lot. She was still very nervous because she thought the luxury cars all belonged to Hugo's friends, 
She couldn't imagine that these people were here to support her brother. When Damon and Selena walked out the gate, they saw Bruno waving at them from the parking lot. The hundreds of gangsters who were leaning against their cars stood up straight to get a better look. They all wanted to see this legend from Meyerson with their own eyes. Damon was younger than they had expected. However, his eyes were bright and he radiated charm. When the gangsters saw this, they nodded with respect. Bro, Selena was gripping his arm tightly. Her palms were sweaty. Bruno came forward first, and then the others followed him. Many of them were big bosses in New York. However, their eyes were filled with respect for the young man before them. They were all ambitious, and they knew they had to gain Damon's favor if they wanted to do business in Meyerson in the future. Some of the younger gangsters looked at him and asked in confusion, Is this the guy who everyone is talking about? But he's so young. What makes him so great? Why should we listen to him? Shut up. You don't know anything, the older men growled. Do you know who he is? Do you know what he did? He's a legend in our world. After the older men told the skeptics about Damon's glorious achievements, the younger men gazed at him in awe and no longer doubted him. Seriously? That's awesome. Wow, he's my idol. Bruno introduced himself to Selena. Hey, you're Damon's sister, right? Great to meet you. My name is Bruno, and I do business with your brother. Although he looked very fierce, he was kind to Selena. However, Bruno knew better than to tell her how he and Damon had met. Instead, he lied and said that they worked together. It was easier that way. Selena's classmate Hugo wanted to get revenge for what had happened in the gym earlier, so he gathered a posse and waited for Damon outside the school. When Damon heard about this, he called Bruno to come help. The gangster called everyone he knew, and they all rushed to the high school to lend a hand. They all greeted Damon with big smiles. New York was Damon's hometown, but he had made a name for himself in the underworld of Meyerson. These gangsters needed to be on his good side if they ever wanted to do business there in the future. When Selena saw all the tough-looking men greeting her brother, she was shocked. At this moment, he was a complete mystery to her. Their family had always been poor, and she was used to people making fun of her for it. Therefore, when she saw the luxury cars that these men were driving, she couldn't believe it. It seemed like they were all trying to curry favor with Damon. Realizing this, she felt a surge of pride. All these men had shown up on Damon's behalf and their cars were so expensive. Naturally, this was a big shock to all the bystanders. Many of these gangsters were famous in the city. Are they here for your classmate? Mr. Wilson stammered to his daughter who was standing beside him. He was so surprised that his mouth hung open. Hadn't his daughter said that these kids were from a poor family? Why were so many people in fancy cars here to pick them up? Mr. Wilson was a law-abiding citizen and he felt intimidated. Clearly, these men were all gangsters. He didn't want to get on their bad side. His daughter nodded stiffly. She looked around at the crowd of thugs in shock. She didn't know what to say. In her eyes, Selena had always been a nobody. She never expected anything like this to happen. It was beyond her wildest imagination. Hurry up, let's go, Mr. Wilson whispered to his daughter. Otherwise, there might be trouble. He had been rude to Damon and Selena before, so he wanted to leave before anything happened. Now that Damon had so many people to back him up, Mr. Wilson was worried. Perhaps these people were here to teach him a lesson. If he didn't slip away now, he might get hurt. The smug look on Hugo's face was gone. His posse of cool kids were all looking around, waiting for him to make a decision. Hugo, do you want us to attack? The green-haired teen asked in a low voice. Hugo turned and slapped him. He said angrily, Are you stupid? The teen felt dizzy from the slap, and he didn't dare to say anything else. Obviously, attacking these gangsters was a terrible idea. Hugo's friends were surrounded. At this moment, they were trembling in their boots, and they shrank back in fear. Hugo stared at the gangster for a moment before saying, Damn it, you guys aren't that awesome. Just wait and see. I will teach you a lesson sooner or later. After saying this, he tossed his cigarette butt and got into an Audi that was parked behind him. Then, he peeled out of the parking lot without a backwards glance. Damon led Selena to the Hummer. At first, he had planned to take her out to eat with Bruno. He could use this opportunity to introduce her to some local gangsters. That way, they could look out for her in the future. However, he could tell that his sister felt uncomfortable. Although the gangsters were all very kind to her, she wasn't used to being around people like them. Damon realized that taking her to lunch with them was a bad idea, so he apologized to Bruno and said he had to get going. He promised that next time he would take everyone out to eat. Bruno and the other men didn't mind in the least, and they still insisted on driving the Walker siblings home. So, Damon put the bicycle in the back of one guy's truck and they all drove off in a convoy. 
The convoy stopped a few blocks away from the Walker home. Damon didn't want to drive through their neighborhood with such a large crowd of gangsters. After getting out of the car, Damon and Selena walked home. On the way, he cautioned, Don't tell mom and dad about what happened today. I don't want them to worry. His sister nodded and then asked curiously, Are, are they really your business partners? Although she was young, she could tell that these men were all gangsters. He smiled and replied, Of course. Would I lie to you? Where do you think I get all my money from? Selena thought about it and decided that it made sense. She didn't care, though. She knew her brother was a good person. Many successful entrepreneurs got their starts on the streets. After they made enough money, they could go legit, but it was inevitable that they'd maintain some connections with their past. Hence, Selena nodded her head in agreement and they returned home together. That night, Damon received a call from Frank, who was currently in the capital. He was flying back to New York City tomorrow afternoon. Damon went to the airport to pick him up. Not long after the flight arrived, Damon spotted his friend's tall figure walking through the crowd. Frank had a few friends with him. Among them was Chloe, the quiet girl who Damon had met a few times back in Meyerson. She was a student there as well. Frank had also brought a friend called Leroy to New York with him. Leroy was studying in military school and he looked very strong. He, Frank, Alex, and Emily often hung out together in the capital. He had heard a lot about Damon, so he came along on the trip to meet this legendary figure himself. Emily and Alex, on the other hand, hadn't come. Frank was here because his father was working in the city these days. Chloe didn't like Damon very much. She was not the kind of person who enjoyed violence. She preferred more academic types. Furthermore, she had always been prejudiced against him. Through Frank and the others, she had heard about all his exploits and she didn't care for them. In her opinion, the only thing Damon was good at was fighting. If he wanted to win her over, he'd have to prove to her that he wasn't just some angry meathead. Unfortunately, she wasn't convinced yet. Therefore, she refused the invitation to hang out the next day. Frank and Leroy could meet up with Damon on their own. She had better things to do. Chloe said goodbye to them at the airport and went her own way. On the other hand, Frank and Leroy were overjoyed to see Damon. Soon, they were engaged in a lively conversation. Even though it was Leroy's first time meeting him, they still found a lot to talk about. Leroy was already a captain in the military, which was surprising for someone so young. He had probably done something impressive to earn this title. Frank winked at Damon and said, We were so bored in D.C. that we nearly went crazy. Luckily, Leroy and I were able to slip away to have some fun in New York. What are we going to do? Damon thought about this for a moment, then smiled. He had just remembered that Noah's wedding was tomorrow. I know what we can do, he declared. I have something fun planned. The three of them went out for dinner and hung out till after midnight. Damon's mother kept messaging to ask him where he was. So at 12.30 a.m., he said goodbye to his friends and went home. The next morning, Liam and Emmett stopped by. It was the day of the high school reunion, so the three friends all got ready together. Damon called Frank and Leroy and told them to meet him at the Dynasty Hotel. When he, Liam, and Emmett got to the hotel, the other two guys were already waiting out front. Frank grinned and introduced himself. Hey, I'm a friend of Damon's. Leroy also greeted them, and they got to know each other a bit. Damon noticed that the parking lot outside the hotel was full of luxury cars. Obviously, a lot of wealthy people were attending events here today. From where Damon stood on the street out front, he could see a bride and groom standing at the entrance of the hotel. The groom was his old enemy, Noah. Today, he was dressed to the nines. Damon was surprised when he saw that the woman beside Noah was not Lily, but someone else. He guessed he should have expected this. After all, Noah had always been a fickle person. What were the odds he had been faithful to Lily? It made sense that they'd broken up. The bride wore a splendid white gown, and she was covered in jewels. She wore at least ten gold necklaces, and she had gold bracelets on her wrists as well. It was totally over the top. Her jewelry alone must have weighed five pounds. She and Noah stood at the door welcoming their guests. They were both beaming. The guests were all very distinguished. Many of them clapped Noah on the shoulders and congratulated him. Damon and his friends were totally engrossed by the scene. Just then, a horn suddenly honked behind them. They turned and saw that a white BMW was trying to get by. The driver was honking because they were in the way. A young man leaned out the window of the car and glared at them. Are you blind? Can't you see that you're in the way? The driver was acting very arrogant. Damon looked at the driver's face and realized that it was Hugo, the same kid who he had beaten up yesterday. What a coincidence. However, Hugo didn't recognize him. Frank frowned and cursed. Damn it, pedestrians have the right of way. What did you say? 
I'll teach you for being so rude. Frank had always been a bit of a hothead. Naturally, he had been friendly when meeting Damon's friends, but he had a short temper. He wouldn't hesitate to teach this rude driver a lesson that he'd remember for the rest of his life. Hugo, who was driving the BMW, saw red. Just as he was about to flip out, someone exclaimed from the passenger seat of the BMW, Oh, Liam, is that you? A beautiful woman stuck her head out of the window to greet them. Liam looked at her in surprise. When he saw who it was, he relaxed. Hello, Patricia. Patricia was his former classmate. She had been in the same class as Liam and Avery. The reunion today was for everyone who had graduated in their year, so she was also attending. Seeing that Hugo was about to lose it, Patricia patted his shoulder and said, I know these guys. Please don't cause trouble, okay? She sounded like she was begging. Only then did Hugo calm down. Today is my brother's wedding, he explained, so I won't cause trouble. He didn't want Patricia to think that he was doing her any favors. When she heard this, she bit her tongue and didn't say anything. However, she was relieved that he had calmed down. What more could she ask for? She put up with his bad behavior because she was after his money. He never treated her with dignity, but she stayed with him anyway. Despite this, she had no regrets. She liked having a rich sugar daddy. It sure beat having to work and earn her own money. She looked at Liam and his friends and couldn't help but sigh. If not for the fact that she had stopped Hugo just now, these poor suckers would have been beaten to a pulp. Hugo had done it before. She'd seen it with her own eyes. He'd even hit a pregnant woman with his car while driving drunk. He hadn't gotten in trouble for it either, because his brother had scared the woman into keeping quiet. That was the first time Patricia had seen the power of Hugo's family. This was why she put up with his crap. He was younger than her too, but she didn't care. She was attracted to his money and power. Now that Patricia had diffused the situation, Frank no longer wanted to cause trouble for Hugo. Originally, he had wanted to pull him out of the car and give him a good beating. But now that he knew the guy was Liam's classmate, he was on his best behavior. He did not want to embarrass Damon or his friends, so he forced a smile. Hugo saw Frank's smile and thought Frank was afraid of him, so he just glared and drove around them. They all walked into the hotel and went straight to the banquet hall where the reunion was being held. Damon saw that many of his classmates had already arrived. He introduced his friends to them and they all shook hands. Frank was clearly a little nervous about meeting so many new people. Leroy, on the other hand, was much calmer. He smiled and nodded at everyone. Damon looked around to see who else was there and spotted Avery across the room. Veronica hadn't come, so Avery was the undisputed star of the gathering. Quite a number of their classmates were fans of her television series. Her name had been in the news several times recently as well. She was already a big star. Damon's arrival was also causing quite a stir. Most people here hadn't seen him since he'd been expelled, but they'd all heard about how he had aced his SATs. Many people clicked their tongues in wonder. Their class had produced some amazing talent. They had a movie star and a genius among them. However, none of them were surprised that Avery had become a star. After all, she was not only beautiful, but also talented. However, it was very surprising for someone like Damon to ace the SATs. From what they could remember, he wasn't a very good student. His amazing performance at the end of the school year was totally out of the blue. It had shocked everyone. Now he was a legend, and people looked up to him. Damon excused himself and said he had to use the restroom. Then, he went to the main hall where Noah's wedding banquet was being held. Everyone there was having a great time. A group of men stood in one corner dressed like hotel staff. Among them was Bruno. His eyes lit up when he saw Damon and he shouted, You're here! Damon was at the Dynasty Hotel for his high school reunion. Coincidentally, his old enemy Noah was getting married there on the same day. Damon slipped away from his reunions and went to check out the wedding venue. Bruno and his men were already there. They were all disguised as hotel staff. When they saw him, they grinned. Damon smiled back and asked, Is everything ready? Yes, it's ready, Bruno replied with a wink. It's going to be a good show. He had everything under control. The two of them had a tacit understanding about what was in store for Noah. Damon went back to his reunion. His classmate, Brandon, had been in charge of the guest list, and he had invited their former teacher, Mr. Ezra, to the event. Unfortunately, the teacher hadn't come. He had been fired from his job and was too embarrassed to face them. Rumor had it that his firing had something to do with Damon's expulsion. After Damon aced his SATs, the school administration came down hard on Mr. Ezra for expelling him. His decision made the school look bad. Even the principal got flack. In the end, Mr. Ezra was demoted to being a janitor. 
However, since he wasn't here, no one could ask him about it. Liam and Emmett were talking to Leroy. They had heard that he went to a military academy. Emmett's university was right next to a school like this, so he had a lot of friends who were in the army and knew a bit about it. When he heard where Leroy studied, he was shocked. The school was the most elite military academy in the country, and it was nearly impossible for ordinary people to be accepted there. They recruited only the best of the best. However, this was only a rumor. Emmett was not certain about entry requirements, so he didn't question Leroy's story. He did, however, mention this to Liam. Liam, on the other hand, believed Leroy. Any friend of Damon's must be a trustworthy person, right? A guy in their class named Paul was also very surprised to hear where Leroy studied. He had come all the way from Boston to attend this gathering, and he had brought his girlfriend along with him. He was from a prominent family, so he knew all about this elite military academy. It was nothing to joke about. Therefore, he asked, Do you really study there? Yes, Leroy nodded. Paul continued, I have a friend who studies there. His name is Desmond Greger. I heard that he's doing well in his classes. Have you heard of him? No, I haven't, Leroy replied, shaking his head. Paul didn't say anything else. Desmond was the son of a senator and a prominent figure at the academy. Since Leroy had never heard of him, it proved that he wasn't a student there. Paul didn't come out and call him a liar, but clearly he was thinking it. Naturally, Leroy could see the contempt in the guy's eyes. He couldn't be bothered to defend himself, though. As for knowing Desmond, Leroy didn't really hang out with other students at the academy because he found them boring. Instead, he spent most of his time with his teachers, who were all high-ranking military officials. Suddenly, Frank's phone rang and he answered it. He listened for a moment and then began cursing loudly. Damn it, get over here right now. There's someone important who I want you to meet. If you're late, I'll chop you up. After saying this, he hung up the phone. Frank was on his best behavior here because the people were Damon's old friends. But normally, he was a loose cannon. Damon raised an eyebrow at him and asked, Who was that? Oh, just some dummy called Smitty Clark. He heard that I'm in New York City, so he wants to come say hi. He's a big loser, though. If it weren't for the fact that his father recently got promoted to police chief, I wouldn't give him the time of day. Frank said this very casually. In his eyes, this son of the so-called police chief was just a piece of trash. He could treat him however he wanted. He didn't realize how this might sound to other people, though. When Paul heard this, his jaw dropped. He was from a prominent family, so naturally he knew a lot of important people. He knew all about Smitty and his father. The police chief was a powerful person. Clearly, this Frank guy wasn't afraid of anything. Otherwise, he wouldn't dare to talk to Smitty like that. Paul wondered if he had misheard. Who was this person who dared to curse at Smitty Clark? No, it couldn't be true. This loser in front of him was just a shameless liar too. As for how Frank knew the name Smitty Clark, Paul couldn't explain it. He decided to ignore what had just happened. Other than Damon, Leroy, and Paul, no one else had heard Frank's outburst. Suddenly, they heard cheering coming from next door. Noah's wedding had begun. The applause seemed to go on forever. Frank started to get annoyed and he roared, Damn it, there are other people in this hotel too. Can't they have some respect? The other students also furrowed their brows. It was inevitable for people to cheer at a wedding, but enough was enough. Eventually, the noise died down. Then, loud music began to blare. Noah had hired a famous radio host to emcee the wedding, and it sounded like the party had started. Damon turned to Frank and Leroy and asked, Do you want to go and watch the show? Okay, Frank replied and immediately stood up. He was eager to join the fun. Leroy was busy chatting with Emmett and Liam, so he didn't want to go. Frank and Damon left the reunion and snuck into the wedding venue. They stood in a corner to watch the festivities. The reception had already begun. Hundreds of guests were attending, and it was very lively. The MC was telling a story about how the bride and groom met and fell in love. It was like a fairy tale, and from time to time, the crowd applauded. Noah and the bride sat at the head table. They were preparing to go on stage to make speeches. The MC announced, Next, the bride and groom will come up and say a few words. Following this, the lights in the hall suddenly dimmed. Immediately after, a spotlight shone and illuminated the bride as she made her way up to the stage. At this moment, she looked very beautiful. It was easy to see why Noah had fallen for her. After she was up on stage, the spotlight suddenly swung around and illuminated Noah, who was wearing a tailor-made suit. He held an enormous bouquet of bright red roses, and he walked up to join her. He handed her the roses and gazed at her with deep affection. Nina, I love you. You're the only woman I want in my life. After saying this, he kissed her. At this moment, Noah sounded very sincere. The bride was so touched that she began to cry. The wedding guests murmured to each other. He's so romantic. He's kind and passionate. 
but he's also rich and handsome. I wish I could marry a man like him. This is the most romantic wedding I've ever been to. Countless other women at the wedding wished that he was their husband. However, there were always bound to be a few troublemakers at every wedding. A man who had clearly had too much to drink stood up and shouted, Noah, you bastard! Don't act so innocent! You got my daughter Sandra pregnant, and you still have the gall to say that you want only one woman in your life! The man stumbled and nearly knocked over the table. I don't care if I embarrass myself today. I'll still tell everyone what you did. As soon as he spoke these words, there was an uproar from the crowd. The bride and groom were stunned. A woman who was clearly Noah's mother stood up and angrily said, How did this guy get in here? He wasn't invited. Doesn't this hotel have security? The drunk man was not afraid. He slammed the table and continued to shout, You dog! Do you deny it? You ruined my daughter's life! If you don't take responsibility for what you've done, I'll kill you! Finally, security arrived to drag the man away. But then, a few more men came to his defense. They were likely the man's friends, and they wanted justice for him and his daughter. The security guards didn't dare to move. They didn't want to make things worse. At the same time, some of the guests began to whisper to each other. Oh, that poor woman, she had his child and he abandoned her. I've heard the baby is five months old now. The beast has no conscience. He won't even pay child support. I heard he even threatened to make the mother and child both disappear. Yeah, he didn't even want her to have the child. What a heartless guy. He's simply vicious. When people heard this, they nodded their heads and started gossiping about the groom. Some people who knew about his questionable past began to tell the people around them. I'm not surprised. Actually, I already knew that he was a piece of trash. I was just too embarrassed to say it out loud before. Tell me more. Why didn't I know? Oh my, are you from New York City? You must have heard rumors about Noah then, right? Wow, you must be kidding. The truth was finally coming out, and all the women who had been infatuated with him moments before realized what a beast he truly was. Noah was scowling. Nina was so angry that her pretty face turned bright red. She asked him, Is it true? He didn't know how to answer. He had always been a player, but for the life of him he couldn't figure out who Sandra was. He forced a smile and began to make excuses. No, Nina, you have to believe me. I'd never cheat on you. You have to believe me. I have no idea who Sandra is. Nina could tell from his expression that he was lying. However, today was her wedding, and she didn't want to ruin the beautiful moment. She declared for all to hear. Noah, I believe you. Can security get those hooligans out of here? If they don't, we'll have to call the police. Even though she knew that her husband was lying to her, she still covered for him. Hotel security didn't dare to disobey. They quickly rounded up the drunk man and his friends. The men cursed and tried to fight back, but they were outnumbered. Eventually, they stopped struggling and security took them away. However, after this commotion, the atmosphere was different. Countless guests pointed at Noah and gossiped about him. When he heard this, he was furious, but he couldn't do anything about it. He had to put on a smile and pretend that nothing was wrong. Nina also forced a smile, but everyone could tell that she felt miserable inside. It was obvious that the MC was also shocked by what had happened. This was the craziest thing he'd ever seen at a wedding. But he had to keep a straight face. Noah waved his hand at the man and told him to get on with it. He wanted to get the speeches over as soon as possible so that the dancing could begin. Then, hopefully people would forget about what had just happened. However, before Noah could relax, he suddenly noticed a big man at a table in the corner standing up fast. The man looked drunk. Noah watched as he jumped on the table and started shouting, You can't stop me! <laughs> I'd like to see you try! <laughs> the man was laughing like a crazy person. His shoes were filthy, and he was walking all over the white tablecloth. Instantly, all the other guests around the table backed away. A man at another table suddenly raised his wine glass and cried, Nina, I love you! Why did you marry him? You've broken my heart! Before Noah could say anything, the music hall suddenly changed. Someone had put on a mournful song about heartbreak. The sad music echoed throughout the hall, and all the guests instantly fell silent. They looked at Noah and Nina with pitiful eyes. Those who didn't know that this was a wedding would think that it was a funeral. Noah was so angry that he couldn't speak. He forgot all about the guest who was dancing on the table, and the man who was declaring his undying love for Nina. His wedding had turned into a joke. He roared, Go and find out who changed the music. Who dares to play this song at my wedding banquet? I will kill whoever it is. The whole room was in chaos. Nina was so angry that she was shaking and crying. Today was undoubtedly the most embarrassing day of her life. Some of the guests began to leave, 
and others just sat and pretended that nothing was wrong. Two big events were being held at the Dynasty Hotel. A high school reunion was happening in one banquet hall, and a huge wedding was happening in another. Damon's old enemy Noah Miller was getting married, but for some reason everything was going wrong. Word of the wedding disaster quickly spread throughout the hotel. When the students in the banquet hall next door heard about it, they couldn't hide their smiles. Frank and Damon were still in the wedding venue watching the fun. Frank's phone rang. It was his friend Smitty calling. He had arrived, but he didn't know where to find them. He wanted Frank to come downstairs to meet him. Frank was annoyed and he cursed. Damn it, you are useless. Then he hung up the phone and grinned. I have to go downstairs to pick this loser up. Damon nodded and his friend went down to find Smitty. After, Damon left the wedding venue and went back to the banquet hall where his reunion was being held. He planned to come back to the wedding later to check in. Just as he sat down to chat with some old classmates, Patricia came in with her boyfriend Hugo. Actually, Hugo was at the hotel today to attend his brother Noah's wedding. However, Patricia had dragged him over to her reunion to have a drink with her old classmates. At the moment, he looked furious. It was obvious that he hadn't expected his brother's wedding to be such a disaster. It was embarrassing for Noah, and it was also embarrassing for him. Patricia held his hand and toasted her classmates. She made a speech and complimented all her old friends. Luckily, Hugo didn't notice Damon. After Patricia finished talking, her boyfriend stood up and waved his hand. He declared, Everyone eat and drink as much as you want. I will pick up the tab. However, I want you all to keep what you've heard about the wedding to yourselves. Although it got off to a rocky start, everything is fine now. Meanwhile, the wedding next door. The mournful music finally ended. Noah wiped the cold sweat from his forehead. No matter what, the rest of the day had to go as planned. The MC put on some lively music and people began to hit the dance floor. Then, Noah and his bride walked around and chatted with their guests. It seemed that the trouble had passed. Just as Noah was finally starting to relax, the music suddenly stopped. Then, a rat-like man went up on stage and took the microphone. He addressed the guests with a smile. Friends, in honor of the occasion, the groom has prepared a special presentation for you. After saying this, he put down the microphone and ran off in embarrassment. No one seemed to know who he was. At this moment, the entire banquet hall waited with anticipation. Then, the lights in the hall dimmed, and a projector turned on. A movie began to play on the screen behind the stage. When people realized what was playing, they all gasped. It was a dirty film. There were grandparents and children here. This was an outrage. Noah, Nina, and their parents were all dumbfounded. Perhaps what had happened before was unavoidable, but this was different. Clearly, someone was trying to ruin the wedding on purpose, but something even more shocking was yet to come. As people watched the screen, they began to realize that the man in the video looked familiar. Although they could see only part of his face, he sure looked a lot like Noah. Everyone turned to look at the groom. His face was ashen, and he had no strength left to defend himself. He suddenly roared, I'll kill you! What the hell is going on? I'll hold the hotel responsible for this! One of the hotel employees wiped the sweat off his forehead and pulled the plug on the projector. The movie flickered off, and someone turned the lights back on but the damage was already done. Everyone was talking amongst themselves. From time to time, people pointed at Noah. The groom trembled and forced a smile. He looked at Nina, who had a gloomy expression on her face. He pleaded, Darling, I'm really sorry. Someone is playing a prank on me. Please forgive me. She didn't speak. From what she had seen, she knew without a doubt that the person in the movie was Noah. It was proof that he'd cheated on her, but she still didn't want it to ruin her happy day. Noah asked some of his people to find out what had happened. After giving these orders, he raised his wine glass and toasted his guests. He had no shame. The older guests felt a little embarrassed. They felt that Noah was too much. Many dark things had come to light during the wedding reception, and it was an insult to the Miller family. His relatives all felt disgraced. The wedding was a complete disaster. The guests were all gossiping together and laughing at the couple. They couldn't believe that Noah had the gall to carry on as if nothing had happened. This was the last straw for Nina. She couldn't take it anymore, and she threw her bouquet onto the ground. I want this marriage annulled. Then she ran out of the hall. With this, the reception was over, and the guests began to leave. Noah's wedding would be the laughingstock of the entire city. People would talk about it for years to come. When Hugo heard the commotion, he came over to take a look. After the bride ran out, he returned to his girlfriend's reunion. However, everyone could see that he was in a bad mood. A guy stood up and toasted him. 
Here's to you, Hugo. Thanks for your generosity. Shut up, Hugo spat. He went over and knocked the guy's wine glass out of his hand. I said shut up. Who the hell are you? You're not worthy of toasting me. The guy hadn't expected Hugo to react like that, and he was so scared that he didn't know what to do. Patricia was also shocked. She pulled on her boyfriend's arm and whispered, These are my old classmates. What are you doing? I don't care who they are, he shouted. They are all a bunch of losers. He was in a bad mood because of what had happened at his brother's wedding. Were these students mocking him? Well, he'd wiped the smug looks off their faces. He glared at them and roared, You are all a bunch of losers! Patricia was frightened by his sudden outburst. Tears welled up in her eyes and she asked, Hugo, why are you being like this? When they were alone together, he never treated her with respect, but this was different. All her old classmates were watching. How could he act like this? He suddenly turned on her and let loose a barrage of curse words. He was right up in her face. Instantly, the entire room fell silent. Everyone looked at Hugo in shock. Yelling at strangers was one thing, but now Hugo was verbally abusing his girlfriend as well. Tears began to flow down Patricia's face. She looked like she was about to run out of the room. Hugo threatened, If you walk out that door, we are through. Don't ever let me see your face again. Patricia's body trembled and tears streamed down her face, but she didn't move. Despite the abuse, she didn't want to lose him. Hugo saw this and was satisfied. Avery, on the other hand, couldn't stand it any longer. She stood up for Patricia and said, How can you treat her like this? Don't you have any respect? Hey, mind your own business, Hugo shot back. Who do you think you are? He rolled his eyes at Avery. Then he realized something. Hey, you're quite pretty. What's your name? How about I dump her and ask you out instead? You're much prettier than this old hag. He motioned to Patricia as he spoke. Get lost, Avery said coldly. You have spunk, I like it, Hugo chuckled. Then he suddenly noticed Damon. Damn it, it's you? Hurry up and come over here. Avery looked at Damon with concern. Liam and Leroy stood up, but Damon didn't move. He leaned back in his chair and said, Why should I listen to you? At this moment, Frank casually walked into the banquet hall. A heavyset man followed behind him. He called to Damon and Leroy. Hey, come and meet Smitty. The two of them came over to Damon and the guy named Smitty introduced himself. Hey, glad to meet you. I've heard a lot about you from Frank. Then he looked around at the other people in the banquet hall. Hello, everyone. My name is Smitty. Thanks for letting me crash your party. His expression was friendly and earnest. This Smitty seems like a nice guy, Paul's girlfriend whispered. Then she realized that her boyfriend was acting strange. His eyes were wide with disbelief and his jaw was open. His girlfriend asked, Paul, what's wrong? I'm not feeling well, he muttered. Then he hurried out of the room. Earlier, when he heard Frank talking about Smitty, he thought that the guy was lying. However, it turned out that Frank really knew him. He'd been telling the truth. This unexpected turn of events shocked Paul. He couldn't afford to offend them, so he decided to leave, just to be safe. Hugo, however, didn't know who he was dealing with. He laughed and mocked them. Hey, where did these two losers come from? I guess I'll have to beat you all up. He grabbed a wine bottle off a table and threw it at Damon, but Damon dodged to the side. Frank was stunned. What's going on? He looked at Hugo. Damon smiled. This guy is stirring up trouble. How dare you mess with my friend? Frank roared. He looked furious. His opponent growled. Come and get me if you have the guts. If you don't, you're a coward. I'm going to beat you to a bloody pulp. I'd like to see you try, Frank replied in a menacing tone. He had been on his best behavior at the reunion, but he wouldn't stand by and let this guy attack Damon. Furthermore, this guy was asking for a beating. It would be more embarrassing not to fight. Before Hugo could speak again, Frank picked up a beer bottle and smashed it on his head. Crash! The bottle instantly shattered and Hugo began to bleed. He screamed and fell to the ground. However, he was used to fighting, and one bottle wasn't enough to take him down. He spat viciously. Just you wait, I'm going to kill you all. Smitty wasn't smiling anymore either. He kicked Hugo in the chest and sent him flying into the wall. Then, he picked him up and threw him out the door. Hugo screamed the whole time. After the troublemaker was gone, Frank dusted himself off. He scoffed. Damn it, what a shameless loser. Everyone in the room had gone pale. They were all good, law-abiding citizens who didn't engage in violence. They had never beaten anyone up over a disagreement. As such, they were all in shock. Clang! Someone suddenly threw the door open. Moments later, Hugo ran back in. He had his hands on his head to stop the bleeding. He shouted angrily, Hey, bro, these are the guys who did this to me. Then, a group of people walked in after him. Noah led the way, and behind him were his parents and two older brothers. Noah's father looked around at everyone. Then, 
he whispered to Noah. Hold whoever did this responsible. Your mother and I will take Hugo to the hospital. Dad, don't worry. Leave everything to me, his son replied. He glared at Damon. He was not in a good mood today, and he finally had someone to take it out on. Their father was the mayor of New York, and he knew he couldn't get involved in this situation, so he just turned and left. Noah was not in a hurry to attack. The hall outside the venue was packed with his lackeys, so he knew Damon wasn't going anywhere. Anyway, his wedding was already ruined, so he had nothing better to do now. He would make the people who attacked his little brother pay. He glared at everyone in the room and growled, I will only say this once. Anyone who wasn't involved should get out of here now. People could see from his fierce expression that he was really angry. Some of the students were so scared that they nearly wet themselves. Liam, Emmett, and Avery didn't want to leave, but Damon said to them, All of you should go. You can help me by calling the police. Then they heard a commotion in the corridor. Bruno, who had been at the wedding causing trouble earlier, had just arrived with his group of thugs. Noah's men refused to let them pass, so Bruno punched the leader in the nose. The man screamed and doubled over in pain. Bruno pushed past him and walked into the banquet hall. He exclaimed, What's going on here? What are you doing? Noah was so angry that all he could do was laugh. Ha 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 ha, good, great, that's just great. Then he suddenly shouted, Kill them, I will take responsibility for whatever happens. A group of gangsters rushed in like a tidal wave. Bruno roared angrily. Everyone attack together. The two opposing sides ran towards each other. Because they were all here for the wedding, no one had brought weapons with them. Instead, they grabbed bottles of wine and swung them like bats. People were screaming and falling to the ground injured. However, it was obvious that those who fell were Noah's men. Bruno fought like a ferocious beast. Although Noah's men were capable fighters, they didn't stand a chance against Bruno. Frank and Smitty rushed forward too. Frank smashed Noah in the face and broke his nose. Then, Smitty jumped on top of him, punching and kicking. The gangster was instantly knocked unconscious. Damon's friends stopped only when their opponent started foaming at the mouth. Then, Frank spat on him and said, This scum got lucky today. Bruno and his gang took care of the rest with ease. They were about to leave when they heard the sound of sirens in the distance. Moments later, a dozen police cars pulled up and officers surrounded the hotel. Someone had called the police. Captain Briggs, the man who was in charge of all the officers, pulled his gun from its holster and shouted, Arrest all the gangsters who participated in this fight. The police had just arrived at the Dynasty Hotel. They were here to arrest all the gangsters who were involved in the brawl. Damon and Frank saw that they were surrounded and smiled coldly. Smitty, however, continued fighting. He kicked a policeman away and yelled fearlessly, Who dares to attack me? I'll kill you! Smack. An officer swung his baton at Smitty's head, but he dodged and got hit on the shoulder instead. He shouted, My dad is the chief of police. How dare you hit me? I'll kill you all! He never hesitated to let people know who his father was. Even though the police had him cornered, he still sounded confident. Usually when people realized who he was related to, they didn't mess with him. Furthermore, all Smitty's friends were in trouble too. If something happened to them, he couldn't bear it. However, Captain Briggs seemed unmoved. He didn't believe that this guy's father was actually the chief of police, so he waved his hand and the officer struck again. Finally, Smitty realized that continuing to resist was pointless. He spat on the ground and put his hands behind his back. The officer handcuffed him and put him in the police car. Oh no, we are finished, Frank muttered. Despite the seriousness of the situation, he was still smiling. Damon, Leroy, I'll cause a distraction and you two run away, okay? Forget it. I don't need you to save me, Damon scoffed. I'm giving myself up, and you should do the same. Then he smiled and raised his hands in a gesture of surrender. Frank could see that they were surrounded, so he raised his hands as well. Captain Briggs saw the smug look on Damon's face and felt a surge of anger towards him, but he suppressed it. Then he walked over to handcuff Damon, Frank, and Leroy. Usually only serious criminals get handcuffed, Frank complained unhappily. Why do you need to use them on us? Do you know who I am? My old man is a lieutenant in the military. Captain Briggs pretended not to hear him. He looked at him coldly and waved his hand. The other officers took Damon and his friends and put them in the backs of police cars. The situation was starting to look serious. Bruno was already handcuffed in one of the cars, but many of his lackeys had escaped during the chaos. Captain Briggs ordered his people to take the captives to the station. Then he went to talk to Noah. Noah was sitting in the back of an ambulance having his wounds bandaged. The captain asked, Are you okay? Do you need to go to the hospital? No, don't worry about me, Captain. I have only one request. I want to see those criminals rot in prison forever. 
Noah wiped the blood from his face as he said this. He still had to apologize to all his wedding guests for what had happened here today. His family had suffered a great humiliation, and he had to try to make things right. All right, Captain Briggs said with a nod. Also, say hello to your father, Mayor Miller, for me, okay? After saying this, the captain got into a police car and left. The police brought Damon and his friends to the station and put them in separate interrogation rooms. The dim light cast long shadows on the floor. Two young officers in plain clothes walked in and sat opposite him. One officer was tall, and the other was short. The tall one asked, Name? Damon Walker. He answered lazily. The officer's eyes narrowed in an unfriendly manner. Age? 21. Wait, no, 22. Gender? Damon rolled his eyes. Do you really need to ask? Damn it! The tall officer swore. He threw his pen across the room and said to his partner, This guy's asking for trouble. The other officer grinned and turned off the cameras in the room. Then, the tall man walked around the table and stood over Damon. He cracked his knuckles and smiled evilly. I'm going to teach you not to talk back. He punched Damon in the stomach. Damon doubled over from the blow, but he was still grinning. Is that all you've got? He mocked. Use your strength. Wow, you think you're hot stuff, huh? The tall officer was furious. He swung again this time hitting Damon in the face. He put all his strength into the blow. Damon cursed. Damn, you were useless. I'll kill you, the officer yelled, flying into a rage. He kneed his target in the chest. Unexpectedly, Damon's handcuffs broke and he was free. He swung and hit the tall man in the face. Blood spurted from the man's nose and he fell to the ground. When the other officer saw this, he was so scared that he tried to run out of the room. Unfortunately, Damon blocked his escape and knocked him down with a single blow. The other interrogation rooms were also in chaos. Smitty wasn't cooperating with his interrogators either. He had always been good at fighting, and he had also attended military school for special training. At the moment, he was also beating up the two officers who were supposed to be in charge of him. Other officers heard the commotion and came to see what was happening. When they saw Smitty beating up their co-workers, they were furious. Three more men rushed in and surrounded him. They punched and kicked him mercilessly. One of them even took out his baton and shouted, If you don't stand down, I'll beat you unconscious. Smitty roared angrily. My father is Police Chief Clark. Let me go or you will regret it. What's going on here? A voice called from outside the room. The speaker was a middle-aged man and he was obviously a higher rank than the interrogators. The officers came out and wiped the sweat from their foreheads. One of them explained, Captain Stoker, this little hoodlum is being disobedient. He even dared to attack us. Why is he so bold? The captain asked furiously. Then... He strode into the interrogation room to see the young man who dared to attack his men. Just what do you think you're doing? He asked menacingly. Smitty, who was about to punch another officer, looked up in surprise. Captain Stoker? Smitty? The captain exclaimed in surprise. Then his tone became serious and he asked the officer who was in charge. What's going on here? This guy was involved in a fight. We were interrogating him. The officer explained. He could tell that Smitty and Captain Stoker knew each other. Smitty pointed and said, Captain, look... Do you see how they are interrogating me? The captain looked and saw various torture instruments lined up on a side table. When he saw this, his expression changed. He addressed the officer. What do you think you're doing? Who told you to do this? Get rid of this stuff. The captain was furious. Although Smitty's father was not his direct superior, he knew the man well. They were old friends, and as such, he felt a responsibility to look after the man's son. But captain, this young man... The officer protested. But Captain Stokes interrupted him. It doesn't matter what he did. Hurry up and release him. The captain was in charge, so the officer had no choice but to do as he asked. When he heard the order, he panicked and quickly released the prisoner. Smitty looked smug. He said, Now what about my friends? What friends? Captain Stokes asked with confusion. He didn't know about Damon and the others. Release my friends now, Smitty demanded without further explanation. After they uncuffed him, he rushed out of the door. The captain watched in shock. He knew all about Smitty's reputation. The guy was not afraid of anything. However, the son of the police chief shouldn't be hanging around with gangsters. It looked bad. Helpless, Captain Stokes watched as Smitty ran to check the other interrogation rooms. The other rooms were also in chaos. Frank and Leroy had attacked their interrogators as well. Without exception, the officers were all stunned by the young man's strength and gall. The captain was surprised to see that they had all broken free from their restraints. Smitty opened the door to Damon's interrogation room, and Damon walked out uninjured. When his friends saw this, they felt relieved. However, the two officers in the room with him hadn't fared as well. They were both unconscious and foaming at the mouth. Damon greeted Frank, Leroy, and Smitty, and they went to bust out Bruno, who was still being interrogated. After he was free, 
Bruno took out his phone and saw that he had dozens of missed calls. The calls were from his lackeys. He called them back to see what was happening and received some bad news. Bruno, come quickly. Someone is attacking your family. What? Who? It's a guy called Noah. Bruno was furious. He hung up the phone and turned to Damon. Noah attacked my family. I have to go help them. Let's go, Damon said with a wave of his hand. We will go together. Smitty added, I know a lot of people in New York City. I'll call them to back us up. Frank did even better. He took out his phone and called the nearby military academy. Hey, it's me, Frank. A hooligan is giving me trouble and I need your help. Let me give you the address. Come quickly, it's serious. After hanging up the phone, he snapped his fingers at Damon. Done. How dare Noah try to get us locked up? Let's teach him a lesson he'll never forget. Then, they all left the station, got in taxis, and rushed to help Bruno's family. At this moment, Captain Briggs was feeling a bit overwhelmed. He received news that Captain Stoker had released Damon and his friends. Apparently, one of the people arrested was the son of the police chief, and he'd used his sway at the station to have his friends released as well. The whole story sounded ridiculous, and Captain Briggs didn't believe it. However, he still had something to deal with, so he didn't have time to think about it right now. Noah and his men were busy hunting down people who were connected to Bruno. Bruno's gang had ruined Noah's wedding reception, so Noah was intent on getting revenge. These ruffians were extremely difficult to deal with, so Captain Briggs planned to personally investigate them. It was late afternoon by the time Damon and company arrived at their destination. They had arrived at a small town not far from the city. Bruno had grown up here and most of his family still lived in the area. The taxis dropped them off and they walked down Main Street together. Then they spotted Noah standing on a street corner. He was surrounded by the rest of his gang and they all looked very menacing. There were some people lying on the ground in front of them. These people's faces were swollen and bloody. They were all people who Bruno knew. Suddenly there was a commotion down the street, and several more gangsters arrived, dragging two old men along with them. They threw them into the ground in front of Noah. Then Noah kicked them hard. The old men grunted in pain. Your son ruined my wedding. Tell me, what do you think I should do? Noah roared at one of them. The old man didn't respond. Bruno, Damon, Frank, and the others saw this and ran over. Noah saw them and smiled coldly. Captain Briggs had called to warn him about their release. Noah hadn't asked about the details because he didn't care. Now that they had arrived, he could take his revenge. Bruno looked at the old men who were lying on the ground and exclaimed, Dad! Uncle Rick! He was about to rush forward, but Noah motioned to his lackeys to stop him. Two men suddenly rushed forward and kicked Bruno in the stomach. They caught him unaware, and he fell to the ground, stunned. Damon saw red and roared, You're going to pay for this! Seconds later, Noah rushed towards him, followed by a group of people. Frank and Smitty weren't about to let their friends down, so they charged as well. Noah had brought only a dozen or so people with him. He didn't stand a chance against Damon's impressive skills. The two sides met and chaos ensued. It didn't take long for Damon's side to gain the upper hand. Noah hadn't expected so many to show up to oppose him. He quickly took out his phone and started calling for backup. After hanging up, he shouted, Just you wait, I'm not done with you yet. Damon shot him a disdainful look. Are you done calling your friends? He nodded, and Damon walked over and punched him in the face. Then, he kicked him for good measure. I will teach you to never mess with us again, Damon growled. Then, he rained a flurry of blows down on his enemy. Before long, Noah was howling in pain. A group of bystanders had formed nearby, and when people saw Noah being beaten, they panicked. Stop attacking him, one man shouted. I'll call the police and have you arrested. It turned out that the man was the town's mayor. Bruno punched him in the face. You bastard! These men are attacking my family! Why don't you stop them? Bruno held the mayor down and shouted, Everyone, how can you just stand there and watch these men attack your neighbors? The mayor cowered in fear. Strictly speaking, it was Bruno's own fault that Noah and his gang had come here to bully his family. The townsfolk were afraid of gangsters, so they didn't dare to say anything. They weren't all that fond of the mayor either, though. He was a corrupt bully, so no one stepped forward to help him. They just stood back to watch the show. Frank shouted, Noah, I want all your men to kneel down and beg for mercy. Apologize for what you've done to Bruno's family. Noah's gang glared at their opponents. They weren't going to give up that easily. Then, everyone heard the sound of cars approaching. The noise got louder, and then the headlights came into view. The cars drove down to the main street and stopped right behind the crowd. Then, 20 to 30 people got out and surrounded Damon and his friends. The man who seemed to be their leader spotted Noah kneeling on the ground. He asked, What's going on here? Get up! 
Noah's backup had arrived and it was an impressive sight. Then, everyone heard more cars in the distance. Moments later, dozens of vehicles drove down Main Street. When Smitty saw them, he exclaimed joyously, Damon, my friends are here. The vehicle stopped and a bunch of young men jumped out. They were wearing black masks and they held hammers, axes, machetes, iron pipes, and baseball bats. Noah and his gang were outnumbered five to one. It was easy to see that they were in big trouble. After being released from the police station, Bruno got some bad news. Noah and his gang had gone to his hometown and attacked his family. After hearing this, Bruno, Damon, and the others rushed to stop Noah. Frank and Smitty called everyone who they knew in New York to come help. Their backup had just arrived. Hey, Smitty, we're here, a young blonde-haired man declared. He strode forward holding a big knife in his hand. Noah, who was kneeling on the ground, was stunned. He had underestimated his opponents. How would he deal with all these newcomers? Although the situation looked hopeless, he knew he had to put on a brave face. Otherwise, his men would all lose courage and give up. However, more and more townsfolk were arriving. They stood in the streets and leaned out of windows. Some of them even climbed the trees that lined the road so they could get a better view. None of them came forward to join the fight, but they all watched attentively. In spite of this, Noah still had the guts to curse. Damn it, if you don't kill me, I'll come after your family. Damon smirked and laughed. <laughs> I'd like to see you try. At this moment, the atmosphere was extremely tense. Frank had never fought in such a large brawl before. He had been only a spectator at the last big fight in Meyerson. As such, he was full of excitement. Both sides charged and they collided with each other in a chaotic frenzy. At least 150 people were involved in the fight. The scene was extremely grand and the townsfolk had not seen anything like it in many years. They all watched with great interest. From time to time, they cheered. It was as if they were watching a sports game on television. Noah's side was outnumbered five to one. Damon, Frank, and Leroy fought like wolves. The other side didn't stand a chance and many of them were beaten unconscious. Noah's right-hand man had his teeth knocked out. He fell to the ground bleeding and howling miserably. When his friends saw this, they threw down their weapons and ran for their lives. The battle was over in less than five minutes. The ground was strewn with discarded weapons and stained with blood. Injured gangsters lay everywhere, moaning in pain. Bruno vented his anger by smashing up Noah's car. He slashed the tires, broke the windows, and even tore the door off. The townsfolk were still watching with interest. Sirens sounded in the distance, and not long after, a squad of police cars arrived. Fifty or so officers surrounded Damon and the others. They looked murderous. Noah laughed wildly. Oh, you're in for it now. It's over. Do you dare to attack the police again? Captain Briggs raised his gun high and fired three warning shots. He shouted sternly, Everyone put down your weapons and lie down on the ground. Just then, a few green pickup trucks arrived on the scene. Frank's friends from the military had finally arrived. A man in an army uniform came forward and whispered something to Captain Briggs. Then... He walked over to Frank and Leroy. Drop your weapons and follow me. Let's get you out of here. Everyone was dumbfounded when they saw this. Captain Briggs frowned and growled. These people are suspects. They can't leave. Get lost, the man from the army spat. He kicked the police captain in the stomach. This doesn't concern you. If you have a problem, take it up with your superiors. Captain Briggs was in so much pain that he almost fell to the ground. He was furious and he asserted, You have no right to interfere. This is a civilian matter. You, sir, are out of line. The other man came over and pointed his finger in Captain Briggs' face. He shouted, You should mind your own business. I'll do what I want, and if you try to stop me, I'll make you regret it. The captain was stunned. Just as he was about to speak, his phone rang. It was Captain Stoker, and he roared angrily. Briggs, what are you doing? You are out of your jurisdiction. Get back here right now. You'll be investigated for this. After saying this, Captain Stoker hung up, leaving Briggs dumbfounded and speechless. The townsfolk realized that the situation was getting out of control. Not only were the police here, but the army was here too. What was going on? The townsfolk had never seen so many police officers in one place before. Some of the more timid bystanders were afraid of getting into trouble, so they quietly slipped away and ran home. Captain Briggs watched Damon, Frank, and the others being taken away. He was angry, but he couldn't do anything to stop it. He remembered what Captain Stoker had said to him on the phone. It was true. He was out of his jurisdiction. He had bent the rules today to help Noah. His only saving grace was that Noah's father was the mayor of New York. He was a powerful person, so he'd be able to help him. After the military trucks left, Captain Briggs told his officers to head back to the station. 
Then, with a gloomy expression on his face, he got in his car and left too. Today, he had faced a crushing defeat. But if Noah and Captain Briggs thought that today's matter was settled, they were wrong. Frank and Smitty wouldn't rest until they got revenge. What's more, Damon would not let Noah go so easily either. The three of them formulated a plan to deal with Noah for good. Although they were only students, they wanted to make sure that this gangster would never bother them again. It wasn't going to be easy, though. However, one of their problems was about to sort itself out on its own. Once the station began investigating Captain Briggs, it came to light that he'd violated many rules. On top of this, the investigators discovered that his connections with Noah Miller ran deep. Clearly, this was a conflict of interest. The investigators looked into Captain Briggs' assets and bank accounts, and they discovered that he had received huge sums of money from Noah. Where had Noah gotten this money from? Was it obtained legally? Was it connected to his father, the mayor? There were a lot of unanswered questions. Due to the importance of the case, it was handed over to the FBI. At the same time, the New York City Police Department began to plot against Noah. Mayor Miller was a sly old fox. He knew that the feds were sniffing around, but he was good at hiding his illegal activities. He quietly covered up all the evidence of his past crimes, and at the same time, he used his power to hinder the investigation. However, Noah was less discreet. He had relied on his father's protection for many years, and he had never made any effort to hide his ill deeds from the authorities. Because of this, it was easy for the relevant departments to investigate him thoroughly. They didn't even need to bring the feds in. He was connected to countless crimes. Not only did he run all sorts of illegal gambling dens, but he was also involved in smuggling firearms. These were all major crimes with heavy penalties. It didn't take long for the police to round him up and put him in jail. When Mayor Miller heard that his son had committed these crimes, he was furious. This was very embarrassing for a public figure like himself. Mayor Miller secretly went to the prison to see his son. Noah was no longer happy and carefree like he'd been before. He knelt in front of his father and begged, Dad, please, you have to do something. No matter what, you have to get me out of here. He was paralyzed with fear. He had never imagined that the consequences of crossing Damon and his friends would be so severe. Why does this happen? Some of Noah's closest companions had even ratted on him and told the police everything that they knew. It looked like Noah was going to rot in prison forever. He didn't want to be locked away. He still had many things he wanted to do. Son, you reap what you sow, growled Mayor Miller. He was so angry that he couldn't even look at Noah. Then he got up and left without saying goodbye. However, no matter how angry he was at Noah, Noah was still his son. Mayor Miller was not so heartless as to abandon him to his fate. So, after he left the prison, he thought carefully about what to do next. Finally, he called the governor of the state. Hey, old friend, how have you been lately? I've been well. Are you calling because of the matter with your son? The governor and Mayor Miller had known each other since their university days. Yes, the mayor said politely. The incident involving him has caused quite a stir. The feds are investigating. Oh, I've told you before to watch that kid. He's a trouble. Now something serious has finally happened, right? The governor sounded unusually tired. Since Noah had been imprisoned, it was very likely that his old friend Mayor Miller would also be implicated. The mayor couldn't contain himself. He began to plead. It's too late to say I told you so. You have to help me. You're my only hope. The governor was furious. It's his own fault. That bastard caused all this trouble. He deserves to rot in jail. Mayor Miller played his trump card. I know a lot of secrets about you, old friend. If the feds come after me, I can't guarantee that I'll be able to keep quiet. The governor was at a loss for words. Finally, he growled. Mm, you're a clever one, Miller. Okay, okay, I'll see what I can do. He was the governor, so he had the power to pardon crimes that occurred within his state. With him on the Millers' side, it was only a matter of time before Noah would be released. After the governor agreed to help, Mayor Miller relaxed a little. After all, his son Hugo was also involved in Noah's crimes. If the feds decided to pursue the investigation, the whole family would be doomed. Now, all the mayor had to do was wait for the governor to pull some strings. Unfortunately, the worst was still yet to come. The police were still putting a lot of effort into their investigation of Noah, and they turned up some vital information. To be on the safe side, they transferred him out of the state to a high-security institution. This meant that Mayor Miller could no longer influence his son's case. He became even more panic-stricken a few days later after receiving a call from the governor. Miller, old friend, tell me, who did your son offend? I, I don't know, the mayor stammered. 
In the past few years, Noah had made many enemies. It was impossible to know who was targeting him. The governor growled. Protect yourself. Forget about your son for now. You have to think about your own situation. If you fall, your whole family is finished. The governor's voice was filled with despair. He knew that Noah had offended someone very powerful, and no one could save him now. After all, Mayor Miller's son was far from innocent. In light of recent events, the governor's hands were tied. He couldn't help the Millers now. All right, all right. The mayor sighed and hung up the phone with trembling hands. Then he sat down and stared out the window blankly. It's over. It's all over. His family had been on top for many years, but now they had fallen. It was all because of Noah. Damon naturally paid close attention to these matters. What surprised him was that Frank and Smitty were powerful enough to put Noah away forever. However, he didn't feel bad for the guy. Noah had gotten what he deserved. He was out of the picture, and Damon had one less enemy to worry about. However, Damon still had wondered where his ex-girlfriend Lily had ended up. Although he didn't have feelings for her anymore, he had once loved her. He hoped that wherever she was, she was okay. The summer vacation felt neither long nor short. Before Damon knew it, September was just around the corner. Frank and Leroy hung out in New York City till the end of the holidays. Then, they returned to Washington, D.C. However, while they were in New York, they had a lot of fun together. Emmett and Liam didn't know how Damon escaped from Noah's grasp. After all, the incident at the Dynasty Hotel had caused a huge ruckus. Moreover, the fact that Noah's father was the mayor was no secret anymore. Given Noah's temper, he wouldn't let Damon off the hook so easily. Damon told Liam and Emmett not to worry. Noah was a busy guy, and he didn't have time to waste on students like him. His friends shrugged when they heard this. It made sense to them. After all, Noah was an infamous gangster. Why would he care about Damon? However, they all agreed that if something happened to Noah and Hugo, it would be very satisfying. This seemed unlikely, though. In any case, it had nothing to do with an honest young man like Damon. On the last day of the summer holidays, the walkers dropped Damon off at the bus station and hugged him goodbye. He was off to start his third year at Meyerson University. The summer vacation was over. During the vacation, Avery's grandparents moved out of their old neighborhood and went to live with her parents. In the future, she wouldn't have a reason to come back here anymore. From now on, people wouldn't see her father's Mercedes-Benz driving past. After she left, the neighborhood lost some of its luster. Fortunately, Damon would still occasionally see her at university. They would have fewer opportunities to interact. Damon worked with Claude to continue perfecting his game, Old Century. It was still growing in popularity. People all over the world were playing. The fans were all crazy for it, and Everbright was raking in profits. Although the company had not gone public yet, its value was soaring. As a new gaming company, its success was shocking. However, what made Damon even happier was the success of his website, the Astromar Community Forum. Apart from the desktop version, he had also developed a mobile app. He continued to work on the site, and the content became richer and richer. People visited the site every day to chat, read ebooks, play games, and make friends. All this traffic nearly crashed the site, so to deal with the increasing number of users, he had no choice but to expand. He brought more servers online and established a huge database. The success of the Astromar Community Forum shocked him. In the beginning, he had started solely as a way to release his ebooks. Under his meticulous care, it had quietly grown strong. Unknowingly, it had become a large and comprehensive community with rich content. Now, the number of users on the site exceeds 150 million. Tens of millions of users logged on every day. This was an extremely large number, and it proved that the site had staying power. The users loved it. They could chat with their friends, play games, read novels, and even publish their own blogs. Most surprisingly, the site had been in operation for less than a year. In light of this, such numbers were very impressive. Now it is also becoming one of the top social media apps. If it continued to grow at the same rate, it would soon be comparable to Facebook and Twitter. If that happened, Damon would feel like he had truly succeeded. Everbright had made its name as a gaming company. However, even if Damon created several more popular games, the company would still be limited to a single industry. If, on the other hand, the Astromar community could succeed from a social media perspective, Everbright could rival other giants like Twitter. If it did, the sky was the limit. To give his forum a push in the right direction, he renamed the website Astronet. Damon was confident that Astronet would overturn the world of social media. After registering the new game, it was time to recruit staff. Then, he would rent office space. With the increased number of servers, Everbright's staffing needs increased as well. 
Damon definitely needed to hire a lot of people. In fact, in the month following his rebranding of the site, he hired several hundred new employees. Existing staff were promoted to managerial positions. The expenses related to renting office space for this venture was quite expensive, so Damon even started thinking about purchasing land and constructing a building. Things were moving fast, and it all seemed a little crazy. It was a big deal for a startup company to buy land and construct its own offices. Real estate in Meyerson was in demand. However, if Astronet continued to grow at this pace, such a move was reasonable. Furthermore, the company was very profitable. As such, buying real estate was not just a pipe dream. Damon started to ask his employees to keep an eye on real estate listings in Meyerson. If something good came up, he planned to bid. Of course, he had never done this before, so he had no experience. He needed to hire a team of experts. He was surprised to find that a lot of desirable properties were about to come on the market. When they did, there would be a lot of competition for them. At the same time, there was an upcoming trade show for office supplies. Damon planned to attend. This way, he could source the supplies he'd need for when he completed construction. Making Astronet a success was a huge undertaking. Luckily, Damon had the funds to do it. Quinn hadn't gone home for the vacation. He had spent his summer taking courses to upgrade his computer skills. His diligence, hard work, and talent had paid off. His skills had improved by leaps and bounds. He was practically a hacker now. During the summer vacation, Old Century had experienced a large-scale cyber attack. Because Everbright was short of manpower, Damon asked Quinn to help him deal with it. Damon was surprised to find that Quinn not only dealt with the security breach, but he also played an important role in developing upgrades to prevent such a thing from happening again. This made him see his old friend in a new light. After tireless efforts, Quinn had seriously improved his skills. Damon was satisfied with his friend's work. In addition to paying him handsomely, he had also hired him to develop Astronet. After all, a successful company needed a strong team. Quinn had proven himself valuable, and he was ambitious as well. Damon planned to train him to be a core member of the team. To express his gratitude, he gave Quinn a bonus on top of his pay. Ever since Quinn's father passed away, his life had been difficult. He had been working three jobs to support himself and his family. Despite working hard, his paychecks hardly covered the costs. The paycheck that he received from Damon was undoubtedly the most money he had ever earned in his life. Working for Everbright would solve his financial problems. When he saw the generous bonus that Damon had given him on top of his paycheck, his eyes lit up, but he shook his head. Damon, this is too much. What I did isn't worth this. Besides, you can't afford to pay me so much. Damon replied, You made a great contribution to my company, and you deserve this money. Keep it. Just give me a thousand, that's all it's worth. Quinn argued, despite the fact that he could really use the money. He still had to pay for his textbooks. However, he had his own principles. His father had taught him to be honest and not to take handouts. For this reason, he continued to refuse Damon's generous bonus. Damon thought for a while and finally said, All right, just take a thousand. After saying this, he canceled the transfer and sent a new one for the agreed-upon sum. Thank you, Quinn replied as he accepted the new transfer without looking at the amount. Then, Damon went to the fridge to grab a beer. He asked his friend if he wanted one, but Quinn refused. Damon cracked his beer and asked, You know all about my company now. Do you want to work for me? Quinn's eyes lit up. Sure, I'd love to. He knew that working for Damon paid well, but he still didn't know just how successful Everbright actually was. He thought that it was still just a small startup company. Although starting a tech company in this era was pretty straightforward, he still felt that Damon was very capable. Starting a company was more than he himself had done. That's good, Damon replied. There's an upcoming event that I want you to attend with me. He was thinking about the trade show. He also wanted Quinn to help him with the process of buying real estate. This way, his friend could gain some useful experience. Quinn needed to broaden his horizons. Sure, just let me know the details, Quinn replied. Then, he opened his banking app and looked at his account. He was happy to see the $1,000 added to his balance. This money would help pay for his new textbooks and cover his living expenses. While Damon was busy rebranding Astronet, he got a call from Miss Branto. She hadn't contacted him for a long time. He saw her number on the call display and answered. Where are you? She asked coolly. Is something the matter? I'm outside your dorm. I have something that I need to talk to you about. Come down. Her high and mighty tone annoyed him, and he said, I'm not in my dorm right now. I'm busy. Miss Branto felt anxious when she heard this. She also realized that she was being demanding, so she softened her tone and asked, I have something important to talk to you about. Can you please come down? Damon had Miss Branto wrapped around his finger. She was a proud woman, but she needed him to cooperate with her. If he didn't, her career was finished. In short, she was desperate. Damon thought for a moment, 
He was interested to hear how she had dealt with Will. Additionally, if he wanted to buy land in Meyerson, he had to finance it somehow. Real estate prices in the city were sky high, and it would be difficult for Everbright to come up with so much money all at once. He might as well extend an olive branch to her. After coming to this decision, he walked downstairs and saw Miss Branto's beautiful BMW convertible parked out front. She was leaning against the car. Although she wore sunglasses, they couldn't hide the cold and arrogant look on her face. It was obvious that she had dressed up today. Her hair was curled, and she was wearing a light pink summer dress that accentuated her exquisite figure. Her pale legs were long and slender, and she had a pair of beautiful white heels on. She looked very sexy. She took off her glasses when she saw Damon. Her expression softened for a moment, but it quickly became cold again. Get in the car, she ordered. He got into the passenger seat, and she drove to a rather quiet coffee shop near campus. After they were sitting at the table with their drinks, Damon asked, Is the matter with Will settled yet? Miss Branto frowned. She was unhappy that he had gotten to the point so quickly, but she kept her tone casual. Why are you in such a rush? I don't have time to waste on you, he replied. She put her hand to her chin and looked at him. Then she began to explain the current situation. In short, she was being delicate with her approach to Will. Is that all the progress you've made? Damon criticized. And why did you come to me? Do you think I'll give you the rights to the game if Will is still in the picture? Damon was quite dissatisfied with her handling of the situation. However, Miss Branto shook her head and said, I didn't bring you here today to discuss that. I have something else to ask you. What? What else could she possibly want from him? Her face turned red. She seemed to be a little embarrassed. After a few moments, she explained, Lately, my dad has been hassling me about being single. Damon's IQ was high, but he had a terrible track record with women. He had been rejected many times before, and he found it difficult to guess what they were thinking. So when he heard this, he was very surprised. What does this have to do with me? Miss Branto was so angry that she rolled her eyes at him. What do you think? She shot back. We hooked up in Berlin and it wasn't bad, right? Damon's eyes widened and he retorted, That was just a one-night stand. It didn't mean anything. Am I so undesirable? Miss Branto fumed. By now she was standing. She said fiercely, Why not? We'd be a power couple and my father would love you. I just want to get him off my back. Besides, meeting a good guy is so difficult. Anyway, it was just a thought. Is that what you want? He asked curiously. He wanted to see what she'd say. Miss Branto continued to act stubborn. She stomped her foot and retorted, I don't know what I want. I'm single, though, and I'm not opposed to giving it a try. We could go on a few dates and see if there's a spark. Damon finally understood what she was up to. She wanted to cozy up to him so that he'd give her a better deal on the rights to New Century. He quickly shook his head. I have a girlfriend. Go find someone else. Unless, when Miss Branto heard him reject her, she was deeply disappointed. She didn't expect him to suddenly change the topic and make a request. When she heard him say the word unless, she looked up hopefully. Unless what? She asked. Then, he made a shameless request. Unless you lend me some money. Oh, don't worry. I'm not asking for much. Just a few million. You have the money, right? If you help me out, I promise that I'll pay it back to you in full. It was worth a shot. He could use this situation to his advantage. However, when he suggested this, he felt a little guilty. After all, he was taking advantage of her desperation. And it was a lot of money. If it weren't for the fact that she had a rich father, he wouldn't have asked. Initially, he thought that she would reject his proposition outright. He hadn't expected her to consider it. When she heard his request, her eyes widened in surprise, and she asked curiously, Why do you need so much money? Miss Branto and Damon were at a coffee shop together. She had just asked him to date her. Damon already had a girlfriend, but he realized that he might be able to use this new development to his advantage. He agreed to go on a date with her if she lent him money. She didn't reject his proposition outright, so he knew there was a chance she might agree. He explained why he needed the money. I want to buy a piece of land on the outskirts of town. Right now my company is based in Germany, but I want to move the headquarters to Meyerson. He didn't tell her about his plan for Astronet. After all, it was only in the early stages. Additionally, he was in competition with Silly Goose. It was better to keep such plans a secret. The fewer people who knew about it, the better. Miss Branto didn't ask any more questions. She assumed that Damon just wanted to expand Everbright. If Damon's company expanded, it was actually a good thing for Miss Branto. If she could convince him to cooperate with her, their alliance would be very powerful. Despite this, Miss Branto sneered. A date with you isn't worth millions. 
Damon had mocked her in the past. She knew he was just trying to take advantage of her now. She still remembered how rude he'd been to her in Berlin. However, Damon was confident. I'm not asking you to give it to me. I just want to borrow the money. I'll even pay it back with interest. She looked at him with her big, beautiful eyes. Then she smiled and said, I'll agree to your request, and I won't even charge you interest, but... But what? She sized him up for a moment. When she next spoke, her tone was softer. But I want you to be my boyfriend. What? He hadn't heard her clearly. She mustered her courage and spoke a little louder. If you agree to be my boyfriend, I will lend you the money without interest. I've already agreed to date you, isn't that enough? He asked casually. She had a strange look in her eyes. Her pretty face became redder and redder and she explained softly. What I mean is, I want the real thing. I want you to love me and be my boyfriend. His eyes widened in surprise. He could see that she wasn't joking. Then his expression became very stiff. Please be serious, okay? I have a girlfriend and I'm not in the mood to play your games. Miss Branto stomped her foot and pouted her lips. Damon had to admit that she looked very cute when she got upset like this. She usually looked so cold and proud. He was seeing a whole new side of her. He noticed her chest heaving as she took deep breaths to calm herself down. Her sexy, tight-fitting dress made this hard to ignore. Miss Branto gritted her teeth and said, You're a bastard. How can you reject me? I don't care. No matter what, I'll make you change your mind. She was being shameless. Damon couldn't believe his ears. He smiled bitterly and said, Love doesn't work like that. She retorted, You stinker. You can't deny that we have chemistry. Think about what you're asking, he replied. It's impossible for us to be together. Our values are not the same. You are from a rich family, and I'm just an ordinary person. You need to find someone who suits you better. I'm not interested in becoming a plaything for a rich young lady like you. You better give up on this idea. I'm tired of discussing it. Her face was still bright red. She said seriously, I'm not as ignorant as you think. Also, she trailed off. Her tone became gentler and her cold expression faded. I think we have similar values, she finished. Although she was ruthless when it came to business, she had principles. She was always honest. Damon laughed. I'd like to hear your reasoning. The two of them didn't really know each other well, but he still found her claim hard to believe. Unexpectedly, she began to explain. First of all, you created the old and new century games, which proves that you're very talented. Second, you risked your life to save all those people on the plane, and you didn't want any recognition for it. That proves that you're brave and selfless. These qualities are consistent with my own values. Women loved heroes. Miss Branto would always remember how Damon had showed up in the nick of time to save her from the hijackers. He didn't realize what this meant to her. She would remember that moment for her whole life, and she wasn't the only one. The flight attendants and the other female passenger, Victoria, would remember it as well. Damon was such a good person. When he realized that he'd never be hers, her heart filled with disappointment. She never imagined that she'd find the hero who saved her again, but she did. Unfortunately, she'd made a big mistake, and he'd never forgive her for it. Her expression was very serious, but her tone was gentle. She was not joking. She really wanted him to be her boyfriend. This was the real reason why she'd brought him here today. She was purposely dragging her feet when it came to dealing with Will because she needed more time to win him over. Once the deal was done, he'd have no reason to talk to her anymore. Even Miss Branto herself couldn't explain her feelings for him. She thought back to the first time they'd met. AC Games had been desperate to partner with Silly Goose. After that, they met at the airport and in Berlin several times as well. Miss Branto was a person who believed in fate. She was sure that their chance meetings hadn't been coincidences, especially that night after the party at Claude's. Although they had hooked up only once, Miss Branto reminisced over it endlessly. She often thought about what had happened that night in Damon's hotel room. She didn't know if this was love, but she couldn't stop thinking about his smile. If only there was a way to make him feel the same way about her. Damon watched her from across the table. His expression was serious. Sorry, I have a girlfriend. Since Miss Branto did not look like she was joking, Damon knew he had to put an end to this discussion. She realized that he did not feel the same way about her, so she became anxious. Why won't you give me a chance? Besides, I have a lot to offer. I'm willing to do anything you want. Her usual cold demeanor was gone. She watched him with big, beautiful eyes. At this moment, she did not look like a domineering business person. He looked gentle and affectionate. Besides, I kind of like you, 
she went on, and we've already hooked up, so that's out of the way. Miss Branta was a straightforward person. Although she felt a little awkward, she was telling him the truth. She was not the kind of person who beat around the bush. Damon, on the other hand, felt embarrassed. He thought about Fiona, who loved him as much as he loved her, and he shook his head. I'm sorry, I can't give you what you want, and I'm really not as amazing as you think. If I was actually your boyfriend, you'd regret it. If you have nothing else to say, I need to get going. I still have some things to deal with today. After saying this, he stood up and prepared to leave. To be honest, he found her gentle side irresistible. He was a romantic at heart. If he weren't, he wouldn't constantly be thinking about Avery and Veronica. He was afraid that if he sat with Miss Branto for too long, he'd fall for her. After all, he had also enjoyed the night that they spent together in Berlin. In any case, he knew that they had chemistry. Miss Branto saw that he was about to leave and she stood up to stop him. Her tender expression still held a glimmer of hope. Don't leave, okay? I can't get you out of my head. I'll never forget how you saved me on the plane. Anyway, I don't care how it sounds. I like you. Please don't leave, okay? He enchanted her. He was so handsome and he'd saved her life. She'd never forget the night they'd spent together. She was shy, but she couldn't deny her physical attraction to him. What happened that night wasn't shameful. It was wonderful. In any case, when she thought of it, her cheeks blushed and her heart started beating uncontrollably. She was proud of their dirty secret. Damon was not prepared to hear her confess her feelings like this, but he stood firm. He shook his head and asserted, It's impossible. We can't be together. You're a dog, she cried in disappointment. She hadn't expected him to reject her offer, so her expression turned ugly. If you don't agree to give me a chance, I will tell your girlfriend what happened between us. <laughs> then she will break up with you. Damon glared at her. You don't dare. Just wait and see. Don't underestimate me, she threatened. She seemed determined to hold on to him till the end. But soon, she softened and gave in. I just like you, that's all. Don't reject me like this, okay? Please give me a chance. As she spoke, she got up and came to stand beside him. Then, she wrapped her snow-white arms lightly around his neck and leaned down to kiss him. From where Damon was sitting, he could see right down the front of her dress as she bent towards him. He felt his mouth go dry. He wasn't sure he could control himself if she continued to seduce him like this. So, he hurriedly pushed her away and fled. He was so angry that she stomped her foot. She called after him. Damon, don't forget about me. I'll be waiting for you. Damon's plan to get Miss Branto to lend him money had failed. The property that he had his eye on was being listed soon. Although it was located on the outskirts of town, it was a large lot and the price was reasonable. However, if many people were interested, there was a possibility of a bidding war. He moved some money around and managed to scrape together the down payment from his company account, but he wasn't sure it was enough. The property would go up for sale early the next morning and Damon wanted to be at the real estate agency when it did. He had hired a team of agents to help him. After all, he knew nothing about purchasing property. His team would handle all the details. He was the CEO of Astronet, so he wanted to meet with the real estate agents in person. He had to be sure that he was making the right decision. When he went to the office, he took Quinn with him. Quinn had no idea what Damon had planned that day. The office was located in a fancy building downtown, and it was Quinn's first time going somewhere so official. He could not help but feel out of place when he saw the well-dressed people in this office. The agency was very busy today. A lot of people were interested in his piece of land. The prospective buyers were all from big and powerful companies. Until now, Quinn didn't know what Damon had planned. After he saw the sign on the door of the office, he asked quietly, What are we doing here? I want to bid on a piece of property, Damon replied casually. He had a lot of life experience, so although this was his first time in a real estate agency, he felt calm. As long as he got the price he wanted, he would put in an offer. Naturally, if the price was too high, he would pull out. Quinn wondered how much his friend was prepared to spend today, but he was too embarrassed to ask. He knew the property prices in Meyerson were sky high. If Damon had bought land, he would still have to develop it too. Of course, Quinn did not know the price of the property in question. Suddenly, someone called Damon's name. Damon and Quinn both turned around in surprise. It was Chloe, the quiet girl who was friends with Alex. However, Chloe had never been fond of Damon. She looked down on him, so it was surprising that she'd taken the initiative to greet him. Damon was at a real estate agency in a fancy office building downtown. A property that he was interested in buying was being listed today, and he wanted to be the first to put an offer on it. He had brought Quinn along with him. 
He hadn't expected to run into anyone he knew here, but then he saw Chloe. She was with a group of fashionable-looking young people. Damon smiled and said, Hello. She nodded at him. She was curious why he was here. After all, he didn't seem like the kind of person who could afford to buy property in Meyerson. Perhaps he was just here for work or something like that. Chloe turned and left without another word. She was with a woman named Starla. Starla could not help but look back at Damon and ask, Who is he? Another friend whose name was Brittany joked, He's quite handsome. Why did you walk away? Chloe said lightly, He's a nobody. He knows Alex, that's all. She had never approved of Damon, and she felt that simply knowing him was a bit embarrassing. Is that so? How come we haven't met him before? Starla asked with interest. Alex was very particular about who he hung out with, so this Damon guy must be something special. If he was friends with Alex, he wasn't a nobody. Alex likes him only because he's skilled at fighting. He just happened to help us out a few times, Chloe said casually with a smile. Then she changed the subject. Hey, have you downloaded the app that I told you about? You know, Astronet? Brittany shrugged. No, I already use Facebook. What's the point? Starla stuck her tongue out at Brittany and said, Come on, Brit, you have to try it. It's really great. Chloe nodded vigorously in agreement. All of our friends are using it. This social media app is truly amazing. It's not as popular as Facebook. I'm not interested, Brittany asserted. She couldn't be bothered to switch to Astronet. More and more people were arriving at the office. Chloe and Starla grabbed a seat in the corner. They were not here to make an offer. Starla's father worked here, so she and Chloe hung around the office sometimes when they were bored. One of the real estate agents was telling people about the property. However, Damon was not interested. He had already done his research on the land. Instead, he wandered around to kill some time. That's when he noticed an old acquaintance sitting in a meeting room. It was Miss Branto, and she was with the group of people wearing silly goose uniforms. It was obvious that she'd noticed him. When she saw him looking at her, a beautiful smile flicked across her face. She even winked at him and raised an eyebrow. Now that she'd confessed her true feelings to him, she wasn't shy anymore. Damon quickly collected himself and went back to listen to the info session that was happening on the other side of the room. The session was just wrapping up. The property was a 30-acre plot in a newly developed part of town. Quinn listened intently during the info session, but afterwards he felt confused. He had assumed that Damon was interested in buying a small lot or a pre-existing building. Why was the agent talking about a 30-acre piece of land? How big was that, anyways? Quinn wondered if he had misheard things. Was this actually happening? No matter how highly he thought of Damon, he never imagined that his friend could afford to buy a property like this. Where would he get the money? All right, everyone, we are now accepting offers, an agent announced. When people heard this, they crowded around the agents and began to submit their offers. Damon, on the other hand, waited patiently to one side. First, he'd see what people were willing to pay. Then, if he could afford to, he'd submit an offer of his own. Quinn, who was beside him, watched everyone busily milling about. Then, he turned and tapped Damon on the shoulder. He whispered, Is this the piece of property you wanted to buy? The 30-acre lot? Yes, Damon replied. Quinn gave him a strange look. He couldn't believe his ears, and he stammered, Really? 30 acres? H how much is it? It will likely sell for more than 10 million, his friend replied casually. 10 million? Even 1 million was a huge amount of money in Quinn's eyes, let alone 10 million. He watched the prospective buyers putting in offers for enormous sums, and he felt very out of place. He whispered to Damon, We're just here to watch, right? Quinn couldn't imagine why else they would be there. Students like them didn't have millions of dollars. Because Damon hadn't made an offer yet, Quinn assumed that he couldn't afford to do so. Not to mention the fact that the price was so high it made Quinn's heart pound. He wouldn't earn that much money even if he saved for the rest of his life. However, Damon muttered, We're here to put in an offer. If the price is right, I plan to buy this land to develop. After saying this, he walked up to an agent to put in an offer of his own. Currently, the highest offer was just under $10 million. Quinn wondered if he had misheard Damon. It was either that or he was going crazy. Then, before his eyes, he heard his friend make an offer. The agent nodded and replied, $10 million from Astronet, right? When people nearby heard this, they all turned to look. Some were surprised that Astronet put in a high offer like this so soon, but most were surprised because they'd never heard of the company before. After all, any company that could afford to buy property like this in Meyerson must be successful, right? Silly Goose was here to put in an offer, but it was a large corporation, so this wasn't surprising. Quinn felt as if he were having a heart attack. Had he gone mad? 
Damon's offer also attracted Chloe's attention. She nudged her friends and whispered something to them. If she was not mistaken, Damon had just made an offer. But she couldn't believe her ears. She must have misheard him. After all, how could someone like Damon afford to buy this piece of property? Starla, on the other hand, said in surprise, Did he just say Astronet? That could be the parent company of the Astromar Community Forum. Brittany had a look of shock on her face as well. No, it can't be. That's the app you were telling me about, right? Chloe, does that guy you know work for the company? Starla thought hard. She remembered seeing the Astronet logo last time she logged on to the Astromar Community Forum. This was really shocking. The crowd around Damon had fallen silent. Although many big companies were determined to get this piece of land, they were hesitant to pay more than $10 million for it. It wasn't worth that much to them. Therefore, many companies quietly withdrew. When the agent who was in charge asked if there were any higher offers, only one person came forward. He represented a company called Meyerson Dynamics. $10.5 million. By now, everyone else had withdrawn. The price was getting too high, and people weren't willing to pay so much. Damon saw the new offer, and he frowned. Then he gritted his teeth and said, $10.8 million. This was as high as he'd go. He was trying to intimidate the other party and show that he was determined to win. If Meyerson Dynamics put in a higher offer, Damon would give up. $11 million, the other man replied. He seemed determined to beat Damon. Damon shook his head helplessly and smiled bitterly. He did not have enough money to go higher. At this moment, he could only give up. Suddenly, someone new came forward and declared, I'd like to offer $11.5 million. Everyone looked to see who had spoken. The agents were also surprised. Which company was rich and powerful enough to compete with Meyerson Dynamics' offer? Silly Goose offers $11.5 million, the speaker reiterated. When people heard this, they understood. Silly Goose was a huge corporation. It wasn't surprising that they could top Meyerson Dynamics' offer. The speaker's voice sounded familiar to Damon. He looked over and saw Miss Branto. Her expression was confident and proud. She was determined to buy the property. The man from Meyerson Dynamics also realized who he was up against. Compared to Silly Goose, his company was much smaller. He didn't have the capital to get into a bidding war with Miss Branto's company. $11.5 million, is that the highest offer? The agent asked. No one else said anything, so the agent shook Miss Branto's hand and went off to finalize the sale. The 30-acre plot was sold. Damon felt a bit disappointed, but the price exceeded his budget. Gwyn was still in shock. Now he was even more curious about his friend. After all, they'd been roommates for more than two years. Where had Damon suddenly got all this money from? Quinn felt that there was a lot he didn't know about the guy, and he wasn't alone. Theo, Xander, and Hector were in the dark about Damon too. However, Quinn assumed that Damon just worked for Astronet, and he was making the offers on behalf of the company. Naturally, Damon was disheartened by the day's outcome. After all, he had all sorts of grand plans for the property. He wanted to take his company to the next level. Unfortunately, the land was too expensive. Damon's company was still in the development stage, so it didn't have enough cash flow to buy something so expensive. Hey, handsome, wait up. Someone called as Damon was about to leave. Chloe and her friends ran over to catch up to him. It was Starla who had spoken. Although Damon did not like girls like Chloe, he was on good terms with Alex and Emily, so he didn't want to insult their friends. He smiled and said, What is it? Starla had a hopeful expression on her face. I want to ask you a question. You work for Astronet, right? Is that company connected to the Astromar Community Forum? Damon and Quinn were just leaving the real estate office. Damon hadn't been able to afford the property. A man from a rival company outbid him, but Miss Branto swooped in at the last minute and made the highest offer. Just as Damon was walking out the door, Chloe and her group of friends stopped him. Starlo wanted to know if Astronet was connected to the Astromar Community Forum. Damon thought for a moment and then said, The forum was rebranded. The whole site is called Astronet now. Starla, Brittany, and the other women looked at him in disbelief. They couldn't believe that they were talking to someone who actually worked for the company. Many of them were big fans. They had stopped using Facebook and Twitter a while ago. Astronet offered a more enjoyable user experience. Starla, Brittany, and the others gazed at Damon with looks of admiration. Starla impatiently asked, Since you work there, have you met the founder? He's my hero. My classmates admire him too. Could you get me his autograph? I'd be very grateful. Um, Damon hesitated. He felt embarrassed. He did not want people to know that he was the founder of Astronet, but he also didn't want to lie. 
He was just about to tell the woman that he'd do his best to get them autographs when he was interrupted. He heard the sounds of footsteps approaching. Then, Miss Branto called from afar. Mr. Walker, I've been looking for you. Why are you hiding over here? Are you playing hide-and-seek with me? Damon turned around and saw Miss Branto leading the entire Silly Goose team over. She had a smile on her face, and she looked victorious. After all, she'd just purchased the land that he'd had his eye on. Was she here to rub it in his face? Damon's expression turned ugly. What do you want? Clearly, he felt sore about the situation. He already didn't like the woman. Was she trying to stab him in the back again? Her cold and arrogant expression suddenly faded, and she burst into laughter. The sight was as beautiful as a flower blooming. What's wrong, Mr. Walker? Are you still angry with my company? What if my company were willing to sell you the land? I'd even give you a reasonable price. Say, $10.5 million? Would you thank me? Damon's eyes widened. Was this a joke? Was Miss Branto actually willing to sell the property to him at a loss? Doing so would be a huge gift to Astronet. He thought he'd misheard her. Are you serious? Would I lie to you? Miss Branto replied. If you want it, we can start the paperwork. I'm not trying to trick you. In return, I hope that you will remember Silly Goose's kindness. Please give us the rights to the new century as soon as possible, okay? After saying this, she shot him a cool look, but Damon could see the affection behind it. She wanted to let him know that she liked him. If you sell me the property at a loss, won't the board of directors be upset? He asked. She put her hands on her hips and stood tall. They won't interfere. Besides, I will cover the loss with my own money. It won't be a problem. Only someone rich could be so generous as to give away that much money. In fact, Silly Goose did not need this piece of land at all. Miss Branto had bought it only because she knew Damon wanted it. She'd made up her mind to give the property to Damon before she even made an offer. Quinn listened to the conversation with disbelief. He couldn't believe his ears. Then I have to thank you, Damon said gratefully. Don't worry, as long as you take care of Will, I won't cause you any more problems. If Miss Branto was really willing to sell this piece of land to Astronet at such a low price, why not accept it? Furthermore, he didn't think that she was joking. After all, she still needed the rights to New Century, so she couldn't risk angering him. All right then, let's get the ball rolling, she exclaimed. She took a long look at him again. Then she bit her lip and asked tentatively, When are you free? We need to discuss the details. We could do it over dinner sometime. It was obvious that she was using this as an excuse to spend more time with him. Since confessing her feelings to him, she'd become bolder and bolder. If it weren't for the people around them, she would have come over and embraced him. Damon didn't dare to look her in the eyes. He avoided her gaze and said, I'll call you. We can make a plan. A trace of disappointment flashed in her eyes, but she nodded and said goodbye. Then she took her team and left. Chloe and her friends had all overheard this exchange. Starla, who had been speechless until now, looked at him in shock. Are you the boss of Astronet? Then that means you're the founder too, right? Damon nodded. There was no point in denying it now. Wow, it's an honor to meet you, Starla gushed. The other women all gazed at him with admiration. They were acting like fans meeting a big star. Starla even took out her notebook and hurriedly asked, Can I have your autograph? I love Astronet. Chloe's other friends all gaped at him but they weren't as starstruck as Starla. Still, meeting someone so important was rare. Damon did not refuse. He took her notebook and signed his name in it. Starla treated the autograph like a precious treasure. She had the founder of Astronet's signature. This was simply awesome. Damon, I underestimated you, Chloe exclaimed in surprise. It was the first time that she had ever praised him. Astronet was the only social media app that she used now. It was extraordinary. Damon just shrugged and smiled. Oh, come out to eat with us sometime, Chloe urged. She had been a snob to him before, but she didn't apologize. That was the way of the world. Now that Chloe had discovered who he was, she felt a bit proud to know Damon. All right, if I have time, I definitely will, he replied, neither declining or accepting her offer. Chloe's expression stiffened when she heard this, but she still nodded. All right, then. However, she was secretly peeved that he'd brushed her off. Well, fine. What did she care about? After saying goodbye, Damon and Quinn left the office. Damon was in a much better mood now. He and Quinn went out to eat together. After the meal, he had some things to attend to before returning to campus, but he asked Quinn if he was interested in seeing the piece of land in question. Quinn was surprised. Doesn't Silly Goose still own it, though? Sure, but not for long. I'm certain that Silly Goose will keep their word and transfer the title to me as soon as possible, Damon said confidently. Then, he hailed a taxi and brought Quinn to the outskirts of town where the property was located. 
The land was just a big, empty lot. A gentle breeze blew through the weeds that grew there, making them sway. Damon and Quinn looked at the land with fascination. It was as if they were imagining the building that would stand there one day. This building would house the world-class enterprise called Everbright. In the future, this part of town would develop and become prosperous. Damon smoked his cigarette and asked leisurely, Do you ever think about the future? Quinn looked at the barren land with longing in his eyes. I just want to live a carefree life. The most important thing to me is paying back those who've helped me, like you, my mom, and my sister. It was hard for Damon to believe that Quinn didn't have higher ambitions, but then again, he knew that his friend was from a humble background. Even just going to university was a big achievement for people from his hometown. He was grateful for what he had. Damon nodded. Have you ever thought about what you want to do after university? What kind of career do you want? You could work for Everbray. The company is going to be a huge success. Quinn nodded. He couldn't see Damon's vision. At this point in life, his future seemed uncertain. He didn't have much thought to life after graduation. Damon pointed at the land and said, I plan to build a big building here. It will be the headquarters for Astronet. Then Quinn asked a question that he'd wanted to ask for a long time now. Damon, what does Astronet do? He still hadn't recovered from his shock over the whole situation. What he'd seen at the real estate agency was completely foreign to him. Damon did not answer. He just asked, Are you willing to join the company? He still had many things to deal with in the early stages, and he could use Quinn's help. He continued, Apart from the management aspects, I'm afraid that your finance major won't be of much use, but you seem to be a natural with computers. I'll join, Quinn said with a nod. After getting back to the dorm, Quinn did some research into Astronet. When he finished, he closed his laptop without a word. He finally understood why Chloe's friends were so excited to get Damon's autograph. However, Quinn also felt excited. He'd read all about Astronet and its future prospects. It was a promising new company. He'd never imagined that his roommate was the founder. Like Quinn, Damon came from humble beginnings. Fiona had also returned to school. She'd spent the summer studying in a special program and her skills had improved by leaps and bounds. Damon hadn't seen her in months. When he finally did, she looked even more beautiful and moving than he remembered. She'd missed him a lot. However, when she returned to school, her mother dropped her off. Fiona didn't want her mother to know that she was still with Damon, so she avoided hanging out with him while Karen was in town. When Fiona and her mother arrived in Meyerson, it was precisely 5 p.m. Let's have dinner together, Karen suggested. All Fiona wanted to do was see her cupcake, so she said, Mom, shouldn't you be heading back? It's already late. Don't worry about me, I can carry my luggage from here. Let my assistant help you carry it, Karen insisted. Let's have dinner. Her words were firm. Her daughter pouted. But mom, you just want to go and meet Damon, right? Karen said lightly. Fiona quickly shook her head and lied. No, he's not back yet. Good, then why are you trying so hard to get rid of me? Karen pulled her daughter's hand and Fiona got into the car. What choice did she have? Karen took her to a rather high-end restaurant and ordered for them both. Finally, her serious expression faded and she looked at her daughter lovingly. Fifi, tell me about your summer. How was the music program in Washington, D.C.? Fiona's eyes lit up and she talked about the program. Oh, it was great. I really like the atmosphere there. In fact, she had once planned to do her undergrad at the D.C. Academy of Music, but she ended up at Meyerson because it was her mother's alma mater. However, Karen could see how much her daughter had improved over the summer. She wondered if she hadn't made a mistake by pushing for her daughter to attend Meyerson University's College of Music instead. Fortunately, it was not too late to correct this mistake. Fiona was only in third year. If she switched schools now, she could still spend two years studying in D.C. before graduating. That's good, Karen replied. I'm happy to see how much you've improved. She smiled and nibbled at her meal. Then she continued, I also talked to Mrs. Shelby. You know, your teacher in D.C. She had great things to say about you. She thinks that you need to strive for more. Fiona blinked her eyes. She didn't understand what her mother was trying to say. Fiona had spent the summer vacation attending a music program in Washington, D.C. Now she was back in Meyerson. Her mother had driven her back to school, and she insisted on having dinner with her daughter before heading home. They were sitting together at a fancy restaurant, and Karen was discussing Fiona's future. She took a sip of her soup and said softly, Making you attend Meyerson was a mistake. Although the College of Music here isn't bad, it's nowhere near as prestigious as the D.C. Academy of Music. I shouldn't have discouraged you from doing your undergrad there. However, it's not too late to transfer. In fact, 
I've already informed the Academy that you're thinking about it. They are willing to accept you. Transfer schools? When Fiona heard this, her pretty face turned pale and she stammered, Mom, you wanted me to attend Meyerson. Besides, I've already gotten used to living here. I... Karen interrupted her. Fifi, didn't you just tell me that you like the DC Academy of Music? That school suits you better. Furthermore, I've found a professional musician there who's agreed to tutor you. Transferring there will be better for your career prospects. You could even do a master's at the Royal College of Music after you graduate. But I've already arranged everything for you, Karen stated firmly. She stared at her daughter's face and asked, What's wrong? Are you worried about leaving Damon? I... Fiona hesitated. She felt a little guilty, and she didn't dare to look her mother in the eye. Karen had always been strong-willed. She was the reason why Fiona had attended Meyerson University in the first place. But this time, her daughter stood her ground. She mustered up her courage and said, Mother, I don't want to go. Karen felt a little angry when she heard this. Is this because of Damon? You should forget about him. He isn't anything special. I had him investigated, and it turns out that he's just like your father. No, he's worse than your father. To put it bluntly, he's a nobody. Karen paused and took a deep breath to calm herself. Then she went on. I know that you're in love right now, but you have to trust me on this. If you stay with him, you'll regret it. I don't want to see you make the same mistake as me. Do you think that guy can give you the life you want? He can't. Stop dreaming. He's useless. Fiona was upset. Mom, don't say that about him. He's a good guy. You saw the car he was driving that day, right? He has his own company and his own career. Anyways, he's not as bad as you think. Is that so? Her mother shot back. He's the boss of KC Games, right? She knew all about Damon's so-called career. She had hired a private investigator to look into him. She even knew about his new company, Everbright. Fiona realized that her mother seemed to know more about Damon's business than she herself. When she heard this, she became curious to know more. Karen smoothed her hair and explained, Honey, KC Games is indeed very successful. I will admit that it has potential. However, your boyfriend doesn't own the company anymore. There was a crisis and he was removed from his position. Fiona's pretty face turned pale. How is that possible? I'm not lying to you, Karen continued. You can go and look online. He is no longer with the company. I've already asked around and I discovered that he sold all his shares. She paused for effect. At the end of the day, he and your father have the same personality. They are both talented, but their horizons are too small. They are satisfied with the status quo and don't strive for more. Fiona bit her lip and did not speak. Her mother softened her tone. Honey, I want you to know that I mean well. I just want what's best for you. Haven't you always wanted a career in the music industry? Now the opportunity is right in front of you. Besides, after you graduate from the DC Academy of Music, you can go on to study at the Royal College of Music. How can you give up your dream? Karen took another bite of her meal. Besides, you don't even have to break up with him. DC isn't that far away. You can visit each other on the holidays. If your relationship preserves, it will prove that you both truly love each other. Even I will have to admit that you are meant to be together. If that's the case, I will support you. What do you think? Karen said it tactfully. She knew that the DC Academy of Music was full of handsome and talented men. In time, her daughter would get over Damon. When that happened, she'd thank her mother. No, Fiona retorted. Her mother had hit a nerve. Her cupcake was the most important person in her life. Karen couldn't hide her anger anymore. Fifi, why can't you trust me? I'm only doing what's best for both of you. You may not want to listen to me, but I bet he will. Since she couldn't convince her daughter, she was willing to use force. She would do anything for the sake of her daughter's future. She didn't care if Fiona hated her for it. She wouldn't let her make a mistake like this. In Karen's eyes, nothing was more important than Fiona's future. Furthermore, she believed that one day her daughter would understand her good intentions. Fiona's pretty face turned pale when she heard her mother's threat. If her mother really wanted to deal with Damon, she could easily do so. Honey, I am giving him a chance. I don't want to force either of you to do anything. If he really loves you, he should help you pursue your dream. He should also try to prove that he is worthy of you. If he does, I will accept him. If he doesn't, then you will have dodged a bullet. After saying this, Karen gave her daughter a long look. Then she finished. I hope you can understand that I have good intentions. Fiona finished her meal as quickly as possible. Then she returned to her dorm. 
Her head was a mess, so she flopped down on her bed to think. Maddie, Gwen, and Tara had also returned from vacation. Maddie and Tara were watching shows on their phones, and Gwen was busy getting dressed up. She was going out tonight. Gwen's eyes lit up when she saw Fiona. She smiled and exclaimed, You're back! Did you go out to eat with your handsome boyfriend? Fiona hummed softly to herself. She didn't intend to tell her roommate what had happened. Gwen looked at her expectantly. Then she blinked and asked, What's wrong? Did you get into a fight with your boyfriend? Hey, it's normal for couples to fight. Don't take it to heart. My boyfriend and I are having problems right now, but it'll blow over in a few days. Her words were meant to be encouraging, but she sounded like she was showing off. Maddie stopped watching her show and asked, Gwen, remind me, where does your boyfriend live again? I can't remember if you said he was studying in Australia or Canada. Gwen cast a cool glance at her roommate. She said lightly, Oh, that guy? We broke up a long time ago. He was a loser. I can't believe I ever dated him. After saying this, she started painting her nails. She continued confidently. My new boyfriend goes to Stanford. He's doing his master's there. He was planning to do his PhD too, but his father wants him to take over for the family business. So in the end, he decided to put off doing his doctorate. Wow. Maddie and Tara gasped in surprise. Gwen's boyfriend sure sounded amazing. Maddie asked, What does his family do? His family has an import-export company. His father wants him to deal with the finances. That's why he studied at Stanford. Her tone was filled with pride, and it was obvious that she wanted her roommates to ask more questions. Sure enough, Maddie complied. How big is his company? Gwen had a smug look on her face. He hasn't told me all the details, but I know it's a big company. His family is very wealthy, and he owns a lot of luxury cars. He even has a Rolls Royce. However, he says that the Rolls is too flashy. He prefers to drive his Bentley. It's even more expensive than that car we saw at the exhibition. Wow, it sounds like your boyfriend is richer than Fifi's, Tara joked. <laughs> no, I didn't mean it like that. He just likes collecting cars, Gwen boasted. Fiona heard her roommate's conversation, but she did not have the slightest interest in joining. She tossed and turned in her bed, unable to fall asleep. The next morning, she called Damon and asked him out to dinner. It had been two months since they'd seen each other. She was so excited that she got all dressed up before going to meet him. Damon spotted her from afar. He saw her exquisite figure coming down the stairs. She was simply stunning. He did not know whether it was just because he missed her so much, but he found her even more beautiful than before. She looked like a beautiful fairy. He felt drunk just from watching her. He looked her over from head to toe. The other guys in the lobby were also drooling over her. They seemed to be lost in thought. One of them even tripped and nearly fell over because he was distracted by her beauty. However, Fiona didn't even look at them. They all wondered what kind of person was worthy of such a perfect goddess. At this moment, Damon walked over to meet her. Instantly, the cold expression on her face melted, and she broke into a dazzling smile. The guys who'd been watching felt their hearts break. So this beauty already had a boyfriend. When Fiona saw Damon, she opened her arms wide and rushed towards him. The other guys all looked at him with envy. Fiona ignored their gazes and hugged her boyfriend tightly. She pressed her body against him and he longed for more. Did you miss me? Damon asked shamelessly. She did not answer. Instead, she held his face in her hands and kissed him with her moist red lips. She'd been longing to do this for months and he could tell. He was surprised that she was being so bold, but he was also proud. It felt good to be embraced by such a beautiful girl. At the same time, he felt a boundless sense of responsibility. He never wanted to let her down ever again. Damon and Fiona had dinner together. After, Fiona asked him to come shopping with her, so they climbed into her mini and drove downtown. They went to a men's clothing store first. It was autumn, so he wanted to buy him some cool weather clothes. She liked to dress him up and make him look handsome. As long as the clothes looked good, she would buy him whatever ones he wanted. After shopping for men's clothing, Fiona wanted to buy some clothes for herself. She wanted his opinion on everything that she bought. No matter how much she liked something, if Damon didn't like it, she wouldn't buy it. She wanted to be irresistible to him. Luckily, his fashion sense was not bad. He liked the same style as her. Before long, he was carrying an assortment of shopping bags. The two of them sat on the bench in the shopping mall and rested for a while. Fiona leaned her head on his shoulder. It was Damon's birthday, and he and Fiona were in a hotel room together. Now that they were alone, she was playing hard to get. She told him to take a shower. He smiled awkwardly and then went into the bathroom. At this moment, 
the smell of Fiona's body still lingered in the small room. He breathed deeply and inhaled it. After showering, he got dressed and went back into the other room. Fiona had already closed her eyes. She looked like she was sleeping. He was a little disappointed, but seeing that it was almost midnight, he guessed he shouldn't be surprised. So he quietly climbed onto the bed. He could smell her sweet perfume and his heart raced. He wanted to hug her, but he was afraid that she would reject him. Although the two of them were boyfriend and girlfriend, they'd never gone all the way before. Sometimes taking things to the next level ruins a relationship. Damon felt conflicted and he wondered if she felt the same. Actually, Fiona wasn't asleep. How could she be? She was just pretending. In fact, she was more nervous than ever at this moment, but she was also excited. Her imagination was running wild. Would her cupcake come and hug her? He probably would, right? No matter how stupid he was, he should know what to do now. Fiona thought about what was going to happen tonight and she felt excited. She was eager to try something new and she was happy that her first time would be with Damon. Although Damon could be hot-blooded at times, she knew that he was actually a very principled person. She had told him not to touch her, and she was a bit concerned that he might actually listen. Can I hug you? Just a hug, I won't try anything else, he whispered into her ear. She'd been expecting this, and she was secretly pleased, but she didn't let on. No, you scoundrel, we had an agreement. Just a hug, okay? Fiona hesitated. She wanted to make him sweat. Okay, fine, just a hug. Damon put his arms around her. He pulled her close. Needless to say, Damon and Fiona didn't do much sleeping that night. The sun rose and birds chirped outside the window. Fiona opened her eyes. Damon was still holding her tightly. He was fast asleep, but his legs were entangled with hers. She remembered what had happened last night and she realized that she still felt a little sore. She slid out of bed and tidied up the room. Then, she quietly left to go get them breakfast. When she came back with the food, her cupcake was still sleeping. She did not have the heart to disturb him, so she simply put the food aside and sat beside him on the bed. She watched his chest rising and falling. He was really handsome. She felt lucky to have him. Recalling the events of last night, she smiled shyly. When he finally woke up, he was touched to see that she'd gotten him breakfast. I didn't even hear you leave, he exclaimed. I'm not surprised, she said, rolling her eyes at him. You were out cold. As she watched him eat the breakfast she'd brought, a warmth rose in her heart. If she got the chance, she'd cook breakfast for him herself sometime. She wondered what he liked to eat in the morning. As she thought of this, a trace of sadness suddenly appeared in her eyes, and she asked, Cupcake, if I transferred schools, would you forget about me? Damon was stunned. He looked at her and inquired, Your mother wants you to transfer, right? Which school are you thinking about going to? Do you have to go? Fiona knew that she couldn't hide it from him. She lowered her head and said softly, Yes, it's my mother's idea. She wants me to go to the D.C. Academy of Music in Washington. Why there? He couldn't help but ask. She thinks it's a better school, Fiona replied, and the city has an amazing music scene. My mother thinks that it will help my future career in the music industry. As she said this, she couldn't help but think back to the time she'd spent in D.C. during the summer vacation, and her face broke into a smile. She loved music. If her mother hadn't pushed for her to attend Meyerson, she would have gone to the D.C. Academy of Music from the very start. She had to admit that the thought of transferring there made her happy. However, she did not regret studying at Meyerson University. She loved her teachers and classmates, and there was also her cupcake to think about. Damon was not stupid. He saw the look on her face, and he understood how she felt. She was a talented musician, and she yearned for more than Meyerson University could offer her. It had always been her dream to go to the D.C. Academy of Music. After all, he wanted her to succeed and pursue her dreams. Despite this, he hesitated for a moment. Finally, he said, I don't want you to go. He admitted that he was being selfish, but he couldn't bear the thought of her leaving him. He loved her, and the idea of them being apart seemed very cruel. Fiona was silent. In fact, she was also struggling with the decision. She loved music, and this had been her dream since she was young. But at the same time, she couldn't bear to part with Damon. Leaving would mean giving up the most precious thing in her life. However, she had to take her own future into account. She didn't know what to say to him. Okay, I'll stay. I'll tell my mom that I'm not going, she said hesitantly. Damon nodded silently. After they finished breakfast, Fiona quietly packed her things. Then she drove him back to his dorm and they bid each other farewell. Fiona returned to her own dorm. When she got there, Gwen was on the phone with someone. Seeing Fiona return, Gwen quickly said, Darling, I have to go. My roommate is back now. I'm hanging up. 
After finishing the call, Gwen seemed very happy. It was obvious that the caller was her boyfriend. She was in love. She looked at her roommate and asked, Fifi, what's wrong? You seem unhappy. Fiona forced a smile and said, It's nothing. I just feel a little down. Really? Are you fighting with your boyfriend again? Gwen asked. She was not stupid. She knew that her roommate was usually optimistic and positive. She was rarely in low spirits, though most likely she was having problems with her relationship. Fiona smiled slightly, but she neither admitted nor denied it. Hence, Gwen went on. Oh, it's just an argument, Fifi. Get over it. All couples fight. My boyfriend and I were fighting yesterday, but we're fine now. He just apologized to me and everything is back to normal. Oh, I'm jealous, Fiona pouted. Your relationship sounds perfect. Gwen waved her hand and soothed. No, actually, we have a lot of problems. It can't be helped, though. He's lucky that I'm a tolerant person. Oh, right, I've been meeting to ask. Do you have time later this week? Fiona blinked. I don't know yet. Why? Her roommate continued combing her hair and explained, Actually, it's not a big deal. My boyfriend is coming to visit, and he wants to take me and my friends out for dinner. If you have time, you should come. She paused for a moment and then added, He wants to take us to the Lux Hotel. Have you heard of it? It's one of the most high-end hotels in Meyerson. Dinners there are very expensive. It'll be my boyfriend's treat. He's even planning on driving his Ferrari here. We will take you for a ride. Gwen had a proud look on her face as she said this. Fiona forced a smile and said respectfully, I've never been in a Ferrari before. But she wasn't really paying attention. She was still thinking about the prospect of leaving Damon. Her roommate gushed. When he gets here, you'll have to come hang out with us. We'll have so much fun. What Gwen said next, Fiona didn't hear because she was too busy dialing her mother's number. Moments later, she heard Karen's calm voice on the other line. Baby, why are you calling? Do you miss me? Yes, Fiona replied. Then she was silent for a moment. Finally, she said, Mom, I have something to tell you. What? She hesitated for a moment, then said softly, I don't want to go to the DC Academy of Music, okay? Karen was silent for a moment. Just as Fiona was starting to get nervous, her mother finally replied. Did you tell your boyfriend about this? She did not want to lie to her mother, so she admitted it. Yes. Fifi, you have to think clearly. This is your future and your lifelong dream. If you pass up this opportunity, you won't get another chance. He is being selfish if he tries to stop you. But mom... No buts. Her mother firmly interrupted. Baby, you have your whole future ahead of you. I don't want you to make the same mistake as me. In any case, you must go to the DC Academy of Music. If you don't agree, I will resort to using extreme means. After saying this, Karen hung up. Fiona stared blankly at her phone. After Damon got back to his dorm, he tried to call Fiona to chat, but the call did not go through. He assumed that she was taking a nap, so he didn't try her again. He remembered what had happened last night, and he smiled to himself. But then he remembered their conversation about her transferring schools, and his mood turned gloomy. Quinn was busy working at his desk, hearing about Damon's plan had filled him with ambition. He was from a poor family, but he still had dreams. He wanted to succeed. Therefore, he was working hard. Damon had given him an opportunity, and he had to do his best to make the most of it. Seeing his roommate return, Quinn said, Where'd you run off to yesterday? Hey, someone dropped a present off for you. A present? For me? From who? Damon asked curiously. Quinn stood up and went to get an exquisite little box from his cupboard. There was no card with it. The box seemed very high quality, and Damon could tell that whatever was inside must be expensive. A fragrant perfume wafted from the box. He gently opened it and found an elegant watch inside. Although he did not know how much it was worth, it was definitely not cheap. There was a note with it. Happy birthday to you. I can't confess my feelings in person. I can only admire you silently. Finally, I've worked up the courage to give you a present. I hope that in the future, when you see this gift, you will wonder who I am. Perhaps one day you will find out. Beneath this was a cute smiley face. Damon had no idea who this gift was from. Not only had this person given him a watch, but she'd also expressed her love for him. The handwriting was beautiful, and Damon wondered if whoever wrote it was beautiful too. Damon had just received a mysterious birthday present. It was an expensive-looking watch, but the note didn't say who it was from. The writing looked feminine, though. This person clearly cared about him a lot. Not only had she remembered his birthday, but she had even gotten him a present. What surprised him even more was how familiar the writing seemed. 
He racked his brain, but he couldn't figure out whose it might be. Quinn, who was standing beside him, couldn't help saying, Wow, that's pretty cool. I wonder which beauty gave you this gift. Not only was the watch expensive, but the note was also beautifully written. On top of this, a sweet scent was wafting from the box. It was intoxicating. Needless to say, it was definitely from a woman. Damon shook his head to indicate that he wasn't sure either. He knew it wasn't Fiona. He more or less knew her handwriting. Furthermore, he had just celebrated his birthday with her yesterday, so it definitely wasn't from her. Could it be from Miss Branto? But that didn't seem possible. She didn't know his birthday. Furthermore, if she wanted to give him a gift, she would not do so anonymously. Who could it be? He didn't know, but he knew that it must be from someone he knew. However, even after pondering it for a long time, he still couldn't figure it out. So, he put the matter to rest for the moment. The next afternoon, he dealt with some problems regarding Astronet, and he also had a video call with Claude to discuss Everbright's current situation. The CEO had both good news and bad news for him. The bad news was that Everbright had already used up all its financing. The good news was that Claude could use his connections to take the company public. This would solve the current financial problem. Naturally, Everbright's value would skyrocket as well. In fact, to most companies, going public was a major goal, and Everbright was no exception. Damon was very happy to hear this, and he told Claude to make the necessary preparations. After that, he hung up the phone. Astronet was steadily growing. Damon was waiting for Silly Goose to transfer the land title for his new property. Then, he could begin the planning phase of development. However, while he waited, Astronet continued gaining users. If Everbright went public, the company would hit a major milestone. Damon started to spend a lot of time researching this topic. Luckily, he was a finance major, so he had a detailed understanding of the process. Moreover, Everbright was short on funds now, so this was definitely the best way to earn more income. During dinner that evening, Fiona came to find him. Originally, they'd been planning to hang out, but that was before she saw the watch. He'd accidentally left it on his desk, and it attracted her attention. At the same time, she saw the note that was with it. Although Damon explained to her that he didn't know who it was from, she still flew into a rage. She was extremely jealous, and she demanded to know who had given it to him. Was he cheating on her? Then, without waiting for him to explain, she turned and left. This was the first time the two of them had seriously quarreled. Although some arguments were unavoidable, Damon still felt crummy about the situation. He kept calling her and messaging her all day, but she didn't reply. Finally, around 10 o'clock that night, she sent a text message. I'm sorry, Cupcake. Actually, I was wrong to get so angry with you today. I just really care about you, and I'm afraid of losing you. My mother says that if you don't agree with me going to the DC Academy of Music, you are being selfish. In that case, she will do everything in her power to break us up. She also says that if you become the owner of a successful company, she will support our relationship. I know that you are outstanding, hardworking, and ambitious, but for some reason, my mother can't see it yet. I realize this is my life, not hers, but I don't have the courage to defy her. Fiona sounded uncertain about her future but it seemed more like she was talking to herself as opposed to him. In fact, he understood her confusion. She had to choose between love and her own future. He could see that she valued her mother's opinion and that she was hesitant to give up everything for him. Damon wrote her a message, promising that he'd always take care of her, but there was no reply. He called her again, but no one answered. He guessed that she probably didn't want to talk to him at this moment, so he hung up. What else could he do? He tried to take his mind off his relationship troubles by thinking about Everbright. Although Everbright was massive now and still gaining users, it was burning through money. Perhaps after the company went public, Fiona's mother, Karen, would see him in a new light. The next morning, Damon called Claude to discuss whether Everbright could be listed on the market and how they would make it happen. He wanted his CEO to get the ball rolling. This was the most important goal for the company this year. Damon was alone in the dormitory that afternoon. He was planning to call his girlfriend when an unexpected guest arrived. It was Nancy. He remembered the last time he'd seen her. It had been before the summer, and at that time he'd warned her not to bother him anymore. They hadn't seen each other for months, and Damon had begun to think that she'd actually given up. Then, right when his life was about to return to normal, she reappeared. Compared to how she looked two months ago, Nancy seemed much thinner now. Although she'd tried her best to hide it with makeup, she indeed looked a little haggard. She couldn't help it. After countless years of suffering, she finally found her son. Finding him was supposed to be a beautiful gift from the heavens, but it hadn't turned out as expected. Her son was so angry with her that he refused to see her again. 
Therefore, no matter how much she missed him, she didn't dare to confront him again. She was afraid that if she did, he'd disappear on her again. If this happened, she couldn't handle it. She would break down and go crazy. But not seeing him was almost as painful. Nancy couldn't stop herself from sending people to secretly check on him. Was he gaining or losing weight? What was he doing recently? How were his studies? Was he being bullied? Did he have enough money? The news she gleaned about him kept her going. Months passed in this way. Nancy lost a lot of weight. Then finally she couldn't stand the torture any longer and came looking for him. She did this despite the fact it might bring irreversible consequences. She had to come. Apart from just wanting to see her son, she also felt that she owed him an apology. What are you doing here? Damon asked coldly when he saw her. Have you forgotten what I said? He was pleased to see how haggard she looked. Tears instantly flowed down her cheeks. Treasure, can I have a few words with you? He sat down and waited to see what she had to say. However, she didn't continue right away. Instead, she just looked at him. She scanned his face to see if anything about it had changed during the past months. Was he thinner? Was he eating enough? Was he wearing warm clothes? Did he have enough money to spend? If he didn't, should she try to give him some more? Fortunately, he looked like he was doing well. His face was rosy, and he even seemed to be a little fatter than before. Nancy felt relieved. Are you done looking? If you are, then get lost. He said to her mercilessly. She snapped out of it and stammered. Honey, your mom, I miss you. Have you paid your tuition fees yet? I can pay them for you. By the way, do you have enough spending money? If not, you can tell me. Just tell me how much you need. If you're in trouble, I'll do my best to help you. Is that all you have to say? Damon shot. His eyes were cold. Nancy quickly shook her head and said, No, no, I still have a lot I want to say to you. Is there anything you want? Oh, remember how much you used to like Transformers when you were young? Well, I bought you a limited edition Transformers set. Do you want to take a look? Damon's expression became even uglier. Do you think I'm still a child? Is that all you have to say? Nancy finally realized that she was treating her son like a child. He wasn't a child anymore. He was all grown up. Her son was already an adult, so he couldn't possibly be interested in toys like this anymore. But Nancy couldn't be blamed for her mistake. In her mind, he was still the little boy who she'd lost at the museum in New York. All she had of him were memories from the past. However, more than ten years had passed and things had changed. He was a different person now, and she knew nothing about him. She looked at his angry expression and she was at a loss for what to do. She felt uneasy. What should she say to him? She wasn't sure, but she still wanted to talk more. Why wasn't he willing to give his mother a chance? If you have nothing else to say, please leave, Damon repeated. He really felt annoyed with her. Nancy started crying again. Honey, I beg you, don't treat your mother like this, okay? It hurts me. You don't know how much I've suffered all these years. Your father and I never stopped searching for you. Do you know how many tears we've shed? She paused to blow her nose. We've searched every corner of New York City for you. We even searched the whole province, but we just couldn't find you. We thought you were dead. Do you know how desperate we are now that we know you're alive? Now I've finally found you, but you continue to treat me like this. Do you know how sad it makes me? She was trying to control her emotions, but she couldn't. Tears streamed down her face. Damon felt moved when he saw her like this. He was an intelligent person, and he could tell that she was being genuine. All mothers loved their children. Children were always the most important things to parents. No one could deny this. If Nancy was faking it right now, she was a world-class actor. No, her feelings were real. Damon quickly turned his head away. He didn't want to see her like this. Nancy saw his expression soften, and she couldn't help but reach out and touch his shoulder. Then she said sadly, Honey, Mommy did everything she could to find you. I know that you were upset and you think that we abandoned you. I don't blame you for feeling that way. What happened was my fault. I made so many mistakes, but I'm apologizing to you now. I'll do anything to get you to forgive me. She looked at him with hopeful eyes. Unfortunately, he remained indifferent. Now he had her in a corner. Tears flowed down her face. She got up and stood next to him. Son, please tell me how I can make it up to you. What can I do? How can we get past this? He still didn't say anything. Finally, Nancy murmured, Do you want me to kneel on the ground and beg you for forgiveness? If that will make you forgive me, I'll gladly do it. I will kneel before you and beg. Damon didn't think that she was serious. How could someone as noble as Nancy kneel down and beg? Then he heard a thud. 
He turned his head and saw that she was actually kneeling on the cold, dirty floor of his dorm. Her eyes were full of sadness. Honey, she sniffed, I'm begging you. Can you forgive your parents for what happened? Is there anything that can change your mind? Please tell me I'll do anything. Nancy would move mountains to get her son to forgive her. Nancy had come to find Damon in his dorm room. She hadn't seen him all summer. She tried to apologize and explain things to him, but he wouldn't listen. Nancy was so desperate for his forgiveness that she knelt down on the floor and began to beg. Damon was shocked. He hadn't expected her to go this far. He didn't know what to do. It was more than he could handle. He wanted to help her up, but this was not his style. He couldn't forgive her for what she'd done. However, he didn't want to watch her embarrass herself. Get up, he said. I... Do you forgive me? She interrupted. Her eyes were filled with hope. I didn't say that. I just want you to get up. Come on, he replied rudely. Despite his harsh tone, Nancy was overjoyed. He was being stubborn, but she felt she might be on the verge of a breakthrough. She suppressed her joy and entreated. Baby, I don't expect you to forgive me right away. I hope only that you give me a chance to prove that I love you. I always have. Are you done talking nonsense? He asked impatiently. I have something important to attend to now. I don't have time to waste on you. He was afraid that if she continued to pester him, his heart would soften. So he quickly opened the door and left. As for whether or not she would leave, he didn't care. After Damon left, Nancy felt disappointed, but quickly her frown became a smile. She had seen the helpless expression on his face, and she knew that he was conflicted. At least, he hadn't rejected her like before. She didn't feel embarrassed about kneeling in front of him and begging. She would do anything to get him to forgive her. She was willing to bear the pain no matter how great it was. Undoubtedly, today was a good start. Hence, she hurriedly called Robert to report the good news. If she could melt their son's heart of ice, he would come around. As long as she kept at it, sooner or later, her child would forgive her. As she thought about how all her years of hard work were finally paying off, she couldn't help bursting into tears again. Later that day, Fiona's roommate Gwen returned to her dorm and announced that her boyfriend was arriving today. That night, he'd treat her and her roommates to dinner at the most high-end place in town, the Lux Hotel. They could even bring dates if they wanted. Gwen's new boyfriend had lots of money, and dinner was on him. Maddie and Tara both had new boyfriends. Their new guys were actually quite outstanding themselves. Maddie's boyfriend was a fourth-year student in the computer sciences program at Meyerson University. His name was Mitch Kingsburg, and he was knowledgeable and talented. When he was in third year, he had become the vice president of the student union. He had the skills to be the president, but he was not charismatic enough. He resigned from his position in fourth year because he wanted to focus on finding a job before graduation. Tara's boyfriend was also a senior. He went to the College of Music with her, and his name was Kevin Pascal. He had already recorded many albums and released them online. A lot of people liked his music, and one of his songs had even made the charts. However, compared to Fiona's and Gwen's boyfriends, these guys lacked something. They didn't own expensive luxury cars. Damon drove a Bentley, and Gwen's boyfriend Richard drove a Rolls Royce. However, Richard was treating them to dinner at the Lux, though there was no reason for the women not to invite their boyfriends. It would be good for the men to get to know Richard. He owned a large company and had a lot of connections. Fiona invited Damon to come as well. Although they had been fighting recently, their relationship was still strong. When Damon arrived at her dorm, he found everyone waiting for him out front. An extremely cool-looking Rolls Royce was parked at the curb, and it was attracting a lot of attention. Gwen's boyfriend was indeed very tall and handsome. He was leaning against the car, smoking. He wore a pair of expensive designer sunglasses and an exquisite tailor-made suit. He looked like he had money. Maddie's boyfriend, Mitch, was also tall. However, he was a computer sciences student, so he did not put much effort into his appearance. His clothes were a little shabby, and he looked out of place standing next to Richard. Tara's boyfriend, Kevin, on the other hand, had dressed for the occasion. His hair was combed back, and he wore a brightly colored dress shirt, which gave him an artistic flair. As expected, the four girls were dressed to the nines. They looked even more youthful and beautiful than ever. It seemed that they had all tried to outdo each other. Of course, Fiona was the most beautiful among them. Although her three roommates looked great, they couldn't hold a candle to her, no matter what they wore. Since everyone was here now, they could be on their way to the Lux Hotel. However, there was one problem. The hotel was 20 miles from campus, and the Rolls-Royce could seat only four people. They were eight in total, so obviously they needed to call a cab or something. 
Gwen couldn't help but ask. Damon, where is your Bentley? Why didn't you drive today? He shook his head. The Bentley isn't here. She gave him a strange look. Richard also looked at him with confusion. He'd heard all about Damon's Bentley from his girlfriend. Fiona, who was beside Damon, didn't want him to be embarrassed, so she quickly said, I'll drive my Mini. It just happens to sit for. It's perfect. She was smart, and she knew that the Bentley belonged to KC Games. Now that Damon didn't work there, naturally he no longer had access to the vehicle. Gwen nodded. Fine. Then Tara and Kevin can come with me, and you drive Maddie and Mitch. Fiona nodded and went to get her Mini. Damon offered to drive. He and Mitch sat in the front, and Fiona and Maddie sat in the back. He drove them to the Lux Hotel. Maddie's boyfriend, Mitch, was quiet the whole way. He wasn't good with words, so he felt too embarrassed to talk. Damon tried chatting with him, but it was a one-sided conversation. Mitch grunted one-word responses. The drive took half an hour. Maddie, who had never been to such a high-end hotel before, couldn't help but exclaim in awe when she got out of the car. Mitch looked at the extravagant building before him, and he felt a little intimidated. Mitch and Maddie, who came from ordinary families, felt out of their league. Damon and Fiona, on the other hand, seemed to fit right in. Richard brought everyone to the table that he'd booked. After that, they ordered drinks and chatted. Richard told them about his family's business. Everyone else listened intently. He also told them about his studies at Stanford. He came off as a perfect gentleman, and he even had a sense of humor. The women were all enchanted by him, and they envied Gwen. Maddie couldn't help but ask, So Richard, what do you do at your family's company? He smiled and said, I'm in charge of finances. Wow, that's really awesome, Maddie gushed. You must manage a lot of money, right? Richard smiled. Actually, the company doesn't make that much. It's about to go public, though. He was being humble. Gwen, who was beside him, added proudly, I heard that the company is worth tens of millions. Maddie and Tara looked shocked. It was obvious that they were jealous. Even Fiona seemed a little surprised. If Damon's company was worth that much, her mother would surely approve of him. If that were the case, Karen would support their relationship. Ah, <sighs> Fiona couldn't help but feel bitter as she thought of this. Maddie hesitated for a moment and then asked, You must have to hire a lot of people at your company, right? Richard smiled and nodded. Yes, we hire talented people from every field. What about computer scientists? She asked. Do you hire them? Yes. Maddie looked excited. She took Mitch's hand and said, My boyfriend is a fourth-year computer science major. He is one of the top students in his year, and he's looking for somewhere to do an internship. Although he is a bit quiet, he is very professional. Her expression was full of hope. Actually, her words had substance to them. Mitch had been the vice president of the student union. He was truly a capable guy. However, his social skills weren't great. Because of this, he'd had a hard time finding job opportunities. Um, Richard hesitated. He wasn't sure how to respond. He chatted with Mitch for a while, but he found the guy dull. Even if he was talented, he wasn't interested in hiring him. Maddie saw his hesitation and her hopes fell. Her expression became somewhat gloomy. Mitch, who was sitting beside her, also had an ugly expression on his face. After all, the whole situation was really embarrassing. The atmosphere around the table was a little awkward. Gwen could tell that something was wrong, so she rolled her eyes and tried to smooth things over. Actually, you can't blame Richard. He runs the financing department, not HR. Besides, he must abide by the company's rules, right? They hire only the best of the best. Maddie looked a little sad. Are you saying that students from Meyerson are not the best? It was considered one of the country's top schools. However, Gwen explained, Meyerson University is indeed quite outstanding, but Richard's company recruits top talent from around the world. Getting a job there is very competitive. But, Maddie began anxiously, but she trailed off when she saw the ugly expression on Richard's face. Gwen said, Don't take it personally. Most people can't get hired there. At this time, Kevin couldn't stand to listen to them anymore and said, Hey Mitch, why don't you check out the university's online career forums? They always have a lot of postings for internships. The atmosphere still felt awkward. Richard tried to laugh it off. That's a good question. But Mitch, if you really want to apply for a job at my company, you can send me a copy of your resume. I'll look it over. Thanks, Maddie quickly replied, even though she knew that Richard was probably just being polite. At least it was worth a shot. Fiona changed the subject. She was more interested in topics like fashion, entertainment, and gossip. Richard seemed to be very knowledgeable, but she found him boring. The atmosphere lightened up when they started discussing fashion. Soon, everyone was talking and laughing again. Damon also found Richard boring. The guy acted superior, and it was annoying. He noticed that Richard and Gwen seemed to treat him differently after they saw that he wasn't driving the Bentley. 
Kevin studied music, so he had a lot to say about fashion and the arts. Damon and Mitch, on the other hand, didn't have much to say on the topic. They were not interested in fashion at all. Damon tried to strike up a conversation with Mitch again. You study computer sciences, right? The guy smiled bashfully. Yes, I do. He was glad for an excuse to talk about something other than fashion. So you were looking for an internship, huh? Damon inquired. Yeah, I've applied to some big companies, but none accepted me. I always mess up during the interviews, Mitch replied. Although he was a quiet guy, he still had his pride. He wanted to intern at a big company. He felt depressed about his situation, but there was nothing he could do. Gwen's boyfriend, Richard, was treating her and her friends to dinner at a fancy restaurant. Most of the people around the table were discussing fashion, but Damon and Mitch were talking tech. It turned out that Mitch was a computer science major and he was looking for a job. Which companies have you applied to? Damon asked with interest. In fact, he was thinking that Mitch might be a good fit for Astronet. The company was growing and Damon needed to hire more employees. Furthermore, he wanted to recruit talented people who he could trust. If Mitch was really all that Maddie said, Damon did not mind offering him a job. Hearing him ask this, Mitch brightened. He spoke frankly. Actually, I'm more interested in working at a tech startup. Although their market values are not as high as the big players like Google or Facebook, I think working at such a company would be more interesting. That said, I did apply at Silly Goose. That company is always hiring. Moreover, they treat their employees well. Unfortunately, I messed up the interview. At this point, Mitch trailed off. His expression was a little awkward. Actually, the company had been quite satisfied with his resume, but he had been nervous during the interview and hadn't made a good impression. So in the end, he wasn't hired. Is that so? Damon was intrigued. Do you know how to program and write code? Can you fix bugs and troubleshoot other IT problems? Mitch nodded vigorously. Yes, of course, that stuff is easy. If I couldn't do it, I'd be a disgrace to my program. Maddie was chatting with Gwen, but she overheard the conversation between the two guys. She piped up. Mitch is a real pro. He's won many big awards for his work. Now Damon was even more interested. That's great. Can you show me your work sometime? Maddie looked at him in surprise. Don't you study finance? Why are you interested in computer science? He smiled and explained. Yes, but my friend's company is recruiting new employees. It's a startup company, but its future is promising. What's the company's name? Mitch asked. Astronet. Mitch looked at him blankly, but Richard, who was happily chatting with the other woman, turned in shock. Did you say Astronet? Yes. Gwen, Maddie, Tara, and Fiona all gave him strange looks. Although Astronet was a newly established company, Richard knew all about it. Gwen couldn't help but ask, What? What is it? Her boyfriend looked at Damon and asked, Are you talking about Astronet, the new social media site? You have a friend who works in HR there? Yes, something like that, Damon said, not revealing the whole truth. Richard looked at Mitch and said, He won't get hired. Richard didn't elaborate on this. He knew all about Astronet, and he doubted that Mitch could get hired there. The guy was too average. The atmosphere turned awkward again. After what seemed like ages, dinner was finally over. It was already past 10 o'clock in the evening when Damon got back to his dorm. Despite the late hour, he called Claude to see if he'd made any progress with his preparations to take Everbright public. The CEO indicated that the matter was under control. The financial tycoons on Wall Street were all eyeing the company with great interest. The analysts had reason to believe that Everbright's future looked promising. Many investment firms were willing to back the company. After chatting with Claude, Damon went to find Quinn. He wanted to ask him how his work on Astronet was going. He knew that he needed to hire more people fast. He had just recruited his roommate, but one person wasn't enough. Although he had yet to assign Quinn a specific position, Quinn was currently his right-hand man. The guy was able to deal with most of the company's internal problems. Damon trusted his roommate and hoped to make him a core member of his team. Growth is progressing smoothly, Quinn told him. Today's data shows that Astronet has 290 million users. Let's see if we can top 300 million tomorrow. Quinn sounded excited. He was passionate about his work. He felt incredibly grateful to his friend for giving him the job. As he gained a deeper understanding of Astronet, he was shocked by the speed of its growth. If the site continued to develop like this, anything was possible in the future. Quinn marveled at his luck. He couldn't believe that he was involved in establishing such a great company. When he saw countless users passionately using the site, he felt a sense of accomplishment. He was making a contribution to the tech world. It was more than he'd ever dreamed of. However, what shocked him even more was that his roommate had created it. His heart was full of respect for Damon. All right, we also need to hire more employees, Damon declared, clapping his friend on the back. The next morning, Damon received a call from Fiona. 
Mitch had given him his resume to Maddie, who in turn gave it to her. Now she was sending it to Damon. Although Mitch hadn't heard of Astronet before last night, he was still interested in doing an internship with the company. Damon had told him to send over his resume. After receiving it, Damon looked it over. He realized that Mitch was indeed a talented guy. He has won many awards for his work in the field of computer science. Damon felt like he'd found a treasure. After looking over the resume, he called Fiona back and told her to have Maddie tell her boyfriend to come in for an interview that afternoon. Damon had rented a temporary office space to house his company, and he gave her the address to pass on. Damon and Quinn didn't have class that afternoon, so they both went to the astronaut office to prepare for the interview. They had just sat down when Mitch called. Is this Damon? It's me. I'm outside the building. Which floor is the office on? After telling Mitch the details, Damon hung up the phone and went out to meet him. When Mitch saw him, he felt relieved. I was afraid that you wouldn't be here. Damon led him to the office. The building was a busy place and many people were coming and going. It was completely different from what Mitch had imagined. What was most surprising to him was that the company seemed to employ a large number of people. He had been expecting to find a tiny startup company. Everyone who worked here was dressed very fashionably. The woman at the front desk was young, beautiful, and energetic. She had a smile on her face, but there was also a hint of pride in her expression. Mitch took this as a good sign. If the receptionist was happy to work here, it must mean that the company treated its employees well. Damon gave him a tour of the office and said, You should familiarize yourself with the layout. Oh right, you were working in the IT department. I'll show you where it's located. You can come say hello to your new colleagues. Mitch was confused. He thought he was here for an interview with HR. Last night, he had memorized answers to possible interview questions so that he'd be prepared. What was going on? Wasn't he supposed to do an interview? Suddenly, the general manager's office door opened and someone shouted excitedly, Quick, quick, everyone, come look! We hit 300 million users! The shouting attracted Damon's attention and he exclaimed, 300 million users? That's amazing! Only then did the general manager stick his head out of the office. He was overjoyed. Boss, you're here! Quickly, come take a look! We just had our 300 millionth user register. Damon turned to Mitch. Have a look around. If there's anything you don't understand, ask your colleagues. I need to go and look at this. Then he strode towards the manager's office. Mitch was stunned. Had he missed something? He saw the other employees respectfully move aside to allow Damon to pass. It seemed like Damon was the one who was in charge here. Mitch greeted the other employees, and they were all very warm to him. Some of them even took the initiative to strike up conversations. They looked at him with envy. However, Mitch wasn't sure why. Finally, the answer became clear. A pretty female employee walked up to him and asked softly, Hey, you're Mitch, right? My name is Kellyanne, but you can call me Kelly. So, how do you know the boss? The boss? Mitch was confused. Who is the boss? Kelly looked at him in confusion. Then she prompted, You know, the handsome guy who you were just with. He, he's the boss? Mitch stammered. He was shocked. He couldn't believe that Fiona's boyfriend was the boss of this company. Maddie never told him this before. Oh yeah, he's the founder of the company, Kelly explained. When she realized that Mitch did not know Damon's identity, she concluded that their relationship was not close. After this, her demeanor towards him cooled a little. Mitch nodded mechanically. Then he went to find his desk. He sat down and began to familiarize himself with the website. Astronet existed in many different languages. When he pulled up the analytics, he finally realized why management was so excited just now. The site had 300 million registered users, and more than 50 million of them were currently online. This was an amazing achievement. He was shocked. Was it real? What kind of website had 300 million users? Why hadn't he heard of it before? Therefore, he took out his phone and did a search. After that, he didn't question what he'd seen anymore. However, what he found most surprising was that Astronet was already one of the world's top 10 social media sites. It was growing at a rapid pace. Moreover, it was able to compete with industry giants like Facebook and Twitter. When he read these descriptions, he recalled the conversation at dinner last night. He remembered the look on Richard's face when he heard the name Astronet. He also remembered what Richard had said about him, and he felt vindicated. He had never thought that this unknown company would be so successful. This startup company already had amazing prospects. Even though he did not know much about finance, he knew that Astronet must be raking in profits. The realization hit him like a brick. At the same time, he felt incredibly grateful. Damon had recruited him to the company because he believed in him. So of course, he wanted to work hard and prove his worth. While Mitch was still looking at the data, Damon finally came out of the manager's office. He came straight over and asked, 
Have you met your colleagues? Do you like the environment here? If you do, you're hired. When the other employees in the IT department saw Damon arrive, they all stood up and greeted him. Seeing this, Mitch also stood up. Now that he knew who Damon was, he felt a bit trepidatious. He no longer spoke as confidently as before. This was the reason why he'd messed up his previous interviews. He panicked when meeting important people. Damon realized this and patted his shoulder. Don't be nervous. Just work hard, okay? I believe in you. Yes, I will. Hearing his boss's encouraging words, Mitch finally calmed down. Damon trusted him, so he wanted to prove himself valuable to the company. Nancy and Robert were sitting in the living room of their apartment in the Brokerton Group building. The huge room was clean and bright. Floor-to-ceiling windows lined one wall, offering an impressive view of the bustling city of Meyerson. The two of them were picking out a gift for their son. Damon's real birthday was in a few days. The birthday that he'd celebrated with Fiona was just a date that the Walkers had arbitrarily decided. Of course, they hadn't known his real birthday when they adopted him. Only Nancy and Robert knew that. After believing him to be dead for so many years, they'd finally found him alive and well. Naturally, the Brokertons wanted to celebrate his real birthday with him. However, this was impossible. It was fortunate that Damon had even agreed to let Nancy speak to him last time. Their relationship had slightly improved since the first confrontation, but the couple didn't dare to push their son. If they were hasty, they might ruin everything. Nancy had time. She could wait. She planned to slowly win him over. The first step was choosing a birthday present. Then she'd personally deliver it to him. Hopefully, when he saw it, he'd be happy. However, choosing an appropriate present was difficult. To show their love for him, they wanted to get him something expensive. But guys didn't like things like jewelry. After much discussion, the two finally decided that buying him a car was an option. No guy would refuse a brand new sports car, right? On top of this, someone like Damon, who came from a poor family, had probably never driven a fancy car before. Although Damon had founded KC Games together with Will, the company had been in the early stages of development before. Now, KC Games was more successful, but Damon didn't own shares in it anymore. Additionally, when Nancy and Damon investigated, the investigator hadn't turned up any records of him owning a vehicle. Let's buy him a vehicle, Robert decided. I will ask someone to look into getting a custom-made sports car. Let's see if he can resist the temptation. He sounded full of confidence. Nancy shook her head. Getting a custom-made sports car requires time. His birthday is soon. Just buy something from the dealership and give it to him. Oh, I was also thinking we could buy a house here and put it in his name. That way, he'll have his own place to live. We can even have a family reunion there someday. Robert shook his head. No, it's too much. Take it slow. You don't want to spoil him. Nancy thought about this for a moment. Her husband's words made sense. She knew she had to restrain herself. While the two of them were discussing this in the living room, their nephew, Silas, was in his office nearby. He felt restless and he frowned to himself. He had always known that his aunt and uncle might find their son one day. On the surface, he showed them respect, but he secretly kept an eye on them. His spies monitored their every move. He treated the possibility of their son's return very seriously. As such, he knew all about the current situation. To him, it had been like a bolt out of the blue. All along, he'd assumed that the Brokerton Group would one day be his. Even if he and Robert had problems, he was still his uncle's only heir. However, when he discovered that the Brokertons had found their son, he realized that his inheritance was at stake. He might even end up with nothing. He knew how much effort Robert and Nancy had put into finding their son over the years. This showed how much they cared about their child. After they retired, they'd have no reason not to give their huge fortune to their own flesh and blood. Damn it, how could someone who was supposed to be dead show up alive and well all of a sudden? Countless people had died in that earthquake. Silas had been certain that his cousin was dead. That was why he'd encouraged his aunt in her search. However, now she had actually found her son. Silas was considering having him killed. Lately, he'd been unable to eat or sleep, and he'd lost weight. The only thing that comforted him was the fact that his aunt and uncle were still treating him the same as ever. 
they hadn't turned on him. Yet. Furthermore, their long-lost son had been living with an ordinary family the whole time. He probably wasn't capable of managing such an empire, right? This was a huge advantage to Silas, and it gave him hope. After all, the Brokertons had been grooming him to take charge of their empire for a long time. No matter how much they loved their son, they wouldn't risk the future of the Brokerton group by giving it to someone who couldn't handle it, right? Silas still didn't know their son's identity, though. He planned to send someone to investigate and find out. No matter what, he would not allow this person to shake him from his position. Meanwhile, Damon was in his dorm at Meyerson University. He had no idea what Silas was planning. Claude had recently arrived in North America, and he had met with many investment analysts. At the same time, several Wall Street institutions had expressed great interest in Everbright. They all supported the company going public. Claude asked Damon to come and meet him so they could finalize the preparations together. The CEO had been hard at work, and everything was almost ready. He just needed Damon to come meet with the financial analysts. After that, he could start the process of listing the company. This was undoubtedly good news for Damon. If Everbright was successfully listed, Fiona's mother might finally respect him. Besides being busy with work, he was also busy with his classes. He was in his third year now, and his course load was a lot heavier. He had fewer electives, but more core courses. If he wanted to take time off to meet with Claude, he would have to ask for permission from his professors. One of Damon's professors was a woman in her 50s named Margaret Galloway. She taught several of his core courses. Professor Galloway was an alumna of the Meyerson University Financial College. Later on, she earned a master's and a PhD. After that, she stayed on to teach. She could be considered an old-fashioned academic. Actually, Damon wasn't very close with her. He'd met with her on only a few occasions. Most of the time, he dealt with the guidance counselors instead. Furthermore, Damon usually sat at the back of the classroom. He hadn't made an effort to get to know his professors. Therefore, when Damon came to Professor Galloway asking to take 10 days off, she was a little surprised. She recognized him from class. She'd seen his transcripts when he applied to the financial program, so she knew he was a bright student. His SAT scores had caused quite a stir at that time. Unfortunately, Damon had faded into the background after entering university. It seemed that he had no interest in extracurricular activities. She had even heard that he'd been in trouble for fighting. Also, he often skipped class. What surprised her, though, was that despite this, he continued to hand in papers and write exams. He was clearly an intelligent young man, but he wasn't applying himself. His grades were usually low, so it was basically impossible for him to get a scholarship. Now, he was requesting to take a leave of absence for 10 days. When Professor Galloway heard this, she frowned. Damon had lied and said that he had to go deal with a family emergency. Professor Galloway called him into her office to ask him about it. She adjusted her glasses and said, Damon, I can approve your leave, but when you come back, you have to prioritize your studies. You did great on your SATs, but now you're at the bottom of your class. She was giving him a warning. She already felt dissatisfied with him. Damon nodded. Thank you, Professor. I will focus on my studies when I get back. Please don't worry. Professor Galloway signed the request and handed it back to him. She then gave him a stern look and dismissed him. The professor watched him walking away, and she couldn't help but sigh. She didn't believe that he'd change. Based on this, his future prospects weren't great. After all, one had to do more than just ace one's SATs to do well in life. Students had to take their education seriously. Life would only get harder. In Professor Galloway's eyes, Damon was a slacker. She knew that he was from an average family. She also knew all about his relationship with Fiona, but she doubted it would work out. Fiona was destined for great things, and this guy was a loser. As she thought of this, she shook her head and went back to her reading. The next day, Damon boarded a plane to Washington, D.C. He was meeting Claude there for business. He had to take Everbright public. The future of his relationship with Fiona depended on it. Damon's seat was in economy class, and the spot next to him was empty. He was leaning back with his eyes closed when he suddenly smelled a whiff of perfume. He opened his eyes and saw an extremely sexy-looking woman standing beside him. She asked charmingly, Sir, is this seat 2C? He nodded, and the woman bent down to put her luggage under the seat. 
He watched her out of the corner of his eye. Even though the weather was a little cold, the woman was wearing a low-cut blouse. Much of her ample chest was exposed. Damon's mind began to race. When she bent over, he could see right down the front of her shirt. He wondered what bra size she wore. She must be at least a D-cup. Her chest was a lot larger than Fiona's or Miss Branto's. What surprised Damon about this woman was that although her chest was large, the rest of her body was slender. She was wearing skin-tight jeans, which accentuated her curves. She was indeed very alluring. Damon took a few subtle glances at her. When he noticed that she was about to get up, he looked away. Hey, can you help me put my bag in the luggage compartment? It's a bit heavy. She looked at him with her big, beautiful eyes. He stood up and helped her put her suitcase away. She gave him a grateful smile and reached out to shake his hand. Hey, my name is Kiki. What's your name? I like your style. She looked at him up and down admiringly. When she saw his muscular body, her eyes lit up. What the heck? He hadn't even left town yet and he was already being tempted by another woman. My name is Damon. Great name, nice to meet you. They shook hands and started to chat. He found out that Kiki was a student in Washington. Damon enjoyed talking with her. This way, in addition to smelling her sweet perfume, he could also look at her. From time to time, she would lean down to get something and he'd get a good view of her chest. When this happened, he had to be careful not to drool. Excuse me, can we please change seats? A voice asked from behind him. Just when Damon felt that life couldn't get any better, someone had to come and ruin it. A handsome man was standing in the aisle, and he explained, Kiki and I are friends. Are you willing to trade seats? I'm sitting in first class. First class? Damon was stunned. Kiki smiled coldly. Miles, I want your first class seat. You take my seat here instead. I already told you that I'm annoyed with you. Actually, Kiki had originally been sitting in first class, but she'd switched to economy to get away from Miles. After all, it was easy to swap from first to economy. Most people were willing to make such a trade. However, Miles wouldn't let her escape so easily. Damon had just boarded a flight to Washington, D.C. He was on his way to meet Claude for business. His seatmate was a very attractive woman but a man she knew had just shown up and asked to trade spots. The man was offering a first-class seat in exchange, so he didn't expect Damon to refuse. However, Damon said, I'm sorry, I like my seat. I have a window on one side and a beautiful woman on the other. I don't want to trade. Thanks for the compliment, Kiki said charmingly. Miles looked upset, but he remained patient. He asked Damon, Have you ever been in first class? Damon shook his head. He was being honest. He'd never sat in first class before. It was too extravagant. Miles laughed. Then I promise you that it's worth it. You should take advantage of this opportunity to experience it. My seat is a lot more expensive than yours, but I'm willing to give it to you. He tried to make it seem like he was doing Damon a favor, but Damon never took people's charity, so he smiled and replied, I really don't care for first class. I'm very comfortable here. Sorry, I won't change. What the heck? Miles' patience was finally running out, and he couldn't help but swear. His expression turned slightly ugly. What's wrong with you? Why don't you want to switch to first class? Fine, be poor for the rest of your life, you loser. Sir, please be polite, Damon warned. Miles wanted to continue cursing, but he realized how fit Damon was, so he turned around and returned to his place. Kiki nodded to her seatmate. Thank you. You're welcome, he replied. Have you really never been in first class? She asked. She had a curious look on her face. For her, sitting in first class was normal. She was wealthy, and she never had to worry about money. She was surprised that someone so handsome had never experienced first class before. He nodded. She smiled charmingly and changed the subject. Before they knew it, the plane took off. Kiki felt sleepy, so they stopped chatting, and Damon looked out the window. He felt bored watching the clouds fly by so he closed his eyes to rest as well. At some point, Kiki began to lean on his shoulder. She looked as if she were sleeping very soundly. Her mouth was slightly open, and a trace of drool dripped from the corner of her lip. Damon looked down and saw that he had a good view of her cleavage. His heart began to beat faster. He had a brief look, 
and then turned away. He didn't want to wake her. It was wrong to disturb people's dreams. Damon closed his eyes for a while, then a slight movement caused him to open them again. Kiki was leaning her whole body on him now. Her head had moved from his shoulder to his chest, and she looked like she was fast asleep. On top of that, she was also holding onto his arm. She was acting as if they were together. This time, Damon felt a little awkward. He didn't know if he should wake her up. Not doing so seemed even more inappropriate. However, he was enjoying the embrace. He decided that he might as well close his eyes and pretend to be asleep too. Eventually, she would wake up and get off of him. After a while, Damon actually fell asleep. He woke up when the plane began its descent. Only then did he realize that they'd nearly arrived at their destination. However, Kiki was still fast asleep. Damon patted her on the shoulder and said, We are about to land in D.C. Oh? The woman opened her sleepy eyes and realized that the plane was indeed landing. That's when she finally realized that she was lying in Damon's arms. She'd even drooled on his chest. However, she remained cool as a cucumber. She smiled seductively and said, Thank you for being my pillow. Your embrace is very warm. Kiki had slept like she was lying on expensive silk sheets. Damon had acted the perfect gentleman and she was impressed. The plane finally landed. Damon stood up and helped her get her luggage down. She thanked him profusely. At this moment, Miles came over from first class. He smiled at Damon coldly and asked, So, how was it? He must have had fun sitting next to Kiki the whole time, right? Damon replied, Yeah, it wasn't bad. Miles smirked at him. He had more that he wanted to say, but he realized that Damon was a hard person to bully, so he remained silent. It was very late when they got out of the airport. Meyerson was a prosperous city, but it couldn't compare to Washington, D.C., D.C. was quickly overtaking New York to become America's financial capital. After leaving the airport, Kiki asked, Is anyone here to pick you up? Damon thought for a moment and said, Yes, I think so. He had told Claude his flight details, but his phone was still off. He turned it on and checked his messages. The CEO hadn't called. Miles looked at Damon with disdain and said loudly, Kiki, why isn't our ride here yet? I thought that your uncle was supposed to pick us up in his Mercedes. Kiki rolled her eyes at him. Obviously, Miles was just showing off. Did he have to be so shameless? Miles shot her a dirty look. He wanted to ditch Damon as soon as possible. Naturally, Damon had overheard him. He didn't want to bicker with the guy, nor did he want to hang out with Kiki anymore. He called Claude, and it turned out that the CEO was already here waiting for him. So he bid his two travel companions goodbye and went to find his ride. He found Claude smoking a cigarette in the parking lot. The CEO was chatting with a middle-aged airport employee. The employee was holding a broom. He was a janitor there, but he was on his break. Claude introduced the man as Klaus. Klaus shook Damon's hand and smiled. Hello, nice to meet you. I've just been talking with your friend here. We are both German. The two men had been speaking German to each other. Now that Damon was with them, they switched to English. Damon nodded and gave the man another cigarette. Klaus lit it and smoked happily. He was dressed in shabby clothes. Presumably he didn't make very much money. He puffed on his cigarette for a moment before asking, Is it your first time in D.C.? Damon nodded. The janitor laughed. Then you must be here on business like a friend. He was telling me all about your company. It sounds very impressive. Klaus went on praising Everbright and Astronet for some time. Damon felt awkward. He was a modest person and he never bragged about his achievements. While this was happening... Miles and Kiki just happened to be walking by. They recognized Damon and stopped to listen to the conversation. Miles smirked. Clearly, he had no respect for the janitor. Klaus noticed him staring and fell silent. Suddenly, bright headlights appeared in front of them, and a rather flashy Mercedes-Benz slowly came to a stop in front of Kiki and Miles. Then, a bald man stuck his head out the window and said with a smile, Kiki, you're here. Hurry up and get in the car. Miles, you too. Your aunt can't wait to see you, Kiki. Miles put their luggage in the trunk and quickly got into the car. Kiki was able to get in too when she noticed that her shoelace was untied. She squatted down to tie it. Klaus had just finished smoking his cigarette. Therefore, Damon took out another and handed it to him. The janitor was grateful. He felt that Damon was a nice young man and he smiled and thanked him for his kindness. 
Damon wasn't listening, though, because at this moment, an entire motorcade of cars arrived. The drivers hadn't been able to find parking, so Claude had gotten out and sent them off to wait elsewhere. Now they were back to pick them up. A black Rolls Royce led the group, and a line of black Mercedes Benzes followed. All the bystanders stared in awe. Everyone wondered who this impressive-looking convoy was here for. The cars pulled up and the doors opened. A group of bodyguards got out. One of them walked over to the Rolls Royce and respectfully opened the door. Claude escorted Damon to the vehicle. A heavy-set man was sitting inside. He was dressed very stylishly. Claude introduced them, and the man quickly reached out to shake Damon's hand. He was the mayor, and his name was Mr. Philip. Welcome, my friend, Mayor Philip exclaimed. It's an honor to have you here. Tonight, I want you to come over to my house for dinner. I want to get to know you. Damon smiled. Hello, Mayor Philip. It's an honor to meet you. I'd love to have dinner at your home. The mayor laughed and said, Excellent, Mr. Walker. Then, Damon and Claude got into the car. Under the escort of the convoy, they headed to the mayor's residence. Klaus, the janitor, watched them go. He still had the cigarette butt in his mouth. He was so shocked that he couldn't speak. Miles and Kiki also saw the scene play out before their eyes. They saw Damon get into a Rolls Royce and drive off under escort. Miles' jaw hung open. He couldn't believe his eyes. However, Kiki's eyes were shining brightly. She felt pleased to have sat next to Damon on the plane. Clearly, he was a very important person. Who is he? Her uncle asked in surprise. He thought he'd heard someone introduce the man in the rolls as the mayor. Kiki said proudly, I met that guy on the plane. I had no idea who he was at the time, though. Amazing, her uncle exclaimed. There was more to some people than met the eye. Claude had a good relationship with Mayor Philip. The mayor supported Everbright's plan to go public. He was also pleased to meet Damon. After all, Damon was a very promising young man. Damon had just arrived in Washington, D.C. to meet Claude. The mayor, Mr. Philip, had invited them to dinner at his house so they could get to know each other. The next day, Claude and Damon met with several investment firms. They were making preparations to take Everbright public. The financial tycoons, who they met, all expressed great interest in Everbright and Astronet. They even held a grand welcoming party on Damon's behalf. At the banquet, Damon made friends with some of these tycoons. He met a billionaire named Zane Rossbank, and they became fast friends. Zane had a strong interest in Everbright, and he supported the company going public. He was eager to buy shares, but what interested him even more was Damon's age. How had someone so young managed to found such a great company? But then again, there were a lot of young entrepreneurs in the tech industry. However, what initially attracted Zane to Damon was the fact that he went to Meyerson University. The university was Zane's alma mater. He had graduated from the school two decades ago and had gone on to make a name for himself. However, he still fondly recalled the four years he spent there when he was young. During the banquet, Damon chatted with Zane for a long time. The billionaire wished him luck with listing Everbright on the market. He was sure that Damon would make their alma mater proud. After talking about Everbright for a while, Zane said, Hey, Meyerson University is holding its 100th anniversary celebration soon. Have you heard about it? Damon nodded. I've heard a bit. It sounds like the school has already started preparations. He'd first heard about it at dinner with Fiona's mother. At that time, Karen's friend had been discussing who would get an invitation. Fiona's mother was sure to get one. After all, she was a successful person from a prominent background. But as time went on, news of the anniversary celebration spread. By now, everyone knew about it. Zane nodded. The university sent invitations to Meyerson graduates from all around the world. Everyone with impressive achievements has been invited. As a successful business tycoon, naturally, Zane was among them. Did you receive the invitation? The billionaire suddenly asked. Damon was stunned for a moment. He came back to his senses and replied, No, I'm still in school. Why would they invite me? Although he was the founder and boss of Everbright, not many people knew about it. He didn't expect to be invited to the celebration. When Zane heard this, his eyes immediately widened. Then he shook his head and exclaimed, What do you mean? Everbright is amazing. You definitely deserve to be there. I have to call President Upperton. You are a great example for your fellow students. 
He was not joking. Creating a company like Everbright at such a young age was definitely impressive. Damon would become the poster boy of Meyerson University's younger generation. It was worth the effort for the school to promote him. Damon quickly shook his head and said, That's not necessary. I'm not interested in attending the anniversary celebration. He preferred to keep a low profile. He did not want the recognition. He preferred to maintain anonymity. Such exposure could hinder his future plans. Zane nodded, but naturally he didn't know what Damon was thinking. He felt that such talent deserved to be recognized. He dropped the subject for the moment. Meanwhile, at Meyerson University, Karen's black sedan had just pulled up in front of Fiona's dorm. When Fiona saw her mother, she burst into tears. Karen saw how upset her daughter was, and she nearly had a change of heart. But then, she forced herself to think about her daughter's future. She knew that she had to be ruthless. She did not want her daughter to make the same mistake as her. She thought that she was acting for the right reasons. Many young women threw their lives away for love. Once they reached middle age, they often came to regret their choices. Karen thought she was making the wise decision for Fiona. In the future, her daughter would thank her. As for Damon, he was indeed talented, but the world was full of talented people. A person needs more than just smarts to succeed in today's world. Karen did not want to gamble on her daughter's future. Her daughter's prospects were bright, and she should be with a well-educated young man from a prominent family. Mom, do I have to go today? Fiona pleaded. Her eyes were filled with pain. I've already made an appointment for you with the head of the music program, Karen explained. It's scheduled for the day after tomorrow, so you must leave tomorrow afternoon. In fact, the so-called interview was just a formality. Even if Fiona made a complete mess of it, she would still be able to transfer to the academy. Even so, Karen hoped that her daughter would make her proud. But Fiona bit her lip. She looked miserable. Karen knew what her daughter was thinking, and she sighed. Do you still want to see that boyfriend of yours again? Her daughter didn't say anything, but her silence said it all. After all, leaving like this was too sudden. She wasn't prepared to go. If you really have to see him, you still have time tomorrow morning, right? Go and find him then, Karen exclaimed. She was at her wit's end when it came to Damon, but she was not so cruel as to stop Fiona from saying goodbye to him. She was afraid that if she did, her daughter would rebel. No, it would be better for her to see him one last time. After Karen left for the evening, Fiona returned to her dorm and tried to call Damon, but the call did not go through. The next morning she went to find him, but his roommates told her that he had taken a leave of absence. As for where he'd gone, no one knew. In fact, Damon was in D.C. on business, and he wasn't answering his phone. Fiona was upset that he'd left without telling her. After returning to her dormitory, she took out a pen and wrote him a letter. Then, she went back and asked Quinn to give it to Damon when he saw him. She tried calling him again that afternoon, but no one answered. So, Fiona had no choice but to pick up her suitcase and get into her mother's sedan. The car drove all the way to the airport. Her flight was leaving soon. Fiona gazed back in the direction of Meyerson University. Her eyes were filled with tears. She was hoping for a miracle. She wanted Damon to appear in front of her in the waiting room. However, when the boarding call was announced, there was still no sign of him. The miracle wasn't going to happen. It was equally unlikely that Damon would ever be successful enough to gain her mother's approval either. Cupcake, where are you? Why didn't you come, even just to say goodbye? Do you know that I'm leaving today? Will we ever speak again? I wish so much that you were here. Unfortunately, he was a thousand miles away. Tears poured from her eyes and she was filled with an endless longing to stay in Meyerson. This was her home now. However, she was leaving. She was going to a new place where she didn't know anyone. At this moment, her heart was filled with regret and trepidation. As she boarded the plane, she kept looking back to see if his familiar figure would appear at the gate behind her. Many people were coming and going, but they were all strangers. Finally, she turned a corner and stepped onto the plane to D.C. In fact, at this moment, Damon had finished his business in D.C. and was about to board a plane back to Meyerson. It was a strange coincidence. Now that the preparations to take Everbright public were complete, it was making headlines in the financial news nationwide. 
the talented young founder of Everbright was on his way to making billions of dollars. Without a doubt, he would become the youngest tycoon in the world. The growth of his company was shocking. He was the new Bill Gates. The media outlets all praised him. People were amazed by this mysterious young man who was the creative genius behind Astromar. However, these reports mostly consisted of text and did not have any pictures. Countless people who paid attention to the financial news wondered what this young tycoon looked like. Miss Branto was among the people who read this news. She read all about Everbright's plan to go public. She also read the profiles describing Damon as the youngest tycoon in the world, and she couldn't help but smile. In her mind, she imagined the scene of him meeting with the big financial analysts. She was amazed by the stories of his success. He was destined for great things. When she thought about their one-night stand in Berlin, she smiled to herself. She was thinking about what she would do to celebrate his return to Meyerson. After all, he was on the path to success now. If Everbright was listed on the market as planned, Damon would undoubtedly reach another major milestone. Thinking of this, Miss Branto went into her bedroom. She looked in her closet and picked out a sexy dress. She put it on and stood in front of the mirror. She wondered whether or not Damon would like it. Hmm, the dress was very revealing. It vividly displayed her most valuable assets. The front was low cut and the back was open, showing even more skin. It would definitely catch his eye. She knew she looked stunning, but she wasn't sure that he'd take the bait. She remembered their night in Berlin again, and a sweet look of longing appeared on her face. Quinn also noticed that Damon was in the news. Although these reports did not have any pictures, they included Damon's name. When Quinn read the reports, he finally learned that his roommate was actually the boss of Everbright. Upon realizing this, he felt a little surprised. Perhaps if he hadn't been at the real estate agency with Damon that day, he wouldn't have believed it, but he'd seen the property with his own eyes, so he didn't doubt these reports. In addition, he'd watched the number of Astronet users exceed 300 million. In light of this, anything was possible. Damon could work miracles, and Quinn no longer underestimated him. Damn, Quinn, did you read the Financial Times? Theo suddenly exclaimed one afternoon in the dorm. Did you read this article about the youngest tech tycoon in the world? He came over and clapped Quinn on the shoulder. This guy has the same name as Damon. It must be a crazy coincidence, right? Theo read the news about a guy named Damon Walker who was poised to become the tech world's youngest tycoon, but he didn't make the connection. The article didn't have a picture. The fact that this young businessman had the same name as his roommate must just be some crazy coincidence. Quinn nodded mysteriously, but he didn't say anything. We are finance majors, Theo stated. Do you think we'll ever be this successful? At this moment, Hector, who was lying on his bed looking at his phone, smirked and said, No way, stop dreaming. Even if we were 1% as successful as that guy, it'd be a miracle. Although Meyerson students were proud, they were also realistic. They knew their limitations. If they could get good jobs after graduation, they'd be satisfied. None of us will ever be that successful. Hector concluded with certainty. Theo nodded. Xander, who was lying on his bed talking on the phone with Riley, also nodded. However, Quinn had a different opinion. In a positive tone, he said, I don't necessarily agree. Someone in our dormitory has already achieved huge success. As for who, only Quinn knew the answer. Hector cast a confused glance at him and asked, Really, who? I know who he's talking about, Theo exclaimed at this moment. It's Levi. Damn, we almost forgot that Levi used to live in our dorm. This made sense to Hector and Xander. After all, Levi was now a popular singer nationwide. He had performed two concerts already this year. His shows had been held in stadiums, and they had completely sold out. Furthermore, they'd also heard that Levi was preparing to go on a world tour. He was already a superstar in the music industry. Compared to Levi, his roommates from room 502 were nobodies. Oh, the difference between them was like night and day. It was a bit infuriating, really. Levi was enjoying his moment in the spotlight. He was rich and famous, but who could say what would happen in the future? However, at the moment, he had surpassed them all. He had risen to great heights. In any case, none of them could compare to him. Quinn hadn't been alluding to Levi, but he didn't explain further. In fact, he was on par with Theo and Xander success-wise. 
He was just lucky enough to be in on some of Damon's secrets, that was all. He didn't need recognition for this. He was just grateful. Since Damon hadn't told the others his secret, Quinn wouldn't either. His friend must have reasons for keeping a low profile. Most people didn't read the financial news anyway. Veronica, Avery, and Fiona had no idea that their classmate was making headlines. Avery was still a rising star in the movie industry. At the same time, she was working on her music as well. Apparently, she had signed a contract with a huge record label. According to the contract, the company would make her world famous. As for Veronica, she had already finished her exchange, and she was now back at Meyerson. At this moment, Fiona was quietly sitting in a classroom at the DC Academy of Music, listening to her teacher. The autumn sunlight shone through the window and warmed her, but at this moment, she was not in the mood to listen to the lecture. She stared blankly out the window. She was sitting next to a new friend, and her friend was reading the news. She read a headline about the so-called youngest tycoon in the world, and she sent Fiona a link to the article. But Fiona was not interested at all. Her thoughts were far away. She was thinking about room 502 at Meyerson University. Has Damon received her letter? Was he sad that she was gone? Unfortunately, it seemed that their relationship couldn't withstand the test. In Fiona's eyes, Damon was outstanding. However, in the end, he might not be outstanding enough to win over her mother. Perhaps one day he would reach that level. But it might not be for a long time. Such an achievement could take years. Who knows what might happen in the meantime. Fiona didn't know. She wanted to call Damon and talk to him, but she was still upset that he'd left without telling her. As she thought of this, tears rolled quietly down her cheeks. Nancy and Robert also didn't know that Damon's company was about to go public. They had investigated him before, but at the time, Astronet wasn't created yet. They still thought he was a failure at business. At this moment, they were driving a very brand new Ferrari sports car to campus. They wanted to surprise him with it. They hoped that when he saw this gift, he would feel less resentful towards them. However, when they arrived at Meyerson University, they discovered that he had taken a leave of absence from the school. The Brokertons were very disappointed. After Damon and Claude finished their work in D.C., they came back to Meyerson together to deal with some more business-related matters. A few days later, Claude flew home. After that, Damon was free to resume his normal life. He realized that he hadn't talked to Fiona since before going to D.C., so he took out his phone and tried to call her. However, it seemed that she had changed her number. He was stunned. He'd been gone only ten days. He went on social media to see if she'd left him a message, but she hadn't. He didn't blame her for being angry. After all, he had left town without telling her. He tried to message her to apologize, but he received no response. Had she blocked him? Just as he was trying to figure out what to do next, Quinn came back for dinner. When he saw Damon, his eyes lit up. They chatted a bit, and Quinn got him up to speed on the new developments with Astronet. Then, Quinn suddenly remembered something. Oh, right, your girlfriend left. She asked me to give you a letter. What letter? Damon asked eagerly. He felt his spirits lift. Why hadn't she told him that she was leaving? He supposed that she hadn't got a chance to. He had been entirely focused on the matter of taking his company public and he'd neglected her. Damon tore open the letter and read her note. He saw her delicate handwriting. It was blurry in places, as if stained with tears. Damon recalled the day he met her. The weather had been hot and sunny. It seemed that their fates were intertwined. He did not remember all the details from the early days of their relationship. He had long forgotten the warm scene of them being together, but he vaguely remembered how she used to pester him. However, as they'd gotten to know each other, she'd become gentler and more loving. What he remembered most vividly was the night of his birthday several weeks ago. Damon used to think that the two of them would grow old together as Fiona had longed for. However, things didn't always go as planned. She left his life as quickly as she'd arrived in it. Was this some sort of joke? The letter had no address or signature, but he knew she'd written it. Cupcake, when you open this letter, I might already be gone. I am boarding a plane to D.C. today. Perhaps when I step foot in Meyerson again, it will just be to visit. However, I do not know when that will be. Yes, I am leaving you. As for how long, I'm uncertain. Perhaps a month? Perhaps a year? Perhaps ten years? Or perhaps... 
Don't be sad, okay? Promise me that you will smile when you finish reading this letter. All good times must come to an end, and nothing in life is perfect. I don't want our relationship to end on a sad note, though, so I hope you can find the silver lining in this letter. First, forgive me for being so distant during the days before I left. I was afraid that the more time I spent with you, the harder it would be for me to leave. I've even wondered if I'm doing the right thing by writing this letter, but I know I must. I already miss you so much. Please forgive me for not leaving you my contact details. I'm afraid that if I hear your voice, I'll regret my decision forever. Remember when I said that we make the perfect couple? I wasn't lying. At that time, I believed you were my soulmate. I believed you would be a perfect husband and father. I looked forward to our future together. I was willing to give up my whole life for you. But later on, it seemed that I wouldn't have to. You proved that you could provide a beautiful life for me and our future children. I will always admire you. Once, I naively thought that we would always be together, but now I realize that that was just a dream. Our relationship couldn't withstand even a single blow. I still remember the first time we met. I remember that simple and honest smile of yours. I admit that I felt that there was something different about you. I remember the first time you came shopping with me, and I also remember that snowy night when you drove me back to campus in the Bentley. You told me about your business that night too. I will never forget it. But in essence, we are all human, aren't we? Despite all this, my mother will never support our relationship, and I don't have the strength to fight her forever. Please forgive me for giving up on us. The future we imagined together is just too beautiful. I don't dare to believe it can happen anymore. I've chosen to leave Myerson because I want to follow my dream. I've realized that you are holding me back. Perhaps I will return, or perhaps not. Even if I do return, it will not be for some years, five years, ten years, I can't say. But I won't ask you to wait for me. Let me go, all right? I look forward to meeting you again five or ten years down the line. At that time, you can tell me all about your achievements. Perhaps, someday, we could even give our relationship another shot. However, I realize this might not be possible. We have many obstacles between us. I'm leaving. You were once my cupcake, but now I'll say goodbye. At the bottom, she'd drawn a picture of a woman crying. Damon held the letter in his hand. He could faintly smell Fiona's perfume wafting from it. He could picture her crying as she wrote the letter. He could also feel the helplessness in her words as if there was an impassable canyon between them. The gap was so huge that even an outstanding guy like Damon couldn't leap over it. Fiona's words were filled with despair. Damon looked at the sky. He wondered what she was doing right now, wherever she was. Why had she chosen to end things with him? He couldn't ask her, though. She had cut off all contact with him. Would he ever see her again? He didn't know. What he did know was that he wouldn't have a chance to share the joy of Everbright's success with her. Damon stood in his dorm room, stunned. He was a tough guy, but at this moment, all he wanted to do was get drunk. So he went to the store to buy a case of beer. Then he went and sat on the rooftop of his dorm building and drank alone. As he drank, he remained stoic. It was hard to know just what he was thinking. While he sat there, he looked up at the sky. He realized that Fiona had unknowingly left a deep impression on him. However, their relationship was over now. Damon poured beer on her letter and her words began to blur. Finally, the words became illegible. They disappeared, just like their love. It was like their relationship had never happened. That night, he couldn't sleep. He tossed and turned in bed. Love had dealt him many blows before, but this was the one that hurt the most. It was the middle of the night, and he couldn't sleep, so he simply got up. He went back to the rooftop and smoked one cigarette after another. When dawn broke, Damon crawled back into bed and finally fell into a deep sleep. When he woke up, it was past two o'clock in the afternoon. His heart was still full of sadness, but he knew he had to pull himself together. He had work to do. Once Everbright was successfully listed, he would have the confidence to face Fiona's mother on her terms. He washed his face and tried to forget about his broken heart. He knew he had to check in with his new employee, Mitch. Damon hoped the guy would not disappoint him.
Damon had just received Fiona's letter. He felt heartbroken, but he wasn't going to let his personal feelings distract him from his work. After getting out of bed the next afternoon, he asked Quinn how their new employee Mitch was doing. Quinn told him that Mitch's computer skills were superb. The new employee was actually much better with computers than Quinn himself. After all, Mitch had won many awards for his work in the computer science program. He was practically a genius. Quinn had asked around and discovered that Mitch's classmate had a nickname for him. They called him The Wiz because of his amazing skills. Mitch quickly identified and fixed many bugs that Quinn hadn't even noticed. As such, Quinn really admired him. Damon was pleased to hear this. After all, he planned to train Mitch as a core member of his team. Therefore, he called him and made an appointment to see him in the afternoon. Later, when Damon and Quinn went to find him, they heard him talking on the phone with his girlfriend Maddie. He was telling her about his new job. He told Maddie that not only had he found a job, but he was also very satisfied with it. Although Astronet was still relatively unknown, it was growing rapidly. Mitch's salary was very generous. On top of that, he was getting in on the ground floor. He might even have a chance to join upper management there one day. Furthermore, Astronet already had more than 300 million users. Its future prospects were bright. As long as he worked hard, his future was guaranteed as well. He loved his new job. Even if he was offered a position at a bigger company, he wouldn't hesitate to turn it down. At Astronet, he was able to use all his skills to help the company grow. He was a valuable member of the team. All in all, he was very satisfied. Maddie was also happy that her boyfriend had found a good job. Mitch didn't tell her that Astronet was Damon's company, though. He was an intelligent guy, and he realized that his boss liked to keep his identity a secret. Since Maddie and her friends didn't seem to know, he wouldn't tell them. After Mitch met up with Damon and Quinn, the three of them made plans to go eat at a nearby restaurant. While they ate, they could discuss future plans for Astronet. Just as they were leaving Mitch's place, they noticed an extremely dazzling sports car parked outside the building. It was attracting a lot of attention from people walking by. A bicyclist almost crashed into a pole because he was distracted by the car. When the three guys walked past the car, the driver leaned on the horn. The doors immediately opened and a man and a woman stepped out. The man had a cigar in his mouth, and he was dressed very stylishly. The woman was incredibly attractive. One look at her was enough to make a man's jaw drop. Damon was stunned to see the two of them. He knew them, but he hadn't expected to run into them here today. It was Will and Miss Branto. Damon wondered why Will wasn't driving the Bentley. Had he already traded it in for something new? It looked like he had earned quite a bit of money in the past two years. His demeanor had also changed. Back when Will and Damon were partners, he had been humble and down to earth. Now he had an arrogant expression on his face. He was acting all high and mighty. However, Damon was puzzled to see Miss Branto standing next to Will. Were they together? Although she had recently pursued Damon, her being with Will was not unimaginable. Thinking about this, Damon frowned. Although he didn't have a relationship with her, they had slept together before. Therefore, when he saw her and Will together, his expression turned ugly. However, he quickly hid it. Naturally, Will noticed Damon as well. He and Miss Branto were here looking for Mitch. Will had been a student in the computer science program at Meyerson University before being expelled. As such, he knew Mitch very well. He also knew about all the guy's talents. Since Mitch was graduating soon, Will and Miss Branto had come here to offer him a job. They hadn't expected to run into Damon here. Will looked at his old business partner disdainfully. Then, he immediately turned and pretended that Damon didn't exist. Instead, he reached out to shake Mitch's hand. Hey, Wiz, how have you been? It's great to see you. Isn't this a pleasant surprise? Hello, Will, Mitch exclaimed with a smile. Naturally, he didn't know about the bad blood between Will and Damon. Will was two years older than Mitch but they still knew each other. Although Will was later expelled, he had been an influential person in the program at the time. Additionally, his classmates had also heard that after being kicked out of school, he'd gone on to open a successful company. KC Games had developed many outstanding products. Will had even been interviewed several times by major news outlets. In the eyes of his peers and juniors, he was famous. His success even caused the professors at the university to look at him in a new light. When his name came up in conversations now, 
it wasn't because of his past misdeeds. Instead, his professors discussed his hard work and many achievements. They talked as if he had graduated from Meyerson University. They were all proud of him. This fickleness couldn't be helped. It was human nature. In the past two years, Will had gained a lot of experience about the world. Hence, he had become shrewd and ruthless. He had also become arrogant, and he never kept a low profile. He used his success to his advantage, and he never held back. Miss Branto was also a little surprised when she saw Damon. Her eyes lit up. She was happy to have run into him, and she stared at him intently. After all, she hadn't seen him for a long time. But soon, a worried look appeared in her eyes. She and Will had just gotten out of the same car. She hoped Damon wouldn't get the wrong idea. She was just here to recruit Mitch, nothing more. Will had told her about his old classmate's impressive skills, and she knew that he would be an asset to the company. She hadn't expected to run into Damon here. For a moment, she was lost in thought. But soon, a mysterious smile appeared on her face. She seemed to have a plan. Will continued to ignore Damon, and he asked Mitch, Where are you going? I'm off to have dinner with my friends, the guy answered honestly. Will finally acknowledged Damon with a cold glance. Then he sneered, Why would you eat with someone like this? Come with me instead. I will take you somewhere nice. Will paused to puff on his cigar. Then he continued casually, Oh, right, I heard that you're still looking for a job. How about you come and work for me? You've heard about KC Games, right? A lot of your friends have applied for jobs with me. If you join my company, I will pay you a great salary with benefits. You will never have to worry about money again. Your future will be secure. He sounded like he was praising Mitch, but he couldn't hide his sense of superiority. Because he'd been expelled, he was extra smug about being able to offer his old classmates jobs now. He felt vindicated, especially when people who he knew from university tried to curry favor with him. From his behavior, this was obvious. He thought Mitch would be grateful for the job offer. After all, KC Games was doing extremely well for itself at the moment. Unexpectedly, Mitch turned him down. Thank you for the offer, but I already have a job. I'm afraid I can't work for you. You have a job? Will was stunned for a moment. Then his expression turned ugly. Where do you work? It wasn't surprising that Will was upset. In fact, he thought quite highly of Mitch. After all, the guy was very talented. If he weren't, Will and Miss Branta wouldn't waste their time on him. They never imagined that someone else would beat them to it and snatch him from under their noses. Realizing his loss, Will became angry. Will was still waiting for Mitch to answer his question. Mitch cast a glance at Damon and said, Sorry, I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to say. Will was not stupid. He could read the guy's body language. He said coldly, Why are you willing to work for such a useless person? You're worth more than that. At this moment, Miss Branto, who had been looking at Damon this whole time, stepped forward and asked with a smile, Yes, what company do you work for? Is it as powerful as Casey Games? If you agree to come and work for us, we can offer you a position in management. As she spoke, her arm lightly brushed against Will's body. Whether intentional or not, the touch seemed very intimate. After that, she looked at Damon mockingly. With this touch, Will's body trembled. Miss Branto had never behaved so intimately with him before. Additionally, he could see that this bothered his ex-business partner. Although Damon was doing his best to hide his displeasure, it was still very obvious that seeing Miss Branto and Will together bothered him. Regardless of this, Will was also openly trying to steal his employee from him. In essence, Will had no respect at all. At this moment, Damon even started to suspect that Miss Branto had been lying to him when she promised to deal with Will. It seemed that nothing had changed for the guy. Clearly, he still lived comfortably. He even had a new car. Furthermore, in light of their intimate body language, how could they be enemies? They seemed more like husband and wife. Miss Branto was really convincing when she wanted to be. Damon smiled coldly. Will, it's none of your business. Mitch already works for me. Go find someone else to hire. Here's a piece of advice, though. It's trashy to flaunt your wealth like that. You should try to keep a low profile. Will finished his cigar and took out another one. He lit it with an expensive-looking gold lighter. Then he asked, Who do you think you are? Do you have the right to give me advice? If you have a problem, just come out and say it. 
Now, Damon was not the only one who was upset. Will's words had also infuriated Quinn and Mitch. Quinn spat. What's your problem, anyway? You think KC Games is pretty great, huh? Well, without Silly Goose, your company would be nothing. Mitch chimed in. Will, thanks for your offer, but I have a job, so I'm not interested. Bah! Will glared at Mitch and growled. I hope that in the future you don't regret your decision today, loser. Then he turned to Miss Branto. Let's go, being here is a waste of time. Will thought that he deserved to be treated with respect. After all, he was rich now. Even a talented guy like Mitch should be trying to curry favor with him. Miss Branto nodded. She took a last glance at Damon and saw his dark expression. She seemed to realize that she'd gone too far. Her expression was tender, and it showed that she still had feelings for him. At the same time, she was pleased to see that he was jealous of her relationship with Will. This meant that he had feelings for her as well. Will got into the car and drove off. Although he could afford to hire a driver, he preferred the feeling of being in control. As he drove, he turned the stereo on and the bass boomed through the speakers. Then he cursed. How shameless the nerve of that guy. He's just an intern who hasn't even graduated yet. Who does he think he is? Miss Branto looked at him. She said lightly, It's not worth being angry about. You're right, Will agreed. He's making a mistake by working for that useless piece of trash anyways. Speaking of which, I can't believe Damon actually started another business. I'll have to find out what kind of lousy company he runs now. If he had the chance, Will wouldn't hesitate to ruin Damon's life again. At this moment, his phone suddenly rang. He answered, and a woman's voice asked, Dear, when are you coming back? I have some matters to attend to right now. You'll have to entertain yourself. But I miss you. Can you come and spend time with me tonight? The woman on the phone asked in a fawning manner. Sorry, I'm busy. After saying this, he hung up impatiently. The caller was Will's ex-girlfriend, Tina. Now that he was successful, she was interested in him again. Will had no respect for her. Will was driving his new sports car and Miss Branto was sitting in the passenger seat. They had just tried to recruit Mitch to work for their company, but the mission was unsuccessful. While they were driving, Will's ex-girlfriend Tina called. She wanted to hang out with him, but he turned her down. He'd never forgot how cold she'd been to him when he was expelled from school. Later at the school's career fair, Tina found out that Will was the boss of KC Games. After that, she became interested in him again. She and Will struck up a casual relationship. Anyway, why buy the cow when you could get the milk for free? Will paid her just enough attention to keep her coming back for more. In his eyes, she was just a fickle bitch who came and went as she pleased. He no longer had any feelings for her. Their relationship was purely physical. On top of that, Will enjoyed hurting her. He wanted revenge for how she'd treated him in the past. At this moment, his phone rang again. This time, it was Will's mother calling. Hi, honey. What are you doing? Why haven't you called your father? Mom, it's not a good time. I'm driving. If this isn't urgent, can we talk later? I'll call you back when I'm free. His tone was a little impatient. Don't hang up, his mother quickly replied. Here's the thing. Your father is having problems again. We are short of money. Isn't your company doing well lately? Could you lend us some, say, 20 grand? Mom... Will replied with exasperation. Recently, my company has encountered some difficulties. I don't have much money to spare. Is two grand enough? All right, all right, yes, that's enough. Even just a grand is fine. Solving your company's problems is more important. His mother sounded very happy. All right, Will agreed. I'll call you when I have time. I'm hanging up now. After saying this, he ended the call. Miss Branto frowned. Where are we going to eat? Shall we go to the Peninsula restaurant? Will suggested. The food there isn't bad. It's my treat. After saying this, he looked at the beautiful woman beside him. He wanted to reach over and put his arm around her, but he didn't. Miss Branto replied, No, that place is too expensive. You should save your money to help your father. Besides, the atmosphere is too romantic. I'm not comfortable going there with you. Oh, Will hadn't expected her to turn him down. He was silent for a moment. Then he prompted, Actually, the prices aren't so bad. It's fine to eat there on occasion. What do you think? Miss Branto suddenly became suspicious. What are you trying to do? You are smart, Will replied. 
you should be able to figure it out. He smiled confidently. In fact, his expression was a little vulgar. You like talented people. You seem to like me, and to be honest, I also like you. Why don't we give it a shot? We'd be the perfect couple. Will's boldness amused Miss Branto. You are really something. Where did you get the idea that I like you? And what about your girlfriend, Tina? She wants to marry you. Will's expression turned ugly at the mention of Tina. He growled, I don't like her. She's always pestering me, but I'm not interested. After saying this, he gazed at Miss Branto with deep affection. Then he continued, If you agree to be with me, I will cut off all ties with her. In short, I'll have eyes only for you. What do you think? Then he boldly reached over to put his arm around her, but she pushed him away. Her expression was cold. Don't touch me. Will was shocked. She seemed serious, so he awkwardly pulled his hand away. He didn't dare to say anything else. Miss Branto, on the other hand, smiled and threw him a bone. Actually, you and I being together isn't impossible. If you can successfully take Casey Games public and release several more games like New Century, I'll consider it. But, Will trailed off. He felt embarrassed. Getting the company listed on the stock market was not hard as long as the proper steps were taken. However, making another game like New Century was a different story. Damon had developed all of Casey Games' most popular games, such as Airblaze, Tomb Run, and New Century. These games were currently the company's main sources of income. Will had been pushing his team to develop new games, but unfortunately nothing they made was any good. The new games were a complete waste of money. They had developed a total of three new games, including a large-scale one. However, they were crudely made and unsuccessful because of it. The new, large-scale game had already been out for a few months now, but the number of users still hadn't reached a thousand. As for the other two, they were nothing special either. Will finally realized Damon's value. However, he didn't regret his choices. He enjoyed the feeling of being in charge of the company. Although Miss Branto was also a major shareholder, Will was the one who actually ran KC Games. I won't let you down, he finished with certainty. In fact, this thought had been in his head since the first time he met Miss Branto. This was also one of the reasons why he'd chosen to side with her over Damon. If he could win her affection, he stood a chance of running Silly Goose one day. He was just an ordinary guy, so the prospect of marrying a rich woman like her was very enticing. He'd never be able to rise to such heights on his own. But I think it's time to properly punish Damon, Will suddenly suggested, changing the subject. He remembered what Damon had said to him during their conversation earlier, and he felt angry. How dare he speak to him like that? Damon was just a clown now. He needed to be put in his place. Will considered sending some people to beat him up. They could break his limbs. That'd teach him. Will thought about how his ex-business partner liked playing basketball and computer games. If someone broke his arms and legs, he wouldn't be able to do those things anymore. When Miss Branto heard this, she perked up her ears. What are you going to do to him? Why do you want to know? Do you have a problem with it? He's ruining our plan, Will exclaimed. He was a little surprised by Miss Branto's reaction. After all, she had supported his decision to chase Damon out of Casey Games, and she had even helped with the plan. He had no idea that Miss Branto and Damon had slept together. He didn't know that she was scheming against him. It's fine, she soothed. Let's forget about this for now, though. We need to ensure we get the rights to the new century first. That's the right way to proceed. Oh, right, he said, remembering something. The one-year anniversary of me taking over the company is in two days. I've asked my staff to organize a celebration to mark the occasion. Are you free? If you are, you should come. After all, you are a major shareholder. It will be a party. I'll see if I have time, she replied politely, although she already knew she wouldn't. She was a busy woman with many things to do. After having dinner with Miss Branto, Will needed to vent his anger, so he called Tina and asked if he could come over. She told him to stop by, so he went to find her. After hearing that Will was coming, Tina was extremely happy. She quickly took a shower and put on makeup. Then, she spritzed herself with sexy perfume and waited for Will to arrive. When he arrived, neither of them spoke. They went straight to the bedroom. It didn't take long for Will to get what he came for. Fifteen minutes later, they were finished. Will leaned back against the headboard and lit a cigarette. 
Tina, who looked very satisfied, leaned her head on his shoulder and said, Baby, there's this new designer handbag that I really like. It's not that expensive. Can you buy it for me? Will nodded. Sure, I'll get it for you. Thank you, baby. Tina kissed him. Will was satisfied, but he wasn't thinking about Tina. His mind was on Miss Branto. He wished that she was the one lying next to him right now. Then, he thought of how Damon dared to oppose him. He had to teach that guy a lesson. It was embarrassing. The next day, Will called the KC Games management team and told them to prepare for a meeting on Friday. Although the company was doing fine, most of its income came from the games it had developed early on, such as Airblaze and Tomb Run. Until the lawsuit, New Century had done well too. However, these games were already old news. People still played them, but they no longer had huge followings like before. Although New Century had been very successful, the lawsuit stalled its progress. In the meantime, many other game developers started releasing similar products. They saw an opportunity and seized it. Now, because so many similar games had flooded the market, interest in New Century had declined. The game no longer drew new users. Its popularity was in decline. New Century's failure was a huge blow to the company. Therefore, although KC Games looked magnificent on the surface, this was just an illusion. Will had been pouring money into expanding the business, and as a result, KC Games was in debt. Will was holding the meeting to discuss cost-saving measures with his employees. Ever since Damon left, the company had been losing money. In addition, they also hadn't developed anything good. If this continued, the financial reports would be a nightmare. In this case, even if he faked the numbers, he still wouldn't be able to take the company public. Will was usually the last to arrive at meetings. But on Friday, he was the first one in the conference room. His expression looked gloomy. This meeting would decide the future of KC Games. As the CEO, he had to make some tough decisions. After a while, the rest of the management team entered the conference room. When they saw their CEO's gloomy expression, they didn't dare to make a sound. Will looked around the room and then started the meeting. He didn't beat around the bush. Okay, everyone, let's get down to business. First, how are things with our new games? Why isn't development moving as scheduled? Progress seems to have stalled. Who can give me an explanation? The executives looked at each other, not knowing what to say. Will turned to the woman who was in charge of game development. Mrs. Rogers, tell me, have any of our new games gained popularity? Mrs. Rogers scratched her head and said helplessly, Games are a big industry and there is a lot of competition. Many companies are releasing new games. Also, our funds are limited and the marketing department is not doing a good job. Consumers don't know about our company's products. In light of this, it's hard to make our games popular. The head of the marketing department immediately retorted. Ms. Rogers, that's unfair. My department has been working really hard lately, all right? We put a lot of effort into the marketing campaign for your last game. We ran ads everywhere. It's not our fault that people didn't like it. Your department didn't take development seriously. Don't blame us for your failings. Mrs. Rogers shot back. Why don't you try to make a successful new game? Do you know how much pressure my department faces? New companies enter the gaming industry every day. We don't have the funding to compete with them, so it's no surprise that they surpass us. Everyone else is way ahead of us in terms of operations and marketing. Will frowned and addressed the head of the marketing department. Mr. Jeffries, tell me how is the ad campaign going? I logged onto various platforms, but I didn't see our company's ads anywhere. We want to advertise on all the platforms and strive to introduce our products to more users. Jeffries' expression turned dark. He explained, Sir, we are trying our best, but more importantly, every time we ask for funding, we are turned down. The company can't afford to run ads on the scale needed to compete nowadays. If there's no money, how are we supposed to publicize our products? Mr. Jeffries had passed the buck to the finance department. Will turned to look at Mr. Timmons, the man who managed Casey Games' finances. Mr. Jeffries says that you won't fund his ad campaigns. What's going on? Mr. Timmons frowned and said helplessly, Sir, what he says is true, but to be honest, it's not that we are being stingy. The company hasn't been doing well recently, and we don't have the money to fund big ad campaigns. Even paying people's salaries is difficult lately. Paying for advertising is... We don't have any money? Will asked with a frown. Clearly, he was very dissatisfied.
Will was in a meeting with the executives of KC Games. The company situation didn't look good, Mr. Timmons said helplessly. Sir, everyone has been overspending. Various department managers have taken trips and bought vehicles with company money. It has been a drain on our finances. Ugh. Mr. Timmons didn't want to mention that the CEO himself had just bought a brand new sports car with company money. On paper, it was a company car, but in reality, no one dared to bring this up. Will looked around again. The executives all lowered their heads. They didn't want to look him in the eye. They were all guilty of being careless with company money. Will had spent a lot of money, though his employees hadn't hesitated to do the same. His expression was gloomy. He growled, In the future, don't spend company money for personal reasons. No more company cars anymore either, okay? You can take the bus if you have to. Does anyone have any objections? Everyone looked dissatisfied. After all, spending money was easier than saving money. They had had these benefits since joining the company, and they hadn't expected the CEO to suddenly take them away. No one was happy about this development. Furthermore, Will had just bought himself a brand new luxury car on the company's dime, yet he expected them to take the bus. Although no one said this aloud, they were all thinking it. The company was in the red because of Will. He was the one who spent the most money. Will hired beautiful women to be his personal assistants, in addition, he took vacations in Hawaii and the Maldives several times this year. On top of this, he'd bought a new sports car. Furthermore, it was rumored that he secretly transferred company money to his own account. Although there was no concrete proof, it wasn't unimaginable. What? Will demanded. It seems like you have a problem with my decision. He pounded his fist on the table and growled. Why do you all look dissatisfied? This is for the good of the company. KC Games is in a crisis. You don't want the company to go under, do you? I'll follow the new rules, too. From now on, I won't use the company money for personal reasons either. Does anyone have any objections? Yes, someone suddenly exclaimed. We're in this situation because of you. You go on trips all the time, and you hire your mistresses to be your assistants. None of them do a lick of work around here. Although the speaker wasn't very loud, the conference room was dead quiet at the moment. Everyone could hear the person clearly. Instantly, the entire room became even quieter. People looked around, trying to see which among them dared to openly accuse Will. Will's expression turned extremely ugly. Who was that? Who spoke just now? Stand up! No one said anything. Will pounded on the table angrily and roared, Stand up if you have the guts! The COO, who was sitting beside him, couldn't stand it anymore. Sir, calm down. Everyone is unhappy, and they have a right to voice their complaints. Actually, we should welcome their constructive criticism. They just want to help improve conditions at the company. We've all heard rumors that someone has been stealing from the company account. People think that this is why the company is in distress. Everyone is just a little worried. Is that so? Do you all think that someone is stealing? Will asked, looking around. The executives all nodded. Will glared at them. Since that's the case, why didn't you tell me? We all have a responsibility to KC Games, so you should have reported this. The CEO sighed and glanced at his boss. Actually, everyone knows who is stealing, but without evidence, no one dares to say anything. The man's tone was somewhat cryptic. Will glanced at him and growled. Are you accusing me? In any other circumstances, the COO would have quickly replied that he didn't dare to make such an accusation. However, this time, he didn't deny it. The other executives didn't say anything either. Despite this, the answer was clear. Miss Branto was the majority shareholder of the company, and Will was the second largest shareholder. However, most of their senior executives also owned shares. Therefore, they couldn't stand the thought of company property being misappropriated. However, since there was no evidence, they didn't dare to say anything out loud. They were also worried that Will might try to take revenge. However, at this moment, it was clear that everyone was furious. When the CEO next spoke, his tone sounded desperate. Sir, please calm down. Anyway, I didn't say anything. Will looked furious. He stared at the man and said, If you think that I am the one who was stealing, you can just come out and say it. Why are you so hesitant? The CEO finally said, You should have known that we'd find out. Why did you do it? Will immediately slammed his fist down on the table and stood up. He roared angrily. So the truth comes out. 
Do you have any evidence to back up your claims? How dare you accuse me without proof? We may not have evidence, but we want only what's best for the company. Don't fight us on this. Damn it, you dare to question me? Will completely exploded. He looked as if he wanted to hit the COO. He shouted, If you are accusing me of misappropriating the company's property, show me what evidence you have. Otherwise, don't blame me for getting upset. Will wasn't afraid. If anyone dared to question him again, he would just fire them. Will had kicked Damon, the co-founder, out of the company, and he could get rid of these people too. They should know this. The executives started whispering to each other. They were all furious. Mr. Timmons stood up and stated, Sir, please respect us. We are also shareholders. We have the right to question your decisions. No! Will roared, slamming the table again. Don't forget, I'm the reason this company exists. I'm in charge here. If you support me, I'll let you keep your jobs. If you're unhappy with that arrangement, then get lost. He was flustered and exasperated. If these people didn't trust him, then he didn't need them anymore. Sometimes, in private, the executives questioned their boss's decisions. Will knew this, and he was very dissatisfied about it. These people didn't know what was good for them. The company was in crisis, and having fewer employees would save money. The COO was outraged. Sir, you're making a big mistake. You will get what you deserve. Oh yeah, Will replied. What are you going to do? You're fired. Now pack your things and get the hell out of here right now. You don't have the right to fire me, the COO protested. The board of directors has to authorize it. You need Miss Branto to support your decision. Miss Branto asked me to represent her, Will spat. Also, you might not know, but she's my girlfriend now, he boasted shamelessly. Although he and Miss Branto weren't together yet, she'd maintained that it was a possibility in the future. In Will's mind, this was all the confirmation he needed. When the executives heard this, they looked at each other in dismay. After all, there was no way to verify his claim. On top of this, they knew that the two of them had a close relationship. They saw Will's proud expression and they guessed that it was most likely true. If that was really the case, Will had the power to do as he pleased. He could fire whoever he wanted. The executives thought about this and their hearts sank. Their expressions turned extremely ugly. Damn it, if what he said was true, then it was over. Will saw their ashen expressions and he felt extremely pleased. He smirked and said, Actually, I'm not an unreasonable person. As long as you admit your mistakes, we can put this behind us. However, as he said this, he pointed at the COO. He continued, I want you out of my sight. You're fired. I don't like you. You're a piece of trash. I'm not leaving, the man refused. If you want me to leave, you can take it to the board of directors. They can make the final decision. The CEO was firm in his stance. He would fight Will to the end. Will was so angry that he grabbed the man by the collar. He threatened, This company belongs to me. If I want you gone, you're gone. Do you want to get hurt? After saying this, he pushed the man away. Bang. Suddenly, someone threw open the door of the conference room. Will turned around and saw Miss Branto standing at the door. She had several members of the board with her. Will was stunned and he asked, Izzy, why are you here? Then he saw the members of the board behind her and immediately felt overjoyed. Great, you can come to help me. Quickly, come in. Call security to take this man away. These people are getting violent. They are rebelling against me. The executives all looked at Miss Branto in a daze. They didn't know what she planned to do. She smiled coldly. Then she waved her hand at them and said, Everyone, I'm here to clean up the mess. Will put his hands on his waist and nearly laughed out loud. He thought Miss Branto was here in the nick of time to help him. Unexpectedly, the two board members behind her walked up to Will and whispered something to him. Then, one of them showed Will some documents. It was an arrest warrant. Sir, you are being charged for theft of company property. You are corrupt, and we have proof that you've accepted bribes. Please follow us. The police are waiting outside to take you away. Will's eyes widened. He couldn't believe his ears. There must be some mistake. How could I possibly steal from the company? He said in a pleading tone. He turned his gaze to Miss Branto. What's going on, Izzy? Is this a misunderstanding? Besides, you said you'd be my girlfriend. What's going on here? Tell them to let me go. Miss Branto put her hands on her hips and smiled coldly. Where is your head? Who said anything about me being your girlfriend? You are talking nonsense. 
but that's what you said when we were in the car the other day. Have you forgotten? Will stammered anxiously. He wanted these two men to get away from him, but they were standing on either side of him holding onto his shoulders. Miss Branto smiled and flicked her hair over her shoulder. Oh, you misunderstood me, she explained. I said that maybe one day we could be together. She smiled at him sweetly, but in his eyes, she was as venomous as a snake. She finished. Unfortunately, in light of this mess, it's never going to happen. Will realized that she'd tricked him. He struggled to escape the two men, and he roared angrily. He glared resentfully at her, but it was all in vain. He hadn't seen her during the past few days. She had been secretly collecting evidence against him. After all, it was not easy to overthrow a boss like Will. Miss Branto had to make sure that she had solid proof of his misdeeds. She watched as Will was escorted out of the building and put into a waiting police car. After he was gone, a smile finally appeared on her face. She dealt with her major problem. Now she could finally go to Damon and ask for her reward. She chuckled to herself at the thought. Once the corrupt CEO was gone, the group of executives applauded. They never would have thought that Miss Branto was secretly investigating Will. The guy had gotten what he deserved. He was an arrogant prick, and he dug his own grave long ago. Meanwhile, at Myerson University, Damon was asleep in his dorm. He didn't have morning classes that day. When he woke up, he found that the dorm was empty. He took out his phone to see what time it was. Only then did he realize that his phone was dead. He felt an overwhelming sense of sadness. Since Fiona left, he hadn't tried to contact her. She had disappeared from his life, just like that. She was gone without a trace. It had been more than ten days since she left. Every night when Damon slept, he dreamed of her. He thought about all the wonderful times they had had together. Only now did he realize that she was the most important woman in his life. However, she'd broken his heart. She left without even giving him a chance to say goodbye. Did she still remember what she'd said to him the first time that they met? Did she remember how she'd used him? As Damon thought of this, his heart suddenly felt empty. Because he could no longer contact her, he hadn't bothered to charge his phone. It had been dead like this for 24 hours already. What was the point in charging it? Fiona used to call him at all hours of the day, but she might never call again. During the past 10 days, He'd fantasized about her suddenly ringing him up out of the blue and calling him Cupcake in a coquettish tone. Sadly, this never happened. It was as if she had disappeared into thin air. After washing his face and brushing his teeth, Damon took his watch out of the cabinet and found that it was already past 11 o'clock in the morning. It was almost time for lunch. After he left his dorm, he saw a pink convertible BMW parked at the curb. A beautiful woman was staring at the door to the building, lost in thought. When she saw him appear, her eyes lit up, and she immediately came over to him. So, Miss Branto was back again. Damon was on his way to have lunch. As he left his dorm building, he saw someone he knew waiting for him. It was Miss Branto. He was shocked, and he asked, why are you here? She blinked her beautiful big eyes at him and a shy smile appeared on her face. I'm waiting for you. You're waiting for me. Yes, she exclaimed, rolling her eyes at him. Who else would I be waiting for? I've been here since nine o'clock this morning. I tried calling you, but your phone is off. Only then did Damon remember that his phone had been dead since yesterday. Have you eaten? She asked gently. She was gazing at him with deep affection. I'm just going for lunch now, he replied. <laughs> That's perfect. I'll take you out. She hesitated for a moment. Then she boldly grabbed his hand and led him towards the BMW. He wanted to pull his hand away, but she was holding on very tightly. She didn't want him to escape. She put her arm around him and pressed her body against his. Damon could feel her shapely body. She was holding him close. When he lowered his head, he could see the pale skin of her bosom. She was wearing a low-cut shirt, and he could see her cleavage. He wasn't sure if this was intentional or not. In any case, her assets were on full display, as if she was giving him an invitation. Although he was tempted to continue staring, he forced himself to look away. He was afraid that if he kept looking, he'd lose all self-control. Naturally, Miss Branto noticed his expression. 
A sweet smile appeared on her pretty face. She felt pleased. She took him to a very stylish restaurant. The prices were not expensive, but the dining experience was very unique. After they sat down, Damon asked casually, Miss Branto, what have you been doing lately? Why did you come to find me? She pouted and said discontentedly, Call me Izzy, okay? That's what my friends call me. She twirled a lock of her hair around her finger and continued, Do I need a reason to hang out with you? Maybe I was just bored. Okay, but it seems like you have your hands full with Will, so why are you here with me? Izzy looked at him and suddenly laughed. He asked curiously, Is there something funny? She nodded and whispered, Do you know what I was just thinking? He was very curious now. What? She rolled her eyes at him and said, I was just thinking about the look on your face when you saw me touching Will the other day. Damon was stunned. He was still thinking about how she and Will had arrived at Mitch's house together. His expression immediately darkened. He asked quietly, What's funny about that? So you're with him now. It's trashy, don't you think? What? Are you jealous? She looked at him. The more upset he looked, the happier she felt. At least this proved that he cared. He growled. Do you think I care what you do? Well, I don't. All right, I don't want to talk about this anymore. You're free to do what you want. Let's talk about something else. But that's what I want to talk about, she grinned. I can tell that you're jealous from your tone. Who do you think I am, your girlfriend? Huh, I did it just to make you angry, and it worked. Who said I'm angry? Damon refuted. I saw the look on your face. I know it bothers you, she accused. Then she gently cocked her head to one side and asked, It's okay, you can say it. You like me just a little, right? No way, he denied. She scooted her chair closer to his and leaned against him. Damon wanted to push her away, but he suddenly felt her perky bosom pressing up against him. It was straining against her low-cut red lace shirt. Instantly, a warm feeling spread throughout his entire body. He couldn't control it, and his mind began to race. He put his hand on her thigh, and Izzy's pretty face turned red. However, she welcomed his touch. Instead, she became bolder and leaned closer to him. Her soft eyes were filled with an expression of longing. You don't like me? But I know you want me. I made a mistake, Damon stammered. Izzy, however, wasn't phased. She liked a challenge. In any case, she knew she was winning him over. Izzy gazed into his dreamy eyes. She murmured, I don't believe that. Come on, I've helped you out a lot. Don't you want to thank me? But you're with Will. I saw the way you touched him, Damon protested. She took the opportunity to hug him with both arms. She put her soft red lips to his ear and breathed, Will's a pig. Let me tell you something. I've already dealt with him. He treated the company like his personal bank account. He was corrupt. Anyway, he's in jail now. Are you happy? Damon hadn't expected her to deal with Will so efficiently. He had thought that she would have difficulty getting rid of him. He hadn't expected him to fall so quickly. Really? That fast? Yep, she nodded and smiled sweetly. She explained, He was too greedy and arrogant. This year, the company made a lot of money because of the new century. When it did, Will bought luxury cars and expensive wines. He also hired beautiful women to be his personal assistants. Originally, he kept all this a secret, but eventually it became too obvious to hide. He even siphoned company money into his own private account to pay for his extravagant lifestyle. In fact, Will had been very careful to hide the evidence of his crimes. It would have been difficult for anyone other than Izzy to find proof. Unfortunately for him, he never suspected that she would turn against him. Damon smiled. Since Will's gone, I will transfer you the rights to New Century. When Izzy heard this, she did not seem very happy. Is that all? She asked. What else do you want? Damon replied in confusion. She wrapped her arms around him again. She pressed her sexy body against him. Then, she sat in his lap and wrapped her slender legs around him too. She was embracing him with her whole body. She whispered, Did your girlfriend leave you? She's in D.C., right? Damon was shocked and his expression darkened. How did you know? Izzy pouted. I have my ways of finding things out. If you dare to investigate her again, I'll never speak to you again. Damon spat. He pushed her away. His sudden outburst of anger frightened her. She said pitifully, I just saw her social media. I didn't investigate her, and I definitely didn't do anything to her. 
She saw how worked up Damon was over his ex-girlfriend and she felt hurt. Damon also realized that he had overreacted. Fiona hadn't been harmed. Additionally, it seemed that Izzy didn't tell Fiona about what had happened between her and Damon either. She could have, but she did not. She'd respected his wishes. Thinking of this, he felt guilty. He couldn't help but apologize. Sorry. After hearing his apology, Izzy felt better. She smiled charmingly and hugged him again. She teased. Is that all you have to say? Just one word? Damon said cautiously. Well, what else do you want from me? She giggled. <laughs> Can you kiss me? Don't do this. I have a girlfriend. <laughs> You're still calling her your girlfriend even though she dumped you? Who knows? She might even have a new guy already. She was trying to provoke him. She saw his expression turn ugly and she hugged him tighter. She gently urged, Don't think about her anymore, okay? At least you still have me. After saying this, she gave him a sweet and tight hug. Damon wanted to push her away, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. The temptation was just too great. Her body was wrapped around his and he found himself enjoying it. Damon's recent breakup had left him feeling empty inside and he'd do anything to fill the void. He was a passionate person and he no longer had an outlet for these feelings. Izzy was so beautiful and she wanted him. She'd clearly put a lot of effort into her appearance today. She looked incredibly moving. Damon did not even have time to think. He just hugged her back. Luckily, their table was in a dark corner of the restaurant and no one else noticed their passionate embrace. After a while, Izzy pulled away and got off his lap. She sat beside him and gently leaned her head on his shoulder. He could smell her sweet perfume. Can you order us some wine? She asked him. Before Damon could speak, she had already signaled to a passing server. In a short while, the server returned and placed two glasses of red wine on the table. Izzy picked up a glass and shyly said, Let's drink, okay? Don't do this, he protested. She was moving too fast. He was still struggling inside. He was starting to like how she made him feel. This woman was beautiful, but dangerous. He was having a moral dilemma. Although Fiona had left without saying goodbye, he still felt like he was cheating on her. Perhaps his relationship was over, but he still had unanswered questions. Why had she left him like that? Had she found out that he'd been unfaithful? Had she done it because of the fight that they'd had? Or did it have to do with her mother? In any case, since he and Fiona hadn't officially broken up, it felt wrong to be with another woman. I know you can't refuse me, Izzy whispered to him. She was smart, and she could see that he was torn. Damon was speechless. She was right. She hugged him again and drained her wine glass. Then she raised the other cup to his lips so he would drink too. Her eyes were already a little hazy. She murmured, Let's get out of here and go somewhere more private. I know you want to, so don't refuse. We're great together. Come on, let's go. After saying this, she put some money on the table to cover their bill. Then she took his hand and led him out of the restaurant. She hailed a cab and they went back to her place so they could be alone. It was drizzling outside the window and gradually it began to storm. Neither Damon nor Izzy noticed, though. After hearing that Will was finally out of the picture, Damon gave Casey Games and Silly Goose the rights to New Century. The day after that, Izzy transferred the title to the 30-acre property to Everbright. True to her word, she charged him the agreed-upon price. This was a generous gift. She wanted him to know that she kept her promises. Damon's broken heart was starting to heal. Astronet continued gaining users, and the process of taking Everbright public was going smoothly. Things were looking up for Damon. Another celebration was on the horizon as well. Myerson University's 100th anniversary was just around the corner. The school was holding a grand festival to commemorate the occasion. For the celebration, the university was decorated with strings of colorful lights. President Upperton had invited famous graduates from all over the world to attend. After all, such a ceremony happened only once every 100 years. After the invitation went out, President Upperton was still very busy. Graduates were coming from all over the world, and many preparations had to be made. Some of the graduates were even arriving early. They wanted to spend some time with Mr. Upperton before the celebration began. When the president heard this, he was touched. Although he had been very busy during the past few days, he did not feel tired at all. Instead, he felt gratified. 
He was proud that so many Meyerson graduates had gone on to be successful. Meyerson University was preparing to celebrate its 100th anniversary. Successful graduates from all around the world had been invited to attend. Some of them had arrived early so they could spend time with their old mentors. One such group arrived to visit President Upperton today. They had been students in his finance class back when he was still a professor. Time passed quickly, and it had been more than 20 years since they'd graduated. During this time, Professor Upperton had become President Upperton. Although not all these graduates worked in finance, they were all pillars of their respective industries. The class had a total of 23 people. Among them, 10 had received invitations to participate in the anniversary celebration. This showed that the success rate for graduates from the program was very high. Now, most of them have come back to campus to meet their old professor. Fiona's mother, Karen, was among them. Karen had many outstanding achievements. She was the one who had organized the visit today. She and her old classmates came to campus and found President Upperton. They invited him to come out to eat with them. That way, they could chat and catch up. The president was honored that his old students had made the effort to come see him like this. They stood in his office and got acquainted. His old students had heads of gray hair, but they were all still energetic. When he saw this, he felt comforted. Karen led the group. She broke into a smile when she caught sight of him. She exclaimed, Professor, do you remember us? Your finance students have all come to see you. The others also greeted him. President Upperton felt gratified to see them. He smiled and said, Good, good. Looking at you, I feel that my work was not in vain. Sit. All of you sit down. Make yourselves comfortable. Thus, the group sat down around the president and began to talk loudly about the upcoming anniversary celebration. For a moment, the atmosphere seemed harmonious. Then, President Upperton suddenly asked, Hey, Karen, why isn't your husband Gerald here? Although Karen looked down on her ex-husband Gerald, he was still considered successful enough to be invited to the celebration. Naturally, President Upperton didn't know that Karen and Gerald were divorced. This was a secret. Back when they attended Meyerson University, they'd been top students. No one had been surprised when they started dating. They were the perfect couple. Now that they had both made names for themselves, their alma mater was proud of them. It made for a good story. Karen shook her head and said, Gerald has been quite busy recently. He might not be able to come. Other than him and Zane, everyone from our class who received invitations is attending. Zane had some urgent business in New York, so he's unable to make it. President Upperton nodded. When he heard Zane's name, his face was filled with pride. After graduating from Meyerson University, Zane had gone on to do great things. Now he has a net worth of more than one billion dollars. He was a prestigious figure on Wall Street. Suddenly, President Upperton thought of something. Speaking of Zane, he recently introduced me to an excellent young student at Meyerson University. If not for his introduction, I wouldn't even know about this capable young man. This student is indeed ambitious. Karen and her friends looked at each other in confusion. Karen couldn't help but ask, who are you talking about? President Upperton kept them in suspense. He asked mysteriously, Has anyone heard of Everbright? The company has recently been gaining popularity. It's about to go public. Apparently, it's poised to be worth billions. As soon as he said this, the group immediately began discussing it amongst themselves. They couldn't believe their ears. Even just one billion was an enormous sum. However, some of them had heard of Everbright in connection with the old century before. After all, it was an incredibly popular game. President Upperton saw that some of the people in the group didn't know about Everbright, so he explained, It's the company that made the old century. That's right, that's right, now I remember, someone replied. Speaking of which, I'm not afraid to say that I actually quite like the game, it's really well done. As soon as everyone heard this, they all seemed to realize what the president was talking about. They'd all heard of the old century before. Karen blinked in disbelief and said, then are you saying that the founder goes to this school? That's right. He is a current student here, Mr. Upperton replied. Her friends immediately started discussing this amongst themselves. Even though they had all made names for themselves after graduation, their companies weren't worth anywhere near as much as Everbright was. Furthermore, the old century was legendary. Karen and her old schoolmates were very interested. They wanted to know more. 
Would this student be at the celebration? They wanted to befriend him. He sounded like he'd be a good person to know. President Upperton continued, The most surprising thing of all is that the student is only in third year. This revelation caused an uproar in the office. Although the alumni were all outstanding, it had taken them years to get where they were today. They couldn't believe that a third-year student had founded such a successful company. It was too shocking. Even Karen had a shocked expression on her face. She was a proud person, but she was extremely impressed. She couldn't help but suggest, President Upperton, this student is really something. You should introduce him to us. The president was very satisfied with the response that he'd received. To be honest, when he first heard this news himself, he was equally as shocked. As the president of the university, having such an outstanding student in the school was something to be proud of. After all, it was the university's job to educate people. Having talented students proved the school's excellence. When he heard Karen's question, he laughed loudly. Ha ha ha, yes of course. You will have a chance to get to know him. The president held up an envelope that had been lying on his desk. Look, this is his invitation. I haven't had a chance to send it yet. Karen and her friends all craned their necks to look. What was the student's name? It was addressed to someone called Mr. Walker. Karen thought about this for a moment. So his last name was Walker. Who could this mysterious young man be? Other than the fluttering flags and strings of colored lights hung around campus, the university's 100th anniversary didn't have much of an impact on its students' lives. The next morning, Damon had two uninvited guests. Nancy and Robert had come looking for him because they wanted to celebrate his birthday. They had a present to give him. Last time they'd come looking for him, he'd been away on his business trip. Today, when they came to campus, they were overjoyed to finally find him. Nancy was afraid that he'd try to hide from her, so she and Robert went directly to his dorm. All of his roommates were there. Recently, Theo and Xander were in high spirits. The basketball league was in full swing. They were still on the school team, and they were the driving force behind its success. Thanks to their excellent teamwork, Meyerson University's basketball team was in the top four of the league. Naturally, many people admired the two friends. Apparently, Riley and Willow had to keep a close eye on Theo and Xander because so many women were writing them secret love letters. They'd found more love letters than they could count, and these were only the ones that they knew about. Sometimes women would even come to room 502 looking for Theo and Xander, they were stars on campus now. At this moment, Riley and Willow were also hanging out in the dorm room chatting about where to go for dinner tonight. When Nancy and Robert arrived, everyone looked at them in surprise. Even those who didn't have sharp eyes could see that they weren't ordinary people. Obviously, they were rich and powerful. Although they wore average clothes, their demeanors gave it away. They acted like very important people. They couldn't hide it. However, no one in the dorm had relatives like this. Xander's parents were well-connected, but they weren't elites like the Brokertons. When Xander saw them, he reacted quickly. He stood up and asked politely, Hello, can I help you? Nancy and Robert smiled and greeted everyone. Then they looked at Damon, who was sitting in the middle of the room. Hi, Damon, Nancy smiled. We're here to see you. She wanted to say, Your dad and I are here to see you. But she respected that Damon didn't want people to know yet. When Damon saw them, his expression became somewhat ugly but he couldn't be rude in front of all his friends. He stood up and led them down the hall to the laundry room. In his eyes, this was all they deserved. He was not even willing to offer them seats. Why are you here? He asked coldly. Nancy smiled. She didn't dare to show any dissatisfaction. Well, she began, it's like this. It was your birthday a week ago. Your dad and I came looking for you, but you were away, so we came back to find you again today. My birthday was a long time ago. What's the point of coming now? Damon didn't even look at her. In his eyes, he had only one birthday. It was the day that the walkers found him, and he'd never change it. Nancy didn't know how to answer. Actually, she had just wanted an excuse to see him. She wanted to celebrate his birthday, but it was more of a pretense. Robert saw that his wife was speechless, and he couldn't help sighing. He asked softly, Are you free? Will you come and eat with us? I don't have time. Damon refused the offer without hesitation. Robert smiled bitterly at him, but he wasn't angry. He continued, Your mother and I came to talk to you. It's fine if you don't want to invite us to stay, but you don't have to be so cold, do you? Damon shook his head and replied, I'm busy. You saw all my friends back there. They're waiting for me. Robert wanted to say something, 
but Nancy was afraid that he would offend their son and cause another dispute. So she quickly said, It's fine. We are not planning to stay. We just wanted to give you your birthday present. Your dad and I picked it out just for you. Although it's not your birthday anymore, we still want to give it to you. Damon was stunned for a moment. A birthday present? Nancy hurriedly took out a car key from her pocket as if it were a precious treasure. Then she explained, We've been separated from you for so many years, so I didn't know what you'd like. We had to guess, so we got this. I don't know if you'll like it or not, but I hope you do. Then she gave the car key to him. He looked at it. He recognized the logo. It was a Ferrari. He hadn't expected this. The corners of his mouth moved as if he were smiling, but his eyes were still cold. He didn't seem very excited. The Brokertons couldn't read his expression. They didn't know if he liked the gift or not. Nancy and Robert suddenly became nervous. Nancy carefully added, The car is parked outside the building. Do you like the gift? Damon fingered the key and said, Not bad. He accepted the gift without hesitation. After all, why not? He knew that they were trying to buy his love, but he didn't care. His resentment for them eased a little. But this was not because of the gift. It was because Nancy had knelt on the ground and begged his forgiveness last time they'd met. Her apology had touched his heart. After Damon accepted the gift, Nancy finally let out a sigh of relief. Then Damon asked, Is there anything else? If there wasn't, he didn't have any more time to waste on them. The Brokertons got the message. Nancy didn't know what to say. She wanted to stay with him for a while longer, even if it was just to look at him. Just being near him made her happy. Unfortunately, Damon wouldn't give her the satisfaction. Robert understood his wife's heart and asked, Will you come eat with us? No, I'm not going. All right, then, Robert conceded. Why don't your mother and I take you to see your new car? Also, in the future, if you need anything, you can call us anytime. Can we have your phone number? From now on, the Brokerton building is your home. If you are willing, you can come with us to California as well. He paused and looked at his wife. That's the place where you lived before we lost you. You can take a look at your old room. Your mother preserved it. She even keeps it clean and tidy for you. You can come and see for yourself sometime. The Brokertons had just given Damon a birthday present. It was a brand new Ferrari. Robert invited their son to their home in California sometime. He wanted Damon to see how Nancy had preserved his childhood bedroom all these years. If he did, maybe he'd realize that they'd never forgotten about him. Damon looked at Nancy. She was wringing her hands and watching him expectantly. I don't have time, he replied casually. Then he took the car key and went back to his dorm, leaving Robert and Nancy in a daze. After a while, the Brokertons finally left as well. When Damon got back to his dorm room, Theo, Xander, and Hector had already left to eat. Quinn was on his computer dealing with some problems. Since joining the Astronet team, he'd taken his job very seriously. Damon paid him well, and he felt at ease only when working to improve the company. Hey, do you know how to drive? Damon suddenly asked. His roommate nodded. I learned when I was 16, but I'm not very good. At this time, Quinn's father had still been alive, and he'd taught his son how to drive. However, that was years ago now, and Quinn hadn't touched a steering wheel in a long time. He'd forgotten everything that he'd learned. All right, are you free? If you are, let's go for a drive, Damon suggested. His roommate nodded, and they went downstairs together. According to Nancy, the car was parked in the small parking lot behind the dorm building. It was the same lot where Damon had parked the Bentley after the car exhibition. At the time... The vehicle had attracted a lot of attention. People even lined up to take pictures in front of the car. When he and Quinn got to the parking lot, they indeed saw a black Ferrari sports car parked there. Sunlight glinted off the sleek body of the vehicle, exaggerating the extreme beauty of its design. Anyone who liked sports cars would instantly fall in love with this Ferrari. Quinn was still looking around. Which car is yours? He never would have imagined that the most dazzling car in the parking lot belonged to his friend. Damon went straight to the Ferrari and pressed the key fob. With two beeps, the doors slowly rose up like the wings of an eagle. Seeing this stunned Quinn. This vehicle was the most handsome sports car he'd ever seen. Just looking at it excited him. 
What do you think? Damon asked with a smile. His roommate didn't hide his amazement. Wow, what a car. Ugh. If you like it, hop in. Come and try it. After saying this, Damon got into the driver's seat and Quinn sat shotgun. Damon turned it on and took a moment to familiarize himself with the various settings. Then, he lightly stepped on the accelerator. Immediately, the engine began to rumble. He eased the car out of the parking lot and on to the campus road. However, because it was busy on campus, he drove very slowly. People exclaimed in surprise when they saw the handsome Ferrari drive by. Some people even recognized that this car was the latest model. It was a limited edition sports car, and it was incredibly expensive. Who would have thought that one would show up at Meyerson University? It was simply too cool. Quinn was also extremely excited. He sat in the front passenger seat and grinned. Although they weren't driving fast, Quinn still felt very satisfied. The car was comfortable and luxurious. Many people spent their entire lives without experiencing such a treat. Do you want to drive it? Damon asked. After all, taking the bus back and forth between Astronet and campus was troublesome. Damon had been planning to buy Quinn a company car, but now that Nancy and Robert had given him the Ferrari, it saved him the trouble. He might as well let Quinn drive it. Me? Quinn was shocked. He hadn't expected Damon to make such an offer. Despite his surprise, he was eager to give it a try. But quickly, his excitement gave way to nervousness. He said, Maybe it's better if I don't. This car is so expensive, I don't dare to drive it. He hadn't driven in a long time. If he got in an accident, he'd never be able to afford the repairs. Don't be afraid, Damon encouraged. Besides, in the future, you will be a manager at Astronet. You need to know how to drive a car. After hearing this, Quinn finally mustered up his courage. They pulled over and he got into the driver's seat. Unfortunately, before he even put his foot on the gas, they heard a crash behind them. The car shook as if something had hit it. Quinn and Damon were shocked. They got out and went to take a look. An Audi had rear-ended them. The Ferrari's alarm blared loudly. A young man and woman got out of the Audi. The man was very handsome and the woman was quite pretty. Now that Damon saw them up close, he realized that he actually knew them. The woman was Sammy, and the man was her new boyfriend. His name was Sean. At this moment, their expressions were extremely ugly. They just realized that they'd hit a Ferrari. Furthermore, Sean had good eyesight, and he could tell that the car was a limited edition. Even worse was the fact that his car insurance had just expired, and he hadn't had the time to renew it yet. In light of this, it was no wonder that he was so upset. The Ferrari's back fender was all dented. It would probably cost a fortune to repair. Sean couldn't afford it. He immediately cursed. Damn it, I told you to be careful. You don't know how to drive, so why were you going so fast? What did you think would happen? Sammy was frightened, but she tried to shrug it off. Maybe it wasn't so bad. Why are you being so mean? The car that I hit probably isn't worth much, right? Besides, don't you have insurance? Sean was furious. How dare you? Damn it, do you know what kind of car you hit? Plus, my insurance is expired. The repairs will cost a fortune. Huh? Sammy's face instantly turned pale. What kind of car is it? She stammered. Why will repairs cost so much? Her boyfriend waved his hand and yelled, That's a limited edition Ferrari. It's incredibly expensive. You can pay for the damage yourself. I can't afford it. Sean's Audi was actually quite expensive too, but he'd bought it on credit and he could barely afford the payments. He couldn't afford to pay the Ferrari's repairs. It would ruin him. Sammy couldn't afford it either. What do you mean? I can pay. I'm just helping you get home. You've been drinking. Now you're blaming me for the car crash? What kind of man are you? I'm not paying for your mistake. You insisted on driving my Audi. You said that it would be fun. Why did you pretend to know how to drive? Obviously, you don't know how. You could find some way to come up with the money yourself, damn it. Sammy was so angry that she started crying. You bastard. How could you? I'm your girlfriend and this is your car. Sean was furious. He roared. You want me to clean up your mess? Well, too bad. It's obvious that you were the one driving. The two of them were having a heated argument. Quinn and Damon didn't interrupt. Instead, they watched from the sidelines. Sammy was Quinn's ex-girlfriend, but she dumped him for a richer guy. Quinn's expression darkened. He didn't know what to think. He hesitated for a moment and then finally said, Don't make them pay, okay? Just deduct the cost from my salary. I'll cover it. Damon patted his friend's shoulder. This car is yours to use now. I have no objections to your decision. Besides, the car is insured. It doesn't matter. 
Actually, he didn't know if the car was insured or not, but he assumed that Nancy and Robert would have done so. Quinn nodded gratefully. Then, he strode towards the quarreling couple. He first wanted to take a look at the damage to the Ferrari. The vehicle was actually quite sturdy, and it was only dented, he said to Sammy. You guys go, you don't need to pay for the damage. He didn't want to see them having a falling out over money. Sammy and Sean stopped quarreling. Sammy looked at Quinn with wide eyes, her face full of disbelief. Is this car yours? Quinn didn't answer her. Instead, he pressed the button on the key fob and the doors opened automatically. Then he got into the driver's seat and honked the horn. Can you please move your car? He wanted to turn around and the Audi was in his way. Oh, oh, yes, I'll move right away. Sean stammered. He had a surprised look on his face, but he quickly got into the car and moved it. The sense of superiority he had before was gone. After Sean moved his car, Sammy watched Quinn turn the Ferrari around and drive away. She looked stunned. She watched the sports car until it disappeared from sight. Afterwards, she didn't speak for a long time. Since Quinn hadn't asked for compensation, Sean finally relaxed. He pulled Sammy's hand and said, Let's go. What are we waiting for? I'll take you back to your dorm. Then Sammy turned around and looked straight at him. When she spoke, her tone was serious. It's over. I'm breaking up with you. Sean's expression immediately changed. What did you say? You cow. Are you dumping me for that rich brat? He wanted to add that the car might not even belong to Quinn. But that was impossible, right? After all, Quinn had been in the driver's seat. Furthermore, he had said that they didn't need to pay for the damage. Only the owner of the car could make a decision like that. Sammy glanced off in the direction that Quinn had driven away. He looked so cool. She didn't know what to think. Finally, she turned and looked at Sean with despair. She slowly said, No, you were wrong. Perhaps I do regret leaving Quinn now, but that's not why I'm breaking up with you. No, I'm doing it because I've seen who you really are. I no longer hold any hope that you'll change. I'd rather be alone than be with you. After saying this, she gave him a determined look and left. Sean was left standing alone on the sidewalk. He was at a loss for what to do. After a while, he shouted after her angrily, Sammy, don't you dare take another step. If you don't turn around now, we are finished. I won't take you back. In the past, Sammy would have turned around when she heard these words, but today, she only shook her head and continued walking. She didn't look back. Sean finally realized that it was over between them. Damon and Quinn were driving around. Damon, did you see Sammy's expression just now? She regrets leaving me. I saw it on her face. It was so satisfying. Does that make me shameless? Am I as despicable as her? Can I tell you something? Damon replied. It made me feel great too. He smiled mischievously and continued. So you don't plan to get back together with her? No, that ship has sailed. I wish her well though, Quinn stated watching the road ahead. The knot in his stomach suddenly relaxed. From now on, he could face life with a chiller attitude. However, after the feeling of satisfaction passed, a faint sadness welled up in him. He couldn't shake it off. They drove around for a while and then went back to the dorm. That night, Quinn and Damon took some beer and went to sit on the roof. They had a great time. Quinn drank a lot. He was slurring his words. Damon, do you know what? My biggest aspiration used to be to return to my hometown after graduation, get a job. Then I would get married and have kids. I never imagined any other future. He paused to take a swig of beer. I've never been an ambitious person. I never thought that city life was for me. I also do not wish to live your life, but you opened up a whole new world for me. His tone was emotional and his eyes were filled with tears. In the end, he was just a guy from a small town. Before meeting Damon, he'd never thought that he would work for a company like Astronet one day. On top of this, he definitely never imagined he'd ever drive a Ferrari. Although the car wasn't his, he still got to use it. Because of his new job, Quinn now earned more than enough to support his family. He would always remember the first time that he'd sent his mother money after starting his new job. With fear in her voice, she'd asked him how he'd made so much money. She was afraid that he was dealing drugs and killing people. After all, for a poor family like his... The amount of money he was now sending home every month was an astronomical figure. Apart from becoming a criminal, how else could he earn so much? Quinn had patiently explained to his mother about his new job. He convinced her that the money he earned was legal. He told her about how he was participating in a great project. His mother trusted him, 
and she told everyone she knew about his success. Now Quinn had become the pride of his hometown. It went without saying that his mother was proud of him too. Seeing the look of joy on Quinn's face, Damon exclaimed, Can you believe it? I have a feeling that Astronet will do great things. It was a grand blueprint for a beautiful future. However, Damon didn't tell Quinn that there were many obstacles in their way. It was likely that Astronet would fall on tough times too. Any internet company was bound to encounter problems, but as long as they didn't go out of business, they would press forward with unstoppable determination. After finishing their beer, the two of them went back to their dorm. That night, Quinn slept exceptionally soundly. For the first time, he felt that life was wonderful. When his father passed away, everything became dark, but now there was light at the end of the tunnel. Life was beautiful again. He had hope for tomorrow.